Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. Well, this is great. Rain, rain, rain. I bet even the ducks wouldn't come out in weather like this. But me, I'm an idiot. I gotta go and take up a profession like being a writer. I couldn't take up something easy. Oh, no, not me. I gotta be a writer so I can be out on nice, cold, wet nights. Beating my brains out. Looking for an idea. Idea. Deadline. Oh, sure. Mustn't forget that ever-loving deadline. <laughs> what a way to make a living. I could have stayed a reporter at the Star Times and had nice assignments. Like listening to political speeches. Or covering the opening of a new manhole. Oh, no, but not me. I have to write fiction. Do it the hard way. Well, I might as well take the usual hand, open the usual door to the usual place, and hear the usual comments. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hiya. Coffee, coffee boy. Hiya, Dan. What do you say, Ed? Miss Editor wants you. How does it, Holiday? Oh, pretty good. Where's the makeup on page four? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. How are you? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hello, Susie. Anything in box 13? Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. What a character I am. Standing here in front of the wanted counter in a newspaper office while the rain runs down off my coat collar into my shoe. Mr. Holliday. I got to ruin my last pair of... Huh? What's that, Susie? I said there's a message in box 13 for you. Here. Oh. Thanks, Susie. Don't mention it. Say, aren't you going to open it? Sorry. Not here, Susie. You know, you got all of us down here at the Star Times awful curious, Mr. Holliday, running that ad. Have I? You've been running it for months. Why don't you change it? Well, I haven't read it for so long, I've forgotten the words. How's it go? Don't you remember? Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. How about that? I still like it. You'd do a lot better with Adventure if you ran your picture with the ad. No, no, thanks. Just keep on running it the way it is. But, gee, aren't you ever going to tell us what you do for a living while you keep running that ad? Susie, same old question, same old answer. No. Well, if I'm not doing anything else, at least I've got the people at the Star Times curious. They'd think my brain cells were ten feet off first base if they knew why I really run that ad. Maybe they are. Hmm. You can help a person out of great trouble and gain an adventure for yourself if you call Chester 8945 and ask for Carla Williams. Chester 8945. Carla Williams. Hmm. Sounds like an interesting name. Well, I hope she's home. Hello? Oh, uh, this is the man from Box 13. Oh? Tell me, are you serious or was that ad just a joke? No joke, Miss Williams. Are you willing to try anything? Well, uh, that depends what's on your mind. I can't discuss it over the phone. Will you meet me? 
Of course. There's a little French restaurant down on Ledge Street. Meet me there in the cocktail lounge. Uh, what time? Make it ten o'clock tonight. Tell the bartender you want to speak to Carla Williams. French restaurant on Ledge, ten o'clock. Oh, uh, what block number? The 600 block. You won't fail me, you'll be there. Lady, if it were winter, I'd come with bells on. This sounds like the beginning of a very interesting story. Beautiful woman in distress calls on struggling writer for help. Only she doesn't know I'm a writer, and I don't know she's beautiful. What's yours, mister? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm looking for uh, Carla Williams. Oh, yeah. She's sitting over there in that front booth. Thanks. Uh, Carla Williams? Yes. Oh, oh. Carla Williams could be material for a love story or an adventure story. Or, uh, maybe both. And, uh, do you have a name? Oh, uh, uh, yes. Dan Holliday. Uh, that's a dog. Oh, thanks. I'm uh, agreeably surprised. I didn't think a person would get such a satisfactory reply from a ward ad. And I didn't think I'd get such a nice reply. You're wondering about me, aren't you? You're wondering why you're here. Naturally. Well, I'm being blackmailed. That's a very nasty business. I've been paying blackmail for five years, but tonight's the end. I'm to meet him in 15 minutes and make the final payment and get the letters. Well, that sounds like the end of your troubles. But is it? I can't be sure. That's why I need your help. But what can I do? Well, you can be there as, as a witness. You can make sure this is the end. You can see that I get the letters and get away safely. Oh, uh, lady, you need the police. Why? To make sure everything I've kept hidden for five years comes out in the open? Maybe a friend could do it. My friends would be the last ones on earth I'd want to know. Are you afraid? No. You advertise for adventure? Blackmail isn't my idea of adventure. I'm sorry if my trouble doesn't measure up to your expectations. The best I could do on such short notice. Uh-oh. Well, I guess I had that coming. Maybe this isn't your idea of adventure, but I do need help. I need help badly. Let, let's leave it at that. Now, that might appeal to my early Boy Scout training. Then you will? I always help ladies across blackmail wraps. Uh, what happens if your friend makes trouble? We can't make any trouble. He seems to have done all right for the past five years. There won't be any trouble if you're alone. Here, reach under the table. Take this. Oh, uh, now wait a minute. It's a gun. Put it in your pocket. Don't let anyone see it. This is supposed to make everything all right? Well, you won't need it, believe me. I, I thought it would make you feel better. It makes me feel like a policeman. And I still think a policeman is what you want. But you promised. I said maybe. I have to meet him in 15 minutes. Please help me. Where do we go? His apartment. Far from here? We can make it if we leave now. What do you say? Maybe I should never have been a Boy Scout. I watch Carla Williams closely as we ride over to the apartment where she used to meet this man she's been talking about. She's perfectly groomed with a certain niceness about her, except for those twin furrows of worry between her eyes and a cold look of anxiety. I don't think I would like to have her angry at me, though. That's funny. You should have been here 20 minutes ago. Huh. Uh, why don't you try the door? It was unlocked. You might as well wait inside. Unless you have any objections. Not at all. There's a light switch on your right. The living room is straight ahead. Say, you sound like you're familiar with the place. Why not? I've been here many times before. There's a light on in there. 
Suppose he might have fallen asleep? Waiting for his money? Hardly. Well, this is more like it. And this spot is nicely furnished. With my money. But at least we can sit down and make us... Make us... Oh, no. Miss Williams, what's the matter? What happened? By the floor. By the desk, look. You stay here. Better call the police. He's dead. Dead? Yeah, he's been shot. Once. Through the heart. I'm glad. I'm glad. He's the one? The man who was blackmailing? He is. Would you... Could you go through his pockets? He must have some of those letters with him. Look in his coat pocket. Uh, just a minute, Miss Williams. You don't understand. This man has been murdered. We've got to call the police. Murdered? What makes you so sure? There's no gun around any place. Just the same before the police come. His pockets... Please, I've got to have those letters. Okay. But it isn't right. Are these what you wanted? Let me see. Yeah. Yeah. They're all here. Now, where's the telephone? We've got to get the police up here and fast. There is no phone. No? How do you know without looking in this? I told you I've been here before. Oh, yes, I forgot. Well, go downstairs. There's a pay phone in the lobby. Tell the police to come up here right away. And come back and we'll wait for them. You're not planning to leave while I'm downstairs, are you? No. Here, here's a nickel. Just dial O and tell the operator you want the police. Hurry. But you, you'll be here. Call, I said. I wanted adventure, so I put an ad in a newspaper. And I certainly found what I wanted. Only this isn't good. A man is lying dead on the floor of this apartment. And Carla Williams and I will have to get down to the police headquarters and answer a million questions. All of them embarrassing. Uh, I hope she's made the calls. Say, that's funny. Why would there be a telephone directory in a place where there's no phone? Or maybe there is one. Of course, right here in the hallway. I wonder why she said there was no phone here. Maybe it's been disconnected. Hmm. Operator. This is the operator. Oh, fine. I've written a dozen stories like this. And whenever I've reached this point, the hero always finds that he's been framed. Hmm. Framed. The gun. I need to look at that gun. To find out if it's been fired. One shot has been fired. And the police surgeon will probably find a bullet from this gun in that dead man's body. The police. Seems like little Carla took care of that. Me, I'm going to take care of something else. I'm leaving. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Once again, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, right now I'm wishing I were half as smart as the heroes of some of my stories. I've got a murder, a strange woman, a strange apartment, and a strange feeling that this might not work out to a happy ending. What I need is a cab, a quick trip home, a short drink, and a long, long think. Sure is a rotten night to be out. Yeah, it sure is. Never seen such rain. Not so good. Cops are sure busy tonight. Sounds like it. I wonder who they're after. I, uh, wouldn't have any idea. Could be a murderer, you know. Yeah, just could be. Just a night for a murder. Perfect. How come you got so wet? It's, uh, raining. <laughs> I know, but how come? My umbrella needs recovering. You want the Normandy Arms? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's your building up ahead, but it looks like you've got lots of company. What do you mean? Them's prowl cars, mister. All over the place. Oh, 
this is very nice. Carla Williams called the police and must have mentioned my name in passing. I'm the type of interesting young fellow that any cop would like to meet. Especially with a murder weapon in my pocket. Tonight, Mr. Holliday, I think you will sleep elsewhere. Want me to pull right in where all them cops are? No, they look busy, so maybe we'd better not bother them. Just keep on driving. But this is where you live, ain't it? I don't feel like going home tonight. I could shove them cops aside, you know. This is a legitimate hack. Uh, that would be fun, but don't bother. You're the boss, mister. Where to? Uh, there's a place down on Franklin Avenue. 1612, I think. I know that place. That's the cheapest hotel in town. Yes, I believe it is. Hey, how do you know about a place like that? I got information there for a story. What a joint like that. What are you going there tonight for? To sleep. You're writing another story? I'm living one. Living one? Yes, I left my typewriter at home. Well, Mr. Holliday, to what do we owe this great pleasure? Maybe you're just lucky. More research on the seamier side of life? No, not tonight. I'm looking for a room. A room? Might I remind you, Mr. Holliday, this ain't the Roney Plaza. Have you got a room? Any particular exposure you might like? The less, the better. I'm sure we can fix you up. That is, if you're willing to pay in advance. Buck, buck and a half, how much? Twenty-five dollars, Mr. Holliday. Twenty-five dollars? And if you committed the murder, it'll be fifty dollars, Mr. Holliday. Come on, talk straight. I don't want any trouble with the police. What makes you think I'll cause you trouble with the police? Little box called the radio. Police calls. They're a lot of fun to listen to, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, I'll bet they are. You'll be comfortable here and safe. I'm beginning to wonder if I could afford it. With your money? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I wasn't trying to. Where's your phone? The one on the wall costs a nickel. Thanks. You're staying tonight, Mr. Holliday? Back there in a hurry. You? Where are you? Still in town. What about the police? They with you? What do you think? Thanks for putting in a good word for me. I had to. They made me. Look, I, I want to talk to you. I know that feeling. I want to talk to you, too. I can explain everything. Like a gun with one bullet fired? Yes. A missing telephone that wasn't? That, too. Oh. Then you're just the little girl I want to have words with. Can you come over here right away? Are the police there? Name the place, I'll meet you. The corner of 6th and Victor, 10 minutes. Right. Follow me, Mr. Holliday. Oh, where to? Your room. This ain't the Roney Plaza, but the service is just the same. I've changed my mind. You're not staying? Your rates are too high. I'll drop in again after I've made a fortune. Now I know how the fox feels when the hounds are closing in. Hmm. <laughs> Someday I'll have to write a story about a fox. Put that guy Burgess and his Peter Rabbit out of business. Hey, cab! Oh, it's you again. Yeah, I get around, don't I? I thought you were set for the night. No running ice water. Six and Victor. Where did you say you wanted to go? Six and Victor. But there ain't no place to sleep there. Oh, I'm not sleepy. I just want to examine a fire hydrant. Okay, mister. I'm glad it's your money and not mine. If we keep on, it will be your money. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Say, uh, is that tonight's extra lying up there? Sure. Want to take a look at it? Oh, yeah, thanks. That picture they got of you on the front page is lousy. What picture? You look like you was facing the camera through a screen door. Yeah, let me see that. Well, 
well, well, this is just wonderful. Prominent writer named by police. Carla Williams accuses Dan Holliday of the murder of Harry Granger. Grief-stricken girl witnessed the murder of her fiancé. And there's going, Carla. It's your word against mine, plus the evidence against me. Now I know why they wrote that song, I Get Along Without You Very Well. Well, there's six and Victor. Cruise on by. You ain't gonna stop? I haven't made up my mind. Looks like a couple of cops waiting around for somebody. That's the way it looks to me. That might be the law. Yes, they might be. What do you want to do now? Get away from here and find a city directory. A chap by the name of Harry Granger should have a home. And he should have stayed in it. I'm either just ahead of the police or right behind them. And if this game keeps up much longer, I'll be right with them. Yeah? Oh, uh, Harry Granger live here? He did. You the police? Well, no, not exactly. A reporter? I used to be. Come here, you. I wonder if you're one of them blackmailers. Just a minute, friend. My coat rips easy. No, I guess not. If you were, you wouldn't be here. Mind if I step in? Come in, come in. This whole thing's got me all upset. You don't say. Oh, uh, you said something about a blackmailer. That's what I'm here for. I came to help Harry get rid of those rats. You mean he was being blackmailed? For five years. I lent him most of the money to pay off with. I told him he was a sucker, but it looks like I got here too late. You heard what happened? Saw it in the papers on my way from the station. Have you told the police? Not yet, but I'm going to. Who did you say you were? I didn't say. You know something about this? I think I do now. I began to see the light when the city directory listed this place as Granger's apartment. Can I help? You might get into trouble. Well, how? Breaking into a woman's apartment. After this, I'll use a fire escape and more of my stories of the most interesting things about a building. Homicide will be out in the hall seeing that no one comes in here. I'll have to work fast, Holloway. You'll have to find something that the police weren't looking for. There must be something. Those letters, comments, that's no good. Look, look for the obvious. That's, that's what I always have my hero doing. Let's see what's the obvious. For well, the living room. Now, let's see. That's where the body was. Nothing obvious there. On the desk. No, no. The table. No. The fireplace. Hello, hello, hello. A small frame snapshot. And I think it might be just what I'm looking for. My old friend, the bartender, and Carla Williams. And with your arms around each other. You know, you two make a nice couple, a wonderful couple. I wonder if they'll let you have your arms around each other in the electric chair. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I finally made it. I'm down at police headquarters in the office of a tall, gangly character named Lieutenant Kling. Of course, a few things have happened. Carl and the bartender were brought in, too. He's so much cooler than I am. Oh, those cell bars give you such fine ventilation. Holiday. Um, what's that, Lieutenant? I said you were a very lucky citizen. After what Carla Williams told us, we thought you were guilty. You should have told me that story to believe it myself. Approving that she and the bartender were married put a crimp in her act as the injured fiancé. Yeah, you showed it up as the same old racket. Smart woman teams up with smart man to blackmail innocent citizen. But just the same, I think you should stick to your writing and let police work alone. Uh, Lieutenant, I'll have that printed and framed in blonde walnut. Hang it on the wall? <sighs> no, around my neck. I'm glad to hear you say that. You may not always have a guy like this Grant who backed up your story. Oh, uh, Granger's friend? That's the one. Say, he's a nice fellow. Wants me to visit him on his ranch. Why don't you do that? 
Riding the range all day when I could be cooking in town? Uh, pardon me. Homicide, Lieutenant Kling. Oh, yes, yes, he's here. It's for you, Holiday. Oh, thanks. Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Susie. Yes, Susie. Can you come down to Star Times right away? Oh, what's the matter? There's another letter for you in box 13. Oh, no, no, no. Should I uh, open it and read it to you? Oh, not now, Susie. I- I've got enough material to last me for a month. Three weeks of which will be a rest. Tell me where. Maybe I can come down and help you. You really want to help me? Sure I do, Mr. Holiday. Then put that letter back in box 13. But, Mr. Holiday. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Ellen Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Well, this is great. You come to the park to get a hot idea, but the day turns out hot. And my idea turns out cold. Idea. Well, I thought I'd find something different in a public park. And I did. A small boy mashing his ice cream cone against my brand new trousers. And all to meet a deadline. Deadline. Story idea. Why didn't I do what I should have done in the first place? Copy, copy, boys. Hi, Mr. Holiday. Hiya. Hey, Smith, where's the lead on that fire? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. What do you say, Bill? Come towards that interview. Hiya, Dan. How are you, Joe? Where's the makeup on page four? Hiya, Holiday. What's a good word, boy? Hiya, Mr. Holiday. Hiya, Susie. Anything in box 13? Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Now for Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Go to the park and get a story idea about romance. Sure, why not? What do I come back with? Gravel in my socks, sand in my shoes, and a June bug in my hat band. Holiday, why didn't you pick a different profession like driving a coal truck? Mr. Holiday. Um, what's that, Susie? I said, there's a message in box 13 for you. Oh, thank you, Susie. Thanks so much. Don't mention it. Say, you got a faraway look in your eyes today. Yes, but only as far as the dry cleaners. Dry cleaners? Have you ever had a small boy wipe his ice cream cone off on your trousers? Oh, <laughs> girls don't call them trousers. And I said it's flat. So it is, Susie. So it is. Well, see you later. Okay, if you say so. But I still don't like that look in your eyes. You look like you might get into trouble. You know what I think after spending the day in the park? What? Trouble will be a welcome relief. <laughs> Why did I ever have to decide to be a fiction writer? I could have stayed a newspaper reporter. I could have kept on writing those snappy obituary notices and worn a hat that turned up in front and shoes that did the same thing. Well, better see what's in this envelope. Hmm. If you want real adventure, be at the corner of 7th and Main at 10 p.m. tonight. 
A black limousine will pick you up at that time. Do not try to engage the chauffeur in conversation. Huh? What's this? No signature. Oh, oh. no signature. Black limousines. Chauffeurs who won't talk. Meetings on street corners at 10 o'clock at night. Well, this should be interesting. Oh, oh, there it is, a black limousine. Look at that chauffeur. This way, Mr. Holiday. Oh, uh, mm, thanks. What a character this driver is. He looks like he spent his nights on a nice cold slab down at the morgue. Wonder if I can get him to talk. Uh, driver. I said driver. Oh, uh, chauffeur. Oh, you. Oh, uh, oh, pardon me. Through there, Mr. Holiday. So you do talk. I was beginning to wonder about that. This way, Mr. Holiday. Uh, 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 who's that? It's only me, Mr. Holiday. That black suit, it makes you almost invisible, you know. Yes, I know. Uh, follow me. You're curious about the way you were brought here. Did it frighten you? Maybe. Maybe not. This room, please. <laughs> My office. Well, this is very cozy. Well, I'm glad you find it so. To eliminate a lot of questions, I'd like to say this. I know all about you. Uh, all? You're a successful writer. Apparently you fear nothing, and I would presume that some of your adventures spring from that ad you run every week in the Star Times. Did you find it interesting? <laughs> Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. Do you catch many people with that ad? I caught you. Or is that vice versa? <laughs> I had you investigated, Holiday. I know where you live, what you do. The newspapers have told me of your experiences. Hmm. What are you leading up to? You'll notice I had you brought here by a devious route. I wanted to be sure no one knew you were here. Go on. How much do you know about insurance, Holiday? A great many people buy it. A great many don't. And of those who do buy, a great many intend to defraud, to steal from their insurance company. Now look, this is a racket. I'm not interested. My name is Abner Blake. I'm the chief investigator for Northern Insurance. Oh. Do you remember the disappearance of Dr. Max Alexander? I read something about it. Why? He carried a very large policy with us. He's been gone almost seven years. When his seven years are up, the law will permit his widow to collect. And Holiday. Yes? I don't think Alexander is dead. <laughs> This man has the coldest, frostiest eyes of any professional man trailer I've ever seen. And he's loaded with energy. Energy which I'll bet has helped him track down the people who tried to cheat his insurance company. Boy, I'm glad I'm on his side. If you'll think back, Dr. Alexander performed a very delicate brain surgery on a prominent man. The operation was not successful. I remember that he was criticized in some circles for taking a chance. Immediately after the patient died, Alexander walked out of the operating room, the hospital, and so far as we've been able to prove, right out of this world. But I still feel that he's alive, somewhere. And you believe it's an insurance fraud? I'm sure it is. And I have a reputation, Holiday. No one has ever attempted to defraud Northern Insurance and has been successful. You, uh, suspect Mrs. Alexander? Hardly. She's barely left her house in all these years. She receives no mail except from her daughter. Her daughter? Uh, she lives in New Mexico. What about your regular men? They've looked everywhere. They've come up with absolutely nothing. Police? Same thing. And you're afraid you'll have to pay off? No. Not if I have a smart man. A resourceful one. A man who can be as relentless as I am. And I think that man is you. <laughs> If Shakespeare were alive, he would cast Abner Blake in the role of Macbeth and throw him an extra part as one of the witches. <laughs> but that's no affair of yours, Mr. Holliday. You've got to find a man who's been gone for almost seven years. 
And if you were the hero of this story, you'd go to the files of a newspaper and look into the past. Well, if it isn't Dan Holliday, what are you doing down the morgue of the Star Times? What would anybody be doing down in the morgue, Mac? Well, some of them just lay there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know me, Dad. I, I just got to have my little joke once in a while. Now, uh, what was it you're looking for? Oh, uh, the clips on a citizen named Dr. Max Alexander. What have you got on him? The works, Dan. The whole works. <laughs> Prominent man dies following delicate operation. Doctor criticized for taking chance. Doctor Alexander walks out of operating room and disappears. Grief stricken wife employs private investigators when police fail to find Doctor Alexander. Doctor Alexander given up for dead. Not a bad looking citizen, the doctor. He's been shot from more angles than this Philadelphia at Atlantic City. Kindly eyes, intelligent face, strong chin. Yes, doctor, when I see you, I'll know you. And I hope to see you soon. Yes? Oh, I'm Dan Holliday, Miss Alexander. I'd, I'd like to talk to you about your husband. My husband is dead. Well, some people think he isn't. They've found something. They think he's alive. Come in. Now then, Mr. Holliday, who are you? And why are you looking for the doctor? Uh, a commission from the insurance company. I hoped you might give me some information. It was on all the front pages. That's exactly as it happened? Yes. He was never seen again. Oh, Mr. Holliday, if only you could find some trace of him. I'm going to try. You don't know how terrible it is. Almost seven years. But still, I've had the feeling that he'll come back someday. He'll look for me, too. Well, of course. I miss him so. What about your daughter? After her father's disappearance, she couldn't stand it here in town. She went to our ranch in New Mexico. Oh? Her father's disappearance broke her heart. I... I pray you find him. Mrs. Alexander, so do I. Mrs. Alexander is a grief-stricken old lady. One who sincerely wants her husband back. So, where to look first? This is the build-up to the main story, Holiday, and if you're smart, you'll... you'll bring in all the characters. Where to, mister? I want a drawing room. To Albuquerque, New Mexico. Well, Holiday, you've got a railroad ticket and an hour to make the train. Better get back to your apartment, a quick shower, pack your bag, and get on your way. We've been waiting for you, Mr. Holiday. Well, gentlemen, is this a pleasant intrusion? And I hope you are, gentlemen. We were positive you wouldn't mind. Oh, of course not. People break in here regularly. Good. Sit down. If you don't mind, I like the air up here. As you wish. I understand you like to travel, Mr. Holliday. Travel? A wonderful pastime travel. Ever think of uh, South America? Often. You see, I'm a common Miranda fan. How would you like to go to South America? For me. All expenses paid. For as long as you want to stay. What would I have to do? Just forget a few things. Like New Mexico? Particularly New Mexico. Give me about two weeks and I'm your man. You don't seem to understand. You're leaving. Tonight. Well, that's what I mean. But I'm going west. No. So, you and I would make a nice compass together. Now, suppose you point north and walk right out of this apartment. Oh, and don't forget your gorilla. You mean Spencer? If that's his name, I mean Spencer. You'll hurt his feelings talking that way. Well, that makes us even. Just looking at him hurts mine. Is it uh, South America? In a way. At least I'm showing you the open-door policy. Now, get out, you and your gorilla. Spencer. I wouldn't recommend that. So? I said get out. Have you ever stopped to consider something, Mr. Holliday? What? 
you may never get to New Mexico. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, well, now you've got all the ingredients for a story. Insurance investigator doesn't believe doctor is dead. Wife doesn't believe doctor is dead. Two men try to stop Ryder from making further investigation. All right, Holiday. Write the rest of the plot. Or maybe you'd better hit the sack. This is very pleasant. I've got a comfortable drawing room, and I'll bet it's got a thousand springs to ease my worries. Uh oh. The man with the urge to send me to South America. Well, I've got something for him. Let's go. Now, fellow, it's the big idea breaking in here. I'm sorry. I must have come into the wrong drawing room. You came into the wrong apartment a couple of hours ago. Now, what do you want? I just want to go to sleep. In my traveling bag? I was looking for my razor. I wanted to shave. You just had a close one. Come on. Well, to find out if you got space in this train. If you haven't, we'll make some for you. Under guard in the baggage car. This is fine. I couldn't prove a thing. My friend had space, and to the conductor, it seemed like a perfectly logical thing to mistake car 19 for car 18. I wonder who this man is and who's in back of him. Next stop, Albuquerque. Albuquerque. Well, that's the end of the line for me. And I hope I don't mean that too literally. Long distance? I, uh, I want to speak to Catherine Alexander at the Bar Cross Bar Ranch just outside of Belmont. Yes. Hello? Uh, Miss Alexander? Yes? This is Dan Holliday. Wonder if I might come out to the ranch and see you. Oh, you're the man who's looking for father. Mother wired me about you. Was it complimentary? Mother said she believed if anyone could find Dad, you could. Come right out. I want to talk to you. And I want to talk to you. Cab, mister? Yeah, ever hear of Alma? Sure did. Know where it is? Sure do. Mm, uh, very far? Sure is. Uh, can you take me there? Sure can. You got enough money to pay for the trip? Sure have. Let's go, then. Sure thing. This is New Mexico holiday. Breathe deeply and treat your lungs to a shot of straight ozone. <sighs> Twenty miles to Valmont, and all you've seen on the whole trip is four buzzards, three in the air, and the one driving. And if he's a cab driver, I'm a flying disc. Car behind. Yeah, I saw here. Wants me to pull over. Don't do it. Know them fellas? One of them is Spencer. Friend of yours? That depends on what you mean by friend. I gotta pull up. Those guys are gonna run me into the ditch. Can you fight? Nope. Then can you recommend a good dentist? What fur? Something tells me that when this is over, I'm going to need a new set of teeth. You feel better, young man? Yeah, thanks. Uh, what happened after those two fellows jumped me? Who are you? My name is Moran. I'm the caretaker up at the Bar Cross Bar Ranch. I was coming down this way when you were forced off the road. Oh, uh. What happened to the driver? Last I saw of him, he was just a cloud of dust. 
I remember now I got out of the car. He drove away. Those two fellows started to beat you up good. When they saw me coming, they ran off too. Hmm. You had a mighty close call, young man. I had three of them. After this, my luck runs out. Somebody after you? And vice versa. Say, uh, how far is the ranch? Half a mile up the road. <laughs> Better take it easy. Come on, I've got to get to the ranch. Feel you can make it? My friend, I've got to make it. This is not good. Spencer and his gorilla followed me all the way out here trying to stop me at every turn. Maybe I'm getting warm. But if that's true, why hasn't someone else found Dr. Alexander? Here's the ranch house, Mr. Holliday. You say Miss Catherine was expecting you? Yes, but hardly in this condition. You're Dan Holliday? Well, what happened? You're all beaten up. So this is Catherine Alexander. What a beautiful girl. And what beautiful eyes. You'd better lie down, Mr. Holliday. You're badly hurt. Oh, no, thanks, Miss Alexander. I, I don't feel that bad. I just look that way. Anything more I could do, Miss Kathy? Oh, no. No, and thank you so much. If you hadn't come along, Mr. Holliday might have been badly injured. Perhaps fatally. Thank you, Miss Kathy. Now then, how about a hot shower? You can get a rub down and change of clothes. Miss Alexander, you read a man's mind. Sometimes that's a pleasure. Depending on the man. You're depending on me? What do you think? Well, this is more like it. Hot shower, brisk rub down, little iodine on a few... Ouch, ouch, that stings. And Catherine was kind enough to loan me some riding clothes. That should indicate a soldier in the saddle out on the desert. With the stars blinking their approval of my companion. Blinking approval? Holiday, you're an incurable romantic. Isn't this beautiful? That gorgeous sky and the stars. You love it, don't you? I always have. Always will. Have you been here long? The bar cross bar belonged to my dad. We used to come out during the summer. Now I live here all the time. Alone? Oh, there's always Moran. Moran? <laughs> he's a strange old fellow. <laughs> People around here say he's a little <laughs> touched. But he's been wonderful to me. Oh, uh, say, those men who jumped me down the road. Moran ever seen him before? How could he? They were strangers. Oh. Your, uh, your mother told me you've been searching for your father a long time. Yes. Mother and I have spent a fortune on private detectives, investigators, following up leads, but nothing ever happened. Yes, I know. Oh, tell me, Miss Alexander. Kathy, please. Oh, uh, Kathy. Have you any idea where I might begin to look? I thought you might give me a starting point. Mm, not unless it would be back in the city. He just walked out one day. No one ever saw him again. Well, I'd better go back there and start from scratch. You don't have to leave right away. I'd enjoy staying a while. Maybe I have been lonesome. Perhaps I've forgotten what companionship can be. Perhaps. You'll stay a while? A while. Good. Say, the time. We'll be much too late for dinner. Come on, I'll race you. You're on. Hurry or I'll beat you. I'm at the corral gate already. Kathy, look out! Ah! Kathy. Kathy. Mr. Holliday, what happened? You're we racing. The horse stumbled over that lower bar and threw her. Look at that gash in her head. She's unconscious. I, I hope she isn't seriously hurt. Don't stand there, man. Get in the house. Call a doctor. Yes, a doctor. A doctor. Hurry, will you? Of course. Get into the medicine cabinet in the house. I need some bandages. She may be suffering from multiple contusions. Multiple contusions? Or even a compound skull fracture. Hurry, will you? Compound skull fracture? I don't know if you can find it. Hurry, I said. There isn't much time. Okay, Dr. Alexander. You 
are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, now I'm back in the city again, walking up the street towards that same grim gray house where I first met Abner Blake. Up the steps, Holiday, and write the final chapter. That was a nice job, Holiday. I was nice about it. What do you mean? You didn't see the look in Dr. Alexander's eyes when he recovered his mind. And that lovely, lovely girl being mixed up in a deal like this. If you feel sorry for her, you're making a big mistake. Yes, I know. She was following him the day he walked out into the country. She'd almost caught up with him when a hit-and-run driver knocked him down. That's when she got the idea for the disappearance act. Why not? The doctor's face had been so damaged no one would ever recognize him. And he'd lost his memory to top it off. We've got the daughter and the mother in custody. Uh, just think, if she hadn't have fallen off that horse, I might never have been able to prove that Dr. Alexander was alive. I know. Hiding him on his own ranch was the daughter's idea, too. Why not? No one would pay attention to an old man puttering around the place. Uh, I've got a story, and I don't like it. Mother and daughter hide amnesia victim to collect insurance. Well, excuse me. Blake speaking. Uh, yes, he's here. For you, Holiday. Oh, thanks. Hello. Mr. Holiday, this is Susie. Oh, yes, Susie. There's a message for you in box 13. Shall I read it to you? No, Susie, you know you're not supposed to open my mail. But this is already open. It's a postcard. Oh, is it interesting? I think it is. All right, come on, come on, tell me what it says. It says, rental for box 13, $15. Oh, fine. Goodbye, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures... Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Copy, boy. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. What do you say? Where's that society page, please? Hiya, Holiday. Hiya. Jerk the first paragraph in that Simmons story. Hiya, Dan. How are you? Hiya, Susie. Hiya, Mr. Holiday. What's in box 13? You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. <laughs> Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, here I am again, standing at the want-ed counter of the Star Times, looking for what? An idea for a story. I could have stayed here as a reporter. I could have been searching for facts, instead I'm fumbling for fiction. Instead of a blonde, I'm meeting a deadline. Instead of Chanel number five, I'm heading for a sniff of printer's ink. Holiday, you're a dope. Mr. Holiday. I... 
What's that, Susie? I said there's a letter in box 13 for you. It's special. Special? Special delivery. It was mailed only a couple of hours ago. Something like that could be important. Mm, could be. Could be adventure. Could be. Could be a, a girl. Could be. <laughs> By the way, Susie, how come you're working so late this evening? Oh, my boss asked me to. He's paying me overtime. Time and three quarters. Time and three quarters? Mm-hmm. I held out for double time when he offered me time and a half. Well, what happened? Oh, we effected a compromise. <laughs> Goodbye, Susie. Special delivery, huh? Well, this could be very important, also it couldn't. Well, come on, open it up, Holiday. You haven't got all night. I'm in terrible trouble. Please come to room 718 at the Bradford Hotel. Hurry. Signed, Agatha Marsh. Hmm, that sounds urgent. Who are you, young man? What do you want? I'm the man from Box 13. I'm looking for Agatha Marsh. I'm Agatha Marsh. Come in, come in. You're Agatha Marsh? But don't stand there with your mouth open. Never can tell who might be snooping around the hall. Find a chair and sit down. Now, what's your name? Uh, oh, Dan Holliday. Well, Mr. Holliday, I don't believe in drinking or I'd offer you one, but I have got some sauerkraut juice in my thermos bottle. Oh, uh, no, thanks. It's the same. I like you, Mr. Holliday. I liked your ad in the paper. Adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. It was just what I needed. Well, thanks again. Now then, what's your charge? Charge? For helping me, your fee. Oh, that. No charge, Miss Marsh. Are you trying to be chivalrous? No, you see, I'm a writer. I'm looking for ideas. If I get a good idea, I consider I've been well paid. Well, that seems a little silly. Might I ask just what your trouble is? Oh, you don't think a girl my age could get into trouble, do you? Well, you look like a very charming old... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, lady, oh, lady, let's not beat around the bush. Now, no doubt you want to know a few things about me. Well, that would be very interesting. Yes, well, I live in Muncie, Indiana, alone. I've got a big house and an independent income. Every year I go someplace for a vacation, and this year I came here. Uh, is that all? Isn't that enough? But the letter you wrote me, you said you were in terrible trouble. Well, I am. If anyone ever finds out about this, I don't know what'll happen. Finds out about what? Come over here to the closet. I want to show you something. Look, on the floor. Well, that's a dead man lying there. Well, this would make a good opening chapter for a story. Young man goes to help charming old lady who is in terrible trouble. Terrible trouble turns out to be a corpse. Corpse? Here, wake up, Holiday. This is the real thing. Now, now do you believe me, young man? When did you find him? Just before I wrote you that letter. Before you wrote the letter? Well, that's hours ago. I know, but what could I do? What could you do? Miss Marsh, you could call the police. And get my name in the papers. Have all the folks back in Muncie know there was a dead man in my room? Oh, no. Miss Marsh, listen to me, please. There's a dead man in that closet. There's a law about dead men. We have to notify the police immediately. You can go to jail for hiding a body. Oh, fiddlesticks. But, Miss Marsh, look at this man. He's been shot at close range. There are powder burns on his coat. I know. I examined him before I wrote you. You see, I read all the current detective stories. Detective stories? This isn't a story. This is the real thing. I know. Well, why don't you try to prove that I did it? With what? A cap pistol? Now, you're a nice person, Miss Marsh, but this is going to be tough. Well, don't get so excited. A girl my age could kill a man if she wanted to. Um, rub him out, as they say in the murder mysteries. Please, Miss Marsh, be sensible. You've got a murdered man in your closet. Now pick up that phone and call the police right away. Mr. Holliday, in all seriousness, I can't do it. Think of what my lifelong friends would say. Yes, yes, I know it doesn't look I good. I can see the headlines now. Prominent Muncie pioneer woman found with dead body in hotel. Oh, please, Mr. Holliday, help me. Well, I don't know. This is a little out of my department. Just this once, Mr. Holliday. I've never asked for help before. I, I'm an old woman. Well, all right. What do you want me to do? I want you to help me get rid of the body. Get rid of the body? 
Now, look, Miss Marsh, you're not serious. You didn't mean that. Oh, you don't know me. I fully intend to get rid of that body. Okay, go right ahead. It's your course. And you're going to help me. No, no, I'm sorry. Try a bell. And have him snitch to the desk clerk. Besides, you advertised for adventure. But this isn't adventure. It's a nightmare. Come on, Miss Marsh. Let me notify the police. Now, there's a broom closet down the hall. That's very interesting. I I just remember I'm, I'm meeting someone in the lobby. I'd take the body there myself, but I'm not strong enough. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. I'll scream. Go right ahead. The hotel detective will show up. Just the man I'd love to see. And I'll tell him you killed that man. Oh. Now, would you help me? Suppose we get caught. Then you'll help me. Now, wait a minute. You said we. Now, I'll open the door and watch the hall. Uh, case the joint, as they say in the mysteries. And then you whisk the body into the closet. You're strong. You can do it. Oh, sure. I'm strong, all right. But not in the head. <laughs> Oh, this can't be happening to you, Holiday. You can't be dragging a body down the hall of the Bradford Hotel. You know better. And as soon as you can get away from this charming but cracked old gal, you're going to talk to the police. Harry, Harry, I'll open the closet door. Put him in right there. Stick him in good. I must be crazy. Now back into my room before anybody sees us. There. Wasn't that easy? Easy, she says. Well, I must say you carry out your part very well. What's next in this little scheme of yours, Miss Marsh? Why don't you know? We have to find out who killed that Michael O'Brien. You know who he is? Well, I do now. I went through his pockets. First him, as they say in the stories. Well, that cuts it. You stay here. I'm going downstairs. Who's that? Just keep cool. I'll handle everything. Oh, I can't believe this. It just can't happen. My name is Kling, Lieutenant Homicide Bureau. Oh, come in. Come in, won't you? I intend to. Holiday, what are you doing here? Hello, Lieutenant. Oh, do you two know each other? Never mind the social chatter. I thought this was some kind of a gag. Now I'm sure of it. Holiday, just what are you trying to dream up? If I told you, Kling, you'd never believe me. Sit down, Lieutenant. Uh, can I get you some sauerkraut juice? Well, I don't mind if... Uh, some what? Sauerkraut juice. Uh, no, thanks. Now, listen, somebody, some crackpot, phoned in a tip that there was a dead man in this room. Why, Lieutenant, how can you say such things? Lieutenant, now listen. You'll be quiet. Miss Marsh, mind if I have a look around? Not at all, not at all. Here's the closet. Have then. You can see for yourself, Lieutenant, there's nobody there. Yeah. I got your name from the desk clerk, Miss Marsh. Maybe you better tell me about yourself. I can tell you all about it. Now I was it. talking to Miss Marsh. Are you Miss Marsh? Right now, I think I'm dead. You will be if you keep interrupting me. Go ahead, Miss Marsh. Tell me about yourself. Certainly. I live in Muncie, Indiana. I arrived this morning for a two-week vacation. I'm well known back there, and you can find out everything about me if you care to wire. Uh-huh. Uh, how did you happen to meet Mr. Holiday here? Look, Lieutenant, if you'll permit me to tell you... I'm asking the lady. I went to school with his mother. That's what I did. Oh, uh-huh. see. Well, I guess it was the work of some would-be comic. But I had to investigate it just the same. Well, of course you do. Oh, but Kling, listen. Goodbye, Miss Marsh. So long, Holiday. But Kling, wait, I want to go with you. Why don't you two have a fast game of hearts? Mr. Holiday, wasn't that thrilling? Just like in the magazines. Miss Marsh, you're going to stay in this room until I get Kling back here. Oh, no, no, no. I want to solve this case myself. I wonder how Kling found out that... Miss Marsh. Yes. I'm not the suspicious type, you understand, but a little bird, a, a tiny little bird, has intimated that perhaps you might know who tipped off the lieutenant. Of course I know. It was I. What in the world are you doing? I made the call from the corner drugstore a little while ago. I wanted to throw the lieutenant off the trail, like they say. You know what I say? No, what? You're going down to police headquarters and tell the truth. Oh, just a second. Excuse me, please. Yes? Yes, this is Miss Marsh. Oh, you did. I thought so. There. You should have had 817 instead of this room. Oh, no, don't bother. I like it here. 
I knew it. I knew it all the time. What did you know? That was the room clerk. He got my reservation mixed up. I was supposed to get 817, and I got 718 instead. You mean the person who killed Michael O'Brien wanted to get back in here to remove the body? No, 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 it doesn't sound reasonable. Oh, it doesn't. Well, guess who was supposed to get this room? Never mind, we're going to police headquarters. It was Tony Bascari. Tony Bascari? He's the biggest racketeer in town. He's dynamite. Miss Marsh, he's deadly. I know, Mr. Holliday, and I love it. Oh, no. no. You are listening to Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now back to Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Two o'clock in the morning and I can't go to sleep. That little old girl has me worried to death. She wouldn't go to the police headquarters, and when I went down and talked to Kling, he acted as though it were a big joke and sent me on my way. Hello. This is Agatha Marsh. Now what? Where are you? At the hotel. I went up to see Tony Basquet. You what? Miss Marsh, don't you know that's the worst thing you could have done? I had to talk with him. I put the heat on him, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you're still alive? I accused him of killing that O'Brien man. I came right out with it. But of course, he wouldn't admit a thing. What do you expect him to do, break down and confess? Well, I think I've got him on the run. But I'm worried. Oh, if I had Tony Bascari on the run, I'd be worried too. Because when I came back, I discovered someone had searched my room. Will you call the police? You should have done it a long time ago. Oh, no, 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 I couldn't. I want you to come over right away. At two in the morning? Mr. Holliday... Someone's trying my door. Hang up quick. Call the room clerk. But, Mr. Holliday, I'd... Hurry, I said. That dear little meddlesome old fool. In your clothes, Holliday, because here we go again. And don't forget your boy, Scott Badge. You'll make the Beaver Patrol tonight. The clerk said she hadn't called the desk. I wonder... No, she would have screamed. Someone would have heard her. It's open. Cleaned out completely. No Miss Marsh, no clothes, no nothing. Not even a piece of note paper. Hey, what's this? Paper airplane. Like the ones I used to make in school. But why should she be making paper airplanes? Airplanes. The airport, that's where they took her. Keep that motor running. I'll be right back. Not many people around this hour of the night. Oh, there she is. And the man with her has his hand in his pocket, and I don't think it's there because it's cold. What I need now is a little fast talk and a little faster action. Okay, I'll take over from here. Uh, who are you? What are you talking about? The old doll. Vascari wants it back. Vascari told me to put her on a plane. I'm doing it. Yeah? Changed his mind. He wants it back. I don't think so. Besides, I never saw you before. I tell you, if you don't turn her over, Vascari might get sore. Why didn't he call me? It's only a half hour ago. I was still at the hotel. He could have called. And spilled everything over our phone. You nuts. This don't sound right. Yeah, forget it. Taking the old doll back with me. Wait a minute. Gonna call Tony first. Go ahead, stupid. Get your ears burned off. Who are you calling stupid? Show me something that'll prove Tony sent you. Got a match? Stop stalling. This is a gun in my pocket. Let's talk to Tony. Yeah, I, I've got some matches here. Thanks. Yeah. Hello! Get him, Mr. Holiday, quick. Come here. Oh, not so fast. Oh, I, I'm not as young as I used to be. You should have remembered that before you got mixed up in this. Come on, get in. Oh, Driver, get out of here fast. What did you do to that guy anyway? 
I, I struck him with my hairpin. I might have guessed it. Now, Miss Marsh, what happened at the hotel? Well, I hung up when I heard him trying the door, but I was too late. The door was unlocked. So it was Tony Basquiat, huh? He wanted you out of town fast. Oh, but they were very nice to me. You can thank your lucky stars for that. Usually, Vasquez's enemies wind up in some ditch. I didn't see him again. That man, the one you knocked out at the airport, he was the one who came in my room. Well, you must have the goods on Vasquez. You must have killed this man or had him killed. But why didn't he take him out of the hotel right away? But there was a convention there last night. The whole place was literally crawling with people. Oh, that's the reason. Oh, that paper airplane. That was fast thinking, Miss Marsh. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Well, now we can go back to Bascari. We've got the goods on him. We can crack the cakes like they say in the murder mysteries. Miss March, I've got news for you. We're not going to see Bascari. We're not? Well, where are we going? You'll hate me, I know, but it's the police station. Well, Holiday, what happens now? You've taken Miss March to Kling's office. She looks at him. He nods her into his private office. And suddenly she comes out smiling. You try to leave, only Kling stops you. You stay here, Holiday. Kling, you can't let her walk the streets alone. Vasquez will get her. Forget it. I got a man tailing her. Okay, okay. But what happened in that office? What did she tell you? Plenty, my friend. She preferred charges against you. She preferred charges against me? Now, what are you talking about? Kidnapping. I kidnapped her. You took her off the plane by force, didn't you? Listen, Kling, that little old lady is a whodunit happy. She'll get herself killed. There really was a body in the hotel, you know. Look, Holiday, do you know what you're saying? Sure, I know what I'm saying. There really was a body in that hotel. Holiday, why didn't you tell me? I tried to, twice. Once in the room and the last time when I came in here. Now think, Holiday, carefully. Where is the body? In a broom closet down the hall. I put it there. You put it there. Yes, I put it there. Holiday, get out of here. Well, Holiday, now you're fixed. Even Kling looked at you like those things in your belt. They weren't bats. They're more like eagles. But you're in it now, so you've got to follow through. And that indicates a fast ride over to the Bradford Hotel. Oh, clerk. Hey, clerk. Uh, yes? I'd like to find out who occupied Agatha Marsh's room the day before she did. Uh, that question is highly irregular. Oh? Then here's a $10 bill that's highly regular. Oh, <clears throat> uh, let me think. Uh, she has 718. She checked in day before yesterday. Yes? The man who had the room before that was a traveling salesman in uh, lady suits, I believe. Uh, you must have cut quite a figure. <laughs> She must be in this hotel someplace. Her room's empty, but she must be around. But where? What are you worrying about, Holiday? You couldn't wait to get rid of her. Now you can't wait to get her back. Oh, you're a character who belongs back in the Middle Ages with a tin union suit for cold nights. Yeah, she'll probably show up safely with that detective tailing her. The broom closet. Wonder if the dead man is still in there. Must be. Kling hasn't showed up yet. Oh, oh, oh hello, Mr. Holiday. Miss Marsh, what happened? How'd you get in that closet? Isn't this thrilling? No, it isn't. There was a detective trailing me, but he was knocked unconscious. Shocked, as they say in the murder mysteries. And you were brought up here? By the same man who tried to put me on the plane. He hit the detective, put me in the car, and brought me here. Well, you two, what are we playing now? And where is the man I put on you, Miss Marsh? He was hit over the head, Lieutenant, but I'm sure he's all right now. This is the closet where you said the body was? Was. It's right, Lieutenant. Here, let me take a look. You know what I think, Holiday? What? I think both of you crackpots are making this all up. I don't believe there ever was a body. Kling, you have my word for it. Your word doesn't mean as much as a Chinese dollar. Kling, Listen. They brought her back here, locked her up. They took the body away, didn't they, Miss Marsh? Probably going to sink it in cement, as they say in the murder mysteries. Vasquez is in his room. I'll bet. Go up and talk to him. Surely. Put the heat on him. Just 
Once more, I'll play with you kiddies. Come along. Where? Miss Marsh's room. I'm locking you pixies in till I get to the bottom of this. Clang's been gone 15 minutes. I wonder what's happening up there. Not much. I haven't heard any shooting. No, that's... I haven't heard any... In that case, how could a man be shot here and that shot not be heard? Oh, it's very easy, Mr. Holliday. The, the killer would use this. Oh, Miss Marsh, now where'd you get that gun? Just took it out of the drawer. It was here all the time. Well, put it down until Kling returns. But I just want to show you why the shot wouldn't be heard. What do you mean? Would you excuse me, please? You see this bath towel, Mr. Holliday? Yes, what about it? Well, a smart person would take the gun like this. Wrap the bath towel around it like this. You know, Miss March, you found out a lot since you came here. Oh, yes, I've done all right since early this morning. Early this morning? But the clerk said... I talked to Tony Biscari and he said... Ping, look out! Give Miss March for me that thing. You shouldn't have moved, Mr. Holliday. I was really shooting at you. What's this all about, Holliday? What was she doing with that gun in her hand? She was going to kill me, just like she killed Michael O'Brien. That little old lady killing somebody? Miss March, you, you did kill him, didn't you? Then you called me, and you got Kling to come up here and catch me dragging the body away. Only he came a little late, as usual. Now, wait a minute, Holiday. Then when you couldn't pin it on me, you tried to hang it on Tony Biscari. Now, what did you do with the body? Dragged it back to the closet in this room. Oh, and I suppose you sat the detective who followed you, too. It was easy. I got him to turn around and hit him over the head with my purse. Why did you kill Michael O'Brien? Did you have something against him? No, no. I never saw him before. Then why kill a perfect stranger? I saw a play once. I liked those ladies in that play. They killed lots of people. I wanted to also. Only I should have done it like the ladies. You don't mean arsenic and old lace. Yes, and I should have worn the lace and given you the arsenic. Well, Holiday, you're back in your apartment again. The sun is shining through the window, a sun you might never have seen again. You know, I've got an idea for you, Holiday. Give up this business and go into something quiet, like night watchman in a cemetery. Holiday. Uh, well, what's that, Kling? They examined the old girl down at the psychopathic ward of the city hospital. She's batty as a loon. You're telling me. I saw that in her eyes when she wrapped the towel around that gun. But uh, what happened to Basquiat and his stooge? When she heard he was in the room above, she tried to pin the body on him. Oh, so he tried to get her out of town in self-defense. Mm. Holiday, you're a very lucky, lucky guy. You can say that again and again. And again. Oh, just a minute. Hello, Mr. Holiday. Susie, what are you doing up here in my apartment? Why aren't you down at the Star Times? Well, my boss and I have been talking about another compromise. Another one? He wants to fire me and I want to quit. Oh, but Susie, if you left the paper, what would I do for my mail? I was thinking, maybe you'd like to hire a good combination stenographer and secretary, huh? That's you? That's me. Well, I don't know, Susie, but as they say in murder mysteries, I'll have to think it over. You better think fast. Good help is hard to find. Goodbye, Susie. Next week, same time... Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. Original music was composed and conducted by Rody Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, 
Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. He leaned over the shining halo of her blonde hair, reflected in the soft glow of the new moon. Oh, no, 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 not that. Holiday, my boy, why did you ever decide to write fiction for a living? You know, you could have gone into something interesting, like being a truck driver. With the open road in front of you and a motorcycle cop in back. Hey, Susie, where have you been? Don't you remember, Mr. Holliday? I went down to Star Times' office. Oh. Oh, so you did. Tell me, what's new in Box 13? Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, what now, Mr. Holliday? What's new in Box 13? Yesterday, a man wanted to sell me a horse for $1,000 and a ranch to go around the horse for 25 times that much. The day before, my ad for adventure brought me a reply from a golf professional who simply wanted to drive golf balls off the tip of my nose. Mr. Holliday. Uh, oh, was that Susie? I said that when a nice young man like you runs an ad, he should get a whole box full of answers. Oh, well, thank you, Susie. He should get bushel baskets full. Well, thanks again. The, the place should be loaded with letters. All right, all right. Now, what did I get? One postcard. And from a kid at that. A kid? You mean a child? Sure, uh-huh. Here, let me see it. A postcard from a youngster. It's probably a gag. Some small girl selling ten cent packages of flower seeds for 50 cents. Sell 5,000 packages and she gets absolutely free a St. Bernard dog. (laughs) Well, let's see what really is on this postcard. Hmm. I wrote to you, care of box 13, because I thought you wanted it that way. I got to see you right away on a very important matter. I am still doing business at the old stand. Signed, Johnny Moran. Johnny Moran? Why, he's a little boy who sells newspapers on the corner. Hey, Susie, get Johnny Moran up here right away. Oh, I can't do that, Mr. Holliday. Why can't you do it? Because he's here already. Oh, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Johnny, how are you, my boy? Why didn't you just come up and see me instead of writing a postcard first? Well, I like to do things sort of business-like. Besides, it was fun to answer an ad for Adventure Wanted. Would you really do anything, Mr. Holliday? Sit down, Johnny. Tell me what your trouble is. Well, uh, I kind of wanted to see you alone. Sort of private-like. Oh, that uh, man-to-man stuff, huh? Yeah, that's it. Well, where would you like to talk? Well, I thought maybe you'd come down to the corner with me. I'll, I'll buy you a drink. A drink? You interest me strangely, Johnny. Come on, let's go. Okay. Oh, Susie, you'll excuse us, won't you? Well, I don't know. You better be careful, Mr. Holliday. Careful? I don't want Johnny teaching you bad habits. Johnny Moran is a very nice boy. Can't be more than 12, but he certainly seems to know his way around. Yes, Holiday, if you were ordering a small boy, this is just the model you would choose. But this drinking business... I'm worried about you, Mr. Holiday. You sure that lemon coke is enough? Lemon cokes are always enough for me, Johnny. Especially when I spike them with an ice cube. Say, how's your banana split? Well, this one's got a little too much chocolate. I like the last one better. Better finish it, my boy. You want to talk business, remember? Oh, yeah. Well, I thought you might have read about it in the newspapers. Of course, you could have missed it. It was way back on page five. What was on page five? Well, here. I got a clip in the story. Read it. Police.
Police announced they had recovered a portion of the jewelry stolen in last Tuesday's raid on Maury Jewelry Company. Held under suspicion of grand theft is John Moran. John Moran. Johnny, that's your father. Yes, and he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. I know he didn't. Just a second. A part of the loot was found in Moran's apartment. I don't care what they put in the newspapers, Mr. Holliday. He didn't do it. That's why I came to see you. Uh, what about your mother, Johnny? Oh, she died when I was a baby. Pop and I lived together. But he didn't do it, Mr. Holliday. Only they won't believe me. Oh, you've been down to the police? Sure, I went there right away. I even offered them my 18 bucks for bail. And you know what? What? The old DA just patted me on the head and told me to go home. Mm. I bet you could go down and talk to that district attorney and make him let my father out. You can do anything. Well, not quite anything, Johnny. Yeah, but this would be easy for a guy like you. Besides, you're not afraid of anything. Not even a policeman. Well, that's very flattering, Johnny, but I don't know what I can do. Oh, you'll think of something, Mr. Holliday. You're a writer. You're smart. Oh, but listen, my boy, I... I bet you get my father out of jail in time for dinner. Okay, Holliday. The boy says you can get his father out of jail in time for dinner. But what day? The story in the paper makes it look like they caught John Moran cold. You don't find stolen jewelry in a man's apartment if he didn't do the stealing. But there's a small boy waiting. Waiting with all the faith in the world. So, Holiday, do something. The district attorney will see you now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, thanks. Holiday, haven't seen you for a long time. Yeah, I know. I've been pretty busy. Huh, busy, huh? Well, then what brings a promising young author down to City Hall? Because he's a promising young author who made a promise. And I hope he didn't make a mistake. Hey, what in the world are you talking about? About a man named John Moran. You've got him locked up in your nice new jail. Yes. And from what we've got on him, he's going to stay there for a while. His son thinks Moran is innocent, Clark. Yeah. Yeah, I feel sorry for that boy. He came down and talked to me, but... What could I do for him? You've got the goods on Moran, then? Absolutely. The police found some of the stolen stuff in his apartment. Well, what's Moran's story? A woman who works in the same building with Moran asked him to stop in at the jewelry store and pick up her watch. While he was there, the stick-up artist walked in and held up the place. And that makes Moran guilty? Don't be in a hurry. The stick-up artist used him as a shield when he beat it. Moran claims the man forced him to drive the getaway car out into the country. Well, that still doesn't make him guilty. I think you've got the wrong person. This is where Moran's story went wrong. He walked into police headquarters and told it, but it sounded too good to be true. They detained him while a detective went over and searched his apartment. Oh? The detective found part of the loot. Moran couldn't explain where it came from. Well, to our office, it looks like he pulled a clever gag. We think he's in with the holdup men. What about the woman, the one who sent Moran after the watch? Grace Willard? We don't have a thing on her. She's in the clear. I see. So, Holiday, you better forget about playing Don Quixote. Day of fighting windmills is over. Go home. Forget about Johnny Moran. Sure, Holiday, just forget all about John Moran. Write for the story and take it out of the typewriter. But how are you going to write the dialogue for a man who has to tell a small boy that his father hasn't got a chance? And describe the look in that boy's eyes. I don't care what that old district attorney said. My father isn't a crook. And your father should have been able to explain the stolen jewelry they found at your place. I'll bet he could, too. They just wouldn't listen to him. Oh, now, Johnny, if your father's innocent, they'll let him go. So you won't help me either. But I'm trying, my boy. What else can I do? Oh, nothing, I guess. See you later, Mr. Holiday. Oh, Johnny, listen to me. I'm kind of busy right now. I gotta earn a lot of dough, I guess. Johnny. Because lawyers come pretty expensive, I heard. Oh, look, kid. You better go home, Mr. Holiday. I should have handled it personally in the first place. <laughs> boys have that knack, don't they? They can just vanish into thin air when they want to. You're quite a character, Holiday. Go home and write this on your typewriter. Write about the small boy who wanted you to get his father out of jail. And you didn't quite make the grade. 
Hello? Mr. Holiday, this is Johnny. I'm up at the place where we live. Yeah, Johnny? There's something funny going on. What are you talking about? I'm afraid to go into our place. There's a man in there. Do you know him? Uh Uh-uh. He's going through the place, though. And he's looking for something. Johnny, listen. Run outside, find a policeman. I'll be right over. I gotta get out of here. Johnny, do what I said. just walked out the door. He saw me. Get over to Moran's place fast, Holiday. You've got no time for fooling. He's not outside. Maybe he's upstairs. Oh, Johnny. Johnny! Where could that boy have gone to? Grace Fullard. The woman who sent Moran up to the watch. If she knows Moran, she knows his boy. Yes? Oh, Miss Willard? Yes. Well, I'm Dan Holliday. Would you know where little Johnny Moran is? Come in. Now, what's this about Johnny? Well, he phoned me a few minutes ago from his place. There was a man going through it. He saw Johnny making the call. Johnny's disappeared? Yes. You phoned the police? Do you think he's been hurt? Well, the police knew nothing about it. I don't know what happened to the boy. That's why I came over here. I figured that if you knew his father, you knew Johnny, you know. Poor Mr. Moran. I feel so badly about him. You know, if I hadn't asked him to get my watch, this never would have happened. But that doesn't make it your fault, Miss Phillips. Oh, I feel terrible about it, just the same. And now, Johnny disappearing. He hasn't been here at all? No. Let me think of it. Oh, um, by the way, I was just having some coffee. Would you care to join me? Grace Willard is a very nice person. Really worried about the boy. Perhaps you'll come back with an idea. Here's your coffee, Mr. Holliday. Now we'll talk. Well, thanks. Uh, did Johnny recognize the man? No, he didn't have time to say. Well, perhaps he found a policeman on the street. He might have gone back to the house. Well, maybe I ought to call back. Johnny's a cute little fellow. Johnny has a father who's in jail. Johnny's quite concerned about his father and would like to set him free. Grace Willard is stalling Holiday, waiting for something. I don't know if Johnny will get his wish or not. You see, his father looks very guilty to the police. Holiday, you idiot. That coffee was doped. The oldest gag in the world and you swallowed it. You look sleepy, Mr. Holiday. Are you feeling all right? She looks like a reflection in one of those amusement park mirrors. She's she's long and skinny. No, no, she's short, short and fat. Holiday, Holiday, get up on your feet. How do you feel, Mr. Holiday? Are you all right, Anson? Get on your feet, I said. Walk, Holiday, walk. Walk this thing off before it's too late. You look very tired, Mr. Holiday. Let me get you a pillow. Come on. Come on, Holiday. One big How do you effort. feel, Mr. Holiday? I I I can't can't make it. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh, take it easy, Holliday. Take it easy. Turn slowly now. Maybe your head still is connected to the top of your neck. That's better. Better. Hmm. What am I saying? Where am I? An alley. Oh, fine. Dan Holliday, author found lying in an alley. Between yesterday's newspapers and tomorrow's trash. What you need right this minute is a quick change, a fast bath, and a little chat with that district attorney. 
We've got a man going up to the Willard woman's place right this minute, Holiday. Thanks, Clark. This ties her up with the Moran case. Sure, or else why would she give me knockout drops and have me dumped in an alley? I'll bet anything she's disappeared. But why just knock you out? Why not dispose of you permanently? I don't know, unless she was trying to kill time. Enough time to get something done. Well, you can't do anything now. If she's disappeared, she won't stay lost for long. My men will bring her in. Uh, don't let her give him any coffee. She'll be out again. Uh, pardon me. District Attorney's Office, Clark speaking. Yes? Where? When? How is he? Thanks. I'll see you later, Clark. I want to go over and see Johnny Moran. I don't think you'll find him at home, Holiday. Why not? That was a hospital who just called. Johnny Moran was brought in a while ago, the victim of a hit-and-run driver. And on top of that phone call about Johnny Moran is another one. Grace Willard checked out of the Wharton Hotel an hour ago. So, Mr. Holiday, they got you out of the way long enough to get to little Johnny. A small boy in a hospital. Me with an aching head and an aching feeling that something is very, very wrong. I think this is it, room 809. Johnny? Oh, Mr. Holiday. How do you feel, kid? Kind of banged up. Yeah, I know. The nurse said you weren't to do too much talking. So, just let me ask a couple of questions. It wasn't an accident, Mr. Holiday. He did it on purpose. You sure about that, Johnny? Yeah. I was walking down a side street. He had to swing way over to the wrong side to hit me. Johnny, did he look like the same man who was in your place? I didn't get a good look at him. He was bent down way behind the wheel. Well, could you give me just a hint? Was he tall, short, thin, fat? All I know is... Yes? Johnny. Johnny. Johnny passed out and won't be permitted to talk for a while. Well, that puts it up to you, Holiday. Come on, you're an author. You write hundreds of situations like this one. Think. The boarding house where Johnny lives. Maybe the landlady saw the man. I certainly hope so. Johnny Moran? Yes, I saw him come home, but it was quite some time ago. Oh, did you see him leave? Yes, he went upstairs. I heard him on the telephone, and then he came running down. Who was the man chasing him? Chasing him? There was no one chasing him. Are you sure of that? Well, of course I've been here all the time. Oh, poor little fella. Don't know what's going to happen to him, what with his father and all. This doesn't make sense. I beg your pardon? Oh, Nothing. You see, Johnny called me, told me there was a strange man in his place. The man saw him, hung up the phone and disappeared. But I saw no man. Are you sure? <laughs> Only Joe Coakley, but he's one of my rumors. That is, he was. Was? When did he move? Oh, today, just after Johnny left. Was he upstairs while Johnny was there? Why, oh, yes. Yes, he was. Uh... Was he a friend of John Moran's? Oh, no, no. He never spoke to anyone. Stayed in his room all day and went out at night. Oh, one of those night flyers, huh? Uh, could I see the room he occupied? This is Coakley's room. But it's empty. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're on the wrong track. Track? Or are you? from a dance hall ticket. I'd better talk to Johnny about this. Johnny, the man who came out of your room, was he about my height? Did he have grayish hair? Did he wear a brown suit? Yeah. Yeah, that's the man, Mr. Holiday. How come you never saw him before? He lived right across the hall from you. That guy? He only went out at night after I was in bed. Oh? Uh -huh. I'll see you later, Johnny. Hey, where are you going? Tonight, I'm going dancing. This is a very nice place, Holiday. 
Admission 60 cents, which includes an evening of dancing. And from the looks of the customers, they're trying to get their money's worth. You like to dance, fella? Uh, who, me? You ain't no twins, are you? Well, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'm a very bad dancer. Oh, you let me be the judge of that. Come on, kid. You look good to me. Oh, wait a second. Say, isn't that Joe Coakley over there? Oh, you know Joe? Yeah, and uh, and the girl with him. That's his girlfriend, Grace Willard. Oh, thanks. I'll see you later. Hey, where are you going? This is it, Holiday. Only what are you going to do? They're leaving, and if you stop to make a phone call, you'll lose them. And I wouldn't like to lose that man. He's the one who hits small boys with big automobiles. They're going into that apartment house. This begins to look like the final chapter. Now to make a fast telephone call to an old friend, then better to get to the payoff. Mm, this is a very nice door. You can hear quite distinctly through it. Well, Holiday, here's where you cease to be a wallflower and become the life of the party. Go! No. Holiday! Put up your hands, fella. Sure. Sure. Close that door, Grace. Well, here we are. Aren't we? Can you reply, Mr. Joe? What are we going to do? You finish packing that junk, we'll figure out something. We can't let him stay alive. Finish the packing, I said. Too bad I didn't use poison in that coffee I gave him. Quiet. I uh, noticed you were packing. Going away someplace? What do you think? And get away from that bag, Holiday. Oh, that's the stuff that was stolen from the store, huh? None of your business. Oh, uh, going away together? You and Miss Willard? Maybe. Mm-hmm. You pull that, go down and pick up my watch routine in a lot of cities, huh, Joe? Make him be quiet, Joe. Hey, uh, Joe, who was the girl who worked with you before you met Grace? You know, the one who lived in Cleveland, or was it Chicago? I always forget. Come on, Joe, what happened Shut to up, her? you. What happened to her, Joe? Or the girl before? How do you know there was another girl, Holiday? Well, Miss Willard, you don't think you're the only one, do you? You're crazy. Yeah? Ask him where he was last night. Don't pay any attention to him, Grace. He wasn't with you. Know where he was? How do you know he wasn't with me? The stub of a dance hall ticket I found in the other room. It calls for only one admission. You shut up, I said. Just a minute, Joe. Were you down there last night? Were you dancing with that blonde again? Suppose I was. So what? You've got a lot of nerve. You have me set up this whole deal. Have me find John Moran to play sucker for us. Have me frame the business of picking up my watch. I time it out perfect for you. What do you do? You go dancing with a blonde. Grace, be quiet. This fellow's up to something. Me? Now, what would I be up to? What about that other girl he talked about? What happened to her, Joe? Why don't you tell her, Joe? Cut it out, will you? Did she plant stolen jewelry in a sucker's room like I did to Moran? Grace, listen. Yeah. I'm listening. Go on, explain. Hey, Holiday, where are you going? Just opening the door. You see, I'd like the district attorney to hear the rest of your explanation, too. chapter to a story I was afraid might have an unhappy end. But Johnny Moran's father is free, the district attorney has Grace Willard, Joe Coakley and the stolen jewelry, and Johnny? Hmm. Johnny is out of the hospital. Mr. Holliday. Uh, uh, what did you say, Johnny? I said you might have been killed going up to the apartment like that. No, I was safe for the DA just outside the door. Gosh, and you figured it all out by yourself. No, you helped too when you telephoned me. And I hate to mention this, kid, but uh, did you bring the $18 with you? Sure I did. I pay off, you know. Here. Oh, uh, thanks, kid. I, I was just a little worried. I was going to pay before Mr. Holiday, but I didn't think he needed money that bad. I uh, needed it to put with this check. Uh, here. There was a $500 reward for recovering the jewelry, and it's going to a bank account for you. $500? Gee... Gosh, I guess I'm rich. 
Johnny, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you out and buy you a drink. How about an idiot's delight? Uh, a what? Idiot's delight. It's got a pint of ice cream, three bananas, some oranges, and seven flavors. Well, Johnny, I... I don't know, I... M- Mr. Holliday, I just heard that Johnny got out of the house. Ho- oh, there you are, Johnny. How do you feel? I feel swell, Susan. I just invited Mr. Holliday out to have a drink. Well, he can't go out, Johnny. He's got some very important work to do. Well, gee whiz. Thanks a lot, Susan. Thanks? What are you thanking me for? You don't know it, but you've just saved me from a horrible fate. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hediger. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. The body lay like a squashed melon at the foot of the cliff, period. Uh, period is right. Well, what happens now, Holiday? The inspector wonders how... The inspector wonders. Oh, no, it's Holiday who wonders. I wonder how. I wonder why. I wonder what. I wonder where you've been, Susie. But, Mr. Holiday, I've only been gone ten minutes. Went down to Star Times after the mail. Oh, oh, so you did. What's new in Box 13? Box 13. Starring Ellen Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, Box 13. Starring Ellen Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, this is quite a letter. Your ad, Adventure Wanted, will go any place, do anything... Reads like a challenge. If it is, I dare you to go to Bay City Pier tonight and do what you will be told when you board the Ruthie J. The Ruthie J. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's the matter, Susie? You wouldn't go on a boat, would you? Oh, why not? As a kid, I was a sea scout. Haven't been on a boat since, and I love them. But, Mr. Holliday, what if when you got on that boat, you were shanghoed? Susie, the word is... Shanghai. Oh, Shanghai, Shanghai. What's the diff? Suppose some smuggler hits you over the head with a, a sloop or something and, and... A sloop? Oh, Susie. Yes, a sloop. And, and then they sail off and dump you on the beach at Timbuktu. They couldn't sail off and dump me on the beach at Timbuktu. Why not? Timbuktu happens to be in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Oh. Yes, oh. And please tie an anchor to that imagination of yours. Okay, Mr. Holliday. But if you wind up on the other side of the world, please don't write me a letter about your voyage. No? No. Just reading about the ocean makes me seasick. Well, Holiday, this is it. Take in a lung full of that fresh ocean breeze. Mmm. Smell that fresh salt air. And fish. Mmm. Not so fresh. Well, the letter said I was to board the Ruthie J. I wonder where she'll be. I wonder what she'll be. A schooner, trim and neat, 42-footer, 12-foot beam. Uh Uh-oh, there's your dreamboat. And brother, what a scow. Neat. 
Mm. Like a tub of dirty clothes in a mud puddle. Ahoy! Ahoy, mate! Hey, you over there. You calling me, Mac? Yeah. What's with this, uh, ahoy mate stuff? You're a seafaring man, aren't you? <laughs> don't let these tight pants fool you. And just because I'm standing on this sea jitney, don't make me no sailor boy. Oh, my mistake. Where's the skipper? The skipper? Hey, look, Mac, I told you I ain't no sailor. With me, you gotta talk English. Right, Gunzel. Dip that heater back under your wing and take me to the boss of this fish factory now. Ah, that's better. Now you're talking my language. Can I help you across the rail? Oh, thanks. Say, uh, is your name, uh, Holiday? Yeah, yeah. Dan Holiday? Now, how'd you guess? Pleased to meet you. <coughs> Sweet dreams, Holiday. I hope you enjoy the boat ride. <laughs> Holiday. Oh, Holiday, you've been sleeping long enough. Better wake up and see what's making your bed roll around like this. Oh, my aching head. Hey, what is this? Don't look now, Holiday, but Susie was right. You've been shanghoed. You're out at sea. Well, and a pretty girl aboard. Hello, Mr. Holliday. I see you're up and around. Yeah, I'm up and my head's going around. <laughs> Bit of a blow, eh, Mr. Holliday? Uh, you mean the one on my skull or the one outside? Oh, I'm sorry about that sapping you took. Sometimes Manny leans a little heavy with that blackjack of his. Hmm. If he'd have leaned any heavier, he'd have driven me right through the deck. Uh, was it you who answered my ad for adventure? Does that surprise you? I uh, wouldn't have associated such a violent reception with a lady. You've embarked upon a real adventure. Uh, well, suppose I decide to sit this one out. You could go ashore. Mm -hmm. Now, which direction is ashore? Immediately astern. Oh, thanks. About 15 miles. Oh, well, in that case, I think I'll stay. Good. I didn't want you to decline my invitation. Uh, which explains Manny and his blackjack as a reception committee. Oh, well, since you're in back of this, uh, just who are you? My name is Marie Gordon. I felt you might be in need of a vacation, Mr. Holiday. Oh, sort of a holiday for holiday. Is that it? Exactly. Well, great. Now, just where do we go on this uh, vacation? You go fishing with the captain. Oh, I go fishing with the captain. What about you, Miss Gordon? I remain locked in my cabin. I have things to think about. What about... Manny and his convincer. He didn't sail. Other business kept him ashore. Mm. The uh, plot thickens. I fish with the captain while you stay locked in your cabin and Manny with his blackjack prowls ashore. Correct. And uh, speaking of plots, Mr. Holliday, I've always admired those in your books. Uh, perhaps you could confirm something for me. Mm, I could try. Establish the case of someone having something not his own... Wishing to keep it from another person who desires it as well. Where would you put it? Well, in the place you'd least expect to find it, of course. Of course, Mr. Holliday. Good night. Uh, good night, Miss Gordon. Remember, the fish bite early. I know, especially the suckers. There's a strong odor aboard this ship, and it isn't just fish. Well, there's nothing you can do tonight, Holiday, so you might as well get some sleep. Oh, a sailor's life is the very best life, so it's a sailor's life for me. A sailor's oh, morning. life for... You're the captain? Yep. Morning, sir. Come through last night's squall okay? Uh, yeah, except for this bump on my noggin. Roll to get his tension, eh? Twelve bit rough. Rough is right. Oh, um, uh, I understand you and I are... And do some fishing. Aye, sir. These grounds is good for swordfish. Might even catch us a marlin. Uh, just where are we, Captain? Them islands way off there is the Catalinas. And the albacore here, too. Doesn't Miss Gordon like to fish? No, no, sir. This is the first time she's hired me in the Ruthie J. Then this isn't Miss Gordon's boat. Nope. She's mine. 
We're just chartered for this trip. How long are we provisioned for? For five days. Could put in at Avalon if you want to stay out longer. I didn't want to stay out this long. Not ready to go ashore so soon, are you, Mr. Holliday? A few days fishing is just what you need. What I need is to have my head examined. That bump still bothering you? No, but what might be happening back in town? Relax, Mr. Holliday. Everything will be taken care of. Yeah, yeah. But I'm wondering how and what and why. Why is right. Just why would a girl like Marie Gordon maroon you on a fishing boat? What's the gag? And how's it going to be pulled and on whom? Holiday is an author. You're not even a good fisherman. You're quite a fisherman, Mr. Holiday. Why, in just four days, you handle that heavy gear like a real deep sea man. Thanks. But don't you think we've got enough fish? You've got another. There goes your line off the outrigging. It's a big one. Let him run, sir. Now, hit him hard. Good. You've got him, sir. Don't look now, but but I think he's got me. He's a mullin, I think. Let him play. Let him go play with someone else. I'm tired. Well, that's, that's too bad, Mr. Holiday. It's such a drag too soon. That's why he broke the gear. I wanted to break the gear. I'm sick of fishing. Captain, I want to be put ashore now. Sorry, sir. Miss Gordon will have to give me new orders. Now, look, Captain, I'm going ashore. I'm going to be there before tonight. But, but Mr. Holliday... Captain, I... you heard the gentleman. He's going ashore. Aye, man. Do we run for the mainland or the islands? Neither. We stay here. But you said Mr. Holliday was to go ashore. That's correct. Lower the dinghy, Captain. The dinghy? And hand Mr. Holliday the oars. The oars? Ma'am, we're more than ten miles off Catalina. If Mr. Holliday wishes to be ashore before tonight, he'd better start rowing now. Oh, you beautiful Box 13. If it hadn't have been for you, I wouldn't be out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a rowboat. <sighs> better rest on your oars a minute, Holliday. Because the wind is coming up, the bump on your head is swelling, the ache in your back is growing, and the blisters on your hands are spreading. When Susie mentioned the beach at Timbuktu, she knew what she was talking about. There's no ocean there. Hey, uh, Spaulding. You're looking for me? Oh. Oh, there you are, Manny. Yes, yes, I've been looking for you. Now, what does the great Edward B. Spaulding want with me? Quiet. Quiet, will you? You should know better than to mention me by name. Get in that boat. Ah. <laughs> None of your penthouse-type clientele would be in a joint like this. Have a seat, Spaulding. I tell you, that doesn't matter. I, I just shouldn't be seen even talking. In that case, hit the road. I got to keep my rep, too. Meaning what? I'm a nice, honest hood. And even though you act and look like the owner of Tiffany's, to me, you're just a fence. Where's your boss? Marie. She's out fishing. Fishing? She couldn't be. Look, pretty boy. If her and this holiday want to go on a fishing trip, it's their business, see? It's my business to get what I've paid for. The last shipment's overdue. Now, where is it? <laughs> you're sound a kind of tough for you. With the amount of money this deal involves, I can get tougher. Well, I don't know from nothing. You gotta talk to her. If Marie's trying to pull something... Hey, wait a minute. You mentioned a holiday. That wouldn't be Dan Holiday. Did I say, uh, holiday? Thought I said, uh, Hallahan. <laughs> or was it Halloween? All right, Manny, be a comedian. But tell your boss if she doesn't produce that merchandise by tomorrow, there'll be trouble. Ha, ha. <laughs> if I told her, she might die of fright. If she doesn't come through, somebody is going to die. And it won't be from fright. Well, Holiday, you finally made it. You were towed into Catalina, hocked your watch for a ticket, and flew right back to town. If this is adventure, you'd better stick with the more dangerous sports like croquet or something. <laughs> Susie. Oh, I forgot about Susie. She'll wonder what's happened. I'm four days late for lunch. 
She's not here. I guess she got hungry. She's not here, Holiday, but I am. Yeah, who are you? Get in that office. All right. All right. All right, now what's this all about? I want to know where you've been for four days. I, uh... I don't think I've had the pleasure. It may not prove to be a pleasure. What I suspect is true. Now, where's Marie Gordon? Marie Gordon? From your expression of surprise, I gather you know what I'm talking about. Did you catch any fish, or was it larger game you were after? Not knowing who you are, I'm at a disadvantage. Disadvantage is even greater now. Now, do you talk, or do I shoot? Oh, do I have a choice? No. In that case, I'll talk. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Holiday, you can run into more trouble than a kid playing football with a beehive. You know, I don't think this guy's in the mood to believe you just got popped on the bean and taken for a boat ride. He thinks you're in on the deal. Yeah, but what's the deal? Come on, Holiday, talk. Oh, I'd love to, but what do we talk about? About five minutes. And if by then you haven't told me where you and Marie have been instead of fishing, I'm going to pull this trigger. Now, believe me. I caught five tuna, ten albacore, four swordfish, and a pair of blistered hands. And that's no fish story. Hey, where are you going? Over here to turn up your radio. You see, I'm very considerate of others. This is a very big gun. Makes a very big noise. I don't want to disturb the neighbors when it goes off. Okay, mister, whatever your name is. I'm going to tell you exactly what happened. And if you don't believe me, you can start shooting. You sound very brave, Holiday. And I act very dumb. Now, I know it was stupid of me to accept a blind invitation to visit a boat named the Ruti J. Because when I got there, a tough character in tight pants used my head for a dinner gong. Somebody slugged you? Yeah. And I've got the bump to prove it. This character's name wouldn't begin with the letter M... As far as I'm concerned, it ended with A-N-N-Y. So it was Manny. Well, go on. Well, while I was unconscious, I was tucked Betty by in the cabin of the boat. But when I woke up, I was gazing into the lovely blue eyes of one Miss Marie Gordon, a woman I have never seen before in my life. Then I suppose you and this total stranger went fishing for four days. Now you took the words right out of my mouth. Well, find some more. And tell me you didn't ask any questions. That you were just brought back home with salt spray in your hair, a beautiful tan, and nothing else. I asked plenty of questions. To which I got plenty of no answers. And for your information, I wasn't brought back home. Oh? You, uh, swam? No, I rode. Ten miles all the way to Catalina. There I caught a plane, took a cab from the airport, and found you here waiting for me. That, brother, is my story. You, uh... You turn off the radio. What's the trouble? No gunplay? No gunplay. Mm-hmm. Great, but why the change of heart? Holiday, I understand you're quite an author. But even you couldn't make up a story like that one. So, Holiday got rid of the mysterious man with a gun. Hey, but what about Susie? She's not here, she's not at home. The start times. They'll know what happened to her. Well, if it isn't Dan Holiday, have a nice vacation. Oh, uh, wonderful, Jonesy. Hey, have you seen Susie? Not since the other morning. She came in with a wire telling her to take a few days' vacation. Hey, who told her to take a vacation? Well, you did, of course. Don't you remember? Jonesy, sometimes my left hand just doesn't know what my right hand is writing. Where'd she go? She didn't say. She came in with a man wearing tight pants. She looked for the mail. There wasn't any, and they went away. Man with the tight pants. Manny, I'll see you later. Uh, now, wait. All this mail came while you've been gone. And a box, too. 
Here. A box. Hmm, what could this be? Maybe candy. Oh, nobody loves me that much. Wait. What? You hear something tick in that box right now? T- tick? You think it's... I think you better get that thing out of here. Oh, but Jones, yeah. Take it to police headquarters. Get it out of the building fast. It might blow up any minute. You've ridden in many a taxi cab holiday, but this is the first one you've taken with a maniac in the driver's seat and a bomb in the back. Inspector Blake. That's my man. You say this thing kicked? Yeah, it sounds like a clock in there. Oh, come on, hurry. Where are we going? We've got a bomb shelter down in the basement. Oh, that's great, but why take the bomb with us? We're going to open that box. That's all I need. Been soaking for 30 minutes. We're safe now. Whew. Thanks, Inspector. Say, do you mind shoving my heart back into place for me? Now, there's nothing to worry about, my boy. We'll open up this beauty and see what we've got. Holy smoke. These are jewels, Holiday. Now, what made you think this was a time bomb? I have an aversion to anything that ticks. And I have an aversion, too. To people like you who come in here talking about time bombs when all they've heard are some loose jewels clicking together. Well, I'm sorry, Inspector. Well, uh, I think I'll beat it. Just let me wrap up those stones. Oh, no, you don't. No, you don't. Those jewels stay here until you can prove ownership. Now, where'd you get them? To whom do they belong? Give me about 30 minutes, Inspector, and I think I'll be able to answer you. So that's what it was, Holiday. A stunt to smuggle jewels. And a box 13, no less. That Marie Gordon, she's a clever, clever girl. No wonder the mysterious character of the office was waving that gun at me. Oh, think of what would have happened if I'd tried to lie to him. Come on, Holiday, you've got places to go and some people to meet. I was so worried about you rowing all that way, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that's okay, Captain. Hey, uh, what I came here for was to locate Miss uh, Gordon. You know where I can find her? She's a popular woman. Two other men come a-looking for her. Two men? Yep. One was a smooth-looking sort of fella... The other was a tough. With tight pants? That you mention it? Yes. He was here when we docked. Uh, what happened? Did you hear the conversation? Only that the tough one was to go right quick to a place called Rambler's Inn and wait. Uh, then the other man arrived? Yep. He seemed sore about something. They got in a car together and drove off. That's the last I see them. Captain, you're terrific. When my blistered hands heal up, you and I are going back after the mile and it got away. <laughs> All right, Matt. Where do you think you're going? Well, well, if it ain't Mr. Holiday again. Only this time, I don't think you were invited. Yeah, that's right. And this time, you're the one who's going Betty by. You... Pleasant dreams, Manny. Here. Just in case you get restless in your sleep, let me tie in bed with this failing wire. Didn't have time to ask you in which cabin there were, Manny. But those angry voices I hear down the line, I don't think they would be coming from honeymooners. Three for the last time, where are those jewels? Don't threaten me, Spaulding. Manny's right outside. One call from me and he'd be all over you like a rug. I gave you the money to pay off the smugglers. I want the jewels. At first, the boys didn't want to turn over the stuff. When they finally did, I thought they might try to get it back. So you went off on a fishing trip with a man named Holiday. Why? Certainly. And for a good reason. Holiday has the jewelry. What? How did he get into this? You know about his ad in the Star Times? What about it? Well, I thought we might have trouble with the boys. I had to think of a place to put it where they wouldn't expect to find it. So? I sent it to Box 13. <laughs> Where are you going? To pay another visit to Dan Holiday. Don't bother. I'm here. Holiday. Manny. Manny. I'm afraid Manny won't hear you. What? He's taking his nap. And you look sleepy too. Where? Say, Manny's blackjack works fine. Your friend's falling is sleeping like an infant. Now. Now. What? 
Now, what's this about my having that smuggled jewelry? You, uh, could share in it with me. Mm. You're very generous. I can afford to be. Duty-free and with Spaulding's wealthy clients. Oh. You decided to cut Spaulding in after all. Why should I? What do you mean? I'd rather cut you in, Mr. Holliday. No, thanks. I'm not interested. But that's foolish. Think of all that money. I am, but I'm also thinking of a great tag for the yarn I'm going to write. But what will that get you? Royalties, lady. Royalties. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Holiday, prepare yourself for an I told you so from Susie when she comes in. <laughs> Brother, wait till she finds out she was right about those smugglers and my being Shang Ho. Holiday. Uh, what is it, Inspector? Well, we've been after that smuggling gang for a long time. If that Gordon dame hadn't gotten so greedy and tried to chisel on Spaulding, we wouldn't have caught up with him so soon. And, of course, sir, uh, you helped a bit, too. Uh, coming from a police inspector, those are very kind words. Well, Susie, it's about time you showed up. Oh, hello, Mr. Holliday. My, what a beautiful tan. Catch any fish? All kinds. Tell me, Susie, where have you been? Out of town. The wire you sent me said to take a vacation for five or six days. Oh, the wire I sent, which I didn't send. Well, anyway, you didn't specify which, so, Mr. Holliday, I took six. I see. And Mr. Holliday... Yes, Susie? You know the nice man that I went down to Box 13 with? Yes. Well, I told him how I warned you about t- being taken by smugglers, and do you know what he said? No. What did he say? He said you were right about the smugglers. They wouldn't hit you on the head with a sloop. They'd use a blackjack. Oh, fine. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger with original story by Frank Hart Tausig. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. He looked deeply into... Her eyes, which reflected his mood like twin lakes of azure blue. Azure blue. Why does a woman always have to have azure eyes? Why couldn't they be fire engine red? As his muscular arms tightened around her fragile... Susie. Oh, Mr. Holliday, I'm not fragile, but I'm sure scared... Somebody's been following me. With those legs? Why not? I I was petrified, afraid to look back even. His footsteps kept going click, cluck, click, cluck. Real sinister-like. Oh, I bet that's him now. Mr. Click, cluck? Oh, Mr. Holliday, he followed me all the way from Box 13. And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, this is a brand new twist. Besides a message from Box 13, Susie has brought a mysterious caller. 
somebody who wants in, but definitely. Don't answer it, Mr. Holliday. Now, now, Susie. You didn't see this person, huh? No, I, I just felt him following me like a, uh, like a phantom, except his heels went click, cluck, click, cluck. Oh. That doesn't sound so dangerous. Let's take a chance. Come in. Oh. <laughs> Silly me. I ought to be ashamed for being such a fraidy cat. Look who it is. Well, Susie, who is it? I don't know. Who are you, mister? My name is George Flitt. I'm a, a detective. And you're Dan Holliday, the writer. It's, it's on the door. A detective, huh? <laughs> Why, well, isn't any bigger than me. But I have nerves of steel and the heart of a lion. Oh, oh, I see. And what brings you here, Mr. Flitt? Well, who? Uh, Nerves of steel. Heart of a lion. <laughs> that was no fair, girl. You took me by surprise. Susie. Now, Mr. Flitt. Why don't you open the envelope I put in box 13? Here it is, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Open it. I'm all goose lumps. Okay. Well, what do you know? Why, there's nothing written on the paper. Hmm. How about that, Flick? See how clever I am? I put that envelope in box 13 as bait. As bait? Yes, I knew it would lead me to the person who put the ad in the Star Times, Adventure Wanted. We'll go any place and do anything. Very clever, Mr. Flit. Oh, what made your footsteps go click, clock, click, clock? <laughs> oh, that. I lost the metal cleat off of one of my heels. Oh. Well, now that you've discovered me, Mr. Flit, what? Mr. Holliday, I'd say you're just the man for the job. Job? Something exciting, you hope, huh, Mr. Holliday? I'd handle it myself, only I'm so tiny. Besides, I've done mostly divorce work. <laughs> just the right height for keyholes. But uh, about the job? Well, I'm coming to that. Uh, Mr. Gilbert Bolton sent me $50 just to attend the party tonight. $50? I should have been a detective. Oh, you can be. I'll split with you if you'll go to the affair in my place as me. You got the money. What's the catch? Oh, there's really no catch. Uh, only thing Mr. Bolton said was there might be a little uh, bloodshed. Well, well, well. This holiday is the wackiest situation yet from good old Box 13. Yes, Holiday, you must be hard up for story ideas. Hard up for brains, too. Otherwise, why are you riding with George Flitt, detective, in his hot rod jalopy? Destination, bloodshed. And you've never met this Bolton who's having the party? No, but he phoned and explained that the party is going to be at his nephew's place, at Kenneth Bolton. Kenneth, huh? Uh, what about the bloodshed? Well, as I understand it, Kenneth's father, that is, uh, Gilbert Bolton's brother, committed suicide not so long ago. Oh. Uh -huh. Gilbert said the boy is suffering from neurasthenia, I, I think he said. Psychoneurotic, huh? Uh, yes. On account of the way his father died, uh, Gilbert's afraid the boy may take his own life tonight. Why tonight, especially? Well, it seems that Kenneth drinks a lot at these parties and gets depressed. And my job is... To see that he doesn't commit suicide tonight. I've looked forward to more pleasant evenings. I, I think that's the place up ahead with all the lights on. Yeah, that's the address you mentioned. Hmm, we must be about 15 miles from town. Uh, 14 and 7 tenths by my speedometer. Yeah? Well, Flit, I may as well take off. What are you going to do? Oh, I'll sit here in my car and listen to the radio, sort of keep my eye on things from the outside. Good idea. See you later, then. Here we go again, Holiday. Oops, the name's George Flip, detective. Remember? Beyond this door, who knows? But it's a beautiful house. A beautiful night. And a beautiful girl. Good evening. Oh, good evening. I'm looking for Mr. Gilbert Bolton. Won't you come in? And you are... Uh, George Flitt. You say you're George Flitt? 
That's right. I'm Rita Martin. How do you do? Now, let's go in and find Gilbert Belt and Mr. Fletch. Oh, Holiday, here's a jungle cat. A vampire right of Terry and the pirates. That jet black hair, those heavy lidded eyes. That glistening crimson mouth. And something else. Yes, heavy, clawing, sensuous. A perfume such as you've never known before. That's something to remember this Rita Martin by. Mm-hmm. Oh, there you are. Oh, Gilbert. Yes, Rita. Gilbert Bolden, this is George Flitt. George, how do you do, Mr. Flitt? Mr. Bolton? If you'll excuse me, gentlemen, I'll see you all a bit later. So, you're George Flitt, the detective. Yes, that's right. Your voice seemed, well, different over the phone. Well, you know, detectives, many disguises, many voices. <laughs> Got to keep them confused, you know. Somehow I pictured you differently. Oh? Well, no matter. You know why you're here. Yes, to keep my eye on your nephew, Kenneth Fulton. More than that, to keep him from chilling himself. The way this man looks at you, Holiday. So cool, so calculating. With piercing eyes that thud against the back of your skull. He could be one of two men. A man of distinction or a man of extinction. Okay, Mr. Bolton, I'll keep your nephew alive. That's your job. But what makes you think the boy wants to commit suicide? Well, since his father, my brother, took his life, Kenneth has been extremely upset. It's only natural, Mr. Bolton. I know, but I've heard Kenneth threaten suicide, and it's got me worried. Anyone else heard him? Yes, Miss Martin. Uh, anyone else? What do you mean, anyone else? I just wondered if anyone else had heard him make these threats. I really wouldn't know. It's enough that Rita and I know about it. How does Rita figure in this picture? Aren't you being a bit presumptuous, Mr. Flitt? A detective likes to know these things. Miss Martin is an old friend of the family. Oh, there's Kenneth now. I'll bring him over. Just as Gilbert Fulton passed me, there was something familiar about him. What was it? Who was it? Come on, think, Holiday. It may be an important clue. But here they come. The man of extinction and a typical boy from Princeton or Yale or Harvard. George Flitt, my nephew, Kenneth Bolton. Glad to meet you. How do you do? Enjoying yourself, Mr. Flitt? Very much. How about you? Oh, so-so. These parties get to be a bore, you know. Kenneth hasn't been quite himself since the tragedy. Must you always bring that up, Uncle? But you know you've been terribly upset, Kenneth. So I've been upset. Why talk about it? Oh, uh, Mr. Flett. Yes? Will you come with me for a moment? Oh, I sure. It's so close in here that I thought a breath of air. It suits me. In the garden. The garden it is. Hmm. Nice. A moon, too. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely night. Ah, the scent of those flowers. Exquisite, isn't it? Uh Uh-huh. But not to compare with your perfume. You noticed it? Yes, it was so unusual. It's called Whispering Gown. Whispering Gown? Mm, I like the name. Say. Yes? I know where they got that name. Oh? From Cerno de Bergerac. The passage where he describes Roxanne. Across my life, one whispering silken gown. That was lovely. You're quite literary, aren't you, Mr. Blake? Well, yes and no. Just what do you do? Gilbert Bolton didn't tell you. No. No, but let's sit on this bench and you tell me all about yourself. As you come close to her, you get another whiff of... And suddenly you've got it. That's what bothered you about Gilbert Bolton. Her perfume rubbed off on him. It is an old friend of the family. She's young and a close friend of Gilbert Bolton's. She's brought you out here for a reason. Well, aren't you going to sit down? Oh, I sure, but uh, just a minute. I want to borrow some cigarettes. I've got plenty of cigarettes. I'll be right back. Something about this whole setup is as phony as a china egg. And as the crooks in your story say, you better case the joint before you go inside. 
Yeah. There's the window. Just pull the bushes back. Let's take a gander. Well, everything looks on the up and up. Kenneth with a drink on the table beside him, and there's his uncle coming up. Hmm. He said another full drink right beside Kenneth. Hey, what else is he doing? You'd better get in there, Holiday, and fast. Mind if I, I join you, gentlemen? Well, not at all, not at all. You appeared quite uh, suddenly. Care for a drink, Mr. Plitt? Here, I haven't touched this one. No, no, let me fix Mr. Flitt a fresh drink. I think I'll just have one of these hors d'oeuvres. Here, watch it, my drink. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Flitt, you... you awkward idiot. Oh, excuse me. Yes, Uncle. Accidents will happen. I didn't really feel like another drink. It was your idea, remember? Well, Mr. Flitt, were you able to borrow some cigarettes? I was ambushed by hors d'oeuvres. Glad you're here, Rita. I have a proposal to make. Yes? What say we all run up to my penthouse for a while? Oh, sounds good. What do you say, Mr. Flynn? Fine. I think a change of scenery would be nice. Well, you'll enjoy the view overlooking Green Hill Park from the penthouse, Mr. Flynn. Oh, good. What's the address? Uh, I tell you what, Mr. Flitt. Rita, Kenneth, and myself will go ahead in my car. Then you can follow us in yours. Well, maybe I'd better go with Mr. Flitt. To keep him in company. No, I'd like you with me, Kenneth. There's something I uh, want to discuss with you. Important. Well, per- perhaps I should have the address in case I lose you. you that know, but... won't be necessary. Uh, just follow me. Of course, Holiday, you could be wrong, but it looks like Gilbert Bolton isn't too anxious to have you find his penthouse. Uh, but you're a suspicious lad, Holiday. You've created so many diabolical characters for so many fiendish plots. Maybe you, maybe you've become a little touched. Time's a wasting holiday. Get to a phone. Ah, there it is, end of the hallway. Now, if Mac's on duty in the morgue of the Star Times, we'll ask a few questions. Star Times reference room. Hello, Mac. This is Dan Holiday. Ah, oh, Danny, what can I do you for? Say, so you got anything on the Bolton suicide? Just filed those clips away yesterday. And even if this is a clips joint, I won't charge you a penny. <laughs> Clips joint. You get it, Dan? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 I get it. What about Bolton? Poison himself. Left all his dough to his son. Name of Kenneth. Anything else? Well, there was something about Bolton's brother, uh, Gilbert. He sort of taken over and helping the boy. It was pretty broke up. Hey, Dan. Hey, did you hang up? No, but someone did. Someone was listening on another extension. <laughs> Hey, this is the fastest hot rod I've ever driven. We're keeping right up with the Bolton. And he's doing 70. <laughs> Wait until you shift into high gear. Where are we going? To a pot house, I hope. Gilbert Bolton's. Hmm. Now, what happened at the party? Oh, Rita Martin tried to get me into the garden, and I got suspicious. Trying to keep you away from your job, wasn't she? Yeah, so I rushed back into the house, stopping to case the joint through a window. Case the joint? <laughs> a detective talk. Yeah, then I got into trouble with Bolton. Well, how? By knocking a drink from his nephew's hand. Huh? Uh, what did the uncle do? He got insulting. Then all of a sudden he suggested going to his penthouse. Watch it, watch it. He, he's slowing down. Yeah, I wonder what his idea is. Oh, he's just slowing down for that train. But he only slowed down for a second. Look at him go. I know what he's doing. He's trying to beat that train to the crossing. He's trying to lose us. Step on the gas. Step on the gas, Mr. Holiday. Okay. Holiday, are we going to make it? He made it, but I don't know about us. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. And now. Back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, 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 next time I 
want such a close shave, I'll see my barber. Yeah, me too. Gosh, Mr. Holliday, I thought I could handle this hot rod. But the way you whipped her off the road just short of those tracks, I... Not a scratch on her. Lucky us. Uh, that train must be a mile long. By the time it passes, Bolton can be in Alaska. What's the address of this penthouse? You're asking me. All I know is it overlooks Green Hill Park. Our next stop. Well, George, Green Hill Park. <laughs> I bet all these buildings have penthouses. We'll try them all until we hit the right one. I'll go around this side of the park. Okay, and I'll try the buildings around the other side. Bolton's got to be in one. Do you have a Mr. Bolton in your penthouse? No one here by that name. A Bolton in the penthouse? No, but uh, we have a Botsford in the basement. Why, yes, Mr. Gilbert Bolton came in a short time ago. Hello? No, with a lady and gentleman. Want to go up? Oh, please. Did Mr. Bolton say anything about expecting more guests? No, sir. Do me a favor. If a little fellow with a squeaky voice shows up asking for Bolton, tell him I'm here, will you? Dan Holliday. Yes, sir. Oh, here you are. Thank you, sir. Your floor, sir. Uh, that's the penthouse door over there. Right. I've got a sneaking hunch I won't be welcome. Flip, how did you get up here? You, uh, you didn't expect me? Yes, yes, of course, but uh, you've earned your money. You can, well, you can go home now. I'm sorry, Miss Maud, but Mr. Bolton hired me. It's up to him to fire me. But he's not here. He and Kenneth both went out. May I come in and wait? No. Goodbye. Now what? Now what does the intrepid hero of my stories do? Hmm. He looks for another door. Like that one. He tries it. It's open. It leads into a hallway. And there's yet another door. The service entrance to Bolton's penthouse. And ten to one, it's locked, bolted, and barred. Maybe even nailed shut. There's some gambler holiday. Offer ten to one and lose. The door's open. Well, here we go again. Quiet holiday. Ah, oh, there's a door leading to the terrace and voices. I'll get your ear up, Holiday. But don't let them see you. Don't you think it's a little chilly out here, Uncle? Let's go inside. Chilly, Kenneth? I'm really very comfortable. Here's the view I was telling you about, Kenneth. Better lean over the rail a bit to see around that turret. Oh, don't push against me, Uncle. That's a ten-story drop. Now, look over there, Kenneth. Uncle Gill! <laughs> Kenneth, let's get away from that rail! Oh, Flitch, you don't have to throw me back. Better than having your uncle throw you forward. What's the meaning of this outrage? How did you get in here anyway? I'm going to call the police. Fine, and save me the trouble. Look, Kenneth, I was hired to keep you from committing suicide. Suicide? Who, me? Yeah, but instead I'm keeping you from being murdered. Feel in your coat pocket. Ignore Look. him, Kenneth. He doesn't know what he's talking about. A bottle? It's marked poison. Yeah, I saw your uncle plant it in your pocket through the garden window. He wanted to make it look like you poisoned that drink I knocked from your hand. Stop right there, Holiday. This isn't a cap pistol. You too, Kenneth. Don't move. Well, you must be crazy, Uncle Gill. And you knew I was Dan Holliday all along, huh? Of course. I've seen your picture in the book review pages. And I caught you a telephone conversation at the Star Times. On the extension. You get around. I can't believe this. You, you, my uncle. What's the play now, Bolton? Well, first I walk over to Kenneth and knock him out with his gun. Nope. Don't move, Holiday. I've still got you covered. Oh? And now that you've knocked out your nephew, what's your next move? Mr. Holiday, before I heave him over the rail to make it look like suicide, I'm going to shoot you. Oh? Fine. Then I'll wipe my fingerprints off this gun, 
and press my nephew's hand around the butt. Hmm. His fingerprints on the gun will prove he shot me, huh? But what about a motive? Very simple. You tried to stop him from jumping off the terrace. And you're supposed to invent plots, Mr. Holliday. But they'll trace the gun to you, Bowen. Oh, no. It's Kenneth's gun. I took it from his room. And you wanted a detective on hand to throw off suspicion? Yes, Mr. Holliday. Who'd suspect Gilbert of murder when he'd hired a detective to protect Kenneth? But why? Why do you want to kill your nephew? Let's say I borrowed quite a large sum I can't make good. Oh. Embezzlement, huh? And you need Kenneth's inheritance to keep out of jail. When he lend you the money? Not the amount we need. We? Obviously. So, we're taking it all. Clever, eh, Holiday? You're killing me. You're so right. Get rid of whoever it is, Rita. If that isn't help, Holiday, forget about writing the great American novel. No room in a coffin for typing. I tell you, you really can't. I'm trying to finish. I know. 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 I now, Mr. Gilbert Bolton, you know how your nephew feels. Well, I know how it feels to be on the right end of this Smith & Wesson. You knocked him out. What are you going to do? Do? Well, since the party's getting dull, let's invite a few more boys. Say, from headquarters. This is Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Come in. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Hello, Susie. Ah, Mr. George Flitt, detective. How's the arm, Mr. Flitt? Oh, it's uh, healing up fine. One of the bullets just grazed me. You know, I bled quite a lot. Say, wasn't that awful, them trying to kill that boy? And he really wasn't psycho whatchamacallit at all. Uh, Bolton cooked that up to support the suicide story. Oh. What's going to happen to them, Mr. Holliday? Well, they've got Bolton for embezzlement and attempted murder. They're holding Rita as his accomplice. And she was such a beautiful girl and so sweet, too. Yes, George, you can say that again. How, how's the rod hot these days, Mr. Flett? Hot rod, Susie. Hot rod, rod hot, red hot. Oh, how is it anyway? Red hot. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, it's fine. And Mr. Holliday, hmm? even if I did run away from that gun, I really do have the heart of a lion. But of course, George. Only thing is, <laughs> it's a scaredy cat lion. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hediger. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager with an original story by Larry Kraft. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday.
Box 13. Box 13. Box 13. They stood in the warm rays of the autumn sun while the wind played in the girl's hair. Oh, no, not that. Susie. Hello, Mr. Holliday. Oh, no, not what? I'm referring to the story I'm writing. Better forget the story, Mr. Holliday. I've got mail for you. So? What's new in box 13? <laughs> Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Now for Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Uh, let's see. Where was I? Oh. But Betty forgot her dignity as she fell and bumped her head against the tree which stood nearby. Oh, brother. Mr. Holliday. Uh, what's that, Susie? I said that maybe the mail from Box 13 might give you an idea. Today there were two letters. Two? Yes, mm-hmm. One of them is a big, fat envelope. Now, who in the world would send me a big, fat envelope? The police department. It's a block of tickets for their annual ball. What's the other one? Mmm, this one smells all romantic-like. It has the odor of Christmas night. Or, uh, maybe it's Easter morn. Or maybe it's Tuesday afternoon. Here, let's have it. Hmm. If you will really do anything, what I have to ask is very, very little. Please meet me in North Park at 10 o'clock tonight. I'll be waiting at the bench near the entrance to the bridle path. Signed... Anonymous. It couldn't have been very romantic, Mr. Holliday. Oh, why not, Susie? I don't see stars in your eyes. Well, take another look, Susie. Tonight at 10 o'clock. An anonymous note. A rendezvous in the park at night. Well, I must admit it's better than the yarn I was writing. At least it's got a good start. The question is, what's the ending? Well, this is the park, and the clock says ten. There's the bench at the end of the bridle path. And that's all there is. Hey, wait a minute. Is that? No, it couldn't be. A little girl, sound asleep. Nobody else around. What's she doing out here alone this time of night? Little girl. Wake up, little girl. Wake up. Sandman came and I was supposed to stay awake. Now, what are you doing here? Waiting. Well, aren't you cold? No, I'm not cold. I have a nice new coat. See? <laughs> yes, it's very pretty. But for whom are you waiting? I'm waiting for the man. What man? He comes out of a box. It has a number. Oh, no. You don't mean box 13? Yes, that's it. How did you know? Because I'm the man. Oh, I'm so glad. You're nice. Oh, I like you a lot. Well, thanks. Who told you about the man from Box 13? One of my mothers. Mothers? You've got more than one? Of course, I got two. You're a very remarkable little girl. How do you happen to have two mothers? I don't know. Just happened, I guess. What's your name? Jamie. I mean, uh... What's your other name? I promised I wouldn't tell. Now, whom did you promise? My mother. Oh, your mother. Uh, the first one or the second one? The first one, naturally. Forgive me, I, I'm so stupid tonight. Where do you live, Janie? Oh, I had two homes. I couldn't find either one. Mm, that's great. Look, Janie, what are you going to do? I'm going with you because I like you and... I promised I would. Mm, so that's it. Oh, no, you're not. I'm going to take you to the police station. My mother said you wouldn't. Why wouldn't I? My mother said you were a nice man who was smarter than any policeman ever was. Janie, flattery will get you nowhere. What flattery? 
That's something you've probably already learned from your mother. Now, do you know where you live? Sure, I live in the house. And do you know where the house is? Well, first you have to walk down this block to Jack Black's drugstore. Well, come on. And then we get to the drugstore, we turn left and walk a block. Oh, that's where you live? No, no. That's the corner where Johnson's toy shop is. Now, Janie. And then we turn right and go two blocks. <sighs> that's home. That's where the ice cream fire is. Now, stop that, Janie, and tell me how to get to your home. Well, you walk half a block up that street. That's home. Oh, that's your home. No, that's David's home. Hmm. So you're not going to tell me where you live, is that it? I think maybe you'd better look at my book first. It's grim fairy tales. Only oh, they're not grim at all. They're nice. You want me to read to you? At 10 o'clock at night? You know, young lady, it's way past your bedtime. No. No, I want you to read the letter that's in my book. Mommy said to tell you about it. Letter? Well, let me see uh-huh. that. Well, how do you like this? Please take care of my little Janie for me. I shall communicate with you in a little while. Let no one, even the police, take her away. Believe me when I say you're doing nothing illegal. Just helping out. Her mother. Hmm. Here, Mike. I like your voice. What's your name? Dan. A sucker, if there ever was one. This is not good. A small girl left in your care with no more authority than a letter. Suppose the woman who wrote this letter isn't Janie's real mother. Hmm. Then, Holiday, you're in trouble. But suppose she is the real mother. Why should she leave her child with a perfect stranger? Why? Well, there's only one thing to do. Take her to your apartment. Come on, Janie girl. Let's go. Let's hope that the neighbors won't see you bringing home a little girl. Because that happens to be one item you don't win at a bingo game. Uh, put it down on the couch, Holiday. Hmm, that's it. Never knew a kid could have so much strength in her arms, did you? Uh, feels kind of good, too. Better get a blanket to put over. Better yet, stupid, put her in your bed. Well, Holiday, it looks like you're sleeping on the couch tonight. I wonder who she is and what this is all about. Hello? Dan Holliday? Yes? The man from Box 13? Yes? How's my little girl? Did you get home all right? How did you get my phone number? That's not important. How do you know who I am? Please, how is my little girl? She's asleep. Oh, thank heavens. I heard the bell ringing. Uh, she just woke up. Is she all right? She's fine, but... I'm on a fairy tale. Just a minute, honey. How long will it take you to get over here? Oh, I can't come over there now. I'm afraid to. Uh, lady, which mother are you? I don't understand you. She says she's got two. I'm her real mother. Well, then get over here and take her. I can't explain now, but please, Mr. Holliday, keep her just for a few days. A few days? And don't give her up to anyone, not even the police. Now, how do I know this is on the level? You don't. You just have to trust me. I promise you, you'll never regret it. I don't like any part of this, except Janie. He'll understand soon, Mr. Holliday. And remember, be very careful. Both Janie and you are in danger. You're all right, our Holliday. How do you like this plot? A mother gives a little girl to a strange man, warning him not to give the child up to anyone. Not even the police. And then she admits there's danger. <laughs> Janie. Oh, that's all right, baby. Are you hurt? I didn't mean to. I wanted my very tail book. No, don't cry, honey. That was a nasty old lamp anyway. All it did was throw off a lot of light. You're a nice man. Are you my daddy? No, Janie. My daddy went away when I was a baby. Why can't you be my daddy? Hmm. It's getting late, honey. Aren't you sleepy? Not anymore. Read me a fairy tale, Daddy. In the morning, Janie. Now, you'd better get to bed. Have you got a doll? 
No, I'm sorry. No doll. Teddy bear? No teddy bear. You might be awful lonesome. Maybe you've got something there, little lady. Daddy? Hmm? Tell me a fairy story. All right, honey. Let's see now. Once upon a time, there were three bears. The papa bear, the mama bear, and, and the... the ba- baby bear. I know that story. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's see. Once upon a time, there's a little girl named Red Riding Hood. And, and the... the wolf ate up her grandmother. I know that one, too. Uh, Janie, maybe you should tell me the stories. Oh, let's see. Once upon a time, there was a boy named Jack who planted a bean seed... And it grew up into a mighty tall vine, and, and he... he climbed into the sky and killed a bad giant. I know that one, too. Whew. Saved by the bell. Hello, Holiday. Oh, Lieutenant Kling. Holiday, you're in a jam. Lieutenant Kling of the police department doesn't drop in on people unless there's trouble. Watch your step, boy. Well, aren't you going to ask me in? Oh, uh, sure, sure. Come in, Lieutenant. Oh, that's better. Uh, anything wrong? Well, that's what I dropped in to find out. When you stay out of the department's hair for more than two weeks, I begin to worry. Hmm. Haven't been doing a thing, Lieutenant. Not a thing. Besides, I want to know if you got those tickets to the ball. Hello. Yeah. Well, what's this? A little girl. Oh, thanks, Holiday. Uh, what's your name, young lady? Vicky, uh, uh, Vicky Preston. Oh, no, it isn't. It isn't? Uh, holiday. Great little kid, her dandy sense of humor likes to pretend she's somebody uh, else. Uh, all children do. Who is he, Daddy? Daddy? Holiday, my boy. See what I mean? Who is he, Daddy? He's a cop, a policeman, honey, Lieutenant Kling. Oh, I like policemen. And I like little girls. Got two of them myself. The writing business slow these days, Holiday? How do you mean? I oh, thought you might be picking up a few bucks babysitting. Oh, oh yes, just helping out a friend. I could use you sometime. My wife and I like to get out every now and then. What's your price to sit with my kids? That depends. Uh, are your children anything like you? No, Holiday. Oh, I'm just asking, just asking. Glad to accommodate any time. Yep, see you around, Holiday. Yeah, I'll see you. Whew. Your hand is shaking. Never mind, Jane. It's time you went to sleep. There's something about a kid asleep. Maybe I'm glad this happened. Got to use more kids in my stories after this. You know, it wouldn't be a bad idea to have one around all the time. What am I saying? Now what? Lay off, you'll wake the kid. You Dan Holiday? Yeah, that's right. And I'd like to come inside and talk with you. If you don't mind, I'd rather talk out in the doorway. Very well, I'll, I'll be direct. You have a little girl here named Janie, about five years old? Why? My name is Sam Parker. That mean anything? No. I've got a letter here authorizing me to take the little girl away. You're her father? Read the letter, then hand over the child. No. Very well, I'll call the police. I wish you would. Got to use the phone down the hall. I'm sorry about this. But get inside then. Keep your hands over your head. Put down that gun. What do you think you're pulling? Uh, shut up and get inside. Oh, there she is. Put down that gun, I said. You come with me, Holiday. Just keep those hands high. And I said you're staying here. Move over to that wall. Stay away from her, I said. One more move and you think so. Harry! Harry, help! Hit him with the gun, Harry, now! I got him. <laughs> You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Nice going, Holliday. Very nice. You advertise in the newspaper for adventure and you get a little girl. Then you lose her to a man with a gun. You don't even know the mother's name or where she is. Now what? 
Holiday. I'm Wanda Parker, Janie's mother. Is she all right? You're the woman who called me on the phone? Yes. My baby, where is she? You're a fine one to be asking that after you leave her alone on the park bench. I was there hiding. I saw you take... Where is she? You shouldn't have let her go in the first place. Mr. Holiday, where is she? She's not here. Not here? What have you done with my daughter? You're her real mother? Of course I am. Where is she? What's happened? The man came in. And you let him take the child? I'm sorry. There was nothing I could do. He had a friend and a gun. They knocked me out. When I came to, Janie was gone. This, this man, did he have black hair and very thick eyebrows? Yes, he said his name was Parker. Oh, no. No, it couldn't be. Mr. Holliday, we've got to get her back right away. Before I do anything, you're going to tell me a few things. Then we'll decide. Who's that? I don't know. Right now, I wouldn't even care to guess. Is there a back door? Can I get out without being seen? Yeah, through the kitchen. There's a door leads out into the hall. What are you afraid of? Holiday, open the door. Do you know who that is? Yes, a police officer, Lieutenant Kling. You must have seen him. I'll call you later. All right, all right, I'm coming. What took you so long to open the door? Uh, can't a man get some sleep? Are your shoes on? My feet are cold. Get inside. All right, Miss Hatton. Are you sure this is the man, Lieutenant? Do you think he could have taken Janie away? I'm not sure of anything, but what you told me, he's just the type that could dream up a little nightmare like this. Lieutenant, mind telling me what this is all about? I'm Mrs. Hatton, and I'm Janie's mother. I want her right this minute. Janie's mother? You're Janie's mother? Lieutenant Kling, if this man has my little Janie, make him give her up right this minute. Come on, Holiday, where is she? Or who? You know what I want, that little girl you had here half an hour ago. Janie Parker. Me? I had a little girl? Up here? Holiday. Yes, Lieutenant? I came up here to see you. I was worried about you. I didn't know how right I was. And I appreciated your interest. Shut up. When I came up here, there was a little girl around. Now, where is she? Kling, you have my word. I, I don't know. Maybe you can remember down at headquarters. I can't remember something I didn't know in the first place. He doesn't look like the type who would have taken Janie. Oh, thank you. Now, Mrs. Hatton, if you'd tell me what this is all about, maybe I could help you. My little girl disappeared tonight. I was frantic. I called the police. I got the report right after I got here to see you, Holiday. From the description, I'd say you had Janie Parker right here. But you're not sure. Maybe you'd like to prove to me where you got the little girl I saw up here, eh? Come on, come on, tell me. Lieutenant, you'd never believe me. Then where is that little girl now? Can you tell me that? No, I can't. But suppose I produced the girl and you found out it wasn't the same one. Holiday, what are you driving at? I just want a chance to produce the girl. How about it, Kling? I think you're pulling another one of your fast shenanigans. I ought to lock you up. But I'm inclined to give you a chance. What kind of a chance? I'm giving you three hours to find that little girl. Three hours? Then I'll be back, Holiday. So don't try anything funny. Lieutenant, at the moment, I have practically no sense of humor left. At least you're not in jail, Holiday. The good lieutenant walked out with Mrs. Hatton. You're as free as a bird on the wing for three hours. If you were as smart as that bird, you'd wing out of town until this blows over. Mr. Holiday. You. They've gone. You've been listening? Yes, at the kitchen door. Now, look, if you're Janie's mother and Mrs. Hatton is Janie's mother... Mr. Holiday, there's no time to explain. Wait a minute. Then who is Sam Parker? He's not Sam Parker. He's... He's Sam Clark. Oh, I see. Because Janie has two mothers, Sam Parker turns out to be Sam Clark. What are you giving me? I can clear up the whole thing, but we've got to get Janie away from Sam Clark first. Otherwise, I may never see her again. How do you go about finding a man named Sam Clark in a city this size? He doesn't live here. But I heard he drove his car down. That means he's probably staying at Brown's Motel. Uh Uh-huh. I think I'll drop out and pay him a visit. I'll go with you. No, no, I don't think that's wise. I'm going alone. Mr. Holliday... He carries a gun. You stay here. You'll get her. We'll bring Janie back. I'll try my best. I'll be waiting. After that, I'll spend a quiet weekend with a psychiatrist. This is it. Brown's Motel. Now to find a man named Sam Clark or Sam Parker. Ask the manager. That's logical. So he is here. Well, what do you do now, Holiday? You knock on the door, Sam Clark will stick a gun in your ribs. There'll be a fight and Janie might get hurt. The telephone. That's how to do it. Remember to thank...
thank the man who invented outdoor phone booths. There. There it is. Brown's Motel. This is one time you'd better be right over there. Because if you're wrong, you're dead. And that's so permanent. Brown's Motel. I want to speak to Mr. Clark. I don't know. He, he said he didn't want to be disturbed. It's a matter of life and death. Get into the phone. Uh, who is this? Hurry, man. I've only got a couple of minutes. Okay, I'll see. Now, quick, Holiday. Out of the booth and around the corner towards the back. Wait. Now. Take it easy. Here he comes. Now, Holiday, just step around to the side of the booth where you won't be seen. Hello? 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 What kind of gag is this? No gag at all, Mr. Clark. Oh. That'll take care of him long enough for me to straighten this all out. Honey, I want you to tell me the truth. You know what the truth is? Of course I do, Daddy. And tell me quickly, that man who brought you here, is he your real daddy? Oh, no. He's not my real daddy. Besides, I don't like him. Well, come on, Janie. We're getting out of here right now. I hope that's Lieutenant Kling and Mrs. Hatton. So, Holiday, you brought her back. Yeah, I, I brought her back. Oh, Janie, my baby. <laughs> I thought I'd lost you. I thought I'd never see you again. Mr. Holliday, I saw these people come in. Did you... Janie. Mommy. No, no, no. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. What is this? These are my two mommies. Holliday, would you mind explaining this little two-mother soiree you've cooked up? Lieutenant, I think you'd better listen to what Mrs. Parker has to say. I'd like to listen to anyone who can make sense out of this highly confusing little situation. Anyone but you, Holliday. Thanks. Go on, Mrs. Parker. She's Janie's mother. Well, then, who are you, Mrs. Hatton? Kling, let Mrs. Parker explain, will you? Yes, please do, Mrs. Parker. My husband's been dead for some time. I've been working out of town so I could take care of Janie. I placed her in a foundling home for the year I'd be gone. And I'm a foster mother, Lieutenant. The foundling home paid me to take care of Janie. But you two have never met, eh? That's right, Kling. Is it beginning to make sense? No. If neither of these two ladies had the child... Who did? A man named Sam Parker who turned out to be Sam Clark. Holiday, will you cut that out? Sam Clark is my husband's cousin. He's been trying to take Janie away from me legally. That bothers me, Mrs. Parker. Why would he do that? Because there's an inheritance coming to her from her grandparents. He hopes to prove me negligent and get her custody. That way he can control the estate. And that's where I came. You see, I took Janie from Mrs. Hatton's house. I wanted to hide her. I read Mr. Holiday's ad. I gave her to him. You gave her... A child, a holiday? Oh, lady, you didn't know what you were doing. No, no, just to keep until it was safe, until I could get matters straightened out with the court. Well, now I'm beginning to see the light. Are uh, you satisfied, Mrs. Hatton? Of course. I'd never try to keep Janie from her mother. Mm, thank heaven for that. So I guess it's all wound up, eh, Holiday? Oh, no, not yet. There's more. Holiday, if you've got one more ramification up that sleeve of yours... I could hardly get Sam Clark up my sleeve. But I've got a hunch he should be here any minute. Oh, no. Oh, yes. Answer the door, Holiday. I'd suggest a gun in your hand, Lieutenant. A gun? What for? Oh, don't ask silly questions. Come in, Mr. Clark. Get your hands up. We've got something to settle. Meet Lieutenant Kling of the police department. What? No. Oh. <laughs> That's a nice right you've got, Holiday. Uh, pick up his gun. Thanks, Lieutenant. It's a pleasure. Mr. Holliday, how can I ever thank you? Very easily. Just bring little Janie up to see me occasionally. I certainly shall. Oh, by the way, I have a suggestion for you two ladies. I think I know how you can both keep Janie. But how? What do you mean, Mr. Holliday? Suppose you, Mrs. Parker, continue with your work. Janie could stay at Mrs. Hatton's, and so could you. Oh, Mrs. Parker, if you only would. I think that's simply wonderful. Mommy. Yes? He fixed it so I can see my two mommy, didn't he? Yes, he did, darling. And 
Would you be my real daddy? Well, now, Janie, you see, it's like this. I... <laughs> Let's see you get out of that holiday. <laughs> and would you tell me a fairy story? Oh, no, you don't catch me on that one. I'll write you one. Mr. Holiday, I think you ought to know that... Oh, what a cute little girl. Who are you, little girl? I'm Janie, and this is my daddy. Why, Mr. Holiday, you never told me. Now, look, Susie, Janie means I'm her daddy. Well, just sort of imaginary. What's imaginary about being a father? Sit down, Susie. I'll tell you all about it. I'm going to tell you a story. Boy, oh boy. I'll bet this is going to be good. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is written and directed by Ted Hedegar. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Two bucks thirty. Care of the Star Times. Carl! Carl! What are you doing? Nothing. I ain't doing nothing. It's just a book holiday. Somebody sent a book to Box 13. Why? And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Susie. Susie, come here, will you? You call me Mr. Holliday? How did you guess? I heard you. All right. Now that we've cleared that up, how about this book? That one? This one. It came in the mail for box 13. You're sure? Sure, I'm sure, Mr. Holliday. The wrapping paper's right in the wastebasket there. I- I'll get it and show you. Here. Address printed. Block letters. Shaky hand. Susie, did any letter come with this? Hmm, just a book. Ex Libris. Robert and Chase. All right, Susie, we've got a problem. Somebody sends me a book from the library of Robert and Chase. Why? Maybe it's a bestseller. Yeah, and its day it was. Still is. The poems of Sir Walter Scott. Do you like poetry, Mr. Holliday? Love it, Susie. Just love it. Listen. If thou wouldst view fair Melrose aright, go visit it by the pale moonlight. The gay beams of lightsome day gild but to flout the ruins gray. Pretty, huh? What's it mean, Mr. Holliday? Susie, you're asking the jackpot question. The book's broken to fall open at this poem. Why? We're in a rut. Well, there's one way to get out of it. If anyone calls for me, I'll be in the morgue. Star time. Sure, sure. Robert N. Chase. We've got plenty about him, Holiday. Well, let me have it. You ought to remember him. Vaguely, I do. All right, Mac, what have we got? Headlines. Lots of them. Headlines, huh? What's he been doing? Same thing he's been doing for the past ten years. He's in a rut, too. Six foot deep. Dead? Here. You read all about it, Dan. Socialites dead in tragic blaze. I'm oh, sure I remember now. But ten... Ten years ago, I was cutting my reporter's teeth on a police beat. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A cop wouldn't get a juicy story like this to cover. Son near death. Daughter at school escapes tragedy. Last night, fire swept the Robert N. Chase mansion... Blaze unnoticed until too late, spread rapidly. Injured son not expected to live. He did, though. 
Uh-huh, I see. Mildred Chase, 18, was attending a college function when the flames took the lives of her parents and swept rapidly through the palatial country estate, Fair Melrose. They were... Fair Melrose? Yeah, that was the name of the estate. Fair Melrose. Mac, the uh, Chase girl, got anything on her? What paper didn't have? What do you mean? You know, too much dough, spoiled kid, wrong company. She ran smack into the gossip stuff almost every week. Oh, where she is now? Well, she dropped back after the fire. It kind of cooled her off. Mm, you've been a good girl ever since, is that it? Well, that's it. I tell you what, Dan, drop upstairs to see more in society. She can give you the dope. All right. Thanks, man. Say, you must come and visit my morgue sometime. Uh, I like this one. I only read about characters. I don't have to bump into them. Ah, but mine move around, Mac, and sometimes too fast. <laughs> Oui, monsieur. Ah, free French or engaged? You wish to see someone, monsieur? Yes, Miss Chase. Miss Mildred Chase. You have an appointment? Is that an offer or a business question? <laughs> monsieur, if you will tell me... Well, what... what is it? There is someone here, mademoiselle. I don't wish to be disturbed. I'm sorry, monsieur. But mademoiselle Chase, she is not home. Oh, I see. Then you've got a talking piano. <laughs> oh, please, monsieur. I cannot let you in. You are mademoiselle. Yes, I did. But if you will go in and tell Mademoiselle that Sir Walter Scott is waiting to see her, I'm sure she'll listen. What do you say? Where? Vive la France. <laughs> All right. You wait here. But I cannot promise. Yes? What is it? What do you want? Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Chase. I, I have to see you. Well, I don't know you. I've never seen you before. Well, lots of people haven't. But my name's Dan Holliday. The name means nothing to me. It means everything to my mother. <laughs> what do you want? I'm sorry, Miss Chase, bursting in like this. But I've come to see you about Fair Melrose. Who? Who are you? Oh, I told you. Dan Holliday, occupation, fiction writer. And are you writing now, Mr. Holliday? Maybe. Oh, uh, is this yours? Mine? That book? Here, take it. Where did you get this? You don't know. No. Where did you get it? But you do recognize it. Yes. It, it was part of my father's collection. I asked you, how did you get it? Through the mail. It was addressed to Box 13, care of the Star Times. Or doesn't that mean anything? No. Nothing at all. You should read the classified ads, Miss Chase. Box 13. Adventure wanted will go anywhere, do anything. You thank see, I... you for bringing the book back to me, Mr. Holliday. You don't have any idea why the book was sent to me? Why, oh, I, I don't know any more about it than you do. Maybe you don't. That's right. Colette will show you Was there anything I... suspicious about the fire that destroyed Fair Melrose? Mr. Holliday, I don't know what you have in mind, but that was a cruel thing to say. A hateful thing. You're not proud of it, are you? I'm nothing one way or the other, Miss Chase. But that book was sent to me. It was broken to fall open at the palms about Fair Melrose. I'd just like to know why. I know nothing about it. All I know is that fire took my mother and father. It's very sad, Miss Chase. And my poor brother was left a hopeless invalid, completely paralyzed, unable to speak, to move. Where is your brother now? At Fair Melrose. The place he always loved. But I thought it was destroyed by fire ten years ago. Yes. But one wing remains standing. Your brother is there alone? Yes. At where he would want to be. And I arranged for someone to care for him. Oh, I see. Now, Mr. Holliday, I'd like to forget all this. Well, I'm sorry to have bothered you, Miss Chase. I was merely curious about that book. I know nothing about it. All I want to do is to forget. To forget. <laughs> What you want this hour of the night? I'm looking for Fair Melrose. Eh? What for? Will you tell me how I can get there? I'm lost. Stay lost, then. Just a minute, please. Get your foot out of the door. Get 
Don't be afraid. I'm not going to harm you. I just want to know the way to Fair Melrose. Yeah, what for? I've I've got business there. You're Ryan. Nobody's got no business there. Nobody. All right, I'm nobody. Is your house on the ground? Well, it should be. Been here for 30 years. Oh. Nice little cottage you've got here. What you want to go up there for? To look at it. Huh? What for? Huh. Nice waltz we're having. Young fella, I asked you a question, and you ain't answered. All right. I want to find out about the fire. Well, ain't nothing nobody needs to find out about it. It was a visitation of the Lord. It was a judgment on the sin that was going on. Heaven rained fire that night and wiped out the last of Babylon. I'm not sure I got all that. Oh, the wages of sin is death. Now you know. Wait a minute. Were you here that night? Me and Carl. Carl? And my husband. He was down here and seen the fire eaten up like the vengeance of the angels. We seen it, young fella. It was a judgment. A judgment for the years of sin. <laughs> we didn't have to do no more caretaking after that night. Providence took care for us. You and Carl uh, caretakers, is that it? That's right. <laughs> only, only one wing to take care of now. Only one wing and him. Oh, the brother. Yes, yes, him that can't move or talk or hear. And that's where they brung him. And that's where he stayed. Now, you get. I, I talked enough. I wonder. How do I get up there? You're still going up, huh? More than ever now. Which way? Uh, straight up the canyon. Turn left at the top of the hill. Thanks. Well, maybe you should have picked a lighter night. Yes, one with a moon. <laughs> Maybe she's right, Holiday. It's definitely no night for a picnic. And who said it's going to be a picnic? Same to you with feathers on. Hello. Oh. Light a match, Holiday. Don't be so stupid. Is anyone here? Chase? Oh, Mr. Chase. Holy mackerel. Who are you? Answer me. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Oh. Nice barrett's on voice you got there, Holliday. Clean. Inspector Clean. Where am I? Hospital. What for? For your head. There's a little dent in it about two inches deep. Oh, I remember. Where is he? He? Who? The body. Oh, the body. What body? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. How did you get in? Who found me? Who told you all about this? The old girl, caretaker's wife. She found you. Oh. Clay, I saw a body in Fair Melrose. Holiday, I don't know what merry go round you're on, but keep up this way and you'll get the brass ring through your nose. How do I get out of this place? Walk out. Thanks. What are you going to do now? Why? I want to know where to pick up the body. Keep in touch, Clint. What have you got in mind? A date. A date with a beautiful young lady. Slightly hysterical and more than a little mysterious. But interesting. What do you 
want here again, Mr. Holliday? More to the point. What do you want? Will you please leave? Every time I come here, I get invited to leave. I don't know what you're doing, Mr. Holliday, but it's none of your business. You ought to... I went to Fair Melrose last night. What for? I wanted to see it. And your brother. You mustn't see him. Why not? What do you do, Miss Chase? Please leave him alone. All right. Did you go to Melrose last night? No. I haven't been there for ten years. You weren't there the night of the fire either, were you? No, no, I wasn't. All right, all right. I'll take the word for it. Now, mind if I ask you one more question? If you'll go, I'll answer it. It's a deal. What are you afraid of? Nothing. That's your answer? Yes. I, I'd almost forgotten that horrible night until you came here. For ten years, I've lived away from it, keeping it away from me. Now you've brought it all back. Don't you have any pity? Lots of it, Miss Chase. For a lot of people. Particularly you. What do you want to see him for? I got to. I want to talk with him. He can't talk. He can't hear. He's in the only wing left by the fire. Well, that he is. You, you still want to go up to see him? Yes, I do. Oh, the chases. Devil's brood, all of them. Devil's brood. The young and with her temper, screaming at her mother and father. And him that's upstairs now, always fighting with his sister. The fire was a visitation and a judgment of providence. Ah, ah. There he is. Oh, no. Well, that's him. You stay here. Mr. Chase. Mr. Chase. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Can't, can't. Shut up. Mr. Chase, I'm... I'm Dan Holliday. Box 13. Box 13, do you understand? Not in his head. That's all he can do. Mr. Chase, you want to see me. You sent me that book. You had Carl send it to me. Is that right? Nod your head if that's right. Good. Now, why? He can hear. You can hear me a little, can't you, Mr. Chase? Good. Why did you send me that book? Why did you want me to come here? He wants me to look around, Bertha. At what? At what? Ain't nothing in here. Ain't nothing. Look, Mr. Chase. I'll walk around the room. I'll watch you. When you want me to stop, nod your head. Understand? Good. Now watch me. Here, this trophy case. Is this it? What about it? What do you want me to see in this? Good. Bertha, come here. I ain't coming in. I said, come here, come on. Take a good look at this trophy case, Bertha. A good look. Uh, I don't see nothing. There's a plaque missing from its place. There's heavy dust around behind all those cups and trophies, but there's a clean spot here where a plaque stood. No dust, Bertha. No dust. Someone took a plaque from here not more than a few days ago. Did you? I ain't touched nothing. Never touched nothing. Mr. Chase. That plaque. Whose was it? Yours? No. Your father's? Mother's? Mildred's. It was hers. But someone took it. Chase, try to understand. Try to answer. Please, you've got to. He can't. He... Mr. Chase, try hard. Try hard to hear me Let again. Let him alone. He can't do no more. Stay with... Stay with him, Bertha. Don't leave him for a minute, do you hear? Oh, hello there. Hello, Holiday. Inspector, I'm in a hurry. No, it looks like it. But you can't spare a poor cop a couple of minutes to explain something, can't you? What? That body... We found it. In a ravine about a mile down the road. All right, you found the body. Now I'm in a hurry. I gotta go. Not so fast, Holiday. There are a couple of questions I'd like to ask you. Later, Kling, later. You know where to reach me. Holiday. Come back, Holiday. I say come back here. I'd be care of box 13. 
you. You saw my brother, Mr. Holliday? Yes, I saw him. Oh, please keep playing. I don't know why I let you in here. I do. Can't you leave me alone? Please, the piano. I like to hear it. What did you find out? So you don't know why anyone would have taken that plaque from the trophy case? No! Your brother managed to tell me it was yours. You were... Where was it? In the lower right-hand corner of the trophy case. Lower right-hand corner? Lower? That mean anything? Well, it... It was a plaque I won for dramatics at Merrifield Academy. I don't get it. What value does it have? It isn't worth anything except... Except what? The plaque was presented to me at a dinner at Merrifield. So, go on. The dinner was the night of the fire at Melrose. And the plaque would prove you were at Merrifield the night of the fire. Yes. But somebody... Somebody wants people to think you were at Fair Melrose. Were you? No, no, no. How many times do I have to say that? That's enough. Who hates you, Miss Chase? My brother. Your brother? They all hated me. My mother, my father, my brother. Sometimes I think I hated them. Watching me, picking my friends, cutting me off from the friends I picked. I couldn't stand it. I see. All right, Miss Chase. We'll forget it for now. But can I come back this evening? Why? I said before I wanted to help you. That still goes. Miss Chase, it still goes. Please sit down, Mr. Holliday. Thanks, Miss Chase. Do, uh... Do you have anything to tell me? A few things, yes. But first, uh... Is there anything you want to tell me? Tell you? Why, no. You sure? Positive. What could I tell you? A story. I don't know what you mean. All right, I'll explain. Must you play the piano? No, but I'd like to. Miss Chase, let me tell you a story. What about? Well, I don't know whether it's exact or not. You see, I have to guess a lot. Fill in details myself. But this story is about a girl. An 18-year-old girl. That is, she was 18 ten years ago. And what's that got to do with me? Oh, you might be the girl, Miss Chase. Wild with a temper. Bad temper. She had a lot of fights with her parents. Mostly about the friends she had. The way she ran around. What are you trying to say? That one night this girl set fire to her home in a fit of temper. After a fight with her parents. Maybe she didn't mean to do what she did. But the fire destroyed her home almost completely. It meant the death of her parents and it made her brother a... You're making this up. You're guessing. I said I'd have to guess. I was at Merrifield the night of the fire. For a while. I checked. Found out you left early enough to get to Melrose. And you brought a plaque with you. The one you'd won for dramatics. Well, I I brought it to Melrose later. The, the next day or the next. I, I, I don't remember. No, that's no good, Miss Chase. It's too hard to believe that anyone would walk into a ruined home and put a plaque in a trophy case. I say you took it to Melrose. Then had the fight with your mother and father. You're lying. I don't think so. I took it there after the fire. And why is it missing? Want me to look around your apartment for it, Miss Chase? Or send for the police to look for it? No. Why not, if you haven't got it? Why are you afraid to let me look for it? So I am right. Now let's get on with the story. For ten years you held the secret. There's nothing to connect you with the fire at Melrose except that plaque. For years that fire's on your mind. Day after day you have to live with the secret. Wondering if there's anything that will connect you with that night. But there's nothing. There's nothing. Then you remember that plaque. It will prove that you were at Melrose. Because the date engraved on it is the same as the date of the fire. No. I tell you, it's not true. So there's only one thing to do. Get that plaque out of Melrose. But you didn't count on one thing. Your brother. Day after day, he saw that trophy case. Day after day, it was the same. Never changing. Like the four walls he had to stare at. But suddenly it's different. There's... There's something missing. 
He racks his brains and he remembers. He remembers the plaque that was there. When he was able to read, he must have read about the fire. How you escaped the tragedy by being at school that night. How lucky everyone said you were. He read how you were presented with a plaque for dramatics. And his tortured mind puts two and two together. And he arrives at the conclusion that you were at Melrose. Home. The night of the fire. Well, Miss Chase, did you like that story? There's nothing you can prove. Maybe not. But how about Carl's murder? You killed him. Because you thought Carl was me last night. No. What, what are you doing? Calling the police. It's for them now. I think they'll prove you killed Carl. They're good at that sort of thing, Miss Chase. Very good. No, no, please. What do you want? Money? I'll give you money. Anything, only don't call them. Why not? Please, please. Hello, Inspector. Please. They hated me, all of them. Okay, I hated on. them. It's you. I hate you. Look out. Get a Oh, no. <laughs> Hello, Kling. Holiday. Come to the Sunview Apartments now. I, uh, I just rang down the curtain on a ten-year dramatic act. <laughs> Thrilling, Mr. Holliday. Yes, yeah, sure, Susie. About as thrilling as throwing dirt in a guy's face. Oh. Well, here's some more mail for Box 13. Later, Susie, later. But here's something maybe you ought to look into. What? If you subscribe to this book club, you get a free set of Sir Walter Scott's poems. Oh, fine, fine. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. With an original story by Frank Hart Towson. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. I know my life is in danger. I think you can help me. I'm desperate and don't dare go to the police. Please, if you want to help, call at the Tivoli Theater box office for the ticket left there. Our handbill will tell you more. Our handbill will tell you more. Yeah, that's the way it started. The note from the girl, Maria. The theater ticket. And then, murder. And now, back to Box 13. It was Thursday when I received the letter from Maria through Box 13. Some of the letters I get are from cranks. Some from people who are just curious about a reporter turned fiction writer who advertises adventure wanted, will go any place, do anything. But with this one, it was just like Susie said. Gee, Mr. Holliday, it doesn't look like one of those crank letters or somebody that's just curious, thinks you're crazy or something. How can you tell, Susie? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's just female ignition. There's a dictionary over there, Susie. Look up ignition. Don't you know what it means, Mr. Holliday? Hmm. It, it's when a woman... Skip it, Susie. Skip it. Oh, okay. I'm supposed to pick up a ticket for tonight's show at the Tivoli. Take a look at this handbill. Torino. The great Torino. Like his look, Susie? Well, mm, I don't know. That's what I thought. Okay, Susie, close up shop for the day. You're going to follow it up, huh? That's the general idea, yes. I want to see what Maria has on her mind. And why she's afraid. This 
was it. I picked up the ticket at the Tivoli. A big poster told me this was a charity affair with the axe doing a two-night stand. Tickets? Ten dollars a throw. I circled around the lobby, looked at the axe advertised, singers, dancers, a dog act, and then... There it was. A big life-size cut out of the great Torino. Complete with mustache and goatee. Nice-looking guy. Maybe too smooth-looking. But it was what he was doing that made me take a better look. He held a rifle to his shoulder and was aiming it across the lobby at another cutout. And this one? This one was a girl. Pretty? Mm Mm-hmm. Big eyes. Maybe a little scared looking. And looking straight across at the great Torino. And right into the barrel of that rifle pointed at her head. Well, if this was Maria, she had a right to have something on her mind. Anybody who stands up and lets a rifle be fired at her is earning a living the hard way. I was thinking about it when the call buzzer zizzed in my ear. I didn't know with a crowd during the overture and took my seat. First we're all right on the aisle, easy to get at. And Usherette shoved a program in my hands. The great Torino was scheduled next to closing. Okay, that meant I'd have to sit through the rest of the acts. I did. It was skipping. But the great Torino was something different. He had two assistants, a girl and a good-looking young guy. It was a magic act with class, and Torino was clever with his hands. He did a trunk effect that was really great. And the girl who helped was the same girl whose cutout was in the lobby. Torino tied her with a rope, slipped the big canvas bag over her, and locked her in a trunk. He fired a shot, and bang, the girl came running down the aisle. And the trunk she was put in, well, empty. All done in a split second, too. The great Torino took his bow, but I noticed something. When he reached out to take the girl's hand and bow with her, she managed to be busy at something else. Okay. She didn't like him. He gave her a funny look and walked to a rack and picked up a nice nickel-plated rifle. I sat up in my seat because the girl threw a quick look at me and a tiny nod. No one would have noticed it but me. I, I looked back at Torino, who was speaking. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to call your attention to my final effect. A most dangerous one. So dangerous that few illusionists will attempt it. The history of the magician's art has recorded several deaths during the feat. My assistant will go into the audience now and select a committee of volunteers who will please come upon the stage. Maria, if you please. So the girl was Maria. I guess my cue was to be selected as one of the committee. I raised my hand. She picked me. I went on the stage with four others from the audience. Stood there while Torino went to the footlights and spoke again. Uh, Please, the music. No music. Please, no music. Thank you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I shall give the gentlemen of the committee this rifle. It may be examined thoroughly. Also, three bullets which they may mark later for identification. Gentlemen, the rifle. And here, the bullets. Uh, Please mark the lead in any way you choose, unmistakably. We took the rifle and the bullets. And the great Torino, well, he had the audience sitting on the edges of their seats. No one knew exactly what was going to happen, and Torino wasn't going to tell them until the right time came. And one of the other men on the committee spoke to me. Uh, Bullets look okay to you? As good as any bullets can look. 22s, huh? Yeah. How do we mark them? Initials? Yeah, yeah, good idea. The three of us cut our initials in the lead. That all right with you, mister? Good. How about the rest of you? Suits me. I've got a knife here. Yeah, let me see the rifle. Yeah, sure, here. Rifle look okay, no gimmicks? Not that I can see. All right, my my initials are cut in the bullet. Uh, You want to cut yours? Oh, yes. I cut my initials, D.H., in one of the bullets. So we had three bullets with initials cut in the lead. No chance for a substitution. Then Torino took the rifle and the bullets. Thank you, gentlemen. Grazie tanto. You are satisfied? Uh, sure, I am. Yes. Good. Now, if you will all watch closely, I shall load the bullets in the rifle. So, 
And uh, what is your name, sir? Holiday. Good. Then, uh, Mr. Holiday, if you will please hold the loaded rifle until I am ready for it. Oh, sure, sure. In this way, there can be no trickery. Ladies and gentlemen, you saw me load the market bullets, yes. So, and you have the loaded rifle. Good. Now, ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce once more Maria. Maria? The young lady is as courageous as she is lovely. Maria, you will take your place, please. Mr. Holiday, would you care to shoot at Maria? Oh, no. No, thank you. <laughs> then that leaves it up to me. No. The rifle, please. Oh, here you are. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall ask for complete quiet. <clears throat> thank you. Maria... You are ready? Yes. I'm ready. The great Torino walked to the other side of the stage. He raised the rifle to his shoulder, pointed it at Maria. She was pale as death. Her arms were tense, tight. Perspiration stood out on her forehead. And on mine. And on everyone in the audience. Then... So help me, this is what happened... A bullet appeared between Maria's teeth. She let it drop to a plate. She held it in her hands, then... And two more bullets popped between her teeth and fell to the plate. No one in the audience moved. No applause. Just that tense feeling. Torino walked over, took the plate. His hands never touched the bullets. I'll swear to it. He walked to me and the other three men with me and... Gentlemen... You will please to identify the bullets, yes? This one. Initials T.G. Uh, that's, that's me. Yeah, yeah, that's mine, all right. Thank you. And uh, this one. K.R. Mine. Thank you. And the third. D.H. That's mine. <laughs> off the stage, Maria managed to get a note into my hands. When I read it later, it asked me to meet her at a little coffee shop about three blocks from the theater. All right, that's what I did. We sat in the booth, back out of the way, and Maria talked. Thank you for coming, Mr. Holliday. That's all right, Maria. I, I saw a great act, but what am I doing in it? You can help me. Please help me. How? Doing what? You can keep Torino from killing me. More coffee? Didn't you hear me? Oh, sure. Sure, but I don't get it. You saw the act. The rifle trick. Yeah, it was great. Then you must see how easy it would be for Torino to kill me while doing it. Slow up a little, Maria. Let's start from the beginning. All right. You saw the other assistant. You mean the good-looking kid? That's Billy. I love him and he loves me. Then what's your problem? Torino. He hates Billy. And he hates me for loving Billy. Jealous? Insanely. Well, quit then. I will. After tomorrow night's performance. But why wait if you're afraid? I won't be afraid if you're there. What could I do? Be on the committee again. If I think any, anything's wrong, I'll signal you. And then? Do anything. Drop the rifle, but don't give it back to Torino. Now, wait a minute. How could he kill you? He'd claim it was an accident. Three magicians or their assistants have been killed accidentally doing the trick. The mechanism of the gun goes wrong. Giving away secrets, Maria? I have to. There's a mechanism in the breech of the gun. It drops the real bullets down into Torino's hand when he closes the breech. Oh, then I get an unloaded gun. There are blanks in it. The mechanism substitutes them for the real bullets. Hmm. That's good. And he slips the real bullets to you? Yes, when he takes my hand to introduce me. And you slip them into your mouth? While the audience is watching Torino and the rifle. I see. Maria. Yes? Why don't you go to the police? Torino would know. He'd know. How? He watches me. Then aren't you afraid he's watching now? No. Not tonight. I slipped away. I don't think I could manage it again. Don't you see, Mr. Holliday? You're my only chance. I saw you had in the paper, Box 13. You mean the police would ask him questions and he'd lay low until he got the chance to... Yes. Will you be there tomorrow night, Mr. Holliday? Look, I have a ticket for you here. The same seat. Please. Please. 
All right, Maria. I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll try to keep the trick from being trumped by the great Torino. And now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, it sounded like a great assignment. From the way the setup looked from where I sat, it gave the great Torino a perfect chance to kill Maria. I checked on Maria's story about the accidental deaths during the trick, and Jonesy at the Star Times verified it. A smart cookie like Torino could fake an accident, and who's going to pin the black ribbon on him? Nobody. Okay, it's up to you, Holiday, to figure it out. Next night, I sat in the same seat and watched Torino go through his act. The trunk thing, still great, knocked the audience off their seats. Me, too. Couldn't figure it. But the big stuff was still to come, the rifle trick. I went on the stage, kept my eyes on Maria. I marked one of the bullets again. Oddly enough, Torino didn't seem to recognize me. That was all right with me. And now, ladies Torino and went through his same spiel, I word for word. I kept my eyes on Maria. But it was though she'd never seen me before in her life. She looked... Well, it sounds silly, but she looked hypnotized. Then I heard Torino saying to me... Mr. Holiday, would you care to shoot at Maria? No, thank you. <laughs> Torino looked at me hard. My name and my face together might have tipped him. There was a funny look in his eyes. I stared at Maria. Not a sign from her. Maria, you are ready? Yes, I'm ready. I relaxed a little. She hadn't given me a sign. Everything was all right, and then... Maria! Maria! She dropped. Maria dropped. And right between her eyes was a little round hole. Look, Holiday. Is that straight, that story? Sure it is, Kling. She was afraid she'd be killed. But you say she didn't give you a high sign. No, she didn't even look at me. But she told you if there was anything wrong, she'd tip you. Yes, but she didn't tip me. Okay. Sergeant. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Get Torino over here. Yes, sir. All right, you. Lieutenant Kling wants you. Got any ideas, Holiday? No, I'm dry. Bone dry, Kling. And what about this guy, Billy, she told you about? I told you. Okay. It was accident. Accident. Something she was go wrong. Please. Quiet. Now look. Accident. She's oh. wrong accident that happened. You're so... I am an artist. You tell me I do something wrong. No, no, no. It is wrong. Holy accident. mackerel. Sergeant. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Streak and, Put this guy in his dressing Europe, room. And keep him there until he blows off that head of steam. Wrong, you know. But watch his door. And the window from outside. Yes, sir. Come on, Come on. It's funny. I'm hysterical. I don't think... What's funny? The girl Maria. I don't think she knew me tonight. She looked right at me. Didn't give me a tumble. Yeah? So? She told me she'd signal me if anything was wrong. I... I don't get it. But it looks as though she... She what? She deliberately let Torino fire a gun she knew was set to kill her. Okay. Well, that makes great sense. I know. No sense at all. And besides Listen, that, Maria, there... Get away with it. You're going to let him tell you it's all an accident. Well, don't believe him. He killed her. That's Billy. Cling. What? Let me ask him a couple of things. Now, look, Holiday, I'm in charge of this case. You're in on a rain check. Okay, but I'm in, huh? Yeah, for the one reason that Maria told you about it, and he I... He killed her. It wasn't an accident. Oh, I'd better go help the sergeant. Any objections if I mosey along with you? None. Just keep your mouth closed, that's all. Sure. All right. So I listen while Cling asks questions. But there was something knocking at the back of my head. Asking to be let in. Something I'd seen, heard, remembered. I didn't know. But what bothered me was Maria not giving me a signal. When she said she'd know if Torino was up to something. Billy answered Kling's questions. No, no. All I know is that Torino <laughs> bluffed Maria. He said he'd kill her if he saw me hanging around her. Who loads the rifle with blanks? Maria. Maria. Does she do it tonight? She always does it. Maria loaded the rifle herself. She did. Before the performance. 
So I got an idea. I left the stage where the investigation was going on, and I walked backstage toward the dressing rooms. I wanted to talk to Torino, but there was a large blue cop sitting at the door. He looked at me and... Well, Holiday. Oh, hi, Murph. I feel lousy. No, that's too bad. Uh, say, I think I could talk to Torino. No. Oh, no, look, you can watch and listen, tell Kling everything that goes on. <laughs> Playing detective, Holiday? Nope, uh, playing a hunch. What about? Why not listen and find out? And if you learn anything, tell Kling. And you might learn something good. You mean something that might break the case? Yeah, might. Well, well uh... What's the matter, Murph? Can't you use a couple of strikes? Aye, sure. Oh, okay. But I'm standing right here, understand? Sure. Right. Hey, you, get up and... Oh, brother. Look. Hmm. Ain't nobody gonna ask him no questions. No, I don't think he's in any shape to answer. A promotion, you say? A promotion? I'll be lucky if I ain't fouled up for good. This guy's been knifed right under my nose. That's right. Somebody stabbed Torino. He was as dead as Maria. And nobody saw anybody go in or out of the dressing room. There was one window. It was open. But the officer outside swore he had his eye on it. Hmm. Nobody in or out. And nobody in the room but Torino. Well, the knife was in his back, so suicide was out. Clegg and his boys turned the room upside down. Torino's apparatus and trunks were shoved around. Still nobody. And it turned out nobody had a motive for killing Torino except Billy. Me? Me? Are you crazy? I never left the stage. I was talking to you. I was answering questions. I can't be in two places at once, can I? He was so right. Kling was tearing his hair. Then more questions. The rest of the acts were strangers to Torino. Knew nothing about him. I was thinking about it when something hit me. Something Billy had said. While Kling was still firing questions, I got to a phone. Hello? Oh, hiya, Kenny. Still running that private eye? Swell. Do something for me, will you? Hmm? Okay. Put a man on the Tivoli Theater right now. And get him to tail a guy named Billy. Huh? Here's what he looks like. About 5'9", stocky, light complexion, wearing gray suit. Good morning, Mr. Holliday. Hiya, Susie. Any messages? Uh-huh. The detective agency called. And what? What's the message? Oh, oh I wrote it down shorthand. Here. Uh, trail Billy in shoe. No, wait a minute. Oh, terrible ink. Uh, oh, I got it. To insurance company this morning. He placed claim for double indemnity policy for his wife, Maria Baker. Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Holliday. That's not all. That's enough. I'll see you later, Susie. Torino, Torino. Step on him, Jonesy. Oh, you want odd facts? It takes time to find them. Even in the morgue of the Star Times. Okay, Jonesy, okay. But hurry up, will you? Ah, uh, here we are. Torino, born Italy. Skip that. How long has he been in the country? Uh, six months. Noted magician in Italy and Europe before the war. Only six months. Now, Jonesy, if you were a magician, you wanted assistance. How would you get them? Advertising a billboard, magazine for show folks. What else? Hmm. Where can I see the last six months' copies of the billboard? Right, I got a local office in town. All the copies you want. Hey, where are you going? Thanks, Jonesy. Be seeing you. I've got a lot of reading to do. Six months' copies of the billboard. I looked through every one of them, and when my eyes were falling out of my head, I saw it. An advertisement. The one I wanted. And the one that tied up with something Billy said. And something I saw during Carino's act. I tried to get Kling on the phone, but no dice. He was out. I left word for him to meet me at the Tivoli, and I went there myself. 
was nobody there but the watchman. The five dollar bill got me in. Oh, there's no place gloomier than backstage in an empty theater. I headed for Torino's dressing room. Because I had a good idea how someone got in and stabbed Torino. Then disappeared. I opened the door, stepped inside. It was dark. The shade on the window must have been down. I was fumbling for the light switch when somebody pulled the shade on me. Got any idea who slugged your holiday? Yeah, Kling, I have. All right. Who? Billy, maybe. No dice. He didn't come near this place. We had a tail on him. Do you know about the insurance? Sure. But he couldn't have killed his wife because she loaded the blanks into the gun. Uh Uh-huh. And the medical examiner's report on the bullet that killed her? What about that? Twenty-two. No initials on it? No, none. So it looks like this Maria deliberately planned her own death. It wasn't an accident. If it had been, the bullet in her head would have been marked. Kling, put out a dragnet. Uh, For who? For the one who slugged me. I'll cut it, Holiday. If you know anything, spill it before I lose my temper. Who do you want to pick up? Here's a description. Young woman, about 26. 26. Brown hair. Brown hair. Lovely blue eyes. Blue eyes. About five foot two. Five foot two. Worked as a magician's assistant. Hey, what are you giving me? That's Maria. Uh Uh-huh, Maria. She's dead, you dope. You mean her twin sister's dead, Kling. Twin sister? What are you talking about? The chunk effect Torino work. Could have only been done with twins. Billy tipped me off on it. Billy? Sure, when he said nobody could be in two places at once. And Torino advertised in the billboard for twins. You are dreaming this. Put out a dragnet for Maria. Who stabbed Torino? Maria. She got her twin sister to take her place in the rifle trick last night. That's why I didn't get a signal from her. The sister didn't know me from Adam. Now look, Holiday, we searched this dressing room. There was nobody in it when Torino was stabbed. Maria was here. Look. False back in this cabinet. Good old magician's gimmick. She was here all the while. Maria and Billy took out an insurance policy on her and planned to make me the patsy. Because I'd testify that she told me Torino hated her, that she was scared. Torino was knifed to keep him from spilling about the twins. Billy was in the clear on that because he had an alibi when Torino was killed. Okay, Clint? I, uh... Okay, We'll put out a dragnet. And they got her, Mr. Holiday? Yeah, Susie. They got her. Gee, sounds just like a story. Uh huh. Only nobody will believe it. Look, I've got a knot on my forehead to prove it. <laughs> well, does that make you hysterical? No, but I was just thinking. <laughs> Don't be reckless, Susie. What about? I was just thinking, with that bump, you'll have to wear off the face hat for a while. <laughs> You're a great help. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. This is a Mayfair production. Thirteen, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. They said my son was killed in a drunken brawl. I know he wasn't. He was a good boy. He was murdered. Why, I don't know. If you come to 733 Winchester. If you'll come to 733 Winship Avenue any time and listen to my story, I'll be grateful to you forever. 
Mrs. Catherine Bailey. And that was the letter to Box 13. Just a few lines. But, brother, what those few lines led to. And now, back to Box 13. I get some funny letters through Box 13. Some don't mean a thing. Others are from people who answer all the ads. But this one from Mrs. Catherine Daly. It had a real ring to it. I get so I can spot the letters from cranks and curiosity hunters. They're full of big phrases. It's the simple ones that count, like Susie said. Well, it's short, Mr. Holliday. Uh Uh-huh. What are you going to do about it? Well, what would you do, Susie? Mm, well... You know, Susie, I don't know how you manage to get right to the point of things so quickly. Oh, it's easy. Mm. Okay, you talked me into it. I don't know what I'd do without you. I try to make myself indisposable. The word Susie is indispensable. What's the difference? None, I guess. All right, Susie, I'm on my way to 733 Winship Avenue. Mrs. Catherine Daly was a little woman, maybe about 50, 60. It was difficult to tell because gray hair was pushing hard against the brown. It was her eyes that got me. Maybe not too long ago they'd been able to smile. But now they were dead. Lifeless. Something had been taken away from... From well inside. She led the way to a little living room, furnished cheaply but neatly. She sat down, pointed to a chair for me, and then... Are you serious about that advertisement, Mr. Holliday? Well, yes, I am, Mrs. Daly. I... I haven't any money. That is not much. I can afford something, if it's not a whole lot. Now, look, Mrs. Daly, I'm a writer, and sometimes Box 13 leads me to a good plot. You see, I don't take money because I get paid very well for the stories I get. You see, I used to be a newspaper reporter. Newspaper reporter? Anything wrong with that, Miss Daly? Arthur, my son, he was a reporter. Oh? What paper? The evening record. Your... Your letter said that your son was killed. He was. They said he was drunk, that he got into a fight in a cheap saloon. Arthur was never drunk in his life, and he hated fighting. That his picture on the table? Yes. In uniform. That's the Distinguished Service Cross, isn't it? Yes. Okay, Mrs. Daly, start from the beginning. Tell me how you want me to help. I'm sure Arthur was murdered. Murder's a tough word, Mrs. Daly. Tough to say and tough to prove. But for a week before he was killed, he kept telling me that we could get out of this house soon, that he was going to make a name as a reporter. But he didn't tell you why? No. Then, the night he was killed, he got a phone call. From whom? I don't know. He hurried out and... The next time I saw him was when they asked me to come down and... That's as much as you can tell me. It's every word. Mrs. Daly, this may sound brutal, but but your son's dead now. Why would you rather have it said he was murdered? I want to show everyone he couldn't have died in that cheap, shoddy way. Well, that was that. I believed her. Maybe it was the way she talked. Maybe it was her eyes. I don't know. Anyway, I left her house with nothing to go on but what she had told me. And that was little enough. Just that he was on to something would make a name for him as a reporter. Anyway, I went to see what Lieutenant Kling knew about it. About what, Harvey? About the kid that got killed in the saloon brawl. Well, that's what the records show. They show anything else? No, no, they don't. You know, I... I like you. Thanks. You can have the next dance. I'm serious. Okay, so you're serious. What about? You're not satisfied with the daily case either. What makes you think I'm not? Just the way you talk. You don't believe it's right. I believe what the witnesses in that dive said. The daily kid got drunk. Somebody said something the girl he was with. Nothing bad, but daily got mad and started swinging. And? And he ended up in the red. 
You didn't arrest anybody? Look, we get a dozen calls a night from down at the hill places like that. Somebody's always getting pushed around, roughed up, killed. Some of the things don't even hit the newspapers. Run of the mill stuff. Sure, sure. But look, Kling, what kind of guys get killed in places like that? Bums, winos, characters who hang out in those joints. But not a kid like Daly. And you're an honest cop. What was that crack for? For a compliment. The Daly thing bothers you because you know as well as I do that something's wrong about it. Then you tell me. I'll try. Later. Now, look, Holiday. I'm not on the case anymore. Homicide's got enough to do without running down a fight in a saloon. But, uh... But what? But, uh, I don't like it. You're right. I knew I liked you. Okay, I'll marry you in the morning. The place you want is 183 River Street. Oh, nice neighborhood. Right. The cops go in quartets down there. Thanks. See you later. And for the love of Mike, don't end up on the meat wagon like Daly did. Kling was right. It wasn't a neighborhood to raise kids or anything else. And the place I wanted was called the Riverview. Fancy name. Oh, a great place. I stepped over a couple of boarders spending the night on the doorstep and walked inside. There was a tinny piano played by a guy mechanically banging out a tune that its own composer wouldn't have recognized. The bar was set at the back facing the door. I went over to it. The bartender took a long, good look at me. I must have looked strange. I was wearing a necktie and a shirt. He walked over. Yeah? What's with, bud? How are you? Awful. You? Practically dead. Okay. Now that we know each other... What's on your mind? What do you got to drink? Arsenic. Want some? Straight. Water on the side. <laughs> Funny man, ain't you? Sure. Look, what do you want? A drink, maybe? No, you don't. That suit you got on cost maybe 150 The tie, five bucks. Any cookie comes in here dressed like you don't want a drink. All right. You in. Swell. Slumming, huh? No, looking. For what? Last week there was a fight in here. A kid got killed. Arthur Daly. I didn't see nothing. My back was turned. Did you ever see the girl who was with Daly? I told you, I didn't see nothing. Oh. All through the fight, you just kept your back turned. Yeah, I hate fights. Can't stand the sight of blood. That what you told the police? Same thing. Who are the witnesses? Look, when a fight starts in here, there ain't no witnesses. Everybody's blind. That makes it easy. You a friend of this Daily character? Yeah. Yeah, a good friend. Uh-huh. I still don't know nothing. Now blow, mister. Out. Get it out. He knew something all right. But he was clammed up tight. I left and walked up the street. I was close to the spot where I'd parked my car when I heard something. I stopped. Somebody was tailing me, following me from the saloon. Okay, somebody didn't like me nosing around. I walked past my car. Just ahead of me was an alley, and pulling out of the alley was a truck. I walked a little faster. I got to the alley, skirted around back of the truck so my trailer would lose me for a couple of seconds. Then I stepped inside a doorway. It was dark. The truck pulled away. I waited. Then I heard the steps. He didn't know where I'd gone. But if he was going to pick me up again, he'd have to pass the doorway where I waited for him. Let go. Let go. You hurt me. Shut up. Oh, please, mister. I ain't no crook. I wasn't going to put this thing on you. It's out here telling me. I heard you talking to the barkeep back there. I wanted to talk to you, honest. That's all. You should have caught up with me before this. Oh, gee, mister, I didn't want anybody to see me, honest. All right, talk. Oh. You want to know something, huh? Come on, come on. What do you want to say? Well, honest, I might get in trouble. Look, I, I got to know I'll get something out of this, eh? So what you've got, and we'll see how much it's worth. Uh, maybe a fiver? Maybe. Go on, talk. Look, I could get in bad trouble. You are right now. Oh, all right. Oh, all right, make it a fiver. 
What do you know about Arthur Daly? I saw the fight. I saw the whole thing. Did you tell the police? Me? I don't get nothing to do with the cops. All right, tell me. This guy that was bumped, he didn't start the fight. Who did? A pug. ex-pug named Billy Connor. The Daly guy didn't have nothing to do with starting it. It was a frame. Was Daly drunk? No. No, he had one drink. The girl slipped something in it. I saw her. She was a good looker, so I was watching. Do you know her? Me? <laughs> me know a thing like that? Nah. All right, well, here's your five. Now, keep your mouth shut, understand? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, maybe you'd like to know something else, huh? What? Oh, mister, it ought to be worth something. I... All right, here. Oh, thanks. Uh, you ain't been out of the joint down the street more than a couple of seconds when a barkeep goes to the phone. So? I heard him tell somebody that you was nosing around. Mister, something tells me that you're in bad trouble right now. And now, back to Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I had a few facts now. First, Daly knew something that might have got him killed. Second, the girl who was with him put something in his drink so he'd look drunk. Third, an ex-pug named Billy Connor started the fight. Why? The answer to that would put me on first base. So I asked around a little and found out that Billy Connor, a third-rate fighter down at the heels, suddenly came into money and right after the fight in the saloon. I found him in a second-rate nightclub. You the guy that wants to see me? If you're Billy Connor, I'm the guy. Who are you? Knowing that won't make any prettier. Hey, you're a smart boy, huh? Maybe. But you're not acting smart. What? What are you talking about? You're making too much splash, Connor. The, uh... The boss doesn't like it. People might start asking questions about the money. The money you got for killing Daly. Me? Oh, no. I just started the fight. Then I ducked. Somebody else banged his head for him, not me. Ah. Uh, that's the way it was, huh? Sure, you know... Who are you, anyway? I get it, Connor. Wait a minute, fella. Why'd you say that's the way it was? Didn't you know? Sure. Sure I know. You... You ain't from them. Come on. You dirty sneak. You... You a copper? Maybe. Think it over, Connor. Hard. I left him standing there with his mouth open. I thought I'd found out what I wanted to know. But Kling told me... Doesn't mean a thing. You can't prove anything, Holiday. What if I get proof? How? You've got the name and address of the girl Daly was with the night he was killed. And you want him, is that it? You could get hurt. Meaning you won't give me the girl's name? Meaning that if I do, you're on your own. I'll take that chance. Do I get a name and address? Eileen Simmons, 4674 Roberts Drive. And I hope you get more out of her than we did. I hope so, too. I didn't like walking up a blind alley with murder at my back and maybe in front of me. I got to the girl's home, a boarding house in the shabby section, and took a look at the mailboxes downstairs. While I was walking up to her flat, something tingled the back of my neck. Something that screamed a warning. I got to her flat. She didn't answer. Then I smelled it. Gas. I stooped down and one look at the crack between the door and the sill was enough. It was stuffed with newspapers. There was only one thing to do. Eileen Simmons wasn't going to talk to anybody. The room was heavy with gas. The window I broke let in some air. Scared faces stared in at the door. It smashed open, then I yelled at him. You call the police. Ask for Lieutenant Kling. Go on, hurry. I took a quick look around before I left. In one closet was a fur coat. And from what I knew about fur, this one took money to buy. It had her initials embroidered in the lining. But it didn't fit with the cheap flat. Well, I thought it was about time to make a trip to the evening record where Daly worked as a reporter. Some of the boys knew me, so it was easy to get to talk to Daly's editor. I don't know, Holiday. All I know is that Daly promised me a big story. Something he was working on. Now, look, Charlie. Any idea what it was? None. The kid was close-mouthed. Oh, but you must have some idea. Didn't he give you any hint? 
Just that it was big and would blow off the top of the building when we printed it. How long did he work for you? Oh, about six months, no more. What big assignments did you give him? None. Routine stuff, he didn't have enough experience. Just out of journalism college when the war broke. Mm -hmm. Went through it. Then served at the war trials in Germany. And in the six months with you, there wasn't anything important enough to get him killed, huh? No, no, there wasn't. Oh, let's see. We sent him on a routine assignment to San Carlito and... San Carlito? What's that? Just one of those little islands in the West Indies. The paper's doing a series on Latin American neighbors and we... Anything there that might have been the big story? You mean what he was talking about? Yeah, that's it. How long after he got back did he begin to talk about the something big? Hey, just about the same day he walked in here. Where's his desk? Just outside this office. Oh. All his stuff in there? Well, uh, most of it. We were going to send it to his mother, but, well, you know how things are. It was too soon. We figured we'd wait. And... Come on, let's take a look. Just the usual stuff. What are these photographs? Never saw them before. Full face, profiles of men. You know them? Not from Adam. Oh, uh, Charlie, can I have these? Well, I don't know, Holiday. One ex-newspaper man to an editor. Come on, let me have them. Okay. I didn't see you take them. Uh, thanks. Now, mind if I go through the rest of your stuff? No, help yourself. I'll be at my desk. Right. I went through Daly's papers. There was one little notebook with an entry in it that read, Got to be careful. Never be alone. They won't dare make a try for me unless I'm alone. I've got proof on film. Photos of the men I recognize. Okay. So Daly's notebook gave me another lead. But where to? Well, maybe Daly's mother would know. I looked at my watch, but it was after midnight... So I figured it was too late to see her, and I decided to wait until morning. I wish I'd have gone right then and there. The next morning, I went to see Daly's mother, and I found her in the middle of an excited bunch of neighbors. When I got her alone, she told me what was up. There were burglars. They ransacked Arthur's room. Well, let's take a look. But there's nothing missing. Well, let's look anyway. They went through all the drawers. You didn't hear them? No, I slept right through it. Uh-huh. Mrs. Daly, what could they have wanted? I, I don't know. There's nothing of value here. Look, uh, when Arthur came back from San Carlito, did he uh, bring anything with him? Why, I don't think so. A camera, maybe? His own, but he took that with him when he went. Now, now think hard, Mrs. Daly. Did he take any film out of that camera when he got back? I think he did. Yes, I remember. He hurried out with some film to have it developed. Where is it? I don't know. Did he get it back from the shop where he took it? I don't think so. I think he'd have shown them to me if he had. And the roll of film he took out of his camera is still in the shop. It must be. Mrs. Daly, we've got to find a check for that film. The kind you get when you leave film to be developed. Come on, let's look. We looked and looked and looked. No check. Began to seem as though whoever ransacked the room found the check, and if he had, well, the thing was over. After half an hour, we gave up. But there was still one more thing to find out. Mrs. Daly, would you mind taking a look at these photographs? Do you know any of these men? Why, well, I'm not sure. They look familiar, but... <gasps> His scrapbook, the one he brought back from the war. There are pictures like those in the scrapbook. Well, show it to me, will you? It's in my room, right next door. Here it is. Here they are, the pictures. But I don't see... I think I do. But I'm afraid to believe it. Look, Mrs. Daly, whatever you do, stay with your neighbors. Don't be alone for a minute. I left the house, and the idea I had was buzzing around inside my head. If I was right, then the whole thing was fantastic. But the pieces began to fit together. Maybe I was thinking too hard. I didn't see the big black car that turned down the corner. 
I didn't see it until I was almost staring between its headlights. I jumped back and up, and the fenders of the car took the skin off my legs, and the car roared away. That big black buggy had my name for a license plate. It would have looked just like an accident. But it told me something. That whoever was doing the dirty work didn't have the check for the film. Because the proof of what Daly knew was on that film. And if Mr. Accident Maker had it, he wouldn't have risked another accident. I called Kling, got him on the phone. What do you want me to do? Check every Photoshop in the city for a roll of film mailed just before Daly was killed. How do you know he mailed it? Because he wouldn't have been fool enough to take it to a Photoshop. He knew they were tailing him, waiting to grab that film. So he mailed it, with a note that he'd call for it. Okay, I'll pick up the film, if I can find it. Oh, no, Kling, don't pick it up, please. But you just said you were... Kling, tell me where it is, call my office, and I'll pick it up. Look, you're asking for a crab wreath in your door. If those babies are what you say, they'll cut your little pieces. You want them, don't you? Sure, but I don't... The only way to get them is to make them come after that film. And they won't call it headquarters for it, Kling. But they will try to get it from me. I waited. Finally, Kling gave me the word. I picked up the film and printed the little finishing shop. Kling had given orders that I was to have it. I got in my car, looked in the rear vision mirror, and saw a big black sedan pull in behind me. This was it. I couldn't spot Kling in the squad car. He said it would be handy. Maybe something held it up. I didn't know. I got to my apartment. The sedan pulled up behind me and parked. I walked up to my apartment, went over to the window, and saw a man get out of the sedan. He walked slowly and disappeared into my apartment building. I sat down with a film and prints burning a hole in my pocket. Then... Who is it? The holiday. I'd like to talk to you. I took one more look out of the window. The street was empty except for the sedan. No squad car, no cling. Brother, if ever I wanted to see that big guy, it was now. I walked to the door. Mr. Holliday? Uh-huh. Who are you? My name is, uh, we'll say, Stefan. Okay, you're Mr. Stefan. So what? I should be brief. You have a roll of film and some prints. I am a, a camera enthusiast. I shall pay you a good price for the film. Hmm. How much? <laughs> you're going to be reasonable. That's fine. Shall we say 10000 That's big money for a strip of celluloid. I am very enthusiastic about photography. You know, uh, I like pictures myself. Especially pictures of some nice little Nazis who got out of Germany with a lot of money. Oh? You guessed, huh? Yeah, but Daly wasn't guessing when he recognized them in San Carlito. He wasn't guessing that San Carlito is a little island with lots of deserted coastline. Easy to land on. <laughs> yes, very handy. And they paid well to escape the trials in Nuremberg. You just talked yourself out of $10,000. Oh, now that's very funny. You would have killed me anyway, as you killed Daly to keep him from spreading the story. <laughs> You're so right. Now, Mr. Holiday. Oh, that gun didn't look nice. He had it right at my head. I sat still. Stefan came slowly toward me. The black hole in the barrel of his gun looked like the business end of a cannon. Then... Get the floor, Holiday! Come! Cling, at this particular minute, you're the most beautiful thing in the world. Mr. Holliday? Well, at that moment, Susie, Lieutenant Kling landed and took over. Sorry I drew it so close, Holliday, but I had let Stefan talk a while. Yeah. But by the way, where was that squad car? <laughs> well, there wasn't any. The squad car would have scared Stefan away. I had to make it look safe. The boys and I were right next door. Had been for an hour. Now, he tells me. <laughs> well, it's up to the Federals now. We're clean on this end. Gee, I sure... Oh, Mr. Holliday, you might have been killed. Oh, it's okay now, Susie. It's all over. But but you might have been killed. 
and I like this job so much. <laughs> What'd I say? Very funny, Kling. Nothing, Susie, nothing. <laughs> Good night. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. This is a Mayfair production. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Hey, look, boss. Look at this. An ad in the Star Times, out of town newspaper. Yeah. Box 13, adventure wanted. We'll go any place, do anything. <laughs> well, this looks like the right answer, Tony. Yeah. I think I'll write a letter to Box 13. The letter was postmarked from the city in Nevada. It came airmail, special delivery to Box 13 and me. It sounded like a great chance to grab a change of scenery and maybe a little fun. <laughs> fun? Brother, how wrong could I be? Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Triple Cross. Just run an advertisement in the Star Times, one that reads, Adventure Wanted will go any place, do anything, and see what you get. A lot of them can be interesting, like the one I listened to Susie read. The one that came airmail, special delivery from Nevada. And clothes is enough money to buy you a plane ticket to Los Maros. You want adventure? All right. Come to Los Maros. Register at the Paradise Hotel. Wait in your room until you're contacted. And that's all it says, Susie? That's all, Mr. Holliday. There's not even a signature, even. It's what's called an ominous letter. What kind of a letter, Susie? Ominous. Uh, you know, that means it's not signed by anybody. The word you mean is anonymous. Oh, but you could be right after all. Well, Susie, lock up the office and look for me when you see me with a new plot and a nice tan. A new plot and a nice tan, I said. Hmm. I got the plot, but the tan almost turned into a beautiful white pallor, the kind that goes well with lilies. The plane trip was smooth. The trip from airport to the Paradise Hotel was nice and easy. And the hotel itself? Well, it was the only one I could remember that looked like the ads in the travel folders. Oddly enough, there was a room reserved for me. In my name. Okay, somebody checked and found out who I was. I explored the suite, thinking maybe I'd get a lead on what this was all about. But it was just a fancy set of rooms, all newly decorated. I sat down, and then about a half hour later... Come in. Message for you, Mr. Holliday. Oh, thanks. Here you are. Oh, thank you. Uh, just a minute. Who gave this to you? A man, sir. What kind of a man? What do you look like? Oh, just a man, sir. Oh, I see. A head, two eyes, nose, two ears, and a mouth. <laughs> that is description? Yes, sir. That's exactly what he looked like. Good. But not knowing when I see him... <laughs> Oh, did he ask for an answer? Uh, no, sir. He just told me to bring the envelope to you. Will that be all, sir? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, thanks. Well, two $100 bills and a message that said, buy a red carnation in a flower shop and put it in your lapel. After dinner, go to the casino roulette table, buy $200 in chips and put them on number 18. If you win, walk away, wait 10 minutes and put half the winnings on number 22. After you play, wait in the casino. I place you, ladies and gentlemen. Place 
So with a carnation in my lapel, I bought $200 in chips and walked to the roulette table. There weren't many players. It was a little too early for the big crowd. So I waited a minute and watched the play. Took a look at the croupier, but I might as well have been in Timbuktu. He didn't give me a tumble. Okay, the best way to see what was going to happen was to see. I shoved the whole 200 on number 18. One or two of the other players placed bets, and then... No more bets, please. No more bets. Number 18, red and even. Your chip, sir. The croupier shoved the winnings across to me. I, I watched his face. If he had any expression, it was on the soles of his shoes. Well, maybe $7,000 win was coming around here. I left the table, sat down, and did a little problem in arithmetic, which figured out to be $126,000. That's what I'd have if number 22 came up. And brother had looked from where I sat as though it would. The ten minutes went by, and I walked back to the table. Waited until the wheel stopped. Number 16, red and even. Place your bets, please, ladies and gentlemen. Slowly, I shoved 3,500 in chips to number 22. This time, the others around the wheel did look. 3,500 to 35 to 1. Then the wheel began to slow up. No more bets, ladies and gentlemen. No more bets, please. That croupier was as cold as the floor of a mausoleum. Somebody dropped a pin and I heard it hit the floor. The white ball clicked, clicked, clicked its way until... Number 22, black and even. Your chip, sir. I cashed in the chips and there I sat, with $126,000 tucked away in my inside coat pocket. Somebody had that wheel fixed for a killing. I began to wish I was back in my office. I didn't like it. A crooked play. Why? Who? I made up my mind to go to the owner of the place and wash my hands of the whole thing when... Oh, there you are, Mr. Holliday. I've been looking for you. I have a message for you. Yeah? Well, it's verbal this time, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what is it? You're to go into the bar and wait. Is that all? Yes, sir. The same man gave you this message? Yes, sir. Did he still have a head, two eyes, a nose, and two ears? <laughs> yes, sir. Hmm. All right, here you are, kid. Oh, thank you. You know, if this keeps up much longer, you'll be able to retire my tips alone. Thank you, Mr. Holliday. Will that be all? Oh, uh, how much did this character give you to forget what he looked like? Well, nothing, sir. Nothing at all. And a smart boy like you should have taken a good look the second time. Huh? Especially since I asked about him after the first message. Oh, he was big, dark, a little mustache, and had a little white scar over his right eye. Would you take $5 for that information? That's all right, Mr. Holliday. No charge for that service. Mm. Good boy. I'll see you later. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. I walked toward the bar, wondering what was coming next. I didn't like that fortune burning the cloth in my pocket. The bar was like my suite. Fancy, rich, and expensive. I climbed up on one of the stools, and the bartender came over. And... Yes, sir. May I serve you, sir? Got any ginger ale? Yes, sir. What with, sir? Oh, by itself. Just a glass of ginger ale. Just a ginger ale? Oh. You see, I like the bubbles. <laughs> Champagne has bubbles, too. Ah, uh, but they're still around the next day. Just a ginger ale. Yes, sir. Of course. Excuse me. Is someone sitting here? Hmm? Oh, no, no, I don't think so. Thank you. Here you are, sir. Ginger ale. Thanks. The usual, please. Okay. Yes, sir, may I? You got a light? Of course. Thank you. Don't mention it. Here you are. Thanks. Why do you drink ginger ale? I like it. Why do you drink martinis? Same reason, I guess. <laughs> It's a brilliant conversation, isn't it? Well, I've heard better. You're not very friendly, are you? A uh, Boy Scout is always friendly. And does good turns. So I hear. Do you want to be helped across the street? <laughs> All right. I'll shut up. I took a good look at her. There was something scared looking about her. She was nervous. Well, so was I because the minutes were passing and I still had that money. And I wanted to get rid of it. 
But I wondered about the girl, whether she had any part in this. I watched her out of the corner of my eye. She picked up her bag, reached for a lipstick, and then... Oh, oh, clumsy. So it's true what they say about women's handbags. You get the stuff on the bar, I'll pick up the kitchen sink off the floor. <laughs> I'm, I'm so sorry. Did the powder spill on you? No, it's all right. Yeah, here you are. The, the mirror didn't break, did it? Nope, you're still good for seven years more. Thanks. Thanks ever so much. I told you I was a good boy, Scott. You have a nice smile. Want a toothpaste commercial to go with it? No, don't be nasty. I'm sorry. I guess I'm just as nervous as you are. I... Let's talk about something else. She chattered away. It really is I listened with half an ear. Once in a while, threw in a yes or a no. And the clouds began to gather. The mirror at the back of the bar went back and forth. The people got bigger and shrank to midgets. Somebody drove a plane through my head. Buzzed around and made a bad landing on my brain. And... Oh. There you are. Feeling better now? <sighs> oh. You'll be all right. Just lie there, take it easy. Sure, I... Hey. Hey, I'm in my room. Of course. We brought you here. We? I'm the hotel physician, Mr. Holliday. Oh, what happened? And just a fainting spell, nothing serious. Fainting spell? What are you talking about? They're fainting spells. Your wife told me you get them. My what told you what? No, 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 just lie back. Whose wife said what? Your wife. She's got to have a prescription filled. Now, listen, Doc, I... Hand me my coat, will you? Yeah, it's better if you lie here. It's better if you hand me my coat. Give it to me. Oh, very well. There you are. What's the matter? Was my wife in this room? Of course. She came up with me. Uh Uh-huh. Doc, what would you do with $126,000? What? A (laughs) hundred? That's an odd question. (laughs) What would you do with it? I don't know. Because I haven't got it anymore. Now, back to Triple Cross. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So there I was, 126,000 in the red. If it was meant to be taken from me, then somebody was working it the hard way. Sure, the girl slipped something in my ginger ale when I picked up the stuff that fell out of her handbag. She took the money. All right, I want to know more of it. I was going to head for the nearest exit, running, not walking, when... Come in. You Holiday? Yeah. Do I know you? Call me Tony. I'm the guy who wrote the box 13. Oh. All right, goodbye, Tony. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. We're playing 20 questions. Let's skip the other 18, Tony. I got a big one left. Where's the dough? You tell me. Give it to me. Well, I didn't like him. I didn't like the gun he was playing with either. And I didn't like the little white scar over his right eye or the little black mustache. I was willing right then and there to cross him off my friendship list. But I told him what happened. It's a great story. Ain't heard one like it since I read fairy tales. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. You got no regard for your health, Holiday. Look, Tony, I'm leaving this place You'll now. You'll be too heavy to carry out if you take one more step. That's better. Now, what kind of a frame is this? Once more, you tell me. I played a crooked wheel downstairs. I don't like that. You got adventure, didn't you? I don't want anything that's crooked. Now, look who's talking. Who was the girl? Believe it or not, I never saw her before. What did she look like? I don't know. Yeah. Ever try to take a good look at anyone in that bar downstairs? It's too dark to even see a lighted match. You're smart, Holiday. The game with the girl is neat, awful neat. You get the dough, play doggo. Act like the girl slipped your mickey. Later she turns up with the dough and you two split. Now talk sense, Tony. I didn't know why I came to Los Morris in the first place. I didn't know how I was going to get that money. How would I have time to dream up that frame with a girl? Yeah. Yeah, I never thought of that. Okay, Halliday, maybe you're telling it straight. Okay. Now can I go? No, no. You get that money back first, then you can go. 
I don't think I'll stay for the ninth inning, Tony. The game has not started yet, but you get that dough. How? That's your problem, but get it. Look, Tony, I'm backing out of this. You know I can go to the sheriff. Oh, no, you won't. Because there'll be a tail on you from now on up. One move like you're going to the law. Understand? Okay. Okay, I get it. And there'll be somebody in this room to see that you don't use the phone. You'll be covered like a pool table, Holiday. What if I can't find the girl? What if I can't get the money back? The boss will be awful mad. And? There are worse places than Los Moros to spend a lifetime. If you live. Ever have one of those dreams in which you try to run away from something and can't? Well, this one, with my eyes wide open, was really something. Tony and I went downstairs. Two other characters detached themselves from chairs when Tony nodded at them. Brother, I was covered. It looked hopeless. With Tony not far behind, I asked the doctor if he'd ever seen the girl who said she was my wife. Well, there was no dice there. Then I remembered something. I told Tony I was going back into the bar. Bar? What for? Now, look, Tony. Let me do it my way. I'm the one that's on the spot, so let me play it the way I want. Okay. I'll watch, and don't try for a quick steal, because the boys outside know who to look for. Go ahead. Thanks. What would I do without you, Tony? I don't know, because you're not going to be without me. Remember, I'll be watching. (laughs) Yes, sir. May I serve you? Well, feeling better, sir? Well, much. Where were you when, uh... When I fainted. At the other end of the bar, sir. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you were. It wasn't our ginger ale, sir. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I just have a loose head, and when I shake it, it comes off. <laughs> May I serve you something, sir? Yes. An answer to a question. Well, what's that, sir? Who was the girl who sat down next to me? I don't know, sir. Oh, yes, you do. I beg your pardon, sir. But the sir business, you knew that girl. Why do you say that? Because when she sat down, she asked for the usual, and you brought her a martini. And you said okay when she asked you. What does that prove? The martini proves you knew who she was. The okay means she wasn't a guest of the hotel. No bartender as polite as you are would say okay to a lady guest. That makes sense? Why do you want to know who she is? Does that make any difference? Yeah, because I wouldn't want to see her in trouble. I'll try to keep her out of it. I won't tell you. Ever see a picture of Alexander Hamilton? Hmm? What are you talking about? Well, here's one. And funny enough, it's on a $10 bill. In fact, his picture's on all five of these bills. Yeah. Her name's Kathy Lee. I think she has a place at the Las Palmas courts. Thanks. Put these pictures in frames, will you? I found the Las Palmas courts. And, of course, Tony behind me all the way. The name list in front said Kathy Lee lived in number eight. I looked around before I turned in the walk. Yeah, Tony was closer to me than varnish on a tabletop. I found number eight and stopped for a second. Looked for a phone line, but there wasn't any. I knocked at the door. No answer. I tried it again. Then I heard Tony whisper from the shadows. Try the door, Holiday. I did. It was unlocked. Tony coached from the sidelines. Go on in. I went in and closed the door behind me. It was dark. I decided to risk a call. Kathy? Kathy? Kathy Lee? She wasn't there. I fumbled my way to what felt like a dresser and a lamp. Turned it on and... What I saw made me turn that light off fast. What's the matter? She's dead. What are you talking about? You heard me, she's dead. You sure? Well, go in and look. You go back in and look for that dope. Go on. Look, Tony, I don't know any more of this. That poor kid's dead, murdered. I want you to call the sheriff. No, you don't. I said you go back in there and look for that dope. You look for it. Leave my fingerprints all over the place. You go back in there and hunt. Don't be a sap. Whoever killed her took the money. Don't you see that? Maybe. But we'll play this angle all the way. Now stop talking and get in there. I hated to turn on that light, but I had to. I didn't look at her. 
I looked through the room. Then I found something. A plane ticket to San Francisco. Leaving that night. And a boat ticket for South America. They were in an envelope, but the information on the envelope said there would be two reservations. I put it back where I found it because I didn't want Tony to find it on me. And there was something else. A locket. With a man's picture in it. I took it off his chain and shoved it in my pocket and I left. Well, Helen Lee? It's not there. I told you it wouldn't be. Stand still. Back to it. <laughs> a frisk, Tony? You don't trust me, do you? Shut up. No, I told you. Who killed her? Find that out and you'll know where the money went. Come on. <laughs> What's so funny? Helen Lee? Right now, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Tony was right. People at the casino saw me win that money, and somebody must have seen the girl with me. Then I got the Mickey. The money was taken. The girl killed. Who did it? Mm Mm-hmm. Me, Dan Holliday. Because the girl clipped me for the money. Well, this was a beautiful frame. Any art gallery in the country would be proud to hang it. But I knew something Tony didn't. The plane and boat tickets. Two seats. One for Kathy and... her murder. Somebody who left her tickets in her bungalow to make it look as though she was in on the $100,000 job by herself. Sure. Now her killer was taking a plane. In one hour. Then a boat to South America. I could have told Tony, but I wanted to wrap it up myself. Besides, I wanted to get the whole thing to the law. On the way back to the hotel, I figured something out for myself. But I'd have to see the boss of the casino, and I thought I knew how to do that without Tony tagging along. The casino was full. I stopped. Tony stopped. What's the idea? What now? I've got to think. Up to your room. No. You want to get hurt? Sure. Go ahead. Shoot me. Now. In front of all these people. You know, Tony, you, you wouldn't get ten feet. Smart, ain't you? Okay, what's now? I'm going to play blackjack. What? Want to watch? I sat at the blackjack table. I had as much interest in the game as Aunt Mamie back in Iowa, who never saw a deck of cards in her life. But I had an idea. And I played it for all it was worth. Look, uh, dealer. Yes? I didn't like that last deal. I beg your pardon, sir. I said I didn't like that last deal. Well, we'll return your money, sir. Never mind the money. Who runs this place? Hey, what is that guy trying to pull on over there? It? it worked. In three seconds, I was surrounded by muscle boys, and Tony was hotter than a New York sidewalk in August. But he couldn't touch me. A minute later, I sat across the table from the owner of the casino. I told him what happened, and when I finished, he stared at me and said, You're trying to tell me somebody let you win that money on my wheel? I am? You're crazy. The wheel's straight. But you know I won that money. Sure I do. Any time a hundred grand slides across, I know it, but... uh... But this time it was fixed. The croupier was tipped I was to win. Wait a minute. Marty, send Frankie up here right away. Huh? Oh. Okay, forget it. What's the matter? Frankie, the croupier. Went off duty just after you won. It's not back yet. And he won't come back. Now, somebody planned to take the house this evening for that money. Somebody who couldn't risk getting it himself. So I'm the logical one. No one knows me here. I'd look like just another player. Later, Mr. Fixit plans to pick up the money and beat it. Who? Someone besides yourself who could get to the croupier and bribe him to fix the wheel. Got any ideas? Yeah. One. My partner. Well, that's it, then. It's got to be. But the girl, she doped you. That was a hard way to get the money from you. Listen, I've got an idea, but I'm a little cramped for room. Some of your partner's boys, particularly a guy named Tony, are glued to me. Get some of your boys to shake them off, and I'll bring that money back to you. How do you know where it is? I know. Okay, Holiday. Remember, fast play, and I'll find you if it takes the rest of my life. It's a deal. Now, uh, how about the boys? They won't follow you. Marty. A guy will leave my office. Some mugs are telling him. Stop him. Got it? Good. All right, Holiday. You're on first base. Go ahead. I 
was sure he'd be at the airport, and I wasn't wrong. He was sitting in the shadows on the outside. I walked over to him, and he looked up. Holiday. I thought you would be... Thought I'd be framed, huh, Frankie? What are you doing here? I've got a message from Kathy Lee. Kathy? She's... You ought to know you killed her. Ah, <laughs> you're crazy. Not only that, you've got $126,000 in that bag. $126,000 that looked like easy money. Shut up. That money doesn't mean a thing. It's the girl who counts, the girl who was willing to do what you told her to do. The girl you triple-crossed and killed after you double-crossed your boss who bribed you to fix the wheel. It's too bad you're so smart, Holiday. <laughs> it's too bad you led with that right, Frankie. Somebody call the police to uh, come and clean this up. The croupier was... Oh, please hurry, Mr. Holliday. I, I want to hear the ending. All right, Susie, all right. What do you want to know? Well, how did you guess that Kathy Lee was the croupier's girl? Well, her locket had his picture in it. Oh, they should have given you the money as a reward. No, thanks, Susie. They can have it. But there's one thing I don't understand, Mr. Holliday. And that's? You didn't get a tan at all. You're just as pale as when you left. Oh, $126,000. A murder and a tan, too, she wants. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in... Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his new picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard. Production supervision is by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the star time. I am desperately in danger, I'm sure. I'm afraid to go to the police right now. So if you'll really go anyplace and do anything like you're asked for. If you really go anyplace and do anything like your ad says, please meet me tomorrow at 6 in the evening at the corner of Gateway and Lakeview Boulevards. Constance McLean. Hmm. You didn't know it then, but this was one time, Holiday, you had your work cut out for you. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holiday's newest adventure. I guess I was asking for it when I put that ad in the Star Times. But I wasn't asking for what happened this time, and I don't want it again. You see, it was... Well, might as well start from the beginning, and Susie saying... Constance McLean. That's a pretty name, Mr. Holliday. Hmm. Well, what do you make of the letter, Susie? Make of it? Well, what do you mean? Well, take this line. I'm desperately in danger, I'm sure. Well, what about it? No, it sounds like something from an old melodrama. But it's thrilling. Maybe she is desperately in danger, Mr. Holliday. Why don't you find out? You think I should, huh? Sure. You'll be just like one of the old night irritants. <sighs> Night's errant, Susie. What's the difference? They both hunted for trouble, didn't they? Well, what's good enough for a night errant is good enough for me. I'm sorry I can't oblige you by dashing off on a white charge and wearing a tin suit. <laughs> but so long anyway, Susie. <laughs> The intersection of Gateway and Lakeview Boulevards was in the fashionable suburb of the city. 
The kind of a neighborhood where money is the root of the most important family trees. I looked at my watch. It was six exactly. Then I heard someone coming. I waited. It was about dark. The shadows of the trees kept me from seeing who it was whispering. But a couple of seconds later... I... Uh... Hello. Oh, good evening. You're, uh... Constance McLean. Oh, no. No, my name's Barbara Rodney. Uh, Constance is over there. Oh, I see. Well, I'm... I'm box 13. Uh-huh. Well, what's the matter? You're different. From what? From what we thought. You mean to tell me you got me all the way out here to see what I look like? Oh, no. Not at all, Mr. 13. I mean... Well, what is your name? Dan Holliday. Oh, that's nice. Wait a minute. Come on, honey. Oh, my goodness. Right up here. Mr. Holliday, this is Constance. Connie, how do you do? How are you? She stared at me and I stared back. She was about 17. Not pretty. But kind of a hungry face and eyes. I smiled at her and she smiled back. It's awfully nice of you to come, Mr. Holliday. Well, not at all. I think anyone would come on the strength of your letter, Connie. Can we go someplace and talk? I mean, we can't stand here on the corner, can we? We could, but sitting would be better. What do you suggest? How about... How about Smudgy Mary's? I beg your pardon? Well, Connie needs Smudgy Mary's play. Oh. Oh, I thought for a moment you said Smudgy Mary's. We can sit down there. They have tables, and we can talk. I've got to talk to you, Mr. Holliday. Just a minute, Connie. What kind of a place is this, Smudgy Mary's? It's nice. They serve ice cream and sundaes and malt. Oh, well, swell. Let's go. Is it within walking distance, or do we go in my car? Well, we can walk, can't we, Connie? Well, if, if you think it's safe for me. Safe? What's the matter? We'll go in your car, Mr. Holiday. On the way to Smudgy Mary's, I tried to draw Connie out. But she was determined to wait until we got to that paradise of ice cream and malts. The two kids chattered away, and I gathered they both went to a fashionable and ultra-ultra finishing school in the neighborhood. Then I found myself in Smudgy Mary. Kids were all over. Nice-looking kids. And the usual jukebox. Connie and Barbara guided me to a table in the back, and we sat down. What do you have, Mr. Holliday? Huh, that's especially of Smudgy Mary's. You want one? Mm, if you do, Connie. I... No, I don't think so. Just a lemonade. Barbara? Mm, a double malt with chocolate ice cream and whipped cream on top. I'll go over and tell Mary. <laughs> we call her smudgy because she's always got a smudge on her nose. I'll be right there. All right, Connie. Want to talk now? Right. Here. You read this. She took a crumpled piece of paper from a handbag shoved it across the table to me. I opened it. There was a message that read, if you don't get a thousand dollars from your parents, they'll never see you again. The letters were cut from magazine and newspaper print. I read it twice, then asked, how did you get this, Connie? It it came to the school for me. When? Yesterday. Just before I wrote the letter to you, Mr. Holliday. Who knows about this? Just Barbara. She's my best friend. Now you. All right, Connie. As soon as we leave here, we're going to the police. Oh, no, please. Please, Mr. Holliday, we mustn't. Why not? Well, if I did, well, well, Mother would have to know. Don't you think she should? No, she mustn't. Why not? Well, she... She isn't well, Mr. Holliday. With something like this, it would... Could it make her worse? But this is very serious, Connie. Then you help me. Now, look, Connie. You're not helping other girls who may be in your position someday. Let the person who wrote this get away with it this time, and he'll try it again. Mr. Holliday, if you go to the police, I'll, I'll kill myself. I stared hard at her. Her face was more hungry than ever, and her eyes were scared. Then Barbara came back to the orders. Here we are. I brought you a specialty, Mr. Holliday. Oh, uh, thanks, Barbara. Bad. Mr. Holliday wants to go to the police. <gasps> Sit down, Barbara. Yes, sir. Now, Connie, have you anything else to tell me? Well, I, I... Today, someone called me on the phone. It it was a man's voice. He said, I should have the money by the day after tomorrow or, or I'd be sorry. That's right, Mr. Holliday. 
I was there when the man called. Did you recognize his voice, Connie? No, I never heard it before. I'm sure. It it had kind of an accent. Do you know anyone that speaks like that? No, I, I said I didn't recognize him. Why your father and mother? They're, they're away. Where? In in Michigan. For how long? They'll be gone about two months. I see. This man said you'd have to get the money by the day after tomorrow. Is that right? Yes. For well, Mr. Holiday, I'm scared. Why are you afraid to go to the police, Connie? I'm afraid of what will happen if I do. To you? Yes. To me. Yes, she was scared, all right. She didn't touch a lemonade, and I couldn't touch the specialty of the house. You see, I wanted to be alive the next day. A little while later, we left Smudgy Mary's. We didn't say much. Connie, because she was scared. Barbara, because she was scared. And I? Because, well, I had an idea. It was after eight when we pulled up in front of the school where they lived in the dormitory. Connie and Barbara got out of the car. What should I do, Mr. Holliday? You sure that man said day after tomorrow? Oh, yes, I know he did. Hmm. All right, Connie, I'll do what I can. You'll help her, Mr. Holliday? Of course I will, Barbara. Now you two run along. I'll wait till you get inside. Go on now. I don't know how to thank you. Don't try. Just take it easy and don't worry. All right. Good night, Mr. Holliday. Good night, Connie. Barbara. Good night. I watched them until they went in. I was about to close the car door and drive away when... Mr. Holliday! Oh, Mr. Holliday! That was Connie. It didn't take long to cover the distance to the dormitory entrance. Connie! Barbara! Oh, Mr. Holliday! Look! It was under my door. This. I love the letter. Give it to me quick. Oh, here comes Miss Ogilvy. She's had mistress. Oh, please, Mr. Holliday, don't show her that letter. Please, don't tell. I don't know why I stuck that letter in my pocket. Maybe it was Connie's face. Absolute terror. But I ran the letter in my pocket just as... And what does it mean? Please, Miss Ogilvy. And sir, who are you? She looked at me, and I remembered my fifth-grade school teacher, the one who didn't like me. I looked at Connie. There was a desperate, please don't tell look on her face. Barbara was as white as a sheet. I decided to be hung for a sheep as well as a lamb, as Ogilvy repeated. Well, sir, if you please. Girls, into your rooms. Yes, ma'am. I'm waiting, sir. Uh, I'm in the wrong house. Really? And for which house were you looking? The, uh... The Smiths. Really? Where do they live? Uh, not here, I guess. I hope you have an explanation. Well, I'm afraid I don't. Hmm. All right, I'm waiting for a streetcar. Will that do? May I have your name? If you just forget all about this, I'll go quietly home and lie down for a while. I'm afraid I shall have to ask you to stay. That's very kind of you, Miss Ogilvy, but I have a previous engagement. If you try to leave, I shall ring the alarm and the caretakers will stop you. <sighs> All right. What do you want me to do? Nothing. But I'm going to call the police. All right, Holiday. All right. You were in the wrong house. Why? I told you, Kling, I made a mistake. Couldn't you tell a girl's school from a private home? Besides, there's no one in the neighborhood named Smith. How do you like that? 3,000 Smiths in that phone directory, and I picked the wrong neighborhood. You should have worn a ribbon in your hair, but nobody would have noticed you. Thanks, dear. You're pretty, too. Listen, this ogre beat preferred charges, trespassing, and a dozen other counts. She can make them stick. Cling, what if I said I had a good reason for being there, but I couldn't tell what it was? What would you say? The same thing I said two hours ago. Why? I can't tell you. I promised. All right, you'll spend the night in the jug. Unless I put up bail. Which I'll do. I could have told Kling, but I kept thinking about Connie. Maybe I believed her when she said she'd kill herself if I told the police. Anyway, I kept the whole thing to myself. The next morning, I went over the second letter she'd received. It read, you have one more day to get the money from your parents. One more day. That meant today. And that was all. I did a lot of thinking, and it added up to something very, very strange. I was thinking about it when the phone rang, and Susie answered it. Hello? Yes, just a minute. Mr. Holliday, Lieutenant Crane wants to talk to you. 
Oh? Okay, Susie, thanks. Hello? Yeah? What? When did you hear that? Okay, I'll be right over. Mr. Holiday, what's the matter? You look scared. I am, Susie. Maybe I've made a mistake. Connie McLean's disappeared. Now, back to Damsel in Distress. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Kling and I drove out to the school. He pondered at me to find out what I knew. And I told him about the letter then. I had to. He was mad. I guess he had a right to be. At the school, we sat across from Miss Ogilby and Barbara Rodney. All right, Miss Ogilby. Let's hear what happened. Barbara, please tell us what you know. Well, I... I woke up this morning. Connie and I have the same room. We know that, Barbara. Yes, ma'am. Well... I looked across to Connie's bed. She wasn't there. What time was this, Barbara? When I woke up, about 7.30. And you looked everywhere for her? Oh, yes, Miss Ogilby. What makes you think Connie disappeared? Constance has never been tardy for a class, Mr. Holliday. And I might ask what you know about this. Your actions last night... Barbara, will you leave, please? I'll talk to you later. Hey, Holliday. What's the idea? Please, Kling, I want to learn something. Is it all right, Miss Ogilby? I, uh... I suppose so. I'll be in my room. Now, Mr. Holliday. Shh. Cling. Uh, Tiptoe to the door. See if she's there. Huh? Please. Okay, okay. Oh, I'm going. I'll be in my room. Well, that's strange. I, I never suspected Barbara would do a thing like that. What's on your so-called mind, Holiday? Some questions. Miss Ogilby, do you know if Connie had any dates? Dates? Yes. Parties, dances. No, she didn't. Why? How about Barbara? Yes. They're very close to each other, aren't they? Inseparable. But what is this leading to? I don't know yet. Now about Connie's mother and father. Yes. Do they come to see her often? Not very. They do a great deal of traveling. Uh-huh. Thanks, Miss Ogilvy. Now, Holiday, you through playing games? No, not yet. Miss Ogilvy, isn't there some sort of dance coming up soon? I, I think I saw a notice on the bulletin board as I came through. Yes, next week. But really, I don't see how questions like these are going to find Constance. Oh, Kling. Yeah? What now? Are you going to ask me to the dance? Look, Kling, I'll get Connie back here, and no one will know anything's happened if Miss Ogilvy wears the... Uh, charges against me for last night. What? Miss Ogilby, you know it wouldn't be good for the school if this got in the papers, would it? Not at all. Oh, great. The poor kid's disappeared. She got those letters and you're worrying about the school. The letters gave her until tomorrow to get the money. All right, I've got all day. But I want to do this my way. Believe me, it's for Connie's sake. Well? I... Very well. I agree. All right with you, Kling? Oh, it has to be. Good. If I'm not back in 12 hours, bury me anyway. I was playing a hunch all the way to the finish line. If it worked, okay. If it didn't, then Dan Holliday was cooked like a hot dog at a barbecue. I had a couple of stops to make. The first one was at the Star Times. There I asked Mona, the society editor, a few questions. The McLean's? Are they the ones there? Uh Uh-huh. They got a daughter, Constance. That's right. And a hundred million or so. Where are they now? I can't tell offhand, but... Wait a minute. Back files should tell. Hmm. The Riviera, not here. Nice, not here. Monte Carlo, not here. Mona, please drop the opera glasses and get to the McLean's. (laughs) All right, Danny boy. Let's see... Ah, here we are. Mr. and Mrs. Randolph McLean have left for an extended vacation in Florida. Florida? You sure that's not Michigan? Well, if it is, the Florida Chamber of Commerce is going to be awful mad. Did they return you? No. You sure? Of course I'm sure. That's my job here, remember? Okay, Mona, thanks. 
Uh, remember you at Christmas. Once a year is all I ask. Fell on. There was another stop tonight. And strange as it may seem, it was to see a psychiatrist. Well, what he told me checked, but good. Then I made one more visit, this time to a telegraph office. I sent a wire to Connie's parents to charter a plane and come home at once. When that was done, I was all set except for one more little item. A long talk with Barbara. I got Miss Ogilvy's permission to take Barbara for a drive in my car. Mr. Holliday, why do you want to talk to me? Oh, maybe I just like to, Barbara. Where are we going? Is Smudgy Mary's open in the afternoon now? Yes. Okay. Let's you and I drop in for a lemonade or a malt. How about it? Well, I... I've really got to get back to school. Miss Ogilvy said it was all right for you to come with me. Oh. You didn't hear Connie leave the room this morning, did you? No, I didn't. And you're sure you looked all over for her? Oh, yes, everywhere. Uh-huh. Well, here's Smudgy Mary's. You know, Barbara, a diet like this will ruin my health. But come on. I... All right. Well, practically deserted. Is that Smudgy Mary? Yes, that's she. Mm-hmm. Two specials, Mary, please. Oh, really, Mr. Holiday, I don't think I can eat Let's any... Let's try the jukebox. Any particular number you'd like. No. Anyone's all right. Okay. Come on, we'll take this table over here. What do you want to talk about? Connie? What about her? Come on, Barbara. Why don't you tell me where she is? Because I don't know. I, well, I'll bet she's been kidnapped. Those awful letters. They said that Those she... letters wouldn't have fooled a baby, Barbara. No kidnapper is going to ask for a thousand dollars, not when the parents are worth millions. Well, maybe... Maybe he was scared. Could be. But that second letter under the door last night, the kidnapper put it there? But he must have. Mm-hmm. Well, how did he get in? Well, I guess he sneaked in. Barbara, no kidnapper goes around in brightly lighted halls shoving threatening letters under doors. I don't know where she is. Barbara, please tell me. (laughs) You won't tell anyone, will you, Mr. Holliday, please? I'll have to, Barbara. Maybe everything will come out all right. Now we'll save those smudgy Mary specials until later. Hmm? Right now, we're going to pick up Connie. How about it? All right, Mr. Holliday. Barbara and I drove out into the country and up where the lake sits in the hills. There were a lot of cabins around. Barbara directed me to one and I stopped the car. Is it, Barbara? Yes. You wait here. I walked up the path, up the porch stairs. Tried the door. It was unlocked. Mr. Holliday. Hello, Connie. How are you? (laughs) It's all right now, Connie. It's all right. Come on. We'll get back to town. Sure, everything was all right. I drove the two girls back into town. I didn't say a word. I dropped them at the school and then had a long talk with Miss Ogilvy. It was later that night when Lieutenant Kling and I walked into the McLean home. Mr. and Mrs. McLean had called from the airport. They said they'd be home in a few minutes. Connie and Barbara were upstairs. Miss Ogilvy, Kling, and I sat in the big living room. All right, Holiday. How about the plot? Going to get with it? I think we'll wait for the McLeans, huh? There won't be anything in the papers, will there? Mm, that depends on Lieutenant Kling, Miss Ogilvy. Why me? Listen, I still don't know who pulled the snatch. Clay? Oh, uh, I beg your pardon, Miss Ogilvy. What I mean By is... By snatch, the... you mean kidnapping. Yeah, that's right. You talk English. <laughs> oh, that'll be the McLeans. Miss Ogilvy, would you mind getting the girls down here? Certainly, Mr. Holliday. Connie, Where's I... my daughter? Where is she? Mr. McLean, my name is Holliday. I sent you and your wife that wire this morning. Where is she? Is she all right? Yeah, she's all right. She's coming down to... Mother! Connie! Daddy. Oh, darling. Oh, oh darling. Oh, Mr. Children. Holiday, we're so grateful. I can't tell it. you how much. Uh-huh, oh. we'll see. Connie. Yes, Mr. Holiday. Would you and Barbara wait outside? We'll only be a minute in here. Yes, sir. Come on, Barbara. Who did it? Who kidnapped her? 
You did. You and your wife. What? Mr. Holliday. What are you talking about? You're insane. No, I'm not. Now, listen to me. You have a daughter, but no one would ever know it. How often do you see her? Now, see here, Mr. Holliday. About once a year, you put her in a school and forget about her. Except when you think something's happened. Holliday, you can't talk to I'm me. I'm not like finished, Mr. McLean. That kid's lonely. And because she's, well, maybe you call it plain, she doesn't go out very much. Not many dates. I don't see what this is all about. You see, I talked with a psychiatrist today. Used a lot of fancy words, but they boil down to this. Connie wants and needs attention and affection desperately. She didn't get them here, so she thought of this scheme. Pretend to be kidnapped. Get attention called to herself. Then she'd come back with a story. She'd be in the limelight. And Barbara helped her because... Well, because she's her best friend. Now, wait a minute, Holiday. We'd have torn holes in her story. She wouldn't have gotten away with it. I know. That's why I didn't tell you right away. That's why I wanted to handle it my way. If this had gone to the police, the whole thing would have blown up for Connie. It would have been a newspaper story, ridicule for the girl. But this way... Well, let's give Connie a break. And Barbara. How about it, Clay? I, uh... Oh, uh, sure, I'm willing. Oh, thanks, Clay. You're a gentleman and a scholar. I'm a soft-hearted cop, um, Mr. Holliday. Yes, Mr. McLean? I guess my wife and I didn't realize how selfish we really were. We, we thought we were giving Connie all she ever wanted. Yes, all but one thing. The one that really mattered. Affection. Oh, I want to thank you and Lieutenant Kling. And, well, now I... I think I'll start what should have been started years ago. Sure. But you've got lots of time. Mind if I uh, I cut in first? What, what do you mean? No. You can start tomorrow. Meanwhile, I think I'll play this all the way. Huh? What are you up to now, Holiday? Practice what you preach, I always say. Connie. Oh, Connie. Yes, Mr. Holiday. Everything's all right in there. Nothing to worry about. For you either, Barbara. Oh, you're wonderful, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Barbara. Will, uh, will you excuse Connie and me for a moment? Huh? Oh, well, sure. Well, I'll be upstairs, Connie. Connie, about that dance. Got a date for it? Oh, sure, sure I have. Connie? Well, no, I haven't. Well, look, I'm... I'm just a little older than you are, and when I comb my hair and put on a tuxedo, I I look like I've been in the stag line a bit too long, but uh, do I get the day? You? Honest? We'll make a night of it. First the dance, then, even if it kills me, Smudgy Mary's for a special. time at the dance, Mr. Holiday? I was the belle of the ball, Susie. Everybody cut in on me to dance with Connie. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. But you didn't tell me one thing, Mr. Holiday. What's that, Susie? What's a smudgy Mary special? Oh, well, three scoops of chocolate ice cream, three strawberry, two vanilla. Oh. Slice four bananas and embalm them in pineapple syrup and lay them out neatly alongside the ice cream. Pineapple. Strawberry. Uh, let's see now. Oh, pour on two ladles of chocolate syrup, a huge gob of whipped cream. Mr. Holiday, I... Uh, wait. No, wait a minute. Wait. Then sprinkle with nuts with a few bits of shells left in and, and... What's the matter, Susie? I... I ate an awful big lunch. Good night, Mr. Holiday. <laughs> Ellen Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with original story by Russell Hughes and original music composed...
13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. You advertised for adventure? I have it for you. If you will go any place, I can offer Paris. If you will do anything, you are the man I need. If you're interested, call at my office any day between the hours of 10 a.m. Any day between the hours of 10 a.m. and noon. I am at 247 Wabash Place, signed William Martin. Paris. <laughs> Adventure. What a dream that could have been. It was, but the awakening was different. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13, and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Diamond in the Sky. Sounded great. A trip to Paris, and adventure for the frosting on the cake. Whoever Mr. William Martin was, he must have known that waving a deal like that in front of anyone was making it a sure thing. But Susie, as usual, had something to say. I don't know, Mr. Holliday. Maybe it's just somebody kidding you. Mm, that's the girl, Susie. Get out the wet blankets, spread them around. Then again, maybe this Mr. Martin is, is beyond approach. The word, Susie, is reproach. But I've got a brilliant idea. What, Mr. Holliday? It's all very simple. I go to see Mr. William Martin at 247 Wabash Place. <laughs> Wabash Place was one of those little streets filled with small businesses. But number 247 was by itself. No display window in front like the others. I found a bell button that had a card under it with William Martin engraved on it. One minute later, after introductions, I was looking across a desk at a short, stocky, apple-cheeked man who said, No one knows you have come here, Mr. Holiday? No, just my secretary. <gasps> oh, but she won't say anything. You're positive. I am. Oh, good. A uh, cigarette, Mr. Holiday. Oh, yes, thanks. And a uh, light. <coughs> you do not like my brand, huh? Uh, all this lax is a fuse. What's in it? <laughs> my special tobacco. Uh, but uh, here's an ashtray. Uh, thanks. Well, Mr. Martin, you wrote that letter to Box 13, and here I am. Ah, good. Down to business, then. He opened the drawer, took out a photograph, and slid it across the desk to me. What I saw was a picture of a diamond. But what a piece of ice. I was studying it when Martin spoke again. I see by your expression, Mr. Holliday, that you are properly impressed. Oh, I'm impressed, Mr. Martin. What is this, the Rock of Gibraltar or something? <laughs> Not quite. That is the Mirabilis diamond. Oh. You've heard of it then? Yes, yes, but how does it concern me? Now, here. These credentials will tell you who I am. William Martin. Well, that's my name, yes, but, uh, well, you look. Martin passed me a sheet of papers with his photo on them. He was William Martin, representative of Jason Van Vanderclef. Hmm, name sounded familiar. Martin read my expression again, and... Mr. Vanderclef is a diamond merchant. He has recently purchased the Mirabilis for a million dollars. That's a lot of hay for a lot of ice. I beg your pardon? <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Martin. The gem is in Paris. I am to get it and bring it over here. I see. And, uh, Box 13? You will go with me, Mr. Holliday. I have reservations for you on the... Oh, now, just a minute. I'm not a bodyguard, Mr. Martin, or a private detective. Uh, please, I... please. Nothing so crude, Mr. Holliday. No, I have a much better plan. But first, let me tell you something. There is no jewel thief in the world who would not risk everything to get the Mirabilis. He could never sell it. No, no. But it could be cut up, and any one of the smaller stones would more than repay the thief for their trouble. Yes, I guess you're right. Okay, where do I come in? Well, it is very simple. But like all simple things, it is brilliant. I thought of it. Mm, congratulations. Thank you. Now, you will pick up the diamond in Paris. I will go on the same plane, but we shall be complete strangers to each other. Do you begin to see Mr. Holliday? Sure. If anyone's wise that you're going over to get the stone, they'll follow you. Exactly. But I won't have it. You will. 
I shall stroll around Paris as a, as a tourist. Anyone following me will be, uh, shall we say, following a red mackerel? <laughs> All right, let's say it. Oh, uh, but there's only one thing wrong. Wrong? I did not think of something important? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, me. Suppose this plan doesn't fool anyone. Then I'm set up like a clay pigeon. You lose the Mirabilis, and I'm just another claim for the insurance company. Oh, no, no, I love You have no worry. Oh, maybe I worry easily, Mr. Martin. Especially if I'm carrying a million dollars worth of bait. Mr. Holiday, only you and I know of this. There can be no leak of information unless you tell someone. <laughs> oh, sure, I'll go around telling everyone that Dan Holiday's a setup. Here I am, fellas. Come and get me. <laughs> That's right. And thieves would kill to get the diamond. They have already. Why, I can tell you the history of the stone. Calcutta, murder. London, murder. Vienna, two deaths. Uh, Mr. Martin, skip the cook's tour of the morgue, will you? But you advertised for adventure, Mr. Holiday. You will go any place, do anything. Well? Touché. A little below the belt, but touché. And you've added one more to the population of Paris. Martin's plan was simple, and if it worked, a good way to get the Mirabilis into the United States. I said, if. Hey, who invented that word? Well, it was three days later that I was ready to leave. Passport okay, papers in order, and a phone call from Martin warning me not to recognize him when we were on the plane. I gave instructions to Susie and left for the airport. <laughs> later, I was out over the Atlantic. Martin sat well in front of me and never once looked back. So I played it his way, and beyond a quick look, paid no attention to him. Then, as I was suddenly down to watch the ocean go past underneath, Mr. I... Holiday? Mr. Dan Holiday? Uh, yes, I'm Holiday. I'm Irene Carson, your stewardess. Oh, how are you? Fine. And you? Wonderful, thank you. Good. Here's a letter for you. Letter? You're sure it's for me. Mr. Holiday, seat 19, flight 12. Check all the way through on that. All right, thanks, Miss Carson. You're welcome, sir. Oh, Miss Carson. Is there something you want? Well, just an answer to a question. Who gave you this? Well, no one. It was among last-minute letters and packages and gifts for our passengers. Oh, I see. Well, thanks again, Miss Carson. Not at all, Mr. Holiday. The letter was from Martin, brief and to the point. I was to go to an address in Paris and stay there until he called. Well, Mr. Martin was playing them close to his vest. Maybe he didn't trust me. <laughs> and who could blame him? With a million dollars worth of diamond for an ante, he wasn't dealing all the cards at once. Well, all I had to do was wait until morning in Paris. Early next morning, we landed at the Bourget Field. I stuck close behind Martin leaving the plane, but he didn't give me a tumble, so, well, I guess my cue was to hold up at the address mentioned in the letter until he got in touch. I was trying to flag down a taxi when... Is this the last time you saw Paris, Mr. Holiday? Oh, hello there, Miss Carson. <laughs> Looks like you're having trouble. Yes, a little. Say, um, how do you get one of these rounded grasshoppers to stop? You wave in French, like this. Oh, just like that, huh? <laughs> just like that. Teach me to wave like that, and I'll be able to get a taxi in Paris. Of course, if you lend me your face. <laughs> There's nothing to it. Oh, I um, I almost forgot. I came out here to find you. Oh? Something wrong? Passport? Papers? No, or... but I believe this is yours. How did you get this? I found it on the floor of the plane just after you left. Oh? What's the matter? I... Nothing. Can I give you a lift? No, thanks. I have my reports to make out. Maybe some other time if we're still in Paris, huh? Well, I'll be for three days before the hop back to the States. No, I see. Well, thanks a lot, Miss Carson. I'll be seeing you. I hope so, Mr. Holliday. She walked away from me in my hand. It was the letter from Martin telling me where to stay until I heard from him. I hopped into the cab, gave the driver the address, and then leaned back in the seat to do some thinking. The letter was in my inside coat pocket. Pretty hard for me to fall out of there. But my coat had been on a hanger, and I'd been away from it just long enough for anyone to pick up that letter. So, if anyone was wise to the way the game was being played, Martin was home safe, while I stood a better than even chance of being picked off a first base. Mm -hmm.
A half hour later, I was sitting in the little room at the address given me when... Yes? Uh, we? Hello. What do you think? Yes? Oh, Martin? Yes. Everything was all right? Uh, fine. Now what? You are sure no one knows where you are? Well, I... Holiday. All right, no one knows. Now what? Here is an address. Go to it. There you will pick up the package. Okay. Now, don't write this down. Remember it. Please. All right. All right, I can remember it. 45, Rue de la Guerre. 45... No, 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 no. Do not repeat it there. Just remember it. All right, all right. Please, Mr. Holiday, you understand my concern. Look, my neck's out of yard too, Martin. Of course, of course. Now listen. There is a Monsieur Corey. Ask for him. Identify yourself with these words. I've come from the sky. You hear that? I got it. Then what? There will be no question. Those words are our code. Now, I am registered at the Vendôme Hotel. Leave the package for me at the desk. Just like that, I leave a package for... I know what I am doing. Now, that is all. The rest is up to you, Mr. Holiday. Okay. And, uh, Mr. Holiday. Yes, what now? For your sake, I sincerely hope nothing goes wrong. And now, back to Box 13 and Diamond in the Sky with Alan Ladd as Dan Holiday. The rest was up to me, Martin said. All I had to do was collect a marvelous diamond, see that I wasn't caught off base, deliver it to Martin, and then that was all. I hailed a cab on the street. Uh, Captain Saint saint Rue de la Guerre. Pete. Governor, with an accent like that, just talk English. Oh, uh, guess it wasn't very good, huh? Are you an American? No, we're Londoners, from Limehouse. Hop in, sir. That was 45 Rue de la Guerre, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. How did you know I was American? You kidding? I drove a cab three years in Brooklyn. He wants to know how I know he's an American. Okay, Limehouse. Then you should know what this means. Step on it, never mind the tickets, huh? Blimey, I ain't heard that since the days in Flatbush. Hold on, pal. Here we go. You're here, Governor. Want me to wait? Yeah, and keep that motor hot. Hey, what's up? I don't know. Something hot? Just wait. Okay, Governor. I'll be here. I went into the house, asked for Monsieur Corre. Gave him the code words, I've come from the sky. And without a word, he went to the fireplace, lifted out a brick and handed me a velvet case. Well, after all this, I... I had to take a look. Inside the case, well, the marvelous looked like a piece of something that would make any crook risk his neck. Or mine. I snapped the case shut. Ray said nothing, just watched me. Showed me out. All right, Limehouse. Bond home hotel on the way. Don't bother to fly along. I don't know what this is all about, sir. But when you went in that house, that car pulled up back of us and stopped. Huh? And they kept their motor up, too. Limehouse was right. It looked as though somebody had talked to not me and said not Michael. We pulled away the big car tail after us. Limehouse turned his head to talk to me. They're tailing us, all right. Can you get away? With this act? The three cylinders still work and I got asthma. You gotta make it. What did you do? Pinch the crown jewels? You're warm. Step on and do your best, will you? Did you pull a heist? No. Okay, you've got an honest face. All right, Governor. There's nothing keeping this act together but termites holding hands. But here we go. The big car in the back didn't lose an inch. Limehouse and I had to go through an empty stretch of road. So I told him I thought that's where the mugs in the big car would make their pitch and... That's you're right, but I've got an idea. Well, I can use it. Listen, look down the street. See that turn to the right? Yeah. I'll get close to the curb as I can, and you get ready for a jump. Huh? Jump? Sure. I'll act like I'm going straight. But where I showed you, I'll turn fast to the right. You jump out, roll in the doorway or something. Well, what about you? I'll make a U-turn back out and pull the mugs down the street after me. You got it? Got it. Or uh, here's your fare. Plus. <laughs> Ain't had so much fun since Tony Island. Okay, pal. Try for the brass ring. Nah! Attaboy, Limehouse. It worked. 
I collected a few bruises, but I still had the diamond. Farther down the road, Limehouse stopped. He had to because the boys in the big car angled in front of his cab. I waited long enough to make sure Limehouse was going to keep his health. Then I doubled back and forth until I came out on the main street. There I took a bus. I, I felt like having lots of people around. I got to the Vendome Hotel, walked to the desk, and told the clerk I wanted to leave a package for Monsieur William Martin. Oh, brother, I got the surprise of my life when the clerk told me there was no Monsieur William Martin registered there. Well, I sat down to figure that one out. Then, just when I was about to give up, I... Holiday. No, no, no. Don't look at me. Martin. What the devil? Pretend that you are not speaking to me. Now, you have the stone? Yes, but I almost did that. What happened? It's a long story. You want to hear it now? No, no, no. We have not enough time. Look, I will put part of my newspaper on the sofa between us. Then, when no one is looking, put the diamond under the paper. Okay, then what? After a minute, I will pick up the newspaper and leave. Oh, and I hope this ice goes with you, Mr. Martin. <laughs> it will. Don't worry. Well, that looked like it. All finished. Uh, I got a chickens that weren't there. A half hour later, I went to the room of my hotel. I just had the door open when... I woke from my deep dream of peace with a knot on my head and a distaste for the whole proceedings... And the room? Well, it was in shambles. Somebody had fine combed it after drumming on my head. The manager knew nothing about it. Well, that made us even because I, I couldn't figure why somebody took the trouble to slug me and search the room when I didn't have the diamond. Unless... Unless somebody thought I was still carrying it. That somebody? I had an idea... Forty minutes later, I was sitting across from Irene Carson at a little sidewalk cafe. Mr. Holliday, you, you're you insane. I will be after another knock on the head. But why do you accuse me? Because no one but Martin knew where I was going to stay in Paris. And you. But this is ridiculous. How should I know? The letter you said dropped out of my pocket. It did drop from your pocket. And I did not read it. Really, I, I think this is a ridiculous story. A Mr. Martin who wasn't at his hotel to, to pick up a diamond worth a million dollars. Men chasing you, hitting you, searching your room. And now, simply because I had my hands on a letter, you accuse me of a... Who else knew? You're Mr. Martin. And that's another thing. I never saw you with anyone on that plane. You spoke to no one. You got off alone. Really, Mr. Holiday, it's a fantastic story. No one saw me with Martin. Exactly. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get back to Le Bourget. You've taken up too much of my time already. I... All right, Miss Carson. But will you do me a favor? What? Confess to the whole thing? Admit I'm a notorious international jewel thief? No, I... Just get me on a plane back to the States. Look, I... uh, I apologize. All right. All right, I accept the apology. And I'll do my best to get you out of Paris. You, um, you seem to be allergic to trouble here. You're so right, Miss Carson. You're so right. After that rig roll in Paris, New York's LaGuardia Airport sure looked good to me. I was leaving the field when... Welcome home, Holiday. Well, Kling, what a nice surprise. I've got more. Come on. Hey, wait a minute. What is this? You're a writer. Write a line for yourself now. What are you talking about? I'm talking about a pinch, Holiday, which this is. Arrested? Now, wait a minute. It didn't make sense. Nothing made sense. On the way into the city, Kling wouldn't say a word. For every question I asked, he growled. But finally in his office... Where's the diamond, Holiday? Diamond. Mirabilis, Schmirabilis. Where is it? I smuggled it in, Kling. So you got through customs. Now quit stalling. Where is it? Are you kidding? A million in ice and nobody, kids. Nobody. Now, wait a minute. Why did you pick me up? I stopped in at your office to say hello, and Susie told me that you were in Paris. Yesterday we got word from Jason Vandercliff that the Mirabilis diamond he was to get from Paris hasn't shown up. We checked with the Paris police. A guy named Corey. Describe me. Is that it? 
Yeah. Susie tells me you're in Paris. Corey describes you, and two or two make four. Now start talking. Well, I told Kling the story, starting with Martin's letter to Box 13 and ending with my return to the States. Can you prove that yarn? Get Martin and ask him. That'll be a little tough. He's dead. What? Yeah. When did you leave for Paris? The day before yesterday. Martin's body was found in the river that day. We didn't get an identification until yesterday. Vandercliff identified him. Clingy, you're, you're crazy. I tell you, Martin went to Paris on the same plane with me. Here's Martin's photograph. Take a good look. This isn't Martin. Vandercliff ought to know. His own agent. And the Martin... The Martin I went with was a fake. Yeah. He probably killed the real Martin. Took his place, used his own photo and the credentials he showed you. I... Whew. Uh, that's a brilliant remark. Uh, but the crooks who chased me in Paris, my being hit over the head after I got the diamond, I... Yeah. It's easy to figure now. Your fake Martin sent those hoods after you to get the diamond. And get rid of you for good so you couldn't identify him. That's why he wasn't registered at the hotel, because he didn't expect me to show up at the diamond. And the crack over the head, your, your room, sir. Sure, sure, sure. When I got away from his boys, he sent them to my room, thinking I might go back there before I went to the Bon Dome. I walked in while they were searching the room, and they slugged me. I, but don't you see, Kling, I, I'm in the clear. Yeah? How? Well, because I had nothing to do with the... the, the Holiday, the... you've got your story. But only Martin can keep you out of jail. Then you've got to find Martin. How? He must have taken an earlier flight from Paris. But how could he get the diamond through customs? I don't know. You know, Holiday, this looks like the end of Box 13 for you. Martin loses himself in a city of seven million, lays low and leaves you to take the rap. What if I find him? You'll still have to make him talk. Listen, Kling. You know I've never been mixed up in anything shady. Maybe I've been roped in because I follow things through, but, but never deliberately. What are you getting at? Well, will you let me find Martin? How? You're our only link with him. And you don't know a thing about him. He could dye his hair, leave off his glasses. I know, I know. But uh, but if I don't find him, I'm in, I'm in trouble. Is that right? You've never been more right in all your life. All right. If I don't find him in 24 hours, I'll walk back in here and you can do what you want with me. Is that a deal? Uh, you know, Holiday, when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a cop. My father wanted me to be a sign painter. Now I realize my father was a smart man. All right. Go ahead. A needle in a haystack. I was hunting for and it was a pretty sharp needle. Any character who could think up a frame as neat as this one would be tough to locate, if he was still in town. But I had to go ahead. It took me two hours to remember something that would help me. Seven hours more to follow it up and an hour to get hold of Irene Carson and take her with me. Then call Kling and give him the setup. It was later that night that I knocked on the door. Yes? Who is it? Telegram from Mr. Benjamin Slade. Oh, one moment, please. Hello, Martin. Huh? I used to be a salesman. I'm good at sticking my foot in doors. Who are you? Mother Hubbard, and I've come to take a look in your cupboard, Mr. Martin. <laughs> my name is Slade. Benjamin Slade. So... You did dye your hair. And you're much prettier without glasses. I have never seen you before in my life. Yes, but I've seen too much of you. Come on, Slater. or Martin, give it up, will you? What brought you here? One of your peculiar cigarettes. I remembered I tried to smoke one when I first met you. <laughs> you're insane. Yeah? I went to your fake office in Wabash Place. There was an ashtray with some cigarette butts still in it. It took me seven hours to run down a dealer who makes your cigarettes. Clever. But I still deny ever having seen you before in my life. Oh? Okay, let's try something else. Come in, please, will you? Martin, this is Miss Carson. Our steward is on the trip over, remember? Mm -hmm. Miss Carson, is this the man who gave you the letter to give to me? I... Yes, that's the man. I did not... Oh, 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 oh. oh. Slips count in this game, Martin. Besides, your handwriting in the letter can be identified. You're too much too clever. Dr. Carson? Oh. 
Okay, Martin, without a gun, you're just another sitting duck. Now get up and come on. But, Mr. Holliday, how did Mr. Martin get the diamond over here? <laughs> he was too smart for that, Susie. He left it in Paris. He got out and planned to return later. The Paris police have found it. You know, <laughs> he was pretty silly. Silly? Oh, how'd you figure that out, Susan? Well, a million dollars. Jeepers, look at all the income tax he'd have to pay on it. Huh? Oh. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with an original story by Sal Shore, adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. To Box 13, care of Star Times. Dear Dan, if this is the way you want it, okay. If a pal and buddy has to reach you the hard way, all right. Enclosed is a ticket to my fight with Brennan tomorrow night. I'd like to see your mug at ringside. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muss it up. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muss it up for you. Johnny Capella. Johnny Capella, a kid when I first met him, fighting in a different way. At Anzio. And maybe, just maybe, Anzio wasn't as hard for him to take as what happened right here. And now back to Box 13 and Dan Holiday's newest adventure, Double Right Cross. Johnny Capelli, contender for the middleweight crowd, a big overgrown kid with a smile full of white teeth and a heart full of kindness for everybody. Johnny Capelli? I never heard of him, Mr. Holliday. Well, you don't read the sport pages, Susie. But you know him, huh? Uh-huh. We played duck on a rock on the beach at Anzio for keeps. <laughs> I saw him a little while ago. Told him my box 13 idea, and I guess he saw the ad in the star time. And you're going to fight, huh? Yes, that's it, Susie. Did he send you a bedside seat? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing I can do with that one. So long, Susie. In the driving rain, I headed to the stadium. And my cab ran fenders first into a traffic jam. Well, There's no use trying to get through, so I paid off the cabby and started to plow the rest of the way to the stadium. I looked at my watch two minutes after ten. The first round of the fight was underway. By the time I hit ringside, people were already on their feet leaving. There was booing. And talk. Capelli knocked out. Capelli acted like a fourth raider. Johnny Capelli laid down. I pushed my way back to the dressing rooms with a little knot of people around one door, and a girl was rattling the knob and calling. Johnny, Johnny, please open the door. Johnny. What's the matter? What's going on? Uh, how are you? Report up, beat it. No, I'm a friend of Johnny's. Who are you? His manager. I mean, I was, but not after tonight. He loses one fight, and you're quitting. Yeah, like he did. When he comes out of there, tell him he can take this contract and tell him. You're Helen, aren't you? Yes. Please go away. Johnny can't see any reporters now. Please go, will you? I looked at him. So this was Helen. 
The girl Johnny dreamed about, talked about, raved about, and talked some more about. All the while, he and I were trying to miss the casualty list in Italy. The girl he sent a diamond brooch, bought with a year's pay, he hoarded like a miser. Well, if looks counted, she was worth it. She rattled the knob again. And... Please, Johnny. It's Helen. Johnny. May I try? Johnny. Johnny, this is Dan. Dan Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, yes, you recognize the name? Oh, yes, Johnny spoke of you. <laughs> What's the matter with Johnny? He won't come out, Holiday. Oh, who are you? Helen's brother. You see, you can get Johnny out of there, Holiday. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny Capelli. It's Dan, Johnny. Is there any other way out of this dressing room? Yeah, the window. This is the ground floor. He could have got out of the window. Look, both of you, Helen and... Uh, um... Name's Eddie. Yeah, all right, Eddie. Get somebody with a key to open this door. Go ahead, Eddie. Step on it. Okay, be back in a minute. Now, what's all this about, Helen? Oh, I don't know. As soon as the fight was over, it came... He was conscious? Yes, he walked, but we got the door here, and he broke ahead of me and ran in and locked the door, and I just... All right, Helen. All right. Now, take it easy. We'll find out what's happened. When we got into the dressing room, Johnny was gone and Eddie was right. The window was open. I couldn't figure it. Johnny Capelli, a kid whose courage was A+. Plus. A kid who went through Anzio, Salerno, Casino. Sure, he was scared, like just like the rest of us. But he didn't whimper. And he didn't run out ever. He just didn't figure. And Helen didn't make it any more clear. No, I don't know. I don't know why he ran away. Well, oh, take it easy, sis. Johnny must have had a reason. Yes, he must have. Now, listen, where'd he go? Well, if he's not at the hotel, I, I don't know. Well, he called there. That's no good. Any other place, think. I, I don't know of any. All right. Uh, where can I get in touch with you later? 387 Christopher Place. Good. You wait there. I'll find Johnny. It was tough, but I finally tracked on a cab driver who remembered picking up a man back at the stadium. Seemed, well, drunk, he said. Took him to a little hotel on the other side of town. It could be Johnny, so I went there and... Go away. Johnny. Get out. Listen to me, Johnny. This is Dan. Dan Holiday. Dan? Yeah, let me in, Johnny. No, go away. Just go away, will you? What are you trying to do, Johnny? Nothing. Please, will you go away? Look, kid, let me in or I'll break in. Johnny. How are you, Dan? Where's the light? Don't turn it on. Don't, Dan. Okay, Johnny. No light. Close the door. Why'd you come? Why do you think? Listen, nobody else knows where I am, do they? No, nobody. Helen? No. Where is she? Home, waiting waiting for me to call her. But you're not going to. What's the matter, Johnny? Dan, I... I'm sick. What do you mean? I don't know. Look, Dan, it was swell of you to come. There's nobody I'd want to see any more than you, but... Not now, Dan. Some other time, but not tonight. You're going to tell me what's wrong, Johnny. All right. Turn on the light and take a look. Johnny. Yeah. Better with the light off, isn't it? Now, listen, you took a beating. You're hurt, kid. Hurt badly. I've got to get a doctor. No. I said yes. No, you got a doctor, so help me, Dan. I'll kill you. I'll... Uh... Johnny. Hello, desk clerk. Listen, get a doctor to room 10 right away. And that means right now. All right, Mr. Holliday. He'll sleep for a while now. How long before he wakes up, doctor? Five, six hours, maybe longer. How badly is he hurt? Well, it's hard to tell. He took quite a beating. Uh, who is he? A uh, friend of mine. I see. Fight? Yeah, sort of. Well, I, uh... Look, doctor, as long as there's no gunshot wound, you... You don't have to report this, do you? No, but, uh... Well, let's leave it that way, then, huh? You'll be back in the morning? Yes. I'll make a more thorough examination, then. He was too hysterical to do much with tonight. 
But I think he'll be calmer when he awakens. Then there's nothing... nothing too bad. I don't think so. Bruises, contusions, and his eyes. I, uh... What's wrong with his eyes? I'll see you in the morning. Uh, good night, Miss Holliday. Good night. Thanks, Doctor. I sat by Johnny's bed and watched. I... I didn't call Helen because... Well, for some reason, Johnny didn't want anybody to know. To know what? Maybe I'd find out when Johnny came, too. Maybe he wouldn't tell me. And I just couldn't see Johnny running out on anything. There had to be something wrong. Something big. I sat in a chair alongside the bed and thought about it. And I guess I fell asleep because the next thing I knew, I... Huh? Oh, oh, just a minute. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor. Is he still sleeping? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Maybe for another hour or so. But I'll wait. Thanks. He'll be all right? Well, I'd like to ask him a few questions when he awakens. I don't think there's anything seriously wrong, but, uh... Well, I'll wait. What are you getting at? I don't know. You'll have to wait, too. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll go out and get some coffee. You can use some, too, can't you? Yes, thanks. I'll be right back. I thought I'd be right back. But when I got down to the street, something changed my plans. There was a newsstand, and the first thing that hit my eye was a sub-headline. It said, Boxing Commission holds up Capelli purse. Capelli disappears after fight fiasco. I hurried to a phone, called the Star Times, got a few strings pulled, and a half hour later, I was sitting across from the commissioner at his home. Just exactly what interest do you have in this, Mr. Holliday? I'm a friend of Johnny's. I see. All right. You must have something important to tell me this early in the morning. I want you to tell me something, Commissioner. What? Why is the commission holding up Johnny's purse? Because we believe the fight was not quite on the level. Meaning... Do you think Johnny threw it? We don't know. We're going to look at the movies this morning. Johnny didn't throw that fight. Did you see it? No, I didn't, but well, I... Then how do you know? Oh, because I know Johnny. That's your only reason? I think it's enough, Commissioner. Look, Mr. Holliday, we have one job to do. Keep the boxing game fair and square as a service to the fans who pay their money to see good, clean sport. Capelle was a ten-to-one favorite last night. A big bet placed on Brennan would bring a lot of money to anyone. Meaning Johnny might have bet on Brennan? It's been done. And the commission is in business to see that it doesn't happen anymore. Until Capelli proves otherwise, we'll say he threw that fight. I didn't believe it. But Johnny lost. He lost badly. And he did run out and he, and he wouldn't tell why. I went back to the little hotel and ran into the doctor who was just leaving. Oh, Mr. Holliday. That cup of coffee took a long time. It wasn't coffee. How's Johnny? He'll be all right. That all? No. Last night when I examined him, something puzzled me. What? His eyes. Pupils dilated. And? This morning when I examined him again, I asked a few questions. What about? Your friend had every symptom of bellamine poisoning. Last night, the pupils of his eyes were dilated, and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. That would affect his sight, wouldn't it? Yes. Taken internally, bellamine is poisonous. Quarter grain enough is fatal. And less than that? Dryness of throat, nervousness. In other words, if someone gave him bellamine, he'd, he'd have a hard time seeing. Very difficult. And if he were a boxer? Well, <laughs> if he were a boxer and went in the ring with his eyes in that condition, he wouldn't be able to see his opponent. <laughs> to Box 13 and Double Right Cross with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So Johnny lost the fight because he couldn't see Brennan. But why did he run out? Why didn't he want anyone to see him? I, I thought I was going blind, Dan. 
Brown was just a shadow that was beating me. Well, why didn't you quit? Why didn't you say something? Because Tom? I didn't want anybody to know. If it was going to be that way, I'd take it alone. Uh, noble, huh? Look, Dan, I waited a long time for that fight. You meant a crack at the title. Helen waited with me. If I was going blind, I wasn't going to let her know. Stick with me. Sure, sure. A kid like you would think that way. Now, listen to me, Johnny. Somebody fed you the stuff to impair your sight. Somebody who wanted you to lose that fight. Who? You're crazy, Dan. What did you eat yesterday? Eat? The day of the fight? Nothing. Just a little breakfast. And the rest of the day? Nothing. Liquids? Water? Milk? Of course not. No fighter fills himself up with liquids. Makes him logy, heavy on his feet. But, Johnny, the bellamine had to be given to you just before you went into the ring. Any earlier in the day, and the effect would have worn off before the fight. Look, why don't you lay off, Dan? I'm telling you, I, I didn't eat anything or drink anything, not for hours before the fight. But you had to. No, 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 I know what I did. I, look, maybe it was my eyes. Maybe it is what I thought. I got hit in Italy, Dan. Maybe... It's not that. The doctor knows what he's talking about, Johnny. Somebody fed you that stuff. Who? You tell me. Nobody. I didn't eat, drink. Do I have to go over all that again? No, but I am. You wait here, Johnny. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite over Brennan. And somebody played that for all it was worth. And it looked like it was worth a lot of money if the bet was big enough. A little while later, I was talking to Brennan. You're crazy, Holiday. Well, uh, maybe the guy wasn't in shape. Look, Brennan, Johnny was in condition. So you're telling me that somebody doped him? Meaning me? No, no, no. I'm just asking. And I'm telling. I got 120 fights on a clean sheet. None of them were shady. I don't play that way. I'm not saying that. I'm only trying to find out who could have given Johnny that drug. Well, I wasn't near his dressing room. I didn't, didn't even see him after we weighed in that afternoon. All right. It, it had to be in his food. Food? No fighter's going to eat right before a match. A drink water? He just rinses his mouth. That's all. What else, Brennan? If he's training right, nothing else. But, but if he gets thirsty... I told you, he just rinses his mouth. He drinks water, makes him heavy. That's why a fighter chews gum all day. It gives him a more... Gum? Yeah, gum. Why? Gum. That's it, Brennan. That's it. Sure, I chewed gum all day. Before the fight in your dressing room? I must have been chewing gum. I remember that... Go ahead, Johnny. What were you going to say? Nothing. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Look, there's only one way the drug could have been given to you. Now, you've got to think. Who gave you gum just before you went in that ring? I didn't have any. Johnny, what are you hiding? Nothing. You were going to say something a second ago. Did Baker, your manager, give you... No. Who else was with you? Just Baker. I was Helen. Shut up, Dan. Did she give you any gum? Forget the whole thing. I'm going blind, that's all. Ah, oh, you're not. Beat it. Helen gave you that gum. She was in your dressing room before the fight, wasn't she? Cut it out, Dan. That's why you shut up before you remembered. And the chewing gum was the only way the drug could be given to you. Because you didn't eat, you didn't drink water or anything else before you went in that ring. But maybe 15 minutes before, Helen handed you the gum, didn't she? Shut up, Dan. Shut up and forget the whole thing. Come on, Johnny. She gave you the gum, didn't she? Didn't she? You, uh, you still got a good right, Johnny. I'm sorry, Dan. Sure. Sure, let's forget it. But I didn't want to forget it. I left Johnny and went to see Baker's manager. I didn't tell him what I'd found out. I just listened. Sure, I brought the kid up from the ham and egg plums. But after last night, we've washed up. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, a match with the champ next. Did you bet on Johnny? I never bet. Even if you thought Johnny was going to win? What are you driving at? That somebody was stood to make a killing if Johnny lost. You're asking for a cloud holiday. I just had one. What about Helen? Now, what about her? All right, Baker, here are the cards. Johnny went in the ring last night, a sure bet to lose. What? Yeah, that's right. He was drugged. He couldn't see Brennan from the first bell until he was counted out. He was fighting on instinct and courage. Listen, what are you giving me? There was nobody in his dressing room but me and... And Helen? 
Yeah. Now, what about her? Nothing. Except once I walk in on the two of them and... Well, they was having a fight. What about? They clammed up when I walked in, but I heard something about a brooch. Brooch? Diamond brooch? The one Johnny sent her from Italy? Maybe. All I know is what I said. That's enough. Thanks, Baker. Maybe you'll have a champ on your hands yet. The next stop was to see Helen. I, I wasn't sure how to handle this. And all I had to go on was the fact that Johnny was covering for her. Why? And they'd had a fight over that brooch. Again, why? So the big question was, did she or did she not double-cross Johnny? Her first words to me were... Dan, you found Johnny. Maybe. Maybe, but what do you mean? Sit down, Helen. What's the matter? Is he all right? He'll be all right. He's he's in a little hotel. Well, then take me there. I want to see him, Dan. Maybe he doesn't want to see you. What? Johnny, now... Did he say that? No. Well, what are you doing? Why don't you take me to him? Why are you talking like this, Dan? How much did you win on the fight, Helen? What do you mean? I watched her face closely after I asked that. Either she was the new Sarah Bernhardt or she was in the clear. For a couple of seconds, she stared at me and then... That's a filthy thing to say. Yes, I know, but I've got something to find out. And what did you hope to find out by asking me that? I hope to find out who made a killing on the fight by making Johnny a setup for Brennan. He was ten to one. Good odds for somebody who'd lay a good-sized bet on Brennan. You mean you... You think I'd bet against Johnny? Did you? That's not worth answering. All right, look. Johnny was knocked out because he was drugged. He couldn't see. And he was drugged only a few minutes before he went into the ring. Baker? No, a manager who's bringing up a champion doesn't sell him out. And, and that leaves only me, is that it? Maybe. And I bet everything I had on Brennan. Is that your story? What's yours, Helen? I have none. If that's what you believe, believe it. But tell me where Johnny is. I promised I wouldn't. You promised? Oh, no, Johnny can't believe I... Where's that brooch he sent you? Brooch? Yeah, that's right. The one he sent from Italy. A $3,000 brooch would bring about 1500 in a pawn shop. And 1500 at 10 to 1. <laughs> well, seems to be my day for taking it. I'm sorry. Didn't you give Johnny chewing gum just before he went into the ring? What did you say? Chewing gum. Johnny wouldn't tell me, but I know you gave it to him. I... Yes. You... You admit it? Yes. Huh. That was the only way he could have been drugged. And you admit it? Yes, I admit it. Doesn't make sense. All right, it doesn't make sense. You're so right, Mr. Holliday. Nothing makes sense. Nothing. Now go back and tell Johnny. Tell everybody. Go on. Well, this I couldn't get. Two of them. Johnny and Helen knowing it must have been the gum and Johnny not wanting to tell me. Then Helen coming right out and saying she gave it to him. Okay, there was one answer, and I hunted for it in the shape of that brooch. I called Lieutenant Kling at headquarters and got him to do me a favor. It took almost the rest of the day, but late that afternoon. Brooch? Uh, yes, yes, the police called, but I, I assure you I did not receive stolen goods in my shop. The, the police know that I... So don't you're in the that... clear now, don't worry. Has the brooch been redeemed yet? Uh, no, no. Look, uh, all I want to see is a slip and who signed the brooch in. Well, here, I, I have it ready... I thought it would be the police who would come. I, it's right here. Here. Here you are. There's no mistake about this. Oh, no, no. I I let him have a thousand dollars on it. A thousand? And you're sure? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, there. There's where he signed his name. Uh, John, uh, uh, John Capelli. No, that couldn't be right. Unless... Unless Johnny was afraid he couldn't make a fake fight look good. And wanted to make sure. But where did Helen figure? And why? Why? Then it hit me. Johnny protects Helen. Helen admits she did it. It made so little sense it began to clear. I checked with betting agents and found one who took a bet on Brennan. A bet of $1,000 at 10 to 1. 
He remembered who placed the bet, so... Well, that gave me one more call to make. Back, I went to Helen's apartment. Hello. Yes? Oh, hi, Holiday. Come on in. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Your sister home? No. Uh, grab a chair. Haven't you seen her? Oh, yes, yes, earlier. Aren't you going to ask me about Johnny? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, where is he? I know. Well, well, what about him? I mean, he's okay, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's okay. Oh, that's swell. You know, Holiday, I couldn't figure a guy like Johnny doing something like that. No, neither could I, Eddie. That's why I knew he didn't. What? Here, Eddie, uh, have a stick of gum. I... Oh, no, I, I never use it. Good for the nerves. Yeah, that's what they say. Well, that's what you come to see me about, huh? Maybe. You like to gamble, don't you, Eddie? Gamble? Oh, sometimes. Why? Ever get in so deep you had to uh, steal to make yourself even? What kind of a crack is that? Oh, a nasty one. Just as nasty as stealing your sister's brooch. I... What did she tell you? Nothing. She had a fight with Johnny. Maybe he noticed she didn't have the brooch. Asked her about it. Maybe she had her ideas about where it was. Yeah? So what? So she knew and gave you a break. But you had different ideas, Eddie. You pawned the brooch, signed Johnny's name to the slip, and bet a thousand against Johnny. Ah, you nuts, you're off your rocker. Tell you what, Eddie. Let's you and I take a trip to the pawnbroker, then we'll go to the betting agent where you place the bet. Maybe I won't look so much off my rocker then, huh? All right. So what? I got a break. I'll redeem the brooch and... But... What are you looking at me like that for? I took two on the chin today. Maybe it's my turn now to give, Eddie. You lay off now. Sis won't prosecute and Johnny won't neither. <laughs> she won't marry him if he did and... It's not the brooch, Eddie. It's the chewing gum. The gum you gave your sister to give Johnny. The drug gum to ensure your bet. You can't prove nothing, you can't. Eddie, you and I are going to the boxing commission and you're going to talk. No, I ain't. Either that or I tell Johnny everything. And leave him in the room. Alone with you. Oh, uh, Eddie. Get your top coat, too. It's kind of chilly outside. <laughs> Susie, as they say in the books, all's well that ends well. Gee, it's so romantic. Johnny and Helen getting married. Johnny getting another crack at the championship. And I... Uh, What's the matter? Uh, What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? Oh, Susie, my jaw is really sore. Johnny hung a nice right cross on me. What's a right cross? Huh? Well, it's, um... Uh, here, look, put up your hands. This way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, look... I, uh, I leave it my left like this, and you... Like that? I... Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Holiday. Mr. Holiday. I... Oh, good night, Mr. Holiday. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by E. Jack Newman and Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and the part of Johnny Capelli was played by John Veal. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood.
Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. Please meet me at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon in front of the Mercantile Building. You can do me a tremendous favor, perhaps change the whole course of my life. I shall be wearing a brown gabardine suit, and I'll be carrying a forest green suede. I'll be carrying a forest green suede handbag. That was all. No name, no initials. Just the letter. Well, it didn't sound like much of an adventure. Brother, but how I could have used a crystal ball in good working order. to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Look Pleasant, Please. Gee, Mr. Holliday, doesn't look particularly thrilling, but I guess it's like the old age. Huh? The what? The old age. You know, when somebody says something smart that means something different from what it says, only it's the same thing. Oh. Oh. On your next trip around the office, fix that one up, Susie. What? <laughs> Never mind. Just save up your adage. Okay? Okay. Hey, I can just make it to the mercantile building by 2 o'clock. So long, Susie. There were lots of people standing in front of the building, but only one girl in a brown gabardine suit, green hat, and handbag. I didn't walk up to her right away because, well, I wanted to take a good look. And what I saw was good. Maybe about 24, slender... Lots and lots of brown hair that fell down from that cute hat in a nice way. Her clothes spelled money with two capital M's. Well, I walked over to her. Good afternoon. Oh, oh. I'm the man from Box 13. Oh, thank you. Look, I, I know this sounds terribly foolish and silly, but I do want your help, uh, Mr. Mr. Holiday. Dan Holiday. Oh, all right, Mr. Holiday. Do you have half an hour to spare? Well, the afternoon's young, and I can wear it away to an old age. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Do you photograph well, Mr. Holliday? Huh? Well, my baby pictures always turned out pretty good. Of course, that was a little while ago, and I... Look, I want you to have your photograph taken with me. Oh, is that all? Yes, that's all. Of course, I'll pay you for your time and trouble. Oh, no, no, no. My time's my own, and what trouble I get into is usually my own fault. <laughs> all right, Mr. Holliday. There's a photographer in this building. He's ready for us. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, Jones. Uh, Mary Jones. Oh. Do you know, Miss Jones, a writer often spends hours thinking of the right name for the characters in his stories. But here you come along without batting an eye, think of a very unusual one. Do you have to know my real name? Well, I'll live without it, but Will I... Will you do it, Mr. Holliday? All right, Miss Jones. Let's go look at the birdie. The photographer was ready, and it didn't take long for him to run off three shots. Miss Jones paid him, and the two of us went back downstairs. Out on the pavement, I turned to her, and I guess she read the look on my face. Please don't ask me why, Mr. Holliday. Goodbye, and thanks very much. Well, before I could move my feet, she was into a cab and gone. <laughs> If this was it, I'd just chalk up the shortest adventure on record. There's nothing to do but go home and mark it off to experience. <laughs> yeah, that's where it should have stopped. The next morning, I walked into my office as usual. And... Hey, 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 what is this, Susan? You could have told me. Told you what? I quit. You didn't trust me. Oh, Susie, will you stop? Oh, and the phone's been ringing all morning. Everybody wants to know about it. About what? Just answer the phone and find out, you... you. Careful, Susie, careful. Hello. Good morning, lover boy. Oh, Cling. Well, how's the police department? It's bright and early. It's not good to hear your voice. I call for information. Yeah, what kind? What about? Well, shall I wear my organdy hat and crepe machine badge? 
What are you talking about? What is the matter with everyone? For nothing, Angel Face. All's well with the world. And about 15 million bucks. Everybody's crazy. <laughs> yeah, everybody but you. Oh, nice going, Holiday. Nice going. Am I invited or don't you want cops? It might make the thing look bad, you know. In two seconds, Kling, I'm going to hang up on you. What goes? Don't you ever read the papers? Or don't you know what's going on in your life? Now, listen, I... Oh, go arrest somebody. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, Susie, what's this all about? Look at the morning paper. <laughs> all right, I'm looking at... Holy mackerel. He, he's awful pretty. <laughs> Be quiet, Susie. Prominent heiress announces engagement to... Dan Holliday. <laughs> Dan Holliday, that's me. That, that, that's my picture with her. Sure it is. I've been framed. Oh, but you wouldn't frame a newspaper picture, would you? <laughs> Marcia Jameson, beautiful heiress to Jameson Lumber Fortune announces engagement. You, you're, you're just a, a demijohn. Don Juan. Oh, one of the two. But you could have told me. I could have told myself. Susie, if that phone rings anymore, don't answer it until I get this thing cleared up. One way or another. Goodbye. I got Marcia Jameson's address from the society editor at the Star Times and... A half hour later, I was ushered into the big library at the Jameson home. Sitting behind the desk was a youngish-looking man. He rose to meet me as I walked into the room. Ah, oh, Mr. Holliday. I'm very happy to know you. Yeah, I wish I could say the same. I beg your pardon? Where's Miss Jameson? I've asked her to come down. Good. <laughs> I, uh, I suppose I'd better introduce myself. I'm Roger Jameson, Marsh's uncle and guardian. Oh, uh, she needs one. Uh, I don't understand. Well, that makes two of us. Suppose we pool our facts and get one good twisted story out of them. Mr. Holliday, you're acting very strangely. I must say that my niece's choice of a husband is, well, peculiar. All right, I'm peculiar. At parties, I'm a standout, but I'd like to... Dan, Dan, darling, how nice of you to come this morning. What did you expect? You, of course. You've met Uncle Roger? Yes, Marcia, we've met. Oh, I want you two to like each other. Oh, fine. I love everybody in the world, but I... Uncle Roger, could I speak to Dan alone, please? Certainly, Marcia. You'll stay for lunch, Mr. Holliday? No, thank you. Oh, yes, you will, Uncle Roger. Good. We'll have a long talk. Now, Miss Jameson. Why did you come here? Maybe you haven't seen the morning paper. Mr. Holliday... Dan, help me. I did. And I've got engaged. Look, Miss Jameson, I... Uh, Marcia. I don't know you that well. We just became engaged this morning. Dan, it's imperative that you act as my fiancé until after the 16th of this month. Well, what happens then? Oh, Dan, if you'll just do what I ask until the 16th. On that day... I... Uh, yes, come in. Lunch is ready any time. You are staying, Mr. Holliday. Uh, yes. You stay, Uncle Roger. One more lunch like that, and I'd have had indigestion for the rest of my life. Uncle Roger was very curious about me. He asked a lot of questions, which Marsh answered. Then, when I was ready to leave. Well, of course, Mr. Holliday, this engagement came as a complete surprise to me. I had no idea you and Marsh even knew each other. Well, I get around a lot, Mr. Jameson. And you'd better call me Roger, Dan. Yes, there's nothing like being friendly. Well, I'm sure Dan has a lot of things to do this afternoon, Uncle Roger. We'd better let him go. Of course. We'll have plenty of time to talk about things, Dan. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Uh, Roger. Oh, thank you, Dan. You were wonderful. Uh, superb, considering I didn't know where the ball was half the time. Oh, we'll wait until the 16th, won't you? It's five days from now. Meanwhile, what do I tell my friends? And where do I stack the wedding presents? You can always say we broke up. Uh-huh. And uh, I'll tell you something else, Dan. Can there be anything else? I, I almost wish the whole thing were true. Goodbye, Dan. And with that, I was left standing on the elegant steps of the Jameson Castle. Well, I could have put the whole thing on the line and cleared up the situation. It would have been easy. Just deny it. Tell the whole story. 
or I could stay in the play and see what the score was. I walked down the stairs, then glanced back and looked up at a window and right into Uncle Roger's eyes. Before I could smile, he let the curtains fall back in place. Okay, that made up my mind. Curiosity killed a cat, they say. All right. Yeah. Well, Danny, welcome to the Star of Times. And what brings you into the morgue? Jonesy, I want to do some research. So you came to the right place. Oh, congratulations. Uh, thanks. That's a lot of dough you're marrying. Yeah. Kind of sudden, wasn't it? Known her a long time? Jonesy, I feel as though it was just yesterday. Now, get me everything you've got on her. Huh? You're going to look up your own fiancé? Yep. What's the idea? Kind of silly, isn't it? Well, it's your business. I can put my fingers right on the stuff you need. You got much? All here. Matter of fact, I was reading about her this morning. When I heard you were marrying her, I did some work. And? Well, on the 16th of this month, she comes into about 15 million. What? Yeah. But she has to be married by then. Oh. Uh, how come? Her father's will says so. If she doesn't marry by the 16th of this month, this year, her 15 million goes to, uh, oh, uh, Roger Jameson Uncle. Oh. You didn't know? I don't know a lot of things. What else have you got, Jonesy? She had kind of bad luck before. Yes, what kind? Engaged twice before, and uh, both her fiancés had accidents. Bad? Yeah. Dead? Well, if they weren't, they had an awful dirty trick played on them. What? They were buried. Back to Look Pleasant, Please. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, there I was, all wide-eyed and innocent, engaged to marry a girl whose last two fiancés had lots of bad luck. For myself, I wasn't anxious to inherit any of that. But I had to find out a little more. So I went back to the Jameson place. The butler recognized me and let me in without announcing me. I walked down the hall and heard voices in the library. Ordinarily, keyhole listening would have been out, but, well, I heard my name. The door was open, so... I tell you, Dan, we'll go through with it. Oh, Dan. Dan, first name already, huh? Oh, don't be silly, Charles. I, I've got to convince everyone he is my fiancé. Well, what if he backs out before the 16th? He won't. What makes you so sure? I know. Oh? Oh, don't be stupid, Charles. I'm not stupid. I'm just careful. Darling, darling, you know better. Well, I... All right, Marsha. Now, you'd really better go, Charles. After all, you... As they say in Alice in Wonderland, curiouser and curiouser. I was wondering about it when Charles came toward the door. I backed away and ducked into another room. Well, where is Dan now? I don't know, Charles, but you'd better get back to the office or Uncle Roger will miss you. All right, darling. Bye. I'll tell you when and where we can meet again, sweetheart. Uh, you know, I'm fussy about uh, these things. Oh, who the devil is... The name's Holiday, Charlie. I'm engaged to Marshall. Well, how did you get in? The front door. It works. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, Charles, kissing another man's betrothed. Well, I... Uh, now, look, Dan, I, I... Oh, you you go on, Charles. Dan, I want to explain something. I can stand it. Now, look, Holiday, I... Go on, Charles. Very well. I'll see you. Will you come into the library, Dan? But I've got a book. Oh, please, I owe you an explanation. Okay. All right, go ahead. Well, Charles is... Charles is the man you love. Is that the line you're hunting for? Yes. All right, that's the first I'll leave out of the bottle. The rest should be easy. But it isn't. You see, Dan... Your life's in danger. Yes, I gathered that from the things I read a while ago. You, you read? 
Yes, the newspaper files. Oh. Dan, if you want to, you can back out. Uh Uh-huh, I know. But maybe I'm more than a little curious. But you... You know about... About my two fiancés. Extinct. Uncle Roger killed them. Or had them killed. And Uncle Roger knows nothing about Charles? No. The aforementioned uncle thinks I'm fiancé number three in order of appearance. Uncle tries to put a block on me while Charles goes for a touchdown, right? Oh, you make it sound so brutal, heartless. Got any other words for it? You and Charles live happily ever after. I don't. All right, all right, you can do as you please. I was going to to ask you to go through with it. But I can't. <laughs> so before I left, I promised Marsh I'd stick it out another day. Okay, I'm a sucker. But if Uncle Roger was going to toss a curve, I'd at least be waiting for it. But before I went any further, I called on Lieutenant Kling, told him I was up. He was very sympathetic. <laughs> oh, what a story. <laughs> ha, 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 ha. It strikes you funny, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All I want to know is, was there anything that might have tied the uncle in with the deaths of Marcia's fiancés? Uh, no. You're sure? Sure I am. When I read about your uh, engagement, I remembered her name. And? Those deaths were accidents. And the uncle? Clean. Look, Clean, maybe he's smart. Yeah, it could be. There are lots of smart people in the world. Oh, but I'm not one of them. Is that it? Look, Holiday, I warned you that someday your box 13 routine would land you in a slippery spot. Okay, it's up to you to keep your footing. Cling, suppose, just suppose I leave with my chin and Uncle Roger takes a poke at it. Would that open up the other two cases? Well, sure. All right, maybe I'll do it. Holiday. What? I, uh, well, uh, look, uh... Take it easy. Why, Lieutenant, you sound concerned for me. I'd miss having to hold your hand every once in a while. Well, what are you going to do now? Call on Uncle Roger and make like a sucker. Well, Dan, sit down, won't you? Thanks, Roger. (laughs) You know, it's going to be quite a treat seeing Marsha married... Yes, after two unhappy beginnings before. Oh, you know about those? Marcia told you, I suppose. In a way, yes. Mm-hmm. You, um, you wanted to see me about something, Dan? Oh, oh, just a social call, if you're busy. I can... Oh, no, no, not at all. I was about to leave anyway. You know, Roger, it's very strange. Strange? What is? You haven't asked me anything about myself. I don't have to, Dan. Meaning? I've been very busy since this morning. You see, I have quite a bit of influence. Connection, so to speak. And uh, they told you what? (laughs) Who you are, where you live, what you do for a living. Dan, how much do you love Marcia? I'm going to marry her. You have quite a good income, so it's not the money you're after. Obviously. Dan, I'd give anything in the world to see Marcia happy. We... Well, we practically grew up together. There's only ten years difference in our ages. You see, my brother was 20 when I was born. Oh, I see. Marcia is my only living relative. Oh. Then I understand your concern for her. I'm glad you do. I want to show you something. Miss Claridge, bring in the Jameson estate papers, will you? Thank you. What's that for? Dan, you write mysteries, among other things. Consequently, I think you have a... A suspicious mind. What do you mean by that? (laughs) Well, I'm Marsha's uncle. Trustee of her fortune until she gets married. Which must be by the 16th of this month. Now, surely in one of your stories... you must have written about a guardian who misappropriates funds? Embezzles? No, I never have. (laughs) Well, it doesn't really matter. You see, I... Uh, The estate papers, Mr. Jameson... I thought I asked Miss Claridge to bring them in. Oh, well, she was busy, and I was on my way past anyway. All right, Charles. Thank you. Oh, um, Charles, this is Dan Holliday, Marsh's fiance. Dan, this is Charles Crane. How are you? Fine. Uh, congratulations. Thanks. Is that all, Mr. Jameson? Yes, that's all. Thank you. All right. Here are the papers. I think you'll find every penny accounted for. 
Everything in order, Dan? It looks like it. <laughs> We're going to get along, Dan. Get along beautifully. I wonder for how long. If Uncle Roger was planning on making me number three on his hit parade, he was playing it smart. Oh, he was smooth. Mm-hmm. So smooth that I stayed at a hotel that night. If Uncle Roger knew where I lived, I might have visitors. And of course, I didn't sleep much. There was a lot of thinking to do. And it added up to something funny. The next day was Saturday, and it came in handy because Uncle Roger's office was closed. And I wanted to see something there. I called on Marsha and told her. Maybe she was a little surprised. Why do you want to go through the files, Dad? I've got a hunch, Marcia. Maybe Uncle Roger didn't show me the right papers. For the estate? Yeah, that's it. Have you got a key to the office? I could get one, and one to the files. Mm, get them for me, will you? Say, uh, where's Uncle Roger today? Oh, on the yacht, anchored outside the harbor. You're to go there tomorrow night. Why? He's arranged an engagement party. Dan, if you don't want to go, if you want to back out now... <laughs> Nothing doing. I'm beginning to like this. All right, Marcia, give me the keys. Getting into the office was easy. I went to the files, Mark. Jameson. Yeah, the papers were there, all right. But not the set Uncle Roger had shown me. These were different. What little I knew about finance showed me some fancy juggling had been going on. I was checking them carefully. A neat round hole appeared in the file case alongside my head. I ducked behind the case and peeked around just in time to see the outer door to the office close. Somebody with a silenced gun played clay pigeon with me. So Uncle Roger was on the yacht, was he? When I got back out on the street, a storm had kicked up. I took a cab back to my apartment and phoned Marcia. She didn't answer. The butler said she had gone and Uncle Roger was on the yacht. Late in the evening, I received a note from Marcia. Dan, I'm terribly frightened. Uncle Roger insisted that I come to the yacht tonight. I'm writing this note from my cabin now. I know something dreadful will happen, so please, if you can, come at once. There are speedboats at the dock to take you off. But be careful, Dan. Be careful. Could have been a trap, but I compared the writing on this note with her first letter to box 13. Oh, no, it was hers, all right. Careful. Neat. Precise. Okay, if this was a showdown, might as well get it over with. When I got there, the yacht was pitching and rolling like a bad bronc with a burr under his saddle. That all day storm hadn't let up a bit. Then I, I was on board, but nobody was in sight. There was one cabin with a light inside. I went to it, opened the door. Holiday, what are you doing here? Visiting. I don't understand. Didn't Marsha tell you the party was tomorrow night? I like to be early for appointments. Where is Marsha? What's the matter with you? She's not here. Oh, yes, she is. Have you gone crazy? Not yet. Sit down, Uncle Roger. Oh, I... All right. You know, Uncle Roger, I... I don't like being shot at. I don't know what you're talking about. Where is Marcia? Cut it out, I... I... Yes? What were you going to say? Well, what's the matter? Have you got a gun? Gun? Yes, but... Get it. Are you... Get it fast. It's not here. It's always in this desk drawer. Is this what you're looking for, Uncle Roger? Charles, what are you doing here? And you might ask him what he's doing with your gun. It is yours, isn't it? Well, it looks like it. <laughs> you don't think I'd kill you with my own gun, do you, Holiday? Very neat, Charlie, very neat, but the crew... Just two crewmen aboard. The rest won't be here until tomorrow. And that storm is convenient. <laughs> Lots of noise. <laughs> Something funny, Holiday? Yeah. Yeah, you are. You think you're going to get by with this, don't you? Is there anything to stop me? What is this all about? If this is a prank... Oh, no, Roger, not a joke. Definitely not. Charles and Marcia had it all planned very neatly. The accidents to her other fiancés gave these two beauties the idea. 
Charles takes another set of papers to look as though you were embezzling, and... What? Yeah, yeah. They make it look as though you can't afford to have her married by the 16th, because if she doesn't marry, then the estate goes to you. And you're killed with my gun. That's it. And you're killed the same way. Charles muscles up this cabin to make it look as though there were a struggle. And All I... right, Holiday. Second guessing. Oh, no, Charlie. I'm not so dumb. I... You see, I called the police before I came aboard. You see, I guess... You're a liar. You couldn't know. Oh, but I could. Marsha's note gave it away. Marsha's note? Uh-huh. The note she was supposed to have written aboard this yacht. You see, her handwriting was neat, precise, careful. Charlie, uh, ever try to write a neat hand on a pitching, rolling yacht? Can't be done. So I knew she wasn't aboard. And there was only one reason she'd want to get me here. To work this frame. And... Oh, hello, Lieutenant Clay. Lieutenant Clay. Oh, have the gun. Holiday, is he? Yeah, Charlie's gone bye-bye for a little while. Call the police in here, Dan. I... Where are they? Are you kidding? Lieutenant Kling is probably saving his Betty by. Me, I... I gotta sit down. Susie, they weren't satisfied with 15 million. They wanted Uncle Roger's money, too. Which they would have had if that frame had worked. Uh-huh. Hey, what are you doing? What do you got there? A new camera. It's got a wonderful gadget on it that lets me get in the picture. All I do is press this button and... Oh, here, I'll show you. We'll both bo- down the light. See, like this. And then... Oh, no. Not again. Good night, Susie. <laughs> week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with an original story by Russell Hughes, and original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund McDonald. John Beale played Roger Jameson. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. <laughs> With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of Star Times. I don't know whether going after a ghost is your idea of an adventure, but I think I may have one for you. I don't believe in ghosts either. At least I don't think I do. However, if you're interested, my name is Michael Davis. I'm an artist, and my studio is at 183 Lincoln News. I'm there almost all day. Here's at 183 Lincoln News. I'm there almost all day and any day. So if you'll drop around, this may be interesting. Michael Davis. So Mr. Michael Davis didn't believe in ghosts. Well, neither did I, until I met Mr. Davis. To Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Haunted Artist. Go? Gee, Mr. 
holiday? Are there such things? Ever see a bank account after March the 15th? Huh? <laughs> Skip it, Susie. Michael Davis. He says he's an author. Do you know anything about art, Susie? Well, I- I've been to the museum where they have that statue of the Venus B. De Mille. That's Venus the model. The one with that arm? Uh-huh. Oh. Well, art is long and time is fleeting, and the same goes for Dan Holiday. And it looks like a trip to Mr. Michael Davis is in order. See you later, Susie. A half hour later, Michael Davis and I were introducing ourselves and shaking hands. I liked him. And he looked like an artist, except when he grinned. Then he looked and seemed a lot younger than his old 33 or 4. And he grinned as he said, So you advertise for adventure just to get plots for your stories, huh? Yes, it's a general idea. Maybe I'll be able to use yours. Well, this sounds insane, but I think this studio is haunted. Or I am. Why? Do you hear the patter of cold little feet and the clank of chains at night? I wish I did instead of... Oh, come and look. You see that easel in the corner? Mm Mm-hmm. There's a painting on it. I've got it covered now, but... But what? Well, look. Take a good, long look. I did. What I saw was one of those surrealist things. It was a desert with queer figures raising their arms to a brassy sky and a vicious-looking sun. And somehow it gave me the shivers. I was staring at it when... Well, Holiday, what do you think of it? <laughs> what am I supposed to think of it? Meaning you don't like it? Well, I, I don't know. I hadn't intended you to criticize it. Just look at it and see if you notice anything wrong. Go ahead, I'll keep quiet. I looked again and... Something did strike me as being a little odd. I moved in for a closer look, stood there for a moment. Uh Uh-huh. You've got it, Holiday. That stone quarry painted in the right-hand portion of the canvas. Yes, it doesn't belong. I mean, I mean, it's out of place. I didn't paint it. Maybe we'd better go over the signals again today, but I, uh, I lost the ball on that play. I don't blame you. But it's the truth. I did not paint that quarry in there. Look at it. The technique is different. Yes, the brushwork's not like the rest. Exactly. And that painting has to be done in three days. I've been working on it for seven months, and it has to be finished. Why, what's the rush? Well, I've been invited to hang a canvas in the Berner Gallery. Oh, which means you've arrived. Berner's being taught what the big leagues is to baseball. Exactly. You see, Holiday, I started the painting seven months ago. Everything was fine for What Davis told me was this. He'd finish work in the evening, cover the painting, and turn in. Then in the morning, when he'd take the cover off the canvas, the quarry would be painted in. It happened six times. The last time was the night before he wrote his letter to Box 13. He was sure no one had entered his studio during the night. He'd locked his windows and doors, but, but still it happened. It's driving me crazy. I've lain awake at night trying to catch the person responsible, but nothing doing. He never shows up when I'm waiting for him. Have you told the police? Oh, sure. They they thought I was just two steps ahead of the man in the white coat. Huh. You're sure you've locked up every night? Look at the door. New locks, two of them. Even the window fasteners are brand new. Those are the only entrances? And exits. No, Holiday. No one comes in through the doors or windows, I'll swear to it. But someone has to, Davis. Unless... Unless I am leaving the rails. No, I don't think so. Thanks. Even my... Best friends won't tell me that. Well, if... Marshall, darling, I brought dinner. Oh. Come on in, Betty. Here, Mike. Here, take some of these tops with yeah. Betty, this is Dan Holliday. Dan, this is my fiancée, Betty Harper. Hello, Dan. And my name is Betty. Well, thanks. I'll use it. <laughs> yeah. Mike, darling, mm-hmm. I invited a kid man for dinner. Is that all right? Sure. Uh, will you stay, Dan? Well, I'm afraid I can't. Besides, I'm... I'm unexpected. Oh, no. We've got plenty. Spaghetti, salad, wine... Oh, be careful of that bottle, Mike. Here, let me have it. Bag first. Oh, please, I'm not a child. Oh, that's a matter of opinion. You will stay, won't you, Dan? Well, I... Oh, please do. We can talk some more about my problem. Problem? Your problem, Mike? Oh, yes. Dan's going to help about the painting. Oh! <laughs> and I'm a child, huh? There goes the wine. That was clumsy, wasn't it? Accidents will happen, Betty. If I can put in that bromide. Oh, Mike, I just remembered. We're to go to the Sutton's after dinner. Huh? Oh, that wasn't a promise. We can't refuse them again. But Dan's going to... As a matter of fact, I, I can't stay anyway. I have an engagement, too. 
Well, all right, but you will return tomorrow, won't you? Sure, I'll be glad to. Good night. Well, well, I like this. It looked good. Especially when Mike's own girlfriend was anxious to deal me out. That Betty didn't want me on the team. As easy to see as the brass button in a collection plate. She didn't drop that bottle of wine. It jumped out of her hands when Mike said I was going to help. Why? Well, I had to find that out. I got to my apartment after dinner and sat down to think about it when... Hello? Is this Dan Holiday? Yes, it is. Who's this? Well, never mind. Just a moment. Hello? Hello? Holiday, you're to keep away from Michael Davis. Forget the whole thing, understand? Well, frankly, no. Am I supposed to? Well, yes, I... I mean, look look here, Holiday. It'll be awkward for you if you continue. Go on, I'm interested. Uh, all right, just remember what I said. Keep away from Michael Davis or you will be sorry. <laughs> now, listen, this is no joke. <laughs> but I'm laughing. I warn you, good night. Brother, whoever you were, that was the worst imitation of a squeeze play I ever heard. <laughs> Are you kidding, Dan? No, someone called me last night, wanted me to keep away from you. Why, it must have been a joke. Does anyone want to keep this painting out of the burner galleries for some reason? Mm, I thought of that. You mean sabotage, sort of? Yeah, that's it. Well, who? No one I know. You're sure, Mike? Of course. Uh, we done any work on the canvas today? Yes, I scraped off the stone quarry and started my own work again. Uh, then I've got an idea. What time is it? Uh, four o'clock, why? Got any ceiling wax? Ceiling wax? Well, no, I haven't. Well, can you get some? Well, yes, there's a store a block down the street, but what do you want with ceiling wax? Well, for one thing, we're going to prove there's no ghost. Or, uh... Or what? Or that there is one. Nah, <laughs> run down and get the wax. All right, you're the boss. Make stuff at home. I'll be back in a few minutes. I worked fast to get the thing done before Mike came back. I took every tube of paint, every brush, every palette I could see and wiped them clean. Then I put them back where they had been, just in time. Mike came back, handing me the ceiling wipe. Oh, will this be enough, Dan? Oh, yes, I think so. Okay. Now, we'll lock all the windows. And be sure to lock. What are you up to? You see, we can find out if someone gets in here while you're asleep. To seal the locks and bolts for this wax and... Yes, but wax can be broken. Uh, it is. We'll know someone came in the windows of the door. Yeah, but the person could reseal the locks. Sealing wax melts easily enough. Sure, but he couldn't put the imprint of my signet ring back in the wax without getting the ring from me first. And I'm very fond of this ring. Never take it off my finger. Okay, Mike, let's go to work on the windows. All right, that does it. Both windows sealed. If our ghost gets in now, he'll have to break the wax. You know, uh, there's only one thing wrong. What, Mike? I won't be able to sleep tonight. Oh, I'll take something. You've got to sleep because your visitor won't break in unless you do. Dan, suppose those seals aren't broken in the morning, but the painting's been changed anyway. What then? Uh, we both apply for an outside cell. Now, don't do anything more on your painting. And don't touch a thing. Hmm? Why not? You want me to help you, don't you? Certainly. And ask no questions and do as I say. And tomorrow morning we may have an answer. <laughs> o'clock that night before I left Mike's studio. He had taken a sedative and was sleeping like a baby. I turned off the lights, checked the seals in the windows. All okay. I let myself out, tried the door. Locked, but good. Then I took the sealing wax and melted the hunk of it to go over the keyholes. And I pressed my signet ring against the wax. I even forced the wax into the crack above the door, initialed that. Michael Davis was sealed in. And whoever, or whatever, was doing the dirty work was sealed out. I hoped. When I got home, I set my alarm for five the next morning. Yeah, it went off all right. I stumbled out of my bed into my clothes and drove to Davis's studio. I wanted to get there before he woke up. I did, because when I listened at his door, there wasn't a sound. I looked carefully at the seals I'd put there the night before. Well, they were intact. I'll swear to it. Then I rang his buzzer. He was quite a sleeper. Apparently taking something and... Who is it? Why don't you come back in a week? It's Dan, Mike. Let me in. Huh? Oh. Oh, sure. 
Do you always get up this early? I have a contract with the park commissioners to wake up the birds. Fine. Shouldn't happen to a vulture. Sleep all right? Oh, like a top. Disturb it all? Nope. Okay. Let's look at the seals. You bet. Well, this one's all right. Mm-hmm. So is this one. And the seals on your door were intact, too. Now, take the cover off the painting, Mike. Uh, what if it's been changed again? <laughs> if it has, I'll buy you a new hat. I... I... I wear a size 7 and 3 8. And make it a gray one. To the Haunted Artist, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, the painting was changed. Davis swore he hadn't done it, and I believed him. But if he hadn't... Okay, there had to be an answer. I took all the tubes of paint, brushes, and palettes with me when I left Davis. Also, the painting itself. I wouldn't tell him why. Lieutenant Kling at police headquarters was more curious. What are you doing? Taking a home course in detective work? Yes, I'm on my fourth lesson. It's entitled, How to Be a Nosy Cop. What's the gag, Holiday? Look, there's no gag. I just left a guy who's biting his nails so badly he was working on his elbow a few minutes ago. Kling, run fingerprint tests on those tubes and brushes and palettes. Then compare them with the prints on this glass, will you? Whose glass is it? Belongs to an artist friend of mine. I swiped it when he wasn't looking. Where have you got that big package? A body. Whose? All right, it's a painting. And you don't know anything about art. I knew an artist model once. She wasn't as bad as she was painted. <laughs> okay, so I don't slay you. All right, I'll laugh at your joke. Ha-ha. Remember what you're doing in that paper? Okay, okay. Fingerprint test in the tubes, brushes and palette. Compare with prints in the glass, right? How soon can I have them? For anybody else, in a half an hour. For you, three hours. Okay. Great. Be back in three hours. After leaving playing, I went to the Star Times and learned the name of an art expert. Hmm. That is quite good. Yours? No, it's a friend of mine's. Hmm. Mm, good brushwork. Excellent composition. Wonderful color. And uh, with this, this has no place in the picture. Look, uh, I've got a lot of things to do. What I want you to do is look at the painting and tell me whatever you can about it. I'll pay you, of course. Oh, very well. But uh, it will take uh, maybe two hours to do a good job. Uh, you understand? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Sure, sure. I'll be back in two hours. Well, it was a merry-go-round. From Kling to the art expert, from him back to Kling. A little less than three hours, Dan. Haven't you finished? <laughs> sure. There's your stuff and here's the report. What's the matter with you? Playing. There's no mistake about this report, is there? Mistake? Look, Dan, our boy knows his business. Bet on it. Anything you like. Weren't... Weren't there any other prints at all? None. The prints on the paint tubes and the rest of that stuff were the same as on the glass. All from the same person. But it can't be. I've got news for you. It is. Well, the only person who could have touched those tubes and brushes was Davis himself. Yet why should he sabotage his own painting, one that meant so much to him? And yet, he was asleep when it happened. Or was he? I stopped thinking about it then. I had to get back to the art expert and find out something. And it was a day of surprises, because when I saw him... Yeah, a fine thing. They pushed me and they took a painting. Ah, who? Uh, I'm standing here looking when they come in. I, I have no time to see who they are and who. They, they push me, they, they grab the canvas, and they're gone. Did you call the police? Yeah, yeah, the police come, but I can tell them nothing. I, I... Never mind, never mind. Were they men, the ones who took the painting? One, one man, one woman. You're sure there was a woman? Young man, I'm an art expert, but I also know other things. I know a woman when I see one, even for a second. All right. Never mind them now. What did you find out about the painting? Well, not much. I had not much time. But I can tell you this. I think that the right side of the picture was painted by somebody other than the one who painted the rest. 
You mean that stone quarry wasn't painted by the same artist who did the rest of the picture? No, I do not think so. There's a different technique, one that is familiar, and I think I recognize it. You do? Oh, what's his name? The one who painted the quarry. Well, it's a peculiar technique. Uh, some years ago, I handled some paintings by this man, and... All right, all right. Who is he? Luigi Antonetti. Oh. Where can I get in touch with him? Well, uh... What? I want to see him. Where can I reach him? <laughs> oh, you're crazy, young man. Luigi Antonetti is dead. Oh, that was great. One more twist like that, and I need a corkscrew to take off my hat. And there was one person who could answer a few questions for me. Betty Harper. I got her address from Davis and told him to hold base until he heard from me. I guess Betty didn't expect me. What? Mr. Holliday, I... I was just getting ready to go out. Correction, you just came in. Where's that painting? Painting? What are you talking about? Betty, I, uh... Oh, hello. Hello. Kip, this is Dan Holliday. Kip says, Mr. Holliday. How are you, Holliday? Oh, that voice. The voice of doom over the phone. Well, really, I... Uh... Kit, that was a bad job. Well, I... Quiet, Kit. Where's that painting? Now, Mr. Holliday... You know, you've let yourself in for a vacation on the taxpayer's money with that trick? Now, really, it was a joke, wasn't it, Betty? Mr. Holliday, Kit really thought he was helping out in a practical joke. Well, wasn't I? Look, will you go? Now, Holliday... Oh. Uh... All right. But I must say, it all turned out very stupidly. Okay, Betty. So you've got the painting. Yes. Now, will you please let me alone? Will you let Mike alone? Not before I find out what's going on. What if I told you his career would be ruined? His life ruined, too? Would you still go on? Maybe I don't believe that. But you've got to. I love Mike, and I'm trying to help him. Help him? Look, if Mike doesn't finish that painting, it won't hang in the burners' galleries. What becomes of his career then? You're robbing him of his chance, not helping him. Then I'll rob him of it. I'd rather do that than... Than what? I said enough. Oh, please, please, you've got to believe me, Dan. All I want is for Mike to, to be happy. And all I want to know is what's going on. And what does Luigi Antonetti have to do with all this? How did you find that out? It doesn't matter. Is Luigi Antonetti still alive? He's dead. And how can he paint that quarry on Mike's canvas? Get out of here. You get out. All right. All right, but I'll find out. If you do when any harm comes to Mike, I swear I'll kill you. Now get out. <laughs> It was all from Betty. I would have bet my last penny she was doing what she was doing for Mike. But why? Why? Then I got an idea. Find out about Luigi Antonetti. I looked him up. Found out he'd lived in a small town about 250 miles away. He painted there. Okay, so I drove to the little town. Sure, I found out. He was dead all right. I was even shown his grave, and when I looked at it, I wanted to reach back and chip the icicles off my spine. How could a dead man paint? There was only one answer. He couldn't. Then I learned something else. Antonetti had a pupil, a pupil named Michael Davis. More questions, and finally I found an old school teacher who remembered. Michael, of course, wonderful boy. Luigi Antonetti taught him painting. He said Michael had a brilliant career ahead of him. I see. Well, Mr. Evans, do you know what became Michael? Well, I think he went to the city, although I haven't heard. Where did he go? I believe shortly after he graduated from high school. Uh, that must be 16 years ago. Yes, it was right after his best friend was killed. His what? Yes, poor boy. He fell into the old quarry. Quarry? Stone quarry? Well, yes. It was one night after a senior party. I think, Yes. Both lads, Michael and Arthur, were in love with the same girl, you see. Would her name be Betty Harper? Now, it's amazing you should know that, yes. How about this Arthur? Well, it was quite dark. Arthur, I believe, went back to get something. The bridge across the quarry must have broken. Michael was upset for days, even though Arthur was his rival for Betty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Evans. You'll excuse me, but I've got to hurry. Yeah, but I had to put more pieces together. So I went back to the city and back to the art expert. Yeah, yeah, it's not only possible, Mr. Holliday. It's quite probable. In his early years, he would use his teacher's technique. Next stop, the psychiatrist. Certainly, Mr. Holliday, that's quite possible. There are numerous case histories similar to it in general form. Now, things are 
things began to fit together. The different technique, that of a dead man, yet only Davis's fingerprints on the tubes and brushes. Betty's concern and a willingness to see his career stop rather than have me find out the reasons for everything that happened. But I had to bring the whole thing out in the open. So later in Mike's studio... Let me get this straight, Dan. You say I'm doing that myself, ruining my own painting? Yes, you are, Mike. Don't listen to him, Mike. Now, please don't. What's the matter with all of you? Mike, you've got to listen to me. And he's got to listen to me and Dr. Rawlings. Why did you bring a doctor? I'm not only a doctor, Mr. Davis. I'm a psychiatrist. Sick. Are you trying to tell me I'm crazy? No, no, of course you're not. But you will be if you don't let us help. Now, listen, you want your career, don't you? Certainly. All right, you won't have it if you don't let us help. It won't be helping. Oh, Mike, send him away, please. Mike... Mike, do you remember a person named Arthur Denning? 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 No, I don't. Now, will you let him alone? Betty, believe me, this is better for him. Ask Dr. Rawlings. Tell him, Doctor. I'm sure Mr. Davis has a guilt complex. Oh, yes. Unless we find out why, he'll never finish this painting. Perhaps never finish any other. Why not? What would stop me? Your own mind, Mr. Davis. Mike, you know as well as I that no one came into your studio the night we sealed it up. No one. You were the only person in here. Now, do you see? Not quite. What do you want me to do? Dr. Rawlings told Mike what had to be done. Davis agreed. It took only a few seconds for Rawlings to inject a drug into Davis's arm. Then we waited. Waited until... All right. He's under. You asked the question, Mr. Holliday. Mike. Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Now listen, Mike. It's 16 years ago. You're in high school. A senior. There's a senior party. It's night. Remember? Yes. It's dark. Who's with you, Mike? Betty. Betty and Arthur. What what happened that night, Mike? Uh, I killed Arthur. I don't know. Be quiet. How did you kill him, Mike? He he had to go back for something. I told him to take the shortcut over the quarry. Then, then what happened? I forgot. I forgot. You forgot what? The bridge. The bridge was broken. It was dangerous. But I forgot. I wouldn't have sent him. Yes, I know. He was killed, wasn't he? Yes. I loved Betty. So did he. Everyone would have said I killed him. But I didn't. I didn't. I just forgot about the bridge. I didn't mean... To. All I... right. That's all. I... I thought he did it deliberately. You see, Miss Harper, his conscious mind refused to admit his guilt. So he forgot completely. His conscious mind forgot to protect him from the terrible feeling of guilt. But ultimately it came out. He learned painting from Luigi Antonetti 16 years ago. So it was natural at first that he used Antonetti's style, technique... Then, 16 years later, his mind goes back, back into the past, controls his hand, and he paints as he did 16 years ago. But he paints that quarry, the quarry which was associated in his mind with his guilt, or what he thought was his guilt. And now? What about now? Now? When he wakes up, we'll tell him, and he'll be all right. For good. have come several new painters of distinction. Not the least of them is Michael Davis, whose intensity of feeling and whose brilliant... That's good enough, Susie. Well, it looks like he's all right, doesn't it? Gee, isn't the human mind wonderful? Well, that depends on which way you look at it. Uh-huh. I was psychoanalyzed once. Oh? And what did you find out? We've got a lot of mail to open, Mr. Holiday. Oh. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Demon Holiday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. An original music composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. 
that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund McDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. You dribbling old idiot. What did you do with it? I, I'm not going to tell you. No, be careful. Shut up, Therese. We've got to find out what he did with that copybook. We've... Oh, what's the matter? Look. He's dead. Dead? You killed him. Don't be stupid. He... He just... Died. There's no one can prove anything. Just keep your mouth shut and help me find out what he did with the copybook. Well, well, well. Somebody sends me a copybook through box 13. Now I wonder why. to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, A Sad Night. It was just a child's copybook. And on the front cover was the name Marina Layton and a date, the year 1930, written in a childish, scrawled handwriting. I riffled through the pages. There was nothing of interest, at least. That's the way it looked then. But Susie thought differently. Maybe it's some kind of a code, Mr. Holliday. L- like, like one to a buried treasure. Well, Susie, with your imagination and my typewriter, we could go places. Well, gee, the Count of Monte Woolley found a buried treasure. That's Monte Cristo, Susie. Two different people. Well, they both had beards. Oh, look. Huh? What's that? It's a letter to Box 13. Listen. Box 13. A day or so ago, you may have received a child's copybook in the mail. If you did, I should appreciate it if you'd bring it to the address below. Yours truly, Therese Layton. Hmm. Let me see that, Susie. Yes. 6821 Lakeshore Boulevard. Hmm. Swaggy neighborhood. Are you going to take it back, Mr. Holliday? Oh, yes, Susie. If only to see how the other half lives. So I went to 6821 Lakeshore Boulevard. I tossed the copy book in the back seat of my car and it passed on the floor. Maybe I was thinking about anything but the book, but when I rang the doorbell of the big house, I, I suddenly remembered I'd left the book in the car. I just about started back down after it when the door opened. Yes? I'm looking for Teresa Layton. I'm Mrs. Layton. And you? Holiday. Dan Holiday. I'm sorry, box 13. Oh, oh of course. Uh, please come in, Mr. Holiday. In the library, please. Thank you. Oh, won't you sit down, Mr. Holiday? Thanks very much. It's very kind of you to come all this way to return the book. You see, it belongs to my little girl, and I suppose she sent the book to you in, well, mischievously. Your little girl? Yes, Marina. <laughs> Sometimes I think she's a problem child. Oh, really? How old is she, Miss Layden? Um, seven. Did she tell you she sent the book to Box 13? Well, no, as a matter of fact, she wouldn't say. Then her father found a newspaper with an advertisement cut from it. And? We got hold of a paper with the same date and compared the page. Nice detective work, Mrs. Layden. I suppose all this uproar over a child's book seems, well, stupid, doesn't it? Oh, no, 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 not at all. But there's one question I'd like to ask. I- yes, Mr. Holliday? You say, uh, Marina's seven years old? That's right. Why? There's a date in the book, 1930. It seems to have been written in the same hand as the rest. That date would, uh, would make her quite a big little girl, wouldn't it? I, I... Oh, she put down that date, I suppose, well, not thinking. Oh, yes, of course. Where is she now, Mrs. Layton? She's dead, Mr. Holliday. Huh? Mr. Holliday, this is my husband, Carl. How do you do? I'm very happy to know you, Mr. Holliday. Do you have the book? You get right to the point, don't you? Mr. Holliday, our daughter Marina is dead. We want the book merely for sentimental reasons. Well, I can understand that if your wife hadn't... Well, Lied to you? 
Bluntly, yes. <laughs> Teresa, will you excuse us? Yes, yes, uh, I'll be upstairs. I, my wife isn't well, Mr. Holliday. It's not an easy thing for me to say, but she imagines our daughter is still alive. Look, Mr. Layton, if I'd ever written a story with as many holes in it as yours, I'd be laughed out of the writing game. What do you mean? Your wife says Marina sent me the book, yet you say Marina's dead. You know, you two should get together. All right, Mr. Holliday, how much do you want for the book? Oh, now we're getting someplace. What's it worth to you? Five hundred. Oh, that's a lot of money for a child's copybook. You asked how much and I told you. Now, may I have the book? I don't think so. It's worth nothing to you, Mr. Holliday. Believe me, it's worth absolutely nothing to you. All right, maybe I'm just curious. Tell me why you want the book and maybe we'll do business. I can't tell you. Or you won't tell me, is that it? I want that book. Now. I haven't got it with me. You're lying. All right, search me. I haven't got it with me. I forgot it. You're going to be difficult. Look, the book was sent to Box 13, obviously not by you, your wife, or your daughter. You found out it was sent when you traced my end, right? All right, that means someone else sent it to me. I'll return the book when I find out who and why. Mr. Holliday, I'm going to get that book. All right, all right. We'll play a game. Book, book, book. Who's got the book? Now, goodbye, Mr. Layton. Goodbye, Mr. Holliday. You can find your way out, I hope. I think so. Oh, any time you want to tell me the reason behind all this, we may be able to do business. I think we'll do business, Mr. Holliday. Later. <laughs> I left, and when I got home, I spent the rest of the day and most of the evening trying to figure out why anyone would be so anxious to get hold of the book. It was filled with a kid's scrawling handwriting, sums in addition, problems in subtraction, alphabets. Then I, I came to one page and stopped. It was filled with strange, weird-looking figures as a kid would try to draw human beings. But there was something about them that didn't look like a kid's work. They were grotesque, almost fiendish faces and distorted, twisted bodies. And underneath were three words in Spanish. La noche triste. The sad night. The words were scrawled, too, but somehow they were different from the rest of the book. I, I kept turning back to that page, wondering, trying to connect something in my mind with those figures in the book. And I must have dozed off because the next thing I... Knew it was three in the morning. Turned off my light, lay back in bed. Then uh, I was getting company unexpected, and I wasn't in the mood to entertain. Well, 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 what a wonderful thing a skeleton key is, like the magic words, open sesame. Somebody was looking for something, and it wasn't Easter eggs on the White House lawn. I waited, and then... Looking for something, bud? was in wait for the floor show. I turned on the light. Yeah. He'd grabbed the book, but he had left a knife behind. One that I picked up with a handkerchief. If there were fingerprints, he would introduce me to the gent. And Kling could do me that favor. Got any idea who it was, Holiday? No, I haven't, Kling. We had our waltz in the dark. Oh, it must have been romantic. Oh, yes, yes. I was overcome. Look, can you get prints off that knife handle? Seems to me you could pick an easier way of meeting people. Oh, I like the hard way. It makes for lasting friendships. Look, did he try to knife you? Well, I don't think he was doing KP with it. Why was he after you? He wasn't. Oh, I see. He breaks in at three in the morning. You, you surprise him, he pulls the knife on you. But he wasn't after you. It was just a social call, or maybe he was a visiting nurse. Claim, will you see about those prints? Yeah. If you prefer charges... Maybe, but uh, more important, he took something I want back. What? A child's copybook. A child... You know, Holiday, the more I see of you in his Box 13 gimmick you run, the more I believe in elves and pixies. Why did you have a child's copybook? I'm learning to write. You're going to keep this all to yourself, huh? Till I find out what it's all about. Okay. Well, from what you say about the cookie who disturbed your Betty by this morning, he might have a record. In that case, you can tell me who he is. You don't want me to pick him up? No, I'd rather have the pleasure. You see, he hung one on my chin. 
I'm one of you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Come back in an hour. <laughs> Mr. Holliday, gee, I've been trying to get in touch with you all morning. Now he's at headquarters, Susie. Oh, what'd you do? Oh, no, don't jump to conclusions. Why were you trying to get in touch? Look. Huh? When did this come? This morning. I picked up Box 13 mail at the Star Times, and that note was in it. Mm-hmm. Well, as they say in the books, Susie, the plot thickens. In fact, it's so thick now, I can't see a thing. How'd you get that bruise on your chin? I shaved with a baseball bat this morning. Oh, well, are you going to meet Marina Layton? Yeah, that's what she asked me to do in her letter. So if you want me, I'll be at... At where she said, the lobby of the Camden Hotel. So I got to the lobby of the Camden Hotel. It wasn't hard to find Marina Layton. She was best she said she'd be. I took a good look before walking over to her. She was about uh, 24, not pretty, but with one of those faces that always says, uh, wonderful day, isn't it? Okay. So maybe now I'd find out what all this excitement was about. I walked over. Oh, pardon me. Are you Marina Layton? Yes. And you're... That's it. Box 13. You know, I didn't think there was such a thing. I thought this would all turn out to be some sort of a joke. Oh? Well, uh, do we sit here? If you like. Well, may I have it, Mr... Holiday. First name's Dan. All right. May I have the book, Dan? I, uh... I haven't got it, Maria. But you must have it. Mark said he sent it to you. Oh, no, no. Another character in the show. And who's Mark? He was my father's dearest friend. But, but surely you ought to know that. Look, Marina, I, I don't know a thing. I... Wait a moment. Here. Here's his letter to me. You want me to read it? Yes. Dear Marina... For years, I've kept something from you that your father wanted you to have. Now I know someone else wants it. But you can have it by writing to Box 13, Care of the Star Times. I want to write more, but I don't dare. Just remember, your own name is a clue. Love, Mark. Well? Well, what? If your father wanted you to have what he gave you this Mark, why didn't he try to get it from me? Who? Who tried to get what from you? Your father and mother, they... That's crazy. My mother died when I was born. And, and my father disappeared almost five years ago. Oh, now it begins to make some sense. Not much, but a little. What are you talking about? The character who said he was your father, he, he wanted that copybook of yours. He must have found out in some way that Mark had it. But who was the man? I don't know. He said he was your father. I don't understand all this. Makes two of us. But listen, I... What's the matter? How do I know you're Marina Layton? But I, I am. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you are. Because since someone already took the copy book from me earlier this morning, it'd be a little senseless to try to get it this way. All right, Marina, what do you know about a copy book? Yours, with the date 1930 written in it. Copy book? Mine? But nothing, nothing at all. Huh? Oh, now, wait a minute. All this business has to mean something. Don't you even remember a copy book? Well, I suppose I must have had one. I... Wait, of course. Black, ragged-looking. Alphabet in it. That's it. Now, what about it? Oh, nothing. It was just an ordinary book. I, I scribbled in it and... Did you say 1930? Well, yes, well. Because in 1930, I was with my father in Mexico. I had the book then because I was being tutored by Mark, and I, I used it for my lessons. Did you write anything in it that might, well, that might be important? No, not a thing. Well, you must have. I didn't. Did you write the Spanish words, La Noche Chista? Why, that means the sad night. Yes, I know. Did you write them? No, I don't think so. Oh, then your father must have. But why? Are you sure those words were in the book? Well, of course I am. Oh, uh, would Mark know? Mark? Why, Mark's dead. <laughs> Back to The Sad Night, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. We went to the place where Mark had lived. Yes, he was dead, heart failure, the doctor said. But we learned something else. That he had had visitors the night he had died. And from the description of them, 
They could have only been the man and woman who posed as Marina's parents. And I learned a few things more from Marina, that her father was an archaeologist, and in 1930 he was excavating Aztec ruins outside Mexico City. It was on the way back to Kling's office in my car that she told me some more. Father disappeared in Brazil almost five years ago. Then the remains of his expedition were found. And your father? He... he died. But he left records, letters for the museum. And anything for you? No, nothing. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah. Huh. Wrote letters to the museum, yet nothing for his daughter. Why do you say it like that? Well, doesn't it seem odd that he should leave letters and records for everyone but you? Yes, it, it does. And there are a lot of things that seem odd. You wait here, Marina. I'll be by out. Grand holiday. Just about to leave your office. Oh, what'd you find out? You were a distinguished company this morning. Little Georgie Garson, strong man, General Hoodlum. Well, I didn't think it was little either. Want me to pick him up? Yeah, I'd love your company. Okay, Kling, let's go. I want to ask Georgie a few questions. <laughs> about five minutes to get Georgie to talk. He told us he'd been hired to get that book and find his description of the guy who hired him. Well, it couldn't have been anyone else but the man who posed as late the day before. And a quick trip to the house on Lakeshore Boulevard. We might as well have stood in bed. The fake Mr. and Mrs. Layton were gone, and with them, the copy book. And that left us at a dead end. But dead. But at the morgue of the Star Times, Marina and I learned something else. Uh-huh. I think we got lots of stuff on Albert Layton. Try it out, Josie. Yeah. And he's the one who got himself lost in Brazil about five years ago, isn't he? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, here's a folder on him. News clips, photos. Uh, that's that. Look, look, who's this, Josie? Well, let me see. Oh, that's the guy who found Layton, or what was left of the expedition. Name of Carl Bremer. Oh, Mr. Bremer and the gent who wanted that book are one and the same. Did you ever see Marina? Not that I remember. Where were you when your father went to Brazil? In school. And you didn't see him again after you left for Brazil? No. Josie, uh -huh. you know a lot of things. What do the Spanish words, la noche triste, mean to you? Uh, nothing except they mean the sad night. Is that all? Yeah, why? Because they mean more than that. Marina, can you get a sample of your father's handwriting? Oh, yes, of course. And I've got a hunch that Bremer and his wife are leaving for Mexico. Hey, Dan. Yeah? Look, this Leighton was an archaeologist. Why don't you go to the museum to find out about him? Good idea, Jonesy. Thanks. But I've got a phone call to make first. If my hunch is correct, we've got to stop Bremer from getting to Mexico. Let me get this straight, Dan. You want this Bremer and his wife picked up, huh? Yeah, that's it. What's the charge? You pick them up, I'll prefer charges. And maybe one of them will be murder. What? Will you do it? Oh, what if they're out of the country by now? Extradite them. Well, you've got to have a strong charge. To well, I have. One, causing the death of an old man by trying to force something out of him. Two, hiring Georgie Garson to break into my apartment. And three, attempting to defraud. Is that enough? Yeah. If you can make those charges stick. You get them and I'll make them stick. <laughs> Marina got a sample of her father's handwriting. Is this what you wanted? You sure this is your father's handwriting? Of course. That's a letter from him, just before he left for the interior of Brazil. But the writing in the book, it was, it was nothing like this. Well, maybe he didn't write it. He must have. He... Wait a minute. Mind if I... Uh, mind if I write on the other side of this paper? No. Okay. Now watch. I'm right-handed. But suppose I write like this with, with my left hand. What's it look like? Mm, just a scrawl. Sure, as a kid would write. As you would have written in 1930. But why would he have done that? To make it look as though you'd written it. Well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, it does make sense if you realize that your father had learned something. Something that was big enough to make him want to hide it. And where would he hide it? In a place no one would ever think of looking for. It. A kid's copybook. No. No, he kept his, his notebook. Everything he did was in his own notes. But not this. You were with him in 1930. What was he doing? Well, I told you, working on the Aztec ruins outside of Mexico City. And what did he find? His findings were published. The museum has... Oh, the museum, the museum. What's the matter with me? Come on, Marina. Maybe we're getting someplace. Yes, 
course, of course I know Albert Layden's work. He was a great man. The world has lost a genius, Miss Layden. Too bad. Look, Mr. Dugo, we want you to help us. I'll do my best. You said over the phone that it was important. Had something to do with our Mexican antiquities here at the museum. Yes, that's right. What did Professor Layton send here? Well, uh, come in here, into the Aztec room. I, I remember all these things. Of course, everything isn't here. The Mexican museums were given their share and... Oh, pardon me. Yes? Uh, look, what's the matter? Uh, look, look, on that far wall, look at those figures. Oh, yes. Well, they're only copies. Quite well done, of course. The original paintings were lost when the Spaniards destroyed the temples. The well, Aztecs were jealous and more like people. Because on the far the wall were the same the figures I'd seen in that copybook. The same grotesque, weird figures with their twisted bodies and savage faces. There were three of them. Their painted eyes looked out at us, seemed to accuse us. I, I turned to the curator. Mr. Dugo. Yes, Mr. Holliday. What, what are those figures? Well, they're Aztec gods. The one over here in the upper left is Quetzalcoatl, supreme god of the Aztecs. The one in the upper right is Huitzilopochtli. He's one of my favorites, the god of war. The one at the base of the triangle is Tlaloc, god of rain. Marina, those were the figures in your copybook. And they were above the words La Noche Triste. But why? Why should Dad have done that? Mr. Dugo, what is that triangle? Well, where each of those figures is painted was a temple long ago destroyed by the Spaniards under Cortez. In the center was one of the causeways that led to Tenochtitlan. That's today's Mexico City. It was over that causeway that the Spaniards made their escape on La Noche Triste. La Noche Triste. Look, sit down, Mr. Dougal. I want you to tell me a lot more. The curator talked for an hour. And what he told Marina and me all added up. The copybook, the figures of those old Aztec gods. Oh, Marina's father had something all right. And he hid it in that copybook. No wonder Bremer wanted it. No wonder old Mark had kept it, and the whole thing made a story that went back over 400 years. A story of greed and bloodshed. One that reached out to touch me, Marina, old Mark, Bremer, all of us. Later in Kling's office, facing the Bremers, was Marina sitting there, too. All right, Holiday, let's have it. First, I'll take that copybook, Bremer. All right. What good will it do you? None. And it wouldn't have done you any good, either. What do you mean, you caused the death of one man to get this. Another man, famous, respected, lost his head and tried to keep what he had found. But it wouldn't have done your father any good either, Marina. No, I... I know. What's the story, Dan? Well, it really begins, Kling, when Bremer found the remains of the late expedition in Brazil. He found letters, records. He brought some of them back with him, but some he didn't. Is that right, Bremer? You know everything. You tell it. Thank you, I will. One of the letters was to Marina. Marina, whose name is the same as the Indian girl who was Cortez's consort. That was the one you kept, Freeman. A letter telling Marina about the copybook and what it contained. All right, all right. What is it, Holiday? Let's, let's go back to July 1st, 1520. To Hernan Cortez and his army. The army that marched through Mexico and destroyed the Aztecs and Empire. That, that's got something to do with all this? Everything. On that night, the Aztecs rose up in fury against the Spaniards. They had thought Cortez and his men were gods, but they found out differently. They determined to drive the Spaniards out forever. The Spaniards took all the gold they could carry. The Aztecs went after them. They trapped Cortez and his army on one of the causeways that led to the city. The causeways were narrow. There were thousands of Indians in canoes. All night long, the battle went on until... Till in the morning, 450 of the Spaniards were dead and thousands of Aztecs. But Cortez and the remnant of his army escaped, got to the mainland. And uh, the copybook? Those three words, La Noche Triste, the sad night, are written into Mexican history as the night Cortez and his army and the Aztecs fought and killed each other until the canals were choked with them. The gold the Spaniards took with them did them no good. They couldn't fight with it or eat it. So sobbing and screaming, they dumped the treasure into the waters of the canal and it sank into the mud at the bottom. It's never been found. Marina's father thought he had located it. But look. Here's a map of modern Mexico City where the causeways once ran. There are streets and houses. So you see, no one will ever find that gold. 
And maybe, maybe it's just as well. It's, it's too red with blood to be of any use to anyone. If all that gold's there, why doesn't somebody go after it? Oh, you too, Susie. Oh, no, I guess not. But, oh, tell me something, Mr. Holiday. What were the names of those Aztec gods? Uh, quit the... Uh, uh, Wankin, Blankin, and Nod. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Ellen Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carson. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, care of the Star Times. Enclosed, you'll find enough money to do what I want you to do. Go to the Mason auction rooms and bid on an old Chinese teakwood box. I must have that box. And if you get it for me, wait for further instructions. further instructions. Hmm. No address, no signature. Just wait for further instructions. Well, as Bobby Burns would say, the best laid plans of mice and men sometimes go wrong. And Bobby Burns knew what he was talking about. Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Hot Box. It doesn't sound very interesting, Mr. Holliday. Uh, you never can tell, Susie. Now, suppose this teakwood box contains a million crown jewels, and suppose international jewel thieves are after them, and I get mixed up and. and... Gee, go on, Mr. Holliday. That sounded wonderful. Well, what happens then? Well, and then I. What am I saying? I must be out of my head. Well, well, well I think you should go uh, to the auction, I mean. Auctions are very interesting. I went to one once. They're, they're like a gin rummage sale. The gin, Susie. That's extra. Oh. Anyway, maybe I'll see what's in that teakwood box. You'll be able to reach me at the Mason auction rooms. Well, right there's where the plans begin to get twisted. I took a wrong turn and landed at the Mason auction room that the sale had started. Oh, oh, oh. They just sold a teakwood box. Sold it to a scared-looking little guy. He was about 55, pale, and he kept looking around the room while they wrapped the box for him. It wasn't big, that box. Maybe about the size of a cigar box. But the way the little man hugged it to him when he left, it could have been made of radium. Okay, so I missed the boat. Or, or I mean the box. But I wanted something for my trip across town, so I followed the pale little guy from the room. He looked around and saw me. I raised my hand to signal him, and that did it. He spun out to the sidewalk like a rabbit. I went after him. I wish I hadn't, because when he saw I meant to follow, he took a couple of wild looks around, and then... Hey, hey, look out! He ran across the street against the traffic signal and right into the path of a car. 
What happened here, anyway? I pushed my way oh, through the crowd to get him. The little guy was lying in the street. I couldn't help it. He ran right in front of me. He ran against the life. Hey, hey, did anybody see him? Did anybody see him? Yeah, I saw it. It wasn't your fault. No, no, it wasn't my fault. I was trying to stop. I wasn't going fast. I was just going to make the turn. It's... Well, well is he hurt bad? The little man looked as though he was badly hurt. Somebody sent for an ambulance, then I then I remembered the box. I looked around for it. It was on the street. He didn't have it anymore. I looked over the crowd. Nobody had it. Then I noticed the cab at the hack stand on the curb. And getting into it was a woman with red hair. And under her arm was the package. Before I could push my way back to the crowd, the cab was gone. But I saw its number. Okay, it'd be easy to check and find the driver's name and maybe... Maybe ask him a few questions. Well, I waited on the street until the ambulance got there. The intern said it was probably concussion. But that evening, I drove to the Marchmont Apartments. Yeah, that, that was where the driver of the cab said he took the woman. I looked at the names on the mailboxes. Nine apartments in the building. Well, one way to get in was to push all the buttons and wait for the door to click open. I went in, but as I did, I looked out the door. Oh, there was a tail on me. I caught a quick glimpse of a man's face. He hurried past, but not before he gave me a good look. Well, that teakwood box was leading to something. After disturbing seven occupants of seven different apartments and getting seven nasty comments, I rang one buzzer. The name underneath was Ruth Cornwall. Is that you, Tommy? Yes, Ruth. Just a second. Oh. Good evening. Who are you? Not the full of brush, man. May I come in? Of course not. Uh, I've come about a teakwood box. Will you please go? Oh, maybe you didn't hear me. I said I've come about the teakwood box, Miss Cornwall. I don't know what you're talking about. And if you don't go, I'll ring for the manager. All right. Ring for him. Well? Is this a joke? I don't know. That depends on you. Well, I... Come in. That's better. Now, who are you? My name's Dan Holliday. Do I know you? No, I... I don't think so. But I know you. Oh, you do? From where? Mm, from this afternoon... When you hopped into a cab with a package that belonged to a little man. Oh. Uh, <laughs> if that was supposed to be a careless laugh, you need a lot of rehearsal. Well, what makes you think I'm the person you're looking for? I just managed to catch sight of that beautiful red hair of yours. Really, Mr. Holliday, I thought this was a joke at first, but it's getting a little absurd. Oh, no, wait I think you'd better go now. All I want is an explanation. What's in that box? What's in that box that makes it so important? Well, uh... If I knew what box you were talking about, maybe I could tell you. That's good waltzing, Miss Cornwall. You wouldn't have let me in this apartment if you knew nothing about all this. But you were scared enough to let me come in and talk. That makes sense? Why should it? Because I could swear you seem relieved about something. Maybe, maybe you were expecting someone else to come after you. Were you? Of course not. All right, I'll wait. I don't think you will. Oh. Does this make you change your mind? Guns always have a habit of making a man think twice. Just think once, Mr. Holliday, about leaving now. Well, your arguments are stronger than mine, and I... Get out of here quickly. You're getting more company. Get out! Now, let's see. Anyone planning to sneak up on you could do the same as I did. Ring all the buzzers, get in the building, then come up here, but... If you don't leave, I'll... I don't think you will. You're very anxious to have me get out before this company gets up here. And you had better click that front door or you'll get impatient and go away. If, if I give you that box, will you leave? Ah, now we're getting someplace. Okay, you're talking into it. Wait. Here. Here it is. Now get out of here and don't come back. What was in it? Nothing. Now, please, will you go? For heaven's sake, please go. You got what you wanted? Now leave me alone. Well, look, I... Will you leave me alone if he sees you here? I... All right, Miss Cornwall. And please never come back. Never try to see me again. I 
I don't know what it was, but there was something about Ruth Cornwall that put me in sympathy with her. She needed help, wanted it, but it was as though she didn't dare tell me why. I went down the hall, ducked around a corner, and stopped just long enough to look back and see a man go into her apartment. I went downstairs, out onto the street. Keep walking, bub. Huh? I said keep walking, right up to that alley. Hey, what is this? I think you know. But if you want to play 20 questions, I'll let you ask one. This, give you a hint. Oh, when you pull that gun back, take it easy. I think you've got it caught in my ribs. Now walk. Far enough. Now what? Give me that box. What box? Ain't you funny? Yeah, I, I do card tricks, too. That's enough. Hand it over. This seems to be my night to play give and take. Okay. That's better. Now, good night, holiday. When the alleyway stopped spinning long enough for me to catch it, I I stood up on it. I looked at my watch. As closely as I could figure, the character who tattooed my head had put me out for a half an hour. See what you get when you put a gnat in the paper advertising for adventure? You get it. With lumps. Well, there was nothing more I could do that night. My head felt like the inside of a bass drum in a band. And all I wanted to do was hit Betty by and let my head rest on a nice, soft pillow. <laughs> Good morning, Sue. Oh. Uh, Mr. Holliday, this man's been waiting for you. Oh, uh, you again. Did you sleep all right, Mr. Holliday? Like a top, I spun. <laughs> yeah. Do you want me to do anything, Mr. Holliday? I wish you could, Susie. Mr. Holliday, I know a man who wants to see you right now. Uh-huh. Can I persuade you to come along, do you think? Y- yes, you seem to have a way about you. Susie. Uh, yes, Mr. Holliday? If I'm not back in three hours, call up the insurance company and get back that last premium I paid in advance. Huh? That's enough. Let's go, Holiday. Here's Holiday, Mr. Conrad. Oh, yes. Uh, please come in. Sit down. What's the idea? Funny, I was going to ask you that. Here, take a look. Well, that's the box. But it's empty. So it's empty. What am I supposed to do? Fill it with Easter eggs? Shut your trap, Holiday. Take it easy, Jimmy. Maybe Mr. Holiday will tell us things. Now, Mr. Holiday? Like what? Uh, look, I sent you the letter to bid on this box. I checked. Never mind how I found out who you were. Oh, well, then you should know I didn't get the box at the auction yesterday. I know, but you got it last night, Jim. From whom? Look, that's the way I got it. Empty. What more do you want from me? Information. Who had that box? I... Does it make any difference? You've got it now. I want what is in it. That's the way I got it. Jimmy. Yeah, Mr. Conrad? Did you see anybody take the box yesterday when that man was hit by the car? No. Whoever did got away fast. Uh, But Holiday, you went to the Marchmont Apartments last night. When you came out, you had the box. And that's as far as it goes? Uh, Not quite, Where'd you get it from? Conrad looked hard at me. So he didn't know Ruth Cornwall. I could tell him and put her on the spot. But I didn't want to do that. Not until I found out a bit more. Conrad got up from behind his desk. I don't know what game you're playing, Holiday, but I can tell you this. You won't play long. And I'm telling you, I got the box that way empty. All you have to do then is to tell me who picked up that box of the Edison in yesterday. Yes? And what if I don't? Uh, Jimmy. Yeah? How hard is Mr. Holliday's head? <laughs> Not very. Go ahead, then. Wait a minute. Uh, hold it, Jimmy. Okay, Holliday? What? Look, you want what was in that box, right? Sure. Then let me go after it. What are you talking about? You didn't go to the auction yourself to bid for the box, which means that you didn't want anybody to see you get it. All right. Whatever was in that box is important to you. But if you beat me up, you'll never find out. You see, 
I'm the only one who knows who had it. Well, we could go to the March Mart and find out. Sure, sure. But you wouldn't find anybody because... Because there's nobody there now. You're smart, huh? Yeah. Smart. It was a bluff. It had to be. But Conrad was afraid to call it. If he did, he wouldn't get what he wanted, he thought. He stared at me and then... Okay, Holiday. I, uh... I don't know how you found out how important this is, but evidently it did. All right? How much do you want? What makes you think I want anything? Are you kidding? Okay. We'll decide that after I get what you want. Uh, bring the notebook and we'll talk it over. It's a deal. Uh, but uh, you won't be alone, Holiday. You'll have company all the way. Oh, how nice. Jimmy has such a good face. You know, it'll do me a lot of good to be seen with him. Yeah, if you don't come through, it could also do you a lot of harm. Back to Hot Box, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, I could have wound up the whole thing by telling Conrad about Ruth Cornwall. But I didn't want to drag her in unless she was going to double-cross me. Okay, there had to be a starting point. And for me, it was the hospital where the little guy who had bought the box was taken after his accident. Well, I'm afraid you can't talk with him, Mr. Holliday. As a matter of fact, there was another man here yesterday. And he frightened our patient so badly that he had a relapse. Oh. Doctor, what's your patient's name? Ralph Sanders. Uh, he's an ex-convict. Uh, just got out of prison a few days ago. Oh. Okay, thanks, Doctor. Here's my name and phone number. If I can talk with him at any time, please call me, will you? <laughs> That was a dead end. Then I got the idea that the people at the auction rooms might be able to help. Here it is, Mr. Holliday. That box was uh, part of lot number 509. What does that mean? Well, lot 509 was in storage here. For a time, we received the money to pay for the storage, and <laughs> then it stopped. How long ago? Oh, it must have been over 60 days. We hold goods that long and then offer them for sale to pay for the storage charges. Hmm. How long did you have this lot 509? Mm, well, let me look at the books. Four years. Oh. Do you know the name of the person who owned the goods? Uh, James R. Conlon. Uh, at least that's the name on our books. Did you make any attempt to locate this Conlon after the payments on storage stopped coming in? Yes, we did. But we couldn't. I see. Oh, one more question. Did you advertise this sale? Oh, oh yes. yes. We're bound to by law. You advertise in the papers. That's right. Mm-hmm. Thanks very much. Well, there was one place to find out about James R. Conlon. The morgue of the Star Times. And what I found out began to slope the merry-go-round enough to let me see some of the things a little more clearly. Then at my apartment later today... Hello? Mr. Holliday? Yes, who's this? This is Dr. Evans, City Hospital. Oh, yes. Uh, Sanders is conscious now. Oh, fine. But I'm afraid that he won't live. Since you were the only person who left his name, I, I thought you'd want to know. Uh, may I see him? Well, you haven't much time. I'll be right there, Doctor. I saw the poor little guy. He was pathetically anxious to talk. He had been Conlon's cellmate in the penitentiary. And Conlon had talked. He had to talk to someone, tell about something he was saving up for when he got out. And it was Sanders he told about a teakwood box and what was in it. Never dreaming he'd die in prison before Sanders got out. Okay. Now it was my turn. I went outside... Hello, Jimmy. Still playing tag with me? What's the idea, Holiday? Oh, I'm full of ideas. But the best one of all is... Let's go to Conrad. 
Well, you got that book? Not with me, pretty boy. If you want to get your head singed... Look, we're going to Conrad right now. Why, I ought to poke you... You ought to, but you won't. Well, let's get going. If we stand here one more second, I'll let that notebook loose where it'll do the most good. Or the most harm. And that, big ears, depends on the point of view. Why, I... Okay. Okay, but you're asking for trouble. Ah. Let's go hunt for it, shall we? Uh, hello, Halliday. Glad to see you back. You're an optimist, Conrad. Here, I brought your son back with me. Say hello to Papa, Jimmy. What's this all about? I just got tired of having Jimmy Hawking. Jimmy, has he got it? Yeah. Where is it, Halliday? I know. With you? Oh, no, don't be silly. Jimmy, you let him get it and do a fade out on you. No, no, I didn't. Oh, no, Jimmy was with me all the way and a more gruesome companion no man could ask for. Stop yapping. Okay. A while ago, I talked with a little guy named Ralph Sanders. Sanders? So? He was Conlon's cellmate in prison. Go on. It seems Mr. Conn had a notebook filled with a lot of details that would blow you and your nice bunch right out of the window. Where is it? As if I tell you. Now listen. You found out about the box because Sanders talked. The prison grapevine picked it up and it got to you. You wrote me. Wanted me to bid on the box and get it for you. <laughs> the joke's on you, Conrad, because I didn't have the faintest idea what was in that box before today. How long do you think you'll enjoy this big joke on me? A long, long time. I'm walking out of here right now with no tail on me. Yeah? Uh-huh. Because if I don't show up where I'm supposed to, in exactly one hour, that notebook goes to the police. Uh, listen, uh, you're smart. Uh, we can make a deal. Oh, no. Remember, I'm walking out of here. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Good night, Jimmy. Well, his head's not very hard either, is it? Sure, I walked out all right, but I expected to feel my back pick up a few ounces of lead on the way. I didn't. I was very happy about that. Ah, there was still one more thing to clear up. Ruth Cornwall. If she had that notebook and Conrad found out about it, then I was out in the cold. I got to the Marchmont apartment as fast as I could because it could be that she was going to do a little business with Conrad herself. I got in, went to her apartment. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry I couldn't wait to be invited in. I told you not to come back here. Yes, I know, but I'm back. What do you want? Last night you gave me a box. Now I want what was in it. There was nothing in it. Not even a notebook with some very startling things in it? About a certain Mr. Conrad and his gang? So you found out about this? Yeah, but in finding out, I put myself in a wonderful spot to get acquainted with a mortician. All right, so you know. But what good will it do you? What good will it do you? That's no concern of yours. Oh, yes, it is. Put yourself in my place. Conrad thinks I've got the notebook. He also knows who I am and where I live. Now, when he finds out I don't have the notebook and can't hold it over his head, he's going to get awfully, awfully rough with me. <laughs> and that seems to be your problem, Mr. Holliday. Uh -huh. And you won't give me any help with it. Why should I? Fair question. I'll answer it. Because I don't think you want to see me get killed. Look... I can't help you. Do you understand that? I can't help you at all. Where's the book? It's no use. I won't tell you. I won't tell you anything. Anything? Why did you put that on the end? Mr. Holliday, the last time you were here, I was at a disadvantage. Now, our positions have reversed. I think you'll leave now without giving me any more trouble. All right. You ask for it. You'll get it. What do you mean by that? I did a lot of reading today, Miss Conlon. No. Oh, don't call me that. You don't know that. You, you can't know that. No. No, you can't know that. It was a throw in the dark, but it was where I wanted it to. The clippings on Conlon mentioned something about a daughter. Not much. 
But enough to give me a hint that Ruth Cornwall and Ruth Conlon were the same. I watched her for a few seconds and then... All right. I'm Ruth Conlon. Are you satisfied now? Not quite. What I said before still goes. Do you want me to get killed? No. No, of course not. And what are you doing with that notebook? Well, I... If I tell you, what do you do? That depends on what you tell me. All right. I'll tell you. My father died in prison. No one knows I'm his daughter. No one. For four years, I've lived under another name, waiting for him to come home, waiting to help him get even with Conrad and the men who sent him to prison. Sure, he could have told things at his trial. He knew he'd been double-crossed, but he wanted to wait. And now? And now I... I don't know. Why don't you know? I'm going to get married. You see, I, I didn't count on falling in love at 35. Falling in love with Tommy. Oh, he was the man who came here last night after I, after I left. Yes. I had to get that notebook. Because if someone else got hold of it, all the old scandal would be raked up again. People would find out who I was, that my father died in prison. And Tommy would find out. I see. I waited a long time to get even with Conrad, but now I don't want to because of Tommy. Oh, don't you see? I can't let anyone else have that notebook. I want a chance to live like anyone else, like you or a million other people. Yes, I, I see. So, now what do you do? I... I can't do a thing, Miss Conlon. It's your problem now. Mine. That's right. You can destroy that book and let Conrad go along his merry way. You, you can forget your father. He's dead. Whatever happens to Conrad now won't help him. That's true. But leave us out of it. If you let a man like Conrad go free when you could put him where he belongs, that wouldn't be any good, would it? Oh, please, please stop it. And maybe something you've never thought about, but... What? Someday, someday your Tommy might find out. Oh, no. You've got nothing to be ashamed of. It wasn't you. It was your father. Why don't you start with a clean page? If, if this Tommy's a right guy, you'll understand. Well, Miss Conlon. Hello, Tommy. Darling, I... I want you to come over right away. There's something... we've got to talk over. All right, dear. I'll give... ten to one on Tommy, Ruth. of Notorious Racketeer after five years. Dead Man's Notebook... Forget that, Susie. Turn to the society page. Oh, thanks. Here. Ah, read that. Mr. and Mrs. Tommy Gibson leave for Bahamas on honeymoon. Gee, the Bahamas. You must feel just like stupid, Mr. Holiday. The word is Cupid, Susie. And I'm dressed differently. Mr. Holiday. <laughs> Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood.
Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. Your advertisement in the paper has intrigued me. Naturally, I wonder whether you are serious or insane. Either way, I think I should like to meet you and uh, perhaps offer a proposition which may intrigue you. Incidentally, there is a hundred thousand dollars concerned. Does that get your interest? If it does, I shall expect you at dinner tomorrow night. I shall expect you at dinner tomorrow night at eight. It will be informal, so don't bother to dress. Yours for adventure, Charles Winthrop. <laughs> Does a hundred thousand dollars interest me, yes. Brother, that much money would put new life in a mummy. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure... The Better Man. Charles Winthrop. Charles Winthrop. You know, Mr. Holliday, that name sounds awfully familiar. Well, it should, Susie. Mr. Winthrop is one of the richest men in the country. Oh, sure. I remember now. He, he's a regular crisis. A what? Don't you know, Mr. Holliday? Crisis was a rich king. Oh, don't you know, Susie? Croesus, not crisis, was a rich king. Oh, someday I'll pronounce something right. <laughs> you do and you'll lose your job. Okay, Susie, it's dinner tonight with Charles Winthrop to see what's on that mind of his. <laughs> Cigar, Mr. Holliday? No, thanks. Uh, more coffee, perhaps. I don't think so, thanks. <laughs> Curious, Holliday? Very. <laughs> All right, my boy. We'll take care of that shortly. Oh, excuse me. I want to tell my butler he needn't stay around. Oh, William, William, come here a moment, will you? Whatever Mr. Charles Winthrop had on his mind, it was hugely funny to him. All through dinner, he'd stop eating, slap his thigh, and laugh. <laughs> and I wasn't saying anything funny either. Oh, William. I watched him as he told the butler what he wanted. I think you have the knife. I got a kick out of him. Short, thin little man with a twist of gray hair that kept floating over his spectacles. And when he talked, he craned his neck forward like an inquisitive bird, his little eyes twinkling. Oh, he was enjoying a great joke, and I, I wondered what it was. All right, Holiday. We'll be alone and we can chin a little. <laughs> Think I'm crazy, huh? <laughs> Mr. Winthrop, any man who can collect about 20 millions is crazy like a fox. Oh, money isn't everything. <laughs> no, some people die young. <laughs> Touche. Now, let's get right to the point. As I understand it, you advertise for adventure to get uh, plots for your uh, fiction, right? Right. So I'd say you'd like my little proposition. Well, that all depends. Ah, surely. Well, some place in this city, I have hidden a packet containing a hundred one thousand dollar bill. You hear me? I'm afraid I do. No one knows what it is but me. But you can find out. I know a lot of people who would like to find a hundred thousand. Oh, I know. That's why I thought of this wonderful thing. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. What wonderful thing? Ever been to Tibet, Holiday? Not recently. Uh, oh, China, India, Japan, Africa, Malaya. What are you getting at? At me. I've been to all those places, Holiday. 
I went before they stank up the streets with gasoline, uh, commercialized the pyramids, lighted up the tombs with floodlights, and made the world just one long, big bore. And? Well, I'm tired of being bored. I want excitement. So you hit $100,000 where you can find it. What's exciting about that? <laughs> You're going to hunt for it. I am, huh? So are three other persons whom you don't know, whom you've never seen. And these three other persons have never seen you. Ooh, we'll be a cozy little crowd. Oh, think so. But never mind that for a minute. Now, I take it uh, you've got a good income, huh? Not like yours. But then I never eat caviar. <laughs> but you're, you're, you're comfortably fixed, eh? All right, yes. Oh, magnificent. That makes it perfect. I'll have a grand time. Oh. Well, drop me a postcard. I'll keep in touch. Oh, now, wait, wait. If you find the money, I will match it with another 100000 and give it to any charity or cause you name. Oh, cancer Research, Infantile Paralysis Fund, or any of a dozen. Or split the entire amount any way you want. Now, how's that? It sounds good. Now, what's the rest of this? Oh. At midnight tonight, after you leave, I will drop four letters in the mailbox. These four letters will be identical. Each will contain the first clue to the whereabouts of the money. The first clue will lead to the next and to the next... And so on until the money is found. Is that it? Exactly. Each of the four persons concerned will receive one of those letters at the same time. <clears throat> the hunt will be on. I take it you had one of these cozy little dinners for each of the other three. Yes, that's right. Each one agreed. Each one agreed to turn the money over to charity. <laughs> Maybe I'm bringing back vaudeville. I'm killing it. No, 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 no. Now, this is what makes the plan so perfect. One of the persons is a man who would kill to get that much money. Oh, I chose him well. Oh, no. He'll not turn the money over to charity. I see. And the others in this little game? Well, I'm not so sure. But $100,000 is a lot of money. I've watched people grab and cut each other's throats for much less, Holiday. In other words, you'd send four people against each other to amuse yourself. No thanks, Winthrop. I'll take my hat and some clean, fresh air. Well, uh, after all, Mr. Holiday, you, you, you advertised adventure wanted. That's right. And that's not an entry blank into a cutthroat game to amuse a cynical old man who's down to his last 20 million. So long. Uh, wait. What for? Now, listen. Those other three who are going after the money. Now, now, one is a man to whom the money would mean cheap nightclubs, gambling, and everything else his stupid mind thinks is life and living. Uh, the other two would keep the money, I'm sure. Unless you keep them from getting it. Oh, but I won't. I'll watch them play my game and let the one who wins take the stakes. But you, oh, Holiday... What makes you think a hundred thousand wouldn't tempt me? Oh, I got my money by knowing people. So? You got the chance to get $200,000 for a worthy cause if you play. And if I don't? The money will still go to one of the other three. And I'm inclined to think the killer will win unless uh, he's playing against a smarter man. Well? What if someone gets killed? How will you feel? <laughs> no better, no worse than now. Did you ever start to think it would be the same as murder? What law could touch me, Holiday? I hid the money, I give out the clues. If someone gets killed, the money is the murderer, not me. I see. Of course, if you refuse, you can always think of how much good the money could have done. Why, you... <laughs> I'll send out the letters at midnight, Holiday, four of them. You'll get yours in the morning. So you have all night to make up your mind whether the money is squandered by a cheap, stupid fool or helps some of humanity. I went home. I went to bed. I didn't sleep much. I had dreams. Dreams that featured the grinning, weasened face of old man Winthrop, thousand-dollar bills, sick kids in hospitals... They changed places with each other all night. Then in the morning. All right. All right, who is it? Special delivery, Mr. Holiday. Okay, thanks. Shove it under the door. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. It was from Winthrop. At first, I wanted to burn it. Forget the whole thing. Because the thought of people running around the city fighting over that money made me... Well, it made me a little sick. Then... Well, I guess I was mad at Winsor for his cynical attitude that the killers would always win. I opened the letter and later in my office listened to Susie read it. 
High swings the hunter, his dog's eye bright. Where science is king, the clue will be right. What's it mean, Mr. Holiday? I don't know. High swings the hunter, his dog's eye bright. Hunter? Hunter? Me? And his dog's eye bright. I never saw a dog with only one eye, or, or, or a hunter with a dog's eye. His dog. And why, where science is king? Gee, I never saw a puzzle like this one before. Well, old man Winthrop is certainly having his fun. I, I worked out a puzzle once about movie stars. Uh, the names were all jumbled, see? A and Susie. And... Mm -hmm. Susie, said that again. Say what? What kind of a puzzle did you work out? One about movie stars. Why? Stars, stars, stars. Susie, you're wonderful. Am I? Absolutely magnificent. Here. Mr. Holiday, you... You kissed me. All that in a raise, too. But what did I say? The dog star, Susie, the dog star. What dog star? Hand me that encyclopedia quickly. Gee. Here. Now. Now. Dog star, dog star. Ah, here. here, listen. The dog star, or Sirius, brightest star in the sky, in constellation Canis Major, the great dog. Oh, but what about the hunter? Listen, Sirius may be seen below and to the left of the constellation Orion, the hunter. That's it, Susie. High swings the hunter, his dog's eye bright. Uh-huh, but what about the next line? Where science is king, the clue will be right. I don't know, but it's got to have something to do with Orion, the hunter. Uh, listen, Susie, I'm going to find out a few things. I'll be at the Star Times for the next half hour. Okay, I'll say one thing for Winthrop. He made the game fun to play. That is, if keeping one step ahead of a killer was any fun. Anyway, at the start of time, I talked to the science editor. <laughs> Say, what the devil are you up to, Dan? Hey, look, Lou, give me some help, will you? If I can, Dan, sure. What's your problem? Uh, read this. What is all this? Never mind now. I'll explain later. But Orion is the hunter. Oh, I see. Well, what do you want to know? What about Orion? Does it, does it swing high? Sure, it rises roughly in the east, swings upward in an arc, and then sets. When is it at its highest? Oh, I should say around midnight. Midnight, midnight. Okay, now what about that where science is king line? Make anything out of that? Mm, well, I should say science is king at an astronomical observatory. At least that would tie in with the rest of this doggerel. Lou, Lou, you're wonderful. <laughs> oh, by the way, Lou... There's an observatory in town, isn't there? Sure, the Winthrop Observatory. The Winthrop? Mm-hmm. Somebody managed to squeeze a few shekels out of the old boy to build the thing. He insisted it carry his name. So, so it all fits. Okay, Lou, tonight I'm going to be a stargazer. <laughs> It was hard to wait through the rest of the day, but I made it. But that night, I drove up the long, winding road that led to the Winthrop Observatory. <laughs> Again, the old man picked his spot nicely. It was dark, and a creeping, damp fog settled down in curling waves. There wasn't a light within ten miles. Then I broke out of the fog, and the mountain leveled off. In the sky, the stars were big and bright. And I came to the end of the road... And from here on, it was shoe leather instead of horsepower. I looked up in the sky. Swinging up in front of me was Orion. Below and to the left of him, a white star shimmered in the night sky. Sirius, the dog star. I looked at my watch. The luminous hands were almost straight up. Okay, midnight, Orion, Sirius. Then what? Who's that? Well, well, well. Mr. Holiday. Winthrop. Yes, yes, indeed. Didn't think I missed the fun, did you? Well, come on, Holiday. Straight ahead. Hey, on the path. Good evening, Holiday. Uh, what now, little rich man? <laughs> so you figured it out, eh? Why else would I be here? Very clever. All right. Here's an envelope. What do I do with it? Oh, there's another clue in it. The second. Oh. How long does this go on? 
<laughs> I'm having such a wonderful time, I'd like it to go on forever. But I'll play the game fairly. One more after this, and that's all. I see. You're really making this great for yourself, aren't you? <laughs> You'll be at each stop, I suppose. Oh, oh, yes. And I wonder how many clues I'll have to give out. What do you mean? Well, only you and one other person showed up here tonight. What? One of them? Yes. And guess who it was. Do I have to guess? Oh, I'll tell you. The only person beside yourself was the gentleman who would play rough. Very rough. I'm afraid, Holiday, that from now on, you better watch yourself. <laughs> Now back to The Better Man, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. It was like playing tag with a, a ghost or fighting a mist. I don't know why I kept at it, except by this time I would have crawled across the Sahara Desert in an overcoat to get that money from Winthrop. When I left him at the observatory, I went to my apartment. There I opened the envelope. Ah, oh, this one was better than the first. It said, He's king, yet a slave. And free, yet a captive. And we, who are weaker, are yet stronger. Those whom he ruled are close to his might, yet fear him not by day or by night. Well, this made a lot of sense. It was after three in the morning when I finally gave up on it and went to sleep. Oh, no, Mr. Holiday. It just doesn't make sense. Come on, Susie. Think. Say anything. Anything what? He's he's king, yet a captive. How can he be king and yet be a captive? That's the point. If we figure that out, we've got the rest. I never was good at riddles. I... Come in. You, Dan Holiday? Yeah, that's right. I want to talk to you. Who are you? Makes no difference. Can you get rid of the dame? I'm not a dame. I'm a secretary. Blow, will you? Hey, wait a minute, bud. Didn't you get in the wrong act? Sit down, Holiday. I'm not tired. Okay, stand then. Get rid of the dame. Susie, run down to the Star Times and pick up the mail, will you, please? All right, Mr. Holiday. But tell him I'm not a dame. Okay. Maybe you know why I come here, huh? I can make a good guess. All right, swell. Now we don't have to beat each other's brains out. I didn't know we were booked for it. <laughs> you could use 50 grand, couldn't you? Keep talking. All right, look. What's the sense in both of us running around in this rat race? You the rat? Don't talk like that, Holiday. Why don't you get to the point? Okay. You and me got the only clues. We team up. We'll reach 50 grand to the good. <laughs> Which means you can't figure out this second clue from Winthrop. Maybe. If you had it figured, you wouldn't be here now. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm, that's right. What do you say? What if I won't make it a duet? What makes you think you'll get to that money? Nothing, right now. I asked a question. What do you say? The answer is no. That final? You can close the books, lover boy. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah? How did you know who I was and where to find me? I didn't know you or where to find you. You figure it, Holiday. You got the brains. But get this. I'll be right on your trail from now on out. If you change your mind about that split, put an ad in the agony column of the papers. I'll see it. So long. Well, 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 that flat-eyed character knew me. But Winthrop said none of us would know each other. So I looked up Winthrop's number in the phone book, dialed it, and... Hello? Winthrop? Yes. Oh, is this Holiday? Look, uh, I just had company. No. Yes, thanks for sending him, Winthrop. How did you know I did? Don't give me that house, but he knew who I was. <laughs> That's right. I 
ahead and put a little uh, little zip into the game, Holiday. He's such a charming fellow, isn't he? Okay, you've had your belly laugh, but that's it. Oh, you're not quitting. I don't like to be thrown to the lions. What did you say? I said I... I... <laughs> well, go on. He's king. Got a captive. King of the beasts. The lion. Wonderful. Now all you have to do is follow it up. Nothing doing. Oh, you're so close, Holiday. And all you have to do is be careful. I'm beginning to like you less and less. <laughs> I'm not a likable person. However, whether you go on or not is your affair. But I should be very disappointed in you if you didn't. Hello. 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 <laughs> had the choice, and I was itching to get even with Winthrop. Somehow I was beginning to suspect he had no intention of letting go of a hundred thousand dollars, and that made up my mind for me. I figured out the rest of his little note, and the only place I could see a lion free, yet captive, was at a zoo. So it was to the zoo I went. The park was crowded, kids, grown-ups, all milling around. Then I came to the lion pits, those semi-natural habitats without bars. I drifted close with the rest of the crowd, leaned over the iron railing that ran along the edge of the moat, and then... I didn't try it. Thanks for helping. Brother, they almost had real fresh meat. What'd you do, lean over too far? Yeah, much too far. And I had help. Lucky you thought to grab that rail. It was a good thought. Thanks again. That's okay, mister. Boy, oh boy. Well, well, well. Did you uh, have a little trouble, Holiday? Winter. Ah, pretty close, wasn't it? Did, uh, did someone shove you? You guess, Winthrop. You yeah, know what some people will do for money. Winthrop, you're not very big. A nice, easy shove, and you'd be where I almost went. Oh, but you won't, Holiday. You won't because you're not the type that kills. Now, your anxious friend is different from you. <laughs> I don't know what keeps me from seeing how tightly your head's on your neck. Oh, you don't like me. All right, Holiday. You've reached the end of the trail. Be at my home at eight tonight. <laughs> It was 8 o'clock when I walked up the steps in front of the winter home. There were little chills chasing each other on bicycles up and down my spine. But I rang the bell. Oh, good evening, Holiday. Come in. What have you got lined up for the night? Come this way. Ah, in here. Ah, sit down, Holiday. Thanks. <laughs> I suppose you'd call all this quite fantastic, wouldn't you? You're insane. <laughs> aren't we all? <laughs> I'm just able to indulge my whims. Most people aren't. Well, I suppose you want the money, huh? You're not kidding anybody, Winthrop. There isn't a penny hidden anywhere. Oh, yes, there is. But the game is not quite over. What do you mean? Uh, you may come in now. I believe you two know each other. Yeah, Sure. Thanks for almost making me Daniel in the lion's den. Bring nothing of it. What is this, Winthrop? A patience holiday. I have a proposition. The best part of the game. Here is $100,000 in cash. Now, you two can decide what to do about it. You can divide it equally, or may the better man take it all. I looked at Winthrop. He was grinning. I looked at the other man. He, he wasn't grinning. He was eyeing that package of money. Then he looked at me, and it was easy to see what was on his mind. And Winthrop saw it, too, because he leaned forward. A hundred thousand is much better than fifty, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> As you see, I am armed. You two are not. Suppose we decide to split. That decision will have to be unanimous with both of you. I ain't splitting it. Good! <laughs> I thought I'd chosen well in you. <laughs> well, Holiday... 
What if I just decide to leave? You won't, because I won't let you. I want my fun, Holiday. Don't spoil it. He looked at me with his little black eyes, and he kept that gun pointed out at me, too. I can shoot you now, and your friend here will be a witness that you attacked me. A hundred thousand dollar witness. Well? Let's get it over with. Exactly. There are no windows in this room, no servants in the house, and only one door. The money's on the desk. It will be merely a fight over money if the police come in today. <laughs> when you've had your little uh, argument, the one who's left can uh, knock on this door, and I'll come and unlock it. Good hunting, gentlemen. This is it. The man left with me got up off his chair walked slowly toward me. I thought maybe I could reason with him. But what argument can you use on a killer? Then... <laughs> Holiday. Surprise, Winthrop. Right. <laughs> Congratulations, Holiday. Uh, brains and brawn. Rare combination. All right. There's the money. Take it, and I'll match it with another hundred thousand. You'll match it with a half a million. Uh, uh, what? You heard me. Your pal there is out right now, but in a minute he'll come too. And I'll leave him alone with you with that money still on the desk. If you can't, I... Go My ahead, God. No, Winthrop. Listen, Holiday. Now, you're not a killer. You, you you wouldn't leave me alone with him. No. Watch. And I'll take your gun with me. And lock the door behind me. After he wakes uh, up. Wait. And I could be a witness. A hundred thousand dollar witness that he killed you in self-defense. You wouldn't. You, why, you, you, you're not that kind. You want to play dog, eat dog, not play it. I... All right. All right. What do you want? Sit down at your desk, make out a check for a half a million. We'll decide where it goes later. And we'll both go to the bank tomorrow and cash it. <laughs> Something funny? <laughs> it's just that I, I could refuse to have it honored at the bank. Yes. Yes, you could. But you won't. All right, Holiday. You've almost restored my faith in people. Give me that pen. <laughs> to charity and medical research. Look, he gets his picture in the paper. Uh-huh. But you did all the work. I'll tell you something, Susie. What, Mr. Holliday? I, uh, I got even with the man who called you a dame. Satisfied now? Well, I don't know. He was kind of cute at that. Oh, no. Good night, Susie. Next week, same time... Through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Dear Dan, I know all about your Box 13 ad in the Star Times. 
but I'm writing to you as a friend to come and see me. As you know, I'm teaching at Riddell College, not too far from where you are. Frankly, I've got a problem. I don't know whether it's anything very exciting. Matter of fact, it's sort of personal. But, well, will you come to see me? Bob Lamb. Yeah, it was a personal problem, all right, at first. Then the whole thing got tangled around. Up to my neck. Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Professor and the Puzzle. Maybe it'll be a kind of a vacation for you, Mr. Holliday. Could be, Susie, but somehow I have a habit of running into trouble or it runs into me. Well, why don't you be careful, then? Oh, now, who has fun that way? Remember that old saying, never trouble trouble until it... Oh, no, that's wrong. It's, it's, it's never trouble, trouble until... You... No, well, it's... Ne- tell you what, Susie. You keep working on it. I'll be back in, say, say a week. Riddell College in the northern part of the state was one of those little places where classes are more important than football, and education is still the prime reason for the buildings being there. I drove to the campus, found the teacher's club where Bob stayed. He, he was a bachelor. And later at dinner... I don't know, Dan. Maybe all this is silly, but... Oh, I thought perhaps you could help. Well, I can't unless I know what's troubling you. Well, I... I was engaged to be married. What? Who changed whose mind? Evelyn. I mean, she changed hers. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. What happened? Well, I don't know, Dan. Everything was fine for a while, and then... Poof. It's all off. And you don't know why? No. Well, did you say something? Do anything? Not that I know of, but... But what, Bob? (laughs) Listen, let's forget it. I almost sent you a wire telling you to forget my letter. Mm, But you didn't. Which means you've got something else on your mind. Want to spill it? All right. But don't let Evelyn know I told you. Well, of course not. Well, everything was fine, as I said, until... Until her uncle committed suicide. Suicide? Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Now she's going to marry Ed Macklin. Oh, now, wait a minute. Her uncle killed himself, and that makes her break her engagement with you and tie up with this Macklin. <laughs> Doesn't make much sense, does it? Not enough to do much good. Is that all you know? Yes. Just a day or so before... before he died, Evelyn sent back my ring. Just like that, huh? Oh, there was a note, but it wasn't an explanation. Just that she thought it wouldn't work. No hint of that before Uncle's death. None, Dan. Absolutely none. That's what's got me stumped. But I could understand it if... if it wasn't Ed Macklin. He's lots older than she is. Why, it was a kind of a joke between us that he... Who is... uh, Who is Ed Macklin? Well, he was her uncle's assistant. Assistant? (laughs) I'm making this as clear as a mud puddle. But Evelyn's uncle, Professor Gardner, was professor of mineralogy. Macklin was his laboratory assistant. Oh, oh, oh. And that's all I know. You sure? Well, of course. All right, now the $64 question. Why did Professor Gardner kill himself? Dan, believe me when I tell you he didn't have a reason in the world. Not a single reason. Well, that made as much sense as double talk from Alice in Wonderland. Bob stuck to it, too. The professor, Gardner, didn't have a reason to kill himself. Evelyn, it seemed, had been raised by him. He was like a father to her. He was respected, well-liked, famous in a small way for his pamphlets and articles. And I got an explanation of his specialty later from Bob in his rooms. He was a crystallographer, Dan. That means he, he studied the crystallization of minerals. You see, each mineral has its own particular crystalline formation. Salt, for example, as common table salt, crystallizes in a particular way. Galena, we used to call it the crystal in the old radio sets, you remember, that has another form of crystallization. Well, Professor Gardner was an expert. Well, was he working too hard? 
I don't think so. It was never work for him. Oh, I see. Well, what do I do now? I don't know. I, I thought maybe you could... Well, I guess it's hopeless. Look, Bob, uh, is it certain that Professor Gardner killed himself? What do you mean? Well, you said there was no reason for suicide. There wasn't. Would anyone have wanted to kill him? No. You're sure about it? I said no. Everybody liked him. Maybe somebody didn't. I didn't know of anyone. And suddenly Evelyn breaks off her engagement with you just after... Now, look, Dan, I'm sorry I got you up here. I, I guess I was stupid to write to you. Go back and forget the whole thing. You're afraid Evelyn's involved. I'm not. That's what's in the back of your mind, but you're afraid to say something. I said I'm not. Okay, 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 Bob. Still want me to go back? Well? No. No, you find out what you can, Dan. Without getting anyone in trouble. Trouble has a bad habit of popping up. I don't want it to. But you still want me to stay? I guess so. All right. But get this straight, Bob. I am not a detective. What do you mean by that? If I find anything fishy about this, I'll have to call the police. They've already been in. All right. I'll start from here. For the rest of the evening, we sat and talked. Bob was nervous. He wanted me to help because... Well, because he was in love with Evelyn. But he didn't want me to help because he was afraid of what might turn up. Well, what could turn up? <laughs> I found out. It was the next morning that I put in a call to Lieutenant Kling. Waited a half hour. Then ambled down to the local police department of Riddell. Oh, yes, Mr. Holiday. Lieutenant Kling called here. Told me about you. I asked him to. Uh, Named Carson. I'm chief police here. Yes, I know. What can I do for you, son? Well, if I'm butting in where I don't belong, just say so, will you? <laughs> Can't tell that. They spit out what's on your mind. Chief Carson leaned back, lighted a corn cob pipe, and waited for me to start talking. I liked him. Behind that pink face was a good, shrewd mind. I told him I had come to Riddell and when I'd finished. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. You ain't a detective. No, not even a private one. <laughs> just uh, helping a friend, eh? That's all. Well... Can't say I can tell you any more than Bob Lanham did. You sure? Yep. Found Professor Gardner in his laboratory. Oh, at the college? No, he had a little workshop back of his house. He was sitting at his table there, his own gun in his hand. Shot himself through the heart. Oh? Something sound odd to you, sir? Yes, a man doesn't usually kill himself that way. That's right. Usually in the head. But that's the way it was, huh? Mm-hmm. Tell me, are you satisfied with the case, Chief Carson? Got to be, son. Which means you're not. Now, look here, son. I'm only a small-town policeman, but I do my work the best I can. Yes, I know. And the thing that's puzzling you is, why should Professor Gardner have killed himself? Uh-huh. Or, if he didn't, who else would have? And there's no one else. Nobody stood to gain nothing. Wasn't a rich man. His niece. Mm, no, I'm sure she didn't. What about uh, Ed Macklin? Nothing to gain. Got it marked down as suicide, son. Just as dead end as a blind rabbit burrow. And so it was. A dead end. I didn't press Chief Carson any further. He was shrewd enough to look for clues, and there just weren't any. I went back to Bob's rooms and stopped outside the door. It sounded as though a square dance were going on with hot music. I opened the door fast. All right, break it up. Come on. Come on, break it up. Bob, stop. Bob, get back. Now. Try it again, let him, and I'll turn uh, Dan, get out of the way. I'll cut it out. Oh, let him come on. Get out of here, Macklin. For now, sure. But try to see Evelyn once more, and I'll beat your head in, that's all. He's a little bigger than you are, Bob. All around. I'll kill him. Now, 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 take it easy. What happened? Well, I... I tried to see Evelyn this afternoon. She wouldn't talk to me. Macklin came in a couple of minutes ago and... Well, you saw what was happening. Yeah, yeah, I did. <laughs> the nice eye you've got there. Shut up. Oh, now, look, remember me? 
I'm sorry, Dan. Okay. So that's Macklin. Uh huh. Sit down, Bob. I don't want to sit down. Sit down. All right. Now that's better. Now, how far do you think you're going to get by running into his fist? Now listen, Dan, I've got to see Evelyn. I've got to find out what's going on. All right, maybe we will. Why is Macklin afraid to let you talk to Evelyn? I don't know, Dan. I take it he's, well, to use an old-fashioned word, a rival. I never thought so. But then... But then, just before her uncle's suicide, she suddenly switches to Macklin. But why? Why should she? If you find the answer to that, Bob, we'll find out a lot of things. Now, let's get a side of beef and fix up that eye. You're going to look pretty silly teaching class tomorrow with a shiner. didn't look silly in class. You see, he never got there. The next morning, I was pulled out of a nice deep sleep by... Nobody home. Oh. Hello. Dan? Yeah, sure. Bob? Yeah. Dan, I'm in trouble. Great. How could you get in trouble at six in the morning? That's too early. It's not a joke, Dan. I'm in jail. Huh? For what? For killing Ed Macklin. Of course, I didn't kill him. I believe you, but look, haven't you got any alibi at all for last night? No. When you left me, I went for a walk to think things over. Oh, fine, fine. Everybody goes for walks when somebody gets killed. What time was Macklin killed? Just about the time I was out for that walk. Morning, holiday. I see. Oh, hello, Chief. You want some breakfast, son? No, no, nothing. Well, you got to eat, son. Got some ham and eggs. Nothing, I said. Uh, bring it, Chief. He'll eat it. Uh-huh. You want anything? Meaning me? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Oh, not at all. Looks bad, don't it? Yeah. Why did you arrest Bob? Well, you ought to know, son. You saw the fight they was having. One of the teachers living next door to Bob here heard it. And... Oh. Yeah. Well, it looks like you've got a motive, Chief. Uh-huh. Macklin takes his girl. They get in a fight. I didn't kill him. Now, I want to believe that, but... Chief, I'd like to talk to Bob if I can. Huh? Oh. All right, I'll get the ham and eggs. Be back in maybe ten minutes. Don't you believe me, Dan? Oh, of course I do, Bob. Look, uh, how was Macklin killed? Knife. His oh. own. Uh-huh. Now, listen, i got to see Evelyn. What for? Because I believe everything goes back to her uncle and, and his death. How? I don't know. But I'd like to find out. Nothing makes sense. Nobody had a motive for killing Professor Gardner. And everyone says he couldn't have killed himself because he didn't have a reason. So what have you got? What have I got? Bob, I... I haven't the faintest idea. Yet. <laughs> Now back to the Professor and the Puzzle, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. I didn't have a thing. Not a thing to go on. Bob was in a spot, but a good one. He had motive, opportunity. Yet I didn't think he'd kill. I believed he couldn't. And I kept thinking that Professor Gardner's suicide had something to do with Macklin's murder. But how? A harmless professor kills himself. His niece suddenly breaks off her engagement and switches to another man, and that man is killed, and... And who gets the brass ring on this merry-go-round? Well, it was about time to see Miss Evelyn Gardner. I found the address, drove there, and... No one answered the door, but I heard someone in the back. So I walked around the side of the house, and putting some papers into an incinerator was a girl of maybe 24, 25. She seemed to be in a hurry, anxious to get it over with. Then she turned when she heard my steps. Oh, who are you? I'm sorry. My name's Dan Holliday. Oh, oh yes, I, I've heard Bob speak of you. Oh, go ahead. 
Finish what you were doing. Oh. Well, I... I haven't got a match. I, I wanted to burn this... this rubbish. Oh. oh. Here's a match. I'll light it for you. Oh, no. No, I can do it. Oh, it's no trouble. I said I'd do it. Well, all right. Here, uh, Here's the match. Thank you. Whatever she was burning, she was anxious to get it over with. But she was a little nervous, and the match went out. Oh, please, have you another match? Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm afraid that was the last one I had. Well, I'll have to get some. Will you come into the house? Oh, thank you. Did Bob come with you, Mr. Holliday? Bob? Haven't you heard? Heard? Heard what? No. No one's told you? Told me what? What are you talking about? Bob's been arrested for the murder of Ed Macklin. Oh, no. No, he didn't. How do you know? Oh, we've got to see him. That might help, but how, how can you be sure Bob didn't do it? Oh, he couldn't have. Then who did? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, but it wasn't Bob. It has something to do with your uncle's death, doesn't it? No, no, nothing. How could there be a connection? I'm asking you. I'm going to Bob. I've got to see him. And she was gone. I watched her drive away, then I hurried back to the incinerator. It was stuck with papers. I dragged them out. Newspapers, wrapping paper, and then a little sheaf of receipts. Registered mail receipts. For parcel post packages. And the signature of the sender was M.A. Gardner. Professor Martin A. Gardner. Now, why was Evelyn burning these? I looked a little longer and found something else. A carbon copy of a letter. It was was partially torn, and all I could read of it was, And this is the last job. Because it's the biggest, I want more than my usual fee. If I don't get it, you'll never get the finished products. And it was signed with the initials M.A.G. Martin A. Gardner. Okay, so I had a lead. But where would it get me? I found out. I didn't go back to the jail because I wanted to look a little longer at those papers I'd found. There was also a bank book, and the deposits totaled over $12,000. But it was in the name of Samuel Stoner. The bank was in the city, not in Liddell. Back in my hotel, I was trying to figure this out when... Things liable to go off. Yeah, it could. Mind if I sit down? I, uh, I wasn't expecting company. I'll sit down anyway. Okay. Now that you're rested, goodbye. In a hurry? That's right. Not so fast, sweetheart. Stay sitting. That's better. What do you want? What you've got right there. These? That's right. Push them across the table. Uh, keep your hands on top. Scared? Not at all. Now, uh, light a fire in that grate. It's awfully warm, don't you think? It could get hotter. Go ahead. Light a fire in that grate. Step on it. Oh. We're going to toast marshmallows, are we? Could be. Now, uh, put some paper on it. Oh, pardon me. You don't have a log with you, do you? <laughs> I'll bring one the next time. Now, uh, throw that stuff on the fire. All of it. But I haven't looked it over yet. Throw it on. Well, what could I do? I threw all the stuff on the fire, watched it burn away. My company did, too. Watched it burn, I mean. It was a cool cookie. Then... Mm, pretty, isn't it? I used to sit in front of a fireplace and read when I was a kid. But you didn't get to be president. No, that's true. Uh, Pop it up a little. See that it's all burned. It is. Good. Now I'm going. Oh, I was hoping you'd stay for dinner. We could put up a spit and roast a chicken. <laughs> oh, uh, I almost forgot. You're to stop nosing around. Well, well. Well, I guess I have to. With that stuff burned. That was the idea. Yes, I suppose you'd have killed me as you killed Macklin. A shot in the dark, but it hit. 
His face, not so bad before, got twisted up. His fingers tightened on the trigger of his gun, but then he smiled. You'll have to prove it. <laughs> and uh, something tells me you'll never see me again. So long. Okay. Maybe the things were burned, but I remember one thing. An address. The address on the registered mail receipts where Gardner had sent the packages. And there was the name Samuel Stoner. Something told me Stoner and Gardner were the same and that bank account was his. But why? Why was he paid that much money? What was he doing? And there was only one way to find out. Go into the city and go to the address written on those receipts. I drove into the city. The address was an office building. And there were 50 firms doing business in that building. I looked at the directory in the lobby. No oh, good. How could I visit 50 places and get right answers? But I saw him. The man who made me burn the papers. He went into the building. He didn't see me. I tailed him. Watched him get into an elevator. I got close enough to hear him say... Seventh, please. Seventh floor. There were other people in the elevator. Chances are I'd make a lot of stops before it got to seven. Okay, the steps for holiday. I wonder if I made it then... Then I heard voices. Are we clear? Macklin's dead. You killed him, I suppose. Uh huh. But it looks like someone else did. It was a perfect setup for a frame. Oh, the niece business, huh? Yeah. Oh, uh, and there was another guy nosing around. He picked up some stuff the girl was going to burn. Who was he? Why didn't you? Oh, bump? two bump offs are enough. I only signed for the gardener job. All right. Here's your money. Uh huh. Now that I know what the gimmick was, I want more. Oh? Yeah. Uh-uh. Don't reach for anything. <laughs> All right, I'll cut you in on this. That's better. Wait a minute. This other fellow. Don't worry. I made him burn the stuff he took from the incinerator. You idiot, you shot. I told you killing Macklin wasn't in on the deal. But he had this. I had to kill him to get it. You sure you're clean on the gardener thing? I know I am. I killed him with his own gun while the machines in that shop were running. Nobody heard the shot. Suicide. All right, now get out of here. Uh, you know, uh, I'm taking this with me. Put that down. Don't worry. We'll split on it. I just want to make sure there's no double cross. Now, uh, see you later. I stepped back, waited. Then as he came through the door, I knocked the gun out of his hand and grabbed it. Stay where you are. What the hell? So you were fired on up. I'll take what you brought back. No. Hand it over, Cookie. All right. Come on. Well, well, well. Okay, let's all take a trip to headquarters. Well, with those two sweethearts safely tucked away, I began to put the pieces together. I did some reading, then I went back to Riddell. Went back to see Bob. Dad, where you been? Playing tag with a man, Bob. Got a phone call, Holiday, from the city. You, you're letting me out? I think they are. Yep. No more free meals on the town, Bob. Come on. But, but, Dan, what happened? We've got to go see Evelyn right away. And straighten out a few things. Now, sit down. Both of you. Evelyn? Yes? I think I know the whole thing. Yes, I... I guess you do. What's everyone talking about? Why was I let out of jail? Because you didn't kill Macklin. And Professor Gardner didn't commit suicide. He, he didn't? Well, how do you know? He was killed. Look, Evelyn, Bob would have been convicted of Macklin's murder if I hadn't... Well, Bob, Professor Gardner was doing illicit diamond cutting. What? Yes, yes, he had a perfect setup for it. The shop where he worked cutting and polishing his mineral specimens. 
The stolen diamonds were sent to him. He recut and polished them so they could be offered for sale. Isn't isn't that right, Evelyn? Yes. But but Macklin. I think you'd better tell him, Evelyn. Ed Macklin found out. Then my uncle was killed, and Macklin knew why. You mean he threatened to expose your uncle if you didn't marry him? Yes. He wasn't sure until after, after Uncle Martin was killed. Killed by a hired killer, hired by the man who was sending the diamonds to be recut. Professor Gardner was going to quit, but he received one last diamond, the biggest. He wanted more than his usual fee, or he would keep the diamond. But Evelyn, how does she come into it? Well, naturally, Evelyn wanted to protect her uncle's name, but Macklin's death prevented it. You see, Macklin found the big stone, and he was killed because he did. holiday. Did you have a nice vacation? Susie, it was just as if I'd never been away. Huh? You mean you didn't take a vacation at all? <laughs> well, not exactly, Susie. Oh. <laughs> you mean it was like a typical holiday. I... What? I made a joke. Get it? Oh. Uh, good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Dear Mr. Box 13, I address you as Mr. because I assume you are of the male sex. If you're a woman, disregard this letter. Come to my home at 7546 Brandon Drive as soon as you receive it. I shall be expecting you at once, and I shall take my reason for that. state my reason for writing this, and I have satisfied myself as to your qualifications. Very truly yours, Mrs. Matilda Cortland. Mrs. Matilda Cortland? Now, why should one of the richest women in the world and one of the least accessible be writing to Box 13? Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Dowager and Dan Holliday. Golly, Mrs. Matilda Cortland. Impressed, Susie? I sure am. Why, nobody ever sees her. And practically no one knows what she looks like. She hasn't had a photograph taken in, uh... <laughs> Come to think of it, I don't ever remember seeing one. Maybe she's a refuge. Susie, you mean recluse. Oh, do I? <laughs> when Matilda Cortland wants help, it's got to be something big. Okay, Susie, Mrs. Cortland's wish is my command. See you later. <laughs> the Cortland mansion on Brandon Drive is the showplace of the city. People framed their next to look at it. But all they ever saw was the dignified prim exterior. Ah, I was privileged. I saw the inside. Because when I rang the front doorbell... <laughs> Yes, sir. Oh, how do you do? I'm the man from Box 13. 
Oh, will you come in, sir? Follow me, sir. I followed the butler down the hallway. The house was just as I expected. It was the 19th century refusing to believe that the 20th had ever rolled around. Then... One moment, if you please, sir. Yes? I beg your pardon, madam, but the gentleman you were expecting has arrived. Seven minutes. That will be all, Jesse. Yes, madam. Stand there for a moment. Huh? I said stand there for a moment. The room was darkened. The shades were drawn over the windows and the heavy old-fashioned drapes let in very little light. Then my eyes became more accustomed to the darkness, and I saw her. Mrs. Matilda Cortland, practically a legend. She was about 75. Her white hair was drawn tightly back over her head and was covered by a jet-encrusted scarf. Her dress was a museum piece, and it fell to the floor in heavy folds. Now you've seen Matilda Cortland. That's an accomplishment, young man. Yes, I know it is, Mrs. Cortland. Come closer. That's enough. Now, turn around. Turn turn around? Yes. Are you a sample of what this modern age has produced? It's very nice out there, Mrs. Cortland. Matter of opinion. Mm -hmm. How old are you? Thirty-two. You may sit down. Oh, thank you. Why didn't you come sooner? I only received your letter this morning. It's after one. I ate lunch. I developed that bad habit. You could have had lunch with me. Well, the letter didn't invite me. No matter. This is your advertisement in the Star Times? Uh, yes, it is, Mrs. Cortland. I saw it by chance. I never read newspapers. I form my own opinions, political, social, and moral, without aid from the press. Some of us, Mrs. Cortland, like to hear other sides of the questions that may come up. Stop arguing with me. Mrs. Cortland, I came because you asked me to. I assumed you had something in mind when you wrote to Box 13. I didn't know it would be a discussion which That's neither of us... That's enough, young man. Do you have a name? Oh, yes, yes. Dan Holliday. Daniel? Only when I'm being formal. Why did you put this advertisement in the paper? Well, I told her she listened without changing expression. When I finished... Then you don't accept payment for your services. <laughs> no, I don't. Very well. You're going to help me. Oh, just a moment now. I haven't heard what you want me to do. Does that matter? You advertised that you would go anywhere, do anything. Well, maybe what you have in mind won't interest me. Mr. Holliday, I want you to do this for me. All right, then tell me what it is. Come here this evening for dinner. Oh, I'm sorry, but I have an engagement. Cancel it. Well, I, I can't. Nonsense. Anyone can cancel an engagement. Look, Mrs. Cortland, this is the 20th century. I know there were days when the word of Matilda Cortland was law to the society of this city. And engagements were canceled right and left to leave room and time for your dinner parties. But, but I still have an engagement I intend to keep. You're unreasonable. No, correction. Independent is the word. No matter. But it does matter, Mrs. Cortland. Now, you'll excuse me. Oh, wait. Yes? Tomorrow night, then. I think I can make that. Seven o'clock. Please be prompt. Do I dress? Of course. And meanwhile, I'm supposed to guess what you want me to do. I know the dinner isn't all of it. That's quite right. You will meet my grandson and a woman. And then? And then, no matter what I say, you're not to act surprised, astonished, or give the least sign that anything is strange or new to you. No matter what you say. Do you think you can manage that? I'll try, Mrs. Cortland. I'll try. Remember, what I say or do may startle you, even shock you, but under no circumstances are you to betray your feelings. Now, Joseph will show you to the door. I shall expect you tomorrow evening at seven. Well, box 13 has brought out some pretty fancy routines. But this one was different. I found out what it was all about that evening at dinner. I met her grandson, who was about 25, and a girl who was, well, maybe a little younger than he. I was still wondering what it was all about, and so was the grandson, Peter. The girl seemed nervous, ill at ease. Matilda Cortland wasn't making it any easier for her. That's right. Uh, yes, Mrs. Cortland. Did you say you've been an engineer? Oh, please, Grandmother. Peggy's told you he was five times. Peter, I am speaking to Miss Wright. Sorry. What sort of an engineer, Miss Wright? Well, he... Civil, mining, chemical, what? 
He was a locomotive engineer. Oh, really? On what railroad? Grandmother, please. Peter, do not interrupt. I, Peter, I, I'd like to go now. But, my dear, we were to spend an evening together. I heard so much about you from Peter that I feel that I'd like to know more. Yes, Mrs. Corker. Uh, we really got to go, Grandmother. We're, we're expected somewhere. Oh? Where are you going? Well, does that matter? Yes. Where are you going? To the Club Pierre. What's that? Daniel, do you know? Oh, yes, it's a very nice club. Dancing, dinner... A cabaret? <laughs> they don't call them that anymore, Mrs. Corbin. Very well. I shall go along. What? I shall go along. But, but, but... Stop sounding like a motorboat, Peter. Well, Daniel, would you like to go? If you would. But, Grandmother, you, you can't go. Would I be barred because of my age? Oh, no, of course not, but... Then why can't I go? Well, I... I guess there's no reason, but... You'd have to leave the house. I didn't expect to carry it along like a turtle with this shell. Oh, of course not. There's a very good reason I want to come along. Isn't that right, Daniel? Uh, y- y- yes, y- yes, there is. I've decided that I've been locked away from the world too long. Now I have a reason for getting out into it. Renewing an old acquaintance, so to speak. Moreover, since I'm going to be married, I... What? What, what did you say? You... Daniel and I are engaged. <laughs> Mr. Holliday, are you all right? I, uh, <clears throat> I never felt better in my life, I think. You must be more careful, Daniel. <sighs> yes, I, I can see that. Well, Peter, you and Miss Wright run along then. Daniel and I will join you later. Uh, yes, Grandmother, come on, Peggy. Excuse me. I've reserved a table. You can just ask for me at the club. Very well. Look. Mrs. Cortland. Quiet. Now, what were you going to say? Why did you say that? About you and me, Daniel? Yeah, that's it. You saw that girl. Miss Wright? Yes, yes. What about her? What's she got to do with this? That girl's a fortune hunter. She's after Peter's money. My money right now. And where do I fit in? I think when she realizes Peter is not liable to inherit my money, we can forget her. In other words... Exactly. You would inherit my money as my husband. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You don't have any intention of keeping on with this, do you? I never start what I cannot finish. I'm sorry, but you can count me out. Why? Because it's ridiculous. I love my grandson. I would do something ridiculous to make him happy. Well, go talk to him. I've tried. He's infatuated with that girl. All right, forget that. What kind of a reputation do you think this will give me? I'll be the fortune hunter. Not at all. You earn a very good living from your writing. Yeah, I know, but... I have enough influence to keep this out of the papers. I promise you, this will be between you, Peter, that girl, and myself. No. No, I can't. I... Daniel, I'm an old woman. I have nothing in the world but that boy whom I love dearly. When I die, I want to be sure he's happy. I'm lonely, Daniel. Very lonely. The only comfort I have is Peter. And that comfort would be taken away if I thought for even a moment that his happiness would be ruined by a a woman who cares nothing for him but for what money he'll have when I die. Please, Mrs. Cotton, what you're asking is... I know a great deal. It might cause you embarrassment. But believe me when I tell you that it cost me a great deal in pride just now to confide in you, a stranger. I know what people say about me. Matilda Cortland, tyrant, money bag, reckless, all those and more. But... Let me finish. Then you can decide. I'm afraid to leave this house. Afraid? Why? Because I'm afraid of the outside world. When my husband died, I went home. Then my daughter died. My son-in-law died. Peter is all that's left. I want him to be happy, and I'm willing to sacrifice anything to see that he is. Mrs. Corton, you're making it tough on me. It'll be just as tough on me as you put it. How how long does this go on, if I agree? Until I find out. (laughs) Well, I'm a sucker, Mrs. Cortland. But all right. Thank you. Now, Daniel, 
Please take me to the club pier. So we went to the club pier. I don't remember much about what happened, except that I felt like a goldfish in a bowl without water. Well, I played my part and went on for two days more. Then in my apartment... I've come to see you, Holiday, because I want to talk with you. All right, Peter, sit down and talk. You can't be serious. How about grandmother, I mean? What makes you say that? Well, you just can't. Why, she's old enough to be your grandmother. She's charming, gracious... And rich. Money isn't everything. It must be to you. Now, wait a minute, Peter. What your grandmother does is none of your concern. It is when she makes a fool of herself. Or when someone does it for her. Meaning me? Meaning you. I don't think I have. Besides, I'm having fun. I've learned to drive her electric runabout. It's a little slow, but I'm even serious now. How do you know? Because it's ridiculous. Maybe she thinks your romance is ridiculous. That's none of your business. All right. All right, it's none of my business. And what I do is none of your business. And you insist on going on with this? Why do you say that? Because if you do, I'll find a way to stop it. Oh? How? I don't know, but I will. Is that a threat, Peter? No. It's a promise. All right. As long as we're playing, oh, promise me, I can promise you that I'll take care of myself. We'll we'll see about that, Holiday. And I warn you, you're going to get into trouble. Now, back to The Dowager and Dan Holliday, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, it all looks so simple. Just go along with the game and tell Matilda Corbin to it off. Yeah, sure, that was all. Then one night at her home... Tonight, Daniel, you're taking me to the opera. Oh, Look, Mrs. Cortland, don't you think this has gone far enough? I'm not finished. Well, we're getting no place. Peggy Ryder is just... I'll be the judge of when we stop, Daniel. Now, hand me that case on the table there. Oh, this one over here? Yes. Here you are. Have you ever heard of the Cortland Emeralds, Daniel? Oh, who hasn't? Now you're going to see them. <whistles> Beautiful, aren't they? Well, I won't argue with you. They were to go to Peter's bride. As they came to me. Mm, nice little trinkets. Each one is perfect and perfectly matched for the next. Twenty of them. Uh, you're going to wear that necklace? Yes. Fasten it for me, Daniel. All right. As I fastened the clasp to the necklace, I got a funny feeling. Maybe it was the jewels themselves, green, glowing in the yellow light of the room. Then, when I finished... Thank you, Daniel. Now, if you're ready... All right, let's go. Oh, wait a moment. I think I hear Peter. Hmm? Grandmother, are you just about ready to... The emeralds? Yes, Peter, the emeralds. I'm wearing them tonight. But but you can't. Why not, Peter? Well, I mean, it's, it's dangerous, isn't it? Why? Well, all I meant was, are you sure the clasp is tight? It won't come loose or anything. Of course not. Come along, Daniel. Yes, sure. And Peter? What? You can close your mouth now. I didn't hear much of the opera because I kept thinking how strange Peter had looked when he saw the necklace. How Matilda Cortland had looked. As if warning her grandson to be quiet and say nothing more. Then the opera was over. I drove her home. And I went home to bed. Yeah? Who is it? Holiday. Uh huh. Open up. Well, who is it? Police. Police? Wait a second. Hey, what's up? You're Dan Holiday. Yeah, that's what the name on my mailbox says. Why? Move over. Sergeant, stay out here. Now, wait. What's the big idea? Got a warrant to bring in. Me? What for? Warrant out by Mrs. Matilda Cortland. What? Eh, let me see that one. You like the way it's written, Holiday? Well, what's the charge? Robbery. This is insane. What are you talking about? I can't talk any plainer than I did, Holiday. 
Robbery of what? Ooh, of about 20 emeralds. The necklace almost immediately after I came inside this house. It, it was just after I left Mr. Holiday. No one else was with you. You know as well as I do that I didn't take that necklace. It was missing. Then look all over the house. The insurance company has already done that. Well, Holiday, You said that once. Did I? Well, you didn't answer it. I can't. Will you need me anymore, officer? No, I don't. Uh, excuse me. You can hang up Jessup. I've taken it here in the library. Uh, yes, of course. It's for you, officer. Thank you. Hello? Uh -huh. Oh. Okay. Stay there. Got any good answers, Holiday? Answers to what? How the necklace got into your apartment? Oh, this was her beauty. I was looking out of a frame that crowded me, but good. I knew Mrs. Corbin had that necklace when she'd left me last night. I saw it, yet how could it get in my apartment? And why? And so I saw Kling, and he pulled some strings, and I was out on bail. I had to get some answers fast. And I thought Peter could give them to me. I'm sorry, Holiday. I can't do a thing. Listen, you saw that necklace when your grandmother and I left for the opera last night. And I saw it when I brought her home. Then how did it get into your apartment? Maybe you've got an answer. No. Listen, your eyes popped out of your head when you saw your grandmother wearing that necklace last night. Why? I, I knew something would happen. How did you know? What gives you the right to question me? I'm doing it. <laughs> All right, go ahead and ask. I was with your grandmother all evening. And you know? I wasn't. If you want to check, go ahead. But it looks as though you're in a mess, Holiday. Oh, nothing I could add to that. Sure, I checked. Peter was in the clear. He hadn't been near his grandmother from the time he saw us until the next morning. Yet someone had to take that necklace and plant it in my apartment. And it looked like a frame-up between Peter and his grandmother. But why? Why frame me? Why go through this whole elaborate fix just to fasten a crime on a guy they'd never seen before? And I got an idea. I went to the insurance company. Of course, Mr. Holliday, now that the necklace is recovered, we have nothing more to do with the case. But if it hadn't been recovered, you'd have paid the claim, right? Certainly. Mm. But it's not the insurance money they were after. Mrs. Cortland? <laughs> Certainly not. Why, she's enormously wealthy. Yeah, But yeah. you know, it is a little strange, come to think of it. What's strange come to think of what? Probably nothing, but uh, we were due for our routine checkup in just two days. Checkup? Of what? Well, you must know we make a checkup on insured objects every so often. And one was due in two days? Yes. Oh, I see. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing, nothing. Well, thanks very much. But it still didn't make sense. It still came back to the necklace being found in my apartment. Then, then I figured out another angle. And my next stop was to see Miss Peggy Wright. What do you mean? What are you talking about? I asked a simple question, Miss Wright. And that was, when were you and Peter planning to leave? Leave? Leave where? I cut it out. You know what I'm talking about. I say you and Peter planned to elope. We didn't. We never even thought of it. Are, are you telling the truth? Of course I am. Why should I lie about that? I don't know. Look. Miss Wright, are you in love with Peter? Yes. You want to get married? If it weren't for her... We... But if I marry his grandmother, then you wouldn't get the money. Oh, I don't care about that. Hmm. Well, I could swear she was telling the truth. At first, I'd thought Peter had taken a necklace so that he and Peggy could get away from Mrs. Corfin. But it was a dead end again. And there was that other thing bothering me. Why frame me? Then I went back to see Mrs. Cortland. I can give you ten minutes, Mr. Holliday. That's all I want, just a couple of questions. Wait. If I promise not to prosecute, if I drop the whole thing, will you forget it? Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You're willing to forget all this? Yes. Why? Because perhaps I like you. Oh, no. That's not it. Then I have nothing more to say. Yes, but I have. Why did you decide to wear that necklace to the opera last night? It's mine, and I wear it when I please. But why last night? And why was it missing this morning? 
It's a little too much of a coincidence that you wore the emeralds last night and that they were found in my apartment this morning. Please leave, Mr. Holliday. And Peter almost fell over when he saw you with that necklace that night. And... And what? And this morning, when you heard it was found in my apartment, you almost fell over. Come on, Mrs. Corbin. What's going on? Do you want money to forget all about this? No, I don't want money. I want the truth. Maybe even then I won't forget it. Jessup will show you out. Jessup will find himself on the end of a fist if he tries it before I find out a few things. I'll call the police. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll wait. Well, why don't you call? I had no wish to harm you. Mrs. Corp and I... What were you going to say? Nothing. Nothing at all. I'm just getting an idea, that's all. An idea. Fantastic, but it made sense. I lined up my facts. First, Peter's reaction when he saw the necklace. Second, the insurance checkup was due just after the necklace disappeared. Third, Peter hadn't had a chance to touch the necklace between the time I saw it last and when it appeared at my apartment. Unless he and his grandmother were trying to frame me. That didn't make sense because there was no reason in the world for them to do it. So I called the cling, another chase around the city, and I found the man I was looking for. Okay. I had everything I needed. And I called that evening at the Cortman Mansion. I made sure Peter and his grandmother were there. And I took Peggy with me. And in the library... This is the last time we'll see you, Mr. Holliday. I don't think so, Mrs. Cortman. Not after the little game we played. What do you mean? When we first started this twister, you said you'd do anything for Peter. What are you getting at, Holliday? And you, Peter, you said you'd get me in trouble. Listen. No, you listen. You planted that necklace in my apartment. Silence after that, huh? But it's true. You uh, wanted to frame me. Mm Mm-hmm. But you, Mrs. Corbin, you suspected he took the necklace, didn't you? you? You're quite mad. Oh, no. With the insurance checkup coming, you wanted to avoid a scandal because you thought Peter had taken the necklace. You had a paste one made. Uh-huh. I checked and found out. The paste one was the one you wore to the opera. And Peter, what? That double take you did when you saw the paste necklace almost floored you. Because you thought you had the necklace. You, you didn't mean to steal it, did you, Peter? No way. Holiday's right, Grandmother. So you reported the missing necklace, the paste necklace, Mrs. Cortland, never thinking the real one would show up. Peter, you you owe Mr. Holiday an apology. And there is the understatement of the year. Mr. Holiday, I... What can we do? Peggy. Yes? Come here. You too, Peter. All right. Peter, you wanted to protect your grandmother by showing me up as a crook. Mrs. Cortland, you wanted to protect your grandson any way you could. It seems to me uh, a lot of energy was wasted that could be used to good advantage. What do you mean? Why don't you stop trying to run other people's lives, Mrs. Cortland? Let Peter and Peggy get married. I'm sure it isn't his money she's out. I... If you don't, this would make juicy reading in the papers, I'm afraid. You wouldn't. Oh, well, yes, I would. Very well. Okay, Peter. You and Peggy run along, huh? Holiday, I... Ah, that's good enough. So long. And I, Mr. Holiday? You and I are going to the Club Pierre. You're very chivalrous, Mr. Daniel. (laughs) So you admit chivalry still lives. Okay, let's go. I'll get the electric runabout and we... No, no, no. Let's go in your car. The runabout's a little slow. So everything's all right now, Mr. Holiday? It sure is, Susie. <laughs> oh. What's so funny? I was just thinking. She couldn't have lost the taste necklace. All right, all right. I'll play straight, man. Why not? Because, because it would have stuck to her neck. See? Oh. 
I'll go get the mail for box 13. Good night, Mr. Holiday. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Speak a little, Miss Jordan. The Box 13 killed the star times. I, uh, I need your help. I dare not go to the police for reasons I'll explain when you see me. Please come to my office in the security. Please come to my office in the security building, signed Douglas McIntosh. Not much of a letter, but then, as the proverb says, great oaks and little acorns grow. And before this was over, the acorn grew into a large, large oak. <laughs> And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Three to Die. Douglas McIntosh. That's a Scotch name, isn't it? Ah, you can smell the heather, Susie. Wonder what he wants. Well, if this man is the same McIntosh I looked up, he's building that new tunnel under the river. <gasps> Gee, maybe he wants you to be a hedgehog. <laughs> No, Susie, they're called sandhogs. Oh, what will they think of next? Well, I think I'll see what Mr. McIntosh has on his mind. I'll be at the security building, Susie. Security building? Huh. It was the only security I was to know until the whole thing was over. Anyway, I went to McIntosh's office. I was shown right in to an oversized man who looked as big as the Washington Monument in the Tweeds. He didn't waste much time. So you're the man, eh? Yes, I'm the man. All right. You call me Mac. What's your name? Holiday. Dan Holiday. All right. Now, Dan, I am in trouble. Mm -hmm. Trouble gets around. Fast. But look here, and I'll tell you quick. I'm a contractor. I bid on this new tunnel. Got the bid and posted my bond to finish the tunnel on time. So far, everything's clear. What now? Dan, I'm not going to finish in time. Oh, why not? Now we get to the point. And a sharp point. You say you're running into trouble? Hey, Sabotage. Well, why don't you call the police? They can't, then. It'd be publicity. Unfavorable. I, they can't risk it. Oh. Then what's my problem? I doubt who's doing this to me. You suspect someone of doing it? Now, look, man. Accidents like we've been having don't just happen. They're made. Broken air hoses, emery in the compressors, hundreds of delays, little things that add up to hours. Oh, I see. Another thing. So far, the men working for me think these things are accidents. But the moment they suspect somebody's doing the dirty work in that tunnel, they'd walk out. Sandhagen's dangerous enough itself. In short, somebody's trying to ruin you. Exactly. It would ruin me. The contract would go to someone else. They'd not get another contract for years. But what can I do? I'm not a detective. You see, I... I beg your pardon, Mr. McIntosh, but... Uh, can't you see I'm busy? What do you want? Telegram. I thought you ought to see it right away. Uh, all right, read it. Well, uh... Oh, it's... It's all right. You can talk in front of him. Dan, this is Fred Harris, construction engineer. Harris, Dan Holliday. I need to know you. Now, what about that wire? Uh, the last shipment of concrete we ordered was derailed about 200 miles from here. What? Well, don't just stand there. Get every truck out of the road. Get that concrete here. You ought to have enough sense to think of that without coming to me first. Go ahead, get it down. Yes, sir. 
You see what I mean, Don? Another delay. Who's this Harris? He thinks he's going to be my son-in-law. Also, he thinks an engineering degree makes him a great man. That it takes the place of 15 years of experience. That's an argument I'd rather watch from the sideline. Well, go on with your story. Well, we have to finish in three weeks or I'll forfeit my contract. McIntosh told me everything he knew. It wasn't much. Only that whoever was doing the dirty work, causing accidents, delays, had to be working in the tunnel. So we went to the tunnel. But first, before I was taken down into the workings, I was given khaki coveralls and a fiber helmet. And a little metal tag to hang around my neck. Mac explained the tag. Every sandhog gets one of those. It's got his own number on it. Well, what's it for? Ever hear a case on disease? Oh, the bends? Yeah. On one side of the tag, it explains the man is a case on worker, working under pressure. Oh, so if the disease hits him on the surface, he can be given proper treatment. Well, that's it. There are six places in the city where that can be treated. The man is put into a chamber, pressure increased, then gradually decreased. Mm, like a diver. If he comes up too fast, the nitrogen in his blood is forced into his tissues. Causes pain. And sometimes worse. You seem to know a lot about it, Dad. <laughs> I'm a writer. A writer has to know a little about everything. <laughs> then I hope you'll be able to tell me more about what's going on down there. All right. Ready? Mm-hmm. I'm ready. Let's go. Together, Mac and I rode one of the hoists down into the workings. My ears began to pop from the pressure. I swallowed hard to keep them open. Then we came to the bottom of the shaft, about 150 feet below the surface of the ground. Mac looked around for a minute, and then... Angus! Angus! Here! Come here! A short, powerfully built man walked over to us. He was grinning as he said to Mac. Ah! What brings the boss into the trouble? Angus, meet a friend of mine, Dan Holliday. Dan Angus Campbell, my foreman. Best man in the world in his life. <laughs> Aye, the best beside yourself. How do you do, Dan? How are you, Angus? First rate. Except we had another little rumpus today, Mac. Uh, what? Another break in the air hose at the shield. The hose whipped around. Anybody hurt? Aye, Phil Evans. Hose got him right in the middle. He's done for this job. Won't work for a month. Look, Drips. Uh, another one. Aye. You visiting us here, Dan? Well, you might call it that. Dan's a writer. Doing a story on sand hogging. Wants atmosphere. Uh, uh, you'll get it here. You want to see the works? Uh, show them around, Angus. And be careful of it. Don't you worry, Mac. Good. I'll go back to the office now. Come back there when you finish, Dan. Oh, sure. Oh, uh, it's got him worried, Dan. A little wonder. Every penny he stands to lose. Every penny. That bad, huh? Worse. And if I ever catch the one that's doing it, I'll whip him around with me bare hands. You and Max seem to be good friends, huh? I started together 30 years ago in Scotland. Uh huh. Well, time's fleeting. Want to show me around? Sure. Let's get going. I followed Angus into a big airlock. It was a reinforced concrete compartment with double steel doors. As one door closed behind us, the pressure was built up to equal that in the tunnel. It built gradually. But I knew what would happen if it went down fast. Case on disease. A terrible, racking pain. Brother, I had a lot of respect for the men who worked down there day after day, taking risks, big chances every time they descended into the workings. Then he opened another steel door, and Angus and I were in the tunnel itself. As soon as my ears became used to the noise, Angus guided me through a small flat car. We got on and rolled down narrow gauge tracks to the center of the tunnel. As you can hear me, this car runs down by gravity. But the handbrake on it is fluid of stop. There's a motor for running back up. It saves time on a job like this. How long is the tunnel? This is about a half mile long now. This side? Aye. It started on the other bank of the river the same time we did. Oh, did you have any trouble over there? No, only on this side. But we're keeping up with them. I'll keep driving till this thing's finished. Accidents or no accidents. How much time have you got? Three weeks. Think you'll make it? We've got to. Our max stands to lose every night. Go. Here's the end of the track. 
I looked ahead. A tremendous scaffold rose into the air. Men covered it like ants. Working with pneumatic drills, shovels, wheelbarrows. Dump trucks ran back and forth, filled with the mud and shale dug out of the wall of earth that lay ahead. I looked up and I felt a little funny when I realized that right over my head was the river. And lots of clean, fresh air. While down here was nothing but the deafening noise of the hammers. And the thought that death worked right next to every one of these men. Angus noticed me gazing up at the scaffold. First time you ever saw anything like this, eh? Yes, yes. What holds all that mud back? That shield and compressed air. Air? Just air holding back the river? <laughs> Aye. You see, compressed air here in the tunnel is built up to a pressure equal to the pressure that's shoving down from a boat. Oh, in other words, if the pressure outside this tunnel is, well, 45 pounds per square inch, that's the pressure in here. Right. This may not be a good question, but uh, what happens if the pressure in here gets less? We'd be crushed to jelly. Uh, nice thought. That's no all. There's always the danger of a blowout. What's that? Sometimes we hit a weak spot in the riverbed. The bed won't take all the pressure we've got in here. And you get a blowout, like a tire blowing out. Aye. The men, machinery, equipment all blown to the surface of the river and into the air. Did that ever happen? Aye. And once, only once, mind you, a man loved to tell about it. Angus, I take off my hat to you boys down here. A million people drive through tunnels every day. Yet maybe not one in a hundred stops to think how the tunnel was built. And what it cost. Not only in money, but in injury. In death. Yeah, when a man takes to sand organ, he takes to the danger too, wouldn't he? Only what? We've only got the half crew working today. Oh? Why? Two men have been killed. Nobody wants to be the third. Superstition? Maybe. But lots of the men are staying home until the third. Well, uh, what I said... Angus showed me the whole thing. Oh, there were a million ways in which someone could sabotage the works. Breaking air holes, tapping with compressed air gauges, lots of ways. Then later, Angus took me to a complicated affair. It was like an elevator case. In fact, it was an elevator, as Angus explained. This is the latest thing. Combination elevator and decompression chamber. Hop in, we'll go back up. We go up slow, Dan. As we go up, the pressure in here is decreased until it's equal to that of the surface. Oh, then there's no danger of case on disease. Not if we go up slow enough. And the pressure's reduced. I set the gauges to do it for us. Oh, I see. Well, did you see enough to write your story? No. No, I don't think I have. Not yet. <laughs> So you, you didn't see anything, Dan? Of course not, Mac. How could I? I was hoping you might get an idea. Yeah, but I didn't. Uh, you going back again? What could I find? Try, try it, Dan. Oh, but I don't think I could find it. Hey, you advertised to adventure. You, you couldn't get it in a better place. Yes, yes, I know, but how could I explain myself down there? You're a writer. Use your imagination, man. Mm-hmm. Well, suppose... Suppose I went back there as a worker. As a sand hog, you mean? Mm-hmm, that's it. But you don't know anything about it. I can handle a hammer, a shovel, a... Uh, <laughs> you'd get dirty and tired. Every muscle in your body would hollow out loud at you. <laughs> well, I can always say I'm doing it for my art. Be a sand hog, see how it feels, then write about it. By Harry, man, you've got it. All right, then. Starting tomorrow, you're a sand hog. Oh, that was the way to do it. But when I got home that evening, I thought about it. That huge scaffold. Men scrambling over it. The pressure within the tunnel holding back the tons and tons of mud and soap ready to come in and crush everyone. What, uh, what if that pressure failed? What if they hit a weak spot in the riverbed and there was a blowout? The more I thought about it, the more inclined I was to... Yes? Hello, Graham. Oh. Shove it under the door, will you? What? Oh, and what a telegram. It read, Save for the fact that I don't want more bloodshed, 
You'd have gotten yours today. Stay away from the tunnel. Or you'll be the third to die. And now back to Three to Die, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Land as Dan Holliday. I showed Mac the color gun the next day, and what he said filled the air with dark blue color for ten minutes. Then... We could check to see who sent this. No dice, Mac, I did. And? It was sent from a pay phone booth. I guess you'll be changing your mind about the job now, eh? What makes you say that? Well, he's after you, whoever it is. Yes, I know. Uh, You can back out if you want to. And what would you think if I did? Does that make a difference? No, but there are a lot of men in that tunnel who stand to lose their lives. Mac, you've got to get the police. I can't, man, I can't. The publicity would ruin me. All right. Fix it up for me to work down there, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I became a sand hog. For three days, I used muscles that thought they'd gone on a permanent vacation. Well, I woke them up. And they woke me up in the middle of the night, aching. Then one day in the tunnel, I was talking with one of the sand hogs. You know, Dan... You've done pretty well, considering you're new at this. Oh, I ache, Joe. I ache all over. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Mm, I don't think so. <laughs> but, Joe, tell me something. Sure, what? What about these accidents down here? Oh, Ben. What about them? Well, maybe they're just part of the job. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you think? Well, some of them weren't just like accidents, that's all. I mean, well, like a hose break. Two guys been killed. You all right? Yeah. Yeah, okay. You? I better show you, Dan. That car would have clipped you in half. Yeah. Look. Look into the decompression chamber, huh? Well, Harris? Yeah, Harris. Oh. See what I mean? That car didn't look like no accident. Thanks, Joe. This is one time I can honestly say I was glad I was shoved. That's okay. You know something? You were almost as safe as I. Before leaving the tunnel, I ran down to the spot where that car had hit the stop bumper at the end of the track. It was wrecked. But in the wreckage, I found something. One of the tags, like the one I had. This one had the number 57 on it. And it slipped in my pocket. Maybe one of these sand dogs had dropped it. Then, just as I was about to step into the decompression chamber, Angus Campbell came up to me and... Your ship's going off, Don? Yeah, I'm finished for the day. Almost in more ways than one, huh? What do you mean? Come on, let's get in. I want to get back up. All right. Tired? I'm worried. I can guess why. Huh? Look, I know you're no writing a story on Sandhogan. I know why you're down here. Oh, you do? Aye. Max Desmond. I want him to call the police, but he won't. How did you find out about me? You've been nosing around, Dan. Hmm. That obvious, huh? Aye, but be careful, lad. Be careful. Yeah, I will be. Joe told me about the car that almost got you. Somebody sent it down the tracks. Aye. Angus. Aye? You've been with Mac a long time. Thirty years. Thirty years. Good ones, bad ones. And yet you stay with a job. I could have a top job on the surface. I see. Angus... Got any idea who's doing all this? No. Harris? Huh? Why him? Mac doesn't like him. Ah, look, since then. What point in Harris's ruin and his own feather-in-law? Father-in-law to be, Angus. Still no point? Then how about the protection insurance to cover the completion bond? Eh? You mean Mac might be doing this himself to get the insurance? This could be. No, no, lad. The insurance wouldn't have covered the loss. No, this that's no it. And why? Uh, I wish I knew. Competitors, do you think? Who are they? Brill and company. But no, they wouldn't. They'd be too easy to find out. Men got a habit of talking. And talk gets around. No, Dan, that's no them. And then who and why? And why did someone try to kill me today? You got the answers to those things, Dan. And you'll have the whole thing. Well, we're up at the top. I 
walk to the shack, will you? No, I'm going back, June. But I thought you were through for the day. I've still got lots to do. See you tomorrow. What Angus said made sense. Couldn't be Max competitors, because I checked. They'd been in business a long time, had plenty of money behind them. Had gotten a bid for another job upstate. And Harris? Uh, it didn't make sense either. If he was going to be Mac's son-in-law, it just didn't wash that he'd be sabotaging Mac. So I changed clothes, thought a lot, and then went home. Went out to get some dinner when... When it hit me. First the twins. And sudden cramps that made me bend over as if someone had folded me inward with a baseball bat. The building started to spin, twist. Then it got all nice and dark. There you are. You're all right now. I... I know this isn't very original, but... Where am I? Take a deep breath. That's it. Do you better? Lots. What happened? Couldn't have been anything I ate, I... <laughs> you had the bends. The bends? Mm-hmm. The tag around your neck tipped us off you were suffering from caisson disease. So we put you in the chamber. Come on, get up. We may need this chamber for someone else any minute. You make it sound as bad as the housing situation. Yes, it is, but you're all right now. Next time, don't come up so fast. But I... I didn't come up fast. No. Yes? Nothing. Nothing at all. Thanks a minute, Doctor. Well, it had me. Good. I knew I came up slowly. Angus had been with me. He... He... Oh, but that couldn't be. Not Angus. The next day I went back to the job. I had just put on my coveralls when... When an idea hit me. I searched in my pocket. Lose something, Dan? Huh? Oh, no, Joe. I, uh... It's easy to drop something out of these coveralls. What's the number of your tag, Joe? Tag? Oh. The one we all wear in case we get the bends on top? Yeah. 502. Why? Got it on? Sure. I always wear it. Here it is. Uh-huh. Why? What are you getting at? I... I don't know. Listen, I'm going back for something I forgot. I'll be a little late on the job. Tell the section boss for me, will you? <laughs> sure. Where are you going? You're all hepped up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I am, Joe. I'll, I'll be back. I went to see Mac. Told him he'd have to go to the tunnel that day and supervise operations. He thought I was crazy. Me? What for? To force your opponents into the open where we can get a shot at them for a change. They don't get this. Look, they're going after you, but by accidents. Things like that. So? But if you're in the workings, they might be tempted to wreck the entire tunnel with one stroke. You mean by going after me? That's it. You want me to lead with my chin like that? I'll call the whole thing off first. Lose the contracts. Money isn't everything. Exactly. You're right. But men have been killed down there. You've got to think of their lives, too. They do. Then get down with me. End this once and for all. Force them into the open. Uh, you're going to? Yeah, because I've got an idea. But I can't prove a thing until we see the last play. I was leading with Max's chin, and I knew it. But mine was plenty sore, too, and that made me feel a bit better about it. Mac knew he had no choice, and so he decided to go with me into the tunnel. I went to my job, and it was ticklish feeling, knowing that any minute something might happen. Something that would make Joe, Mac, Angus, any one of us the third to die. Or worse. Then... Hey, Dan. What is that, honey? Honey, what? I could have sworn the mud down here wasn't this deep before. What do you mean, Joe? Look. Stand still. Look around. The mud's coming up. It's getting high. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Joe, the pressure here must be going down. Yes. Dan, if it gets too low, that wall will come in on us. The whole river will be in our lap. Come on, let's get to the gauges. Dan! Dan, what's the matter? The pressure's going down in here. Come on. There's nothing wrong with the gauges. They reach the right pressure. But they can't. The mud's getting higher. 
Look. Look, the men are coming in. They've seen the mud coming up. The gauges. Hey, there ain't no air being pumped in. The gauges are stuck. Damn. Somebody jammed them so anybody reads them will think the pressure was okay. Get to the emergency compressors. Pressures are on fire. Get to the compressors. Get them on. I got them. Watch the gauges. We're getting pressure now. What's the matter? What happened? Argus, somebody jammed the pressure gauges to make it look like we had enough to the old town. Well, save for those emergency compressors, we'd have been done for. What did you say, Angus? I said the emergency compressors. You said save for the emergency. Save for. Funny way of putting it, Angus. Either in words or on a telegram. What's the matter with you? Where's your tag? Huh? Right. Right here? Yes, of a new chain. So was your tag I picked up in that cart yesterday. The cart that almost killed me. You're crazy. And you, you weren't anywhere around a minute ago. I was coming in here. Then what are you trying to see? There's your saboteur. Mind you're crazy. Stop raving crazy. Yeah? And you went back down yesterday to decompress yourself after I left the chamber. You didn't turn on a decompression valve for me on the way up. You're, you're crazy, man. I'm crazy, Angus, because you were the only one who could have played that trick on me. Get me out of the way by failing to turn on the decompression valve. You and I were the only ones in that chamber. Hey, she's running back to the shield. Get him. Get him before he gets the compressors. You're wrecking. Cut him down. Good. Damn, I never can thank you enough. But to think that after 30 years, Angus would ever do a thing like this. Mac, don't waste time even thinking about it. Let's go finish this tunnel instead. with him, Mr. Holliday? Jealousy, Susie? You see, he'd worked with Mac as a foreman. Then he saw Mac rise from a foreman to the owner of a big company. For 30 years, every day he'd go into the tunnel just, just an employee, while Mac stayed on top, the big boss. And it kind of made him, well, jealous, huh? To put it mildly, yes. Golly. Well, that makes up my mind for me, Mr. Holliday. Congratulations, Susie. Huh? What do you mean? I quit. Huh? In about 29 years. Oh. <laughs> Good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville. Free to Die is an original story by Mr. Sandville, adapted for radio by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Dear Box 13, care of the Star Times. If that there air that yours is on the level, if you'll go anyplace, do anything, I'll be waiting for you three tomorrow afternoon in the park. I'll be sitting on one of the benches near the lake. I'll be sitting on one of the benches near the lake. And you'll know me because I got red hair. That was the letter written on the back of an old handbill. Poor Red. I wonder if he would have written a letter had he known what was going to happen. You know, I think maybe he would have. <laughs> Now back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Philanthropist.
Mm-hmm. It's sure dirty and all full of finger marks. Ah, oh, Susie, don't be a snob. I'm not, Mr. Holliday, but it's very evident that this person isn't too particular. Why, Susie, you went through a whole sentence without shifting gears. Oh, I can be careful of my renunciation if I want to be. Oh, Susie, you had to spoil it. <laughs> Never mind, it's a fine day, so I'll be in the park by 3 o'clock to see what Red has on his mind. It was just 3 when I turned into the park. The benches by the lake were pretty well filled, and I looked around for one that was being held down by a person with red hair. And I saw him. <laughs> Susie must have been psychic, only she wouldn't have pronounced it that way. Red was dressed in a suit that must have had a tentative date with a pressing iron maybe ten years before, and didn't keep it. If he had ever shaved, the shock had been too great for his face, and he had stopped. His red hair bounced out of his head like wires, and he was eating peanuts. Good afternoon, Red. Huh? Oh, hiya, chum. Mind if I sit down? It's a democracy, ain't it? Drop, chum. You, uh, you wrote to Box 13, didn't you? Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. He gave me the once-over, but good. He seemed to be satisfying himself that he'd want to talk to me. He must have checked an okay, because... Uh, that end of yours, was it on the level? On the level, Red. How'd you know my name? Punch. I have an intuitive sense for names. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, Peanut? Oh, thanks. Gotta pick them up fast before the pigeons snag them. <coughs> <coughs> Nothing. Say, uh, how comes a guy like you sticks that ad in the paper? Uh, adventure. I use the plots for my fiction, if they're any good. Oh, you're right, huh? Well, that's my bread and butter. Tough racket? Uh, sometimes. Yeah, I guess. But you make a lot of dough? Yeah, it all depends. How about you? <laughs> I'm retired. Oh. <laughs> What's on your mind, Red? Uh... What's your name? Dan. Dan Holiday. Uh-huh. Okay, Dan. Uh, Peanut? Uh, mm, no thanks. Okay. Uh, Dan, I want to know where my pal is. Your pal? Is he missing? Yeah. Uh, we left Shy together. Then the yard bulls cut a fast clip on us and we do a split. Uh, in other words, you were separated by railroad detectives. Yeah. The best way to keep him being jugged upon a bad charge... Well, anyway, we're supposed to meet him in town. And he didn't show up? Yeah. I got in late. Had a stop off in Indianapolis. So I go to the place where Suki told me to... Suki? Is that his name? I guess. I never heard him say no other one. All right, and then what? Well, we was going to meet here at the Hope Rescue Mission. You know where it is? I think so. At least I know the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, I wait there one, two, three, well, five days. But no Suki. I get worried. I ask around, but nobody's seen Suki. Well, maybe he changed his plans, Red. Without consulting me? Mister, Suki wouldn't leave without me. We're pals, buddies. We've been hitting roads for five years together. Uh -uh. Something's happened to Suki. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, I thought maybe you could help me look for him. Well, look, Red, the police are could... You kidding? But if he's missing, they can locate him for you. Uh, one bag missing ain't nothing, mister. Something bad's happened to Suki. Oh, well, how do you know? Because one of the bows in the jungle said Suki was talking about a job. <laughs> that funny, mister? Look, Red, maybe Suki did get the job and... Then why ain't I heard from him? Maybe you will sooner or later. You ain't gonna help me, then. But what can I possibly do, Red? In a city this size... Yeah, it's... yeah, I get it. In a city this size, nobody cares none about a guy like Suki. Except maybe a guy like me. He pulled me out from under a freight once. Almost got it himself by doing it. I like Suki. We're buddies. Red stared out over the lake, and somehow a little lump came into my throat. Certainly, Red was no pillar of society, but he was a man. A human being, and Suki was his friend. For a minute, neither of us said anything, then... Okay, mister. Forget the whole thing. Sorry I got you out of bed. Oh, wait a minute, Red. Come back here and sit down. Huh? What for? I... I want to help you. Why? Well, I guess I like Suki, too. But you ain't never seen him. No, I don't have to. He saved your life. Risk his own. Now, what do you want me to do? <laughs> now, you're a topper, Dan. A good guy. Suki like you, too. Well, now, what's your idea? Well, Red had a 
an idea that we could find out what became of Suki by going to the mission. But as Red put it, I'd have to dress differently. So that night, I wore my oldest suit. I helped it along a little by dipping it in water and letting it dry. Oh, yes, now I forgot to shake. I had something to eat, then went to meet Red at the Hope Mission. It was typical of the missions that do a great job helping, well, men who need it. It was clean, neat. And when I got there, the men were just sitting down to supper at a long wooden table. I was looking over the room when... Good evening. How are you today? Huh? Oh, uh, fine, thanks. You're just in time for supper. Sit down, won't you? Well, you see, I... Now, now, this is your first time here, isn't it? Well, yes, it is. That's perfectly all right. You needn't feel embarrassed or ashamed. Now, you come and sit down to a nice hot meal. Well, that's very nice. My name is Work. Mrs. Work. I superintend the mission here. Uh, My name's Dan. Very well, Dan. Now, just come with me. I followed her to the table. She made me sit down and put a bowl of soup in front of me. I wasn't hungry. I there just you eaten. are, Dan. Now, just you go to it and you'll feel better in a jiffy. A uh, gentleman. Gentlemen, this is Dan. Dan, these are my boys. Oh, oh. Uh, oh, oh, What's the matter? Huh? What'd you say? Jump in the matter? No, why? Eat the soup, then. Well, I don't. You, 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 you want to hurt her feelings? Well, of course not, but then I... Then eat the soup, Bub. Look, I, I don't see how I can eat it when I just got... Look, the... look, look, you've got to eat the soup, Bub, and I'll show you how. Like this. <clears throat> it's easy, see? Now eat it. Okay, okay, you start, and I'll find the right key. There. Good, ain't it? Swell. New here, huh? Yeah. yeah. Where'd you pull in from? Uh, shy. Good job. Oh, swell. You ain't eating the soup, Bub. It's hot. Low on it. Okay, okay. Uh, see Red this evening? Red? Yeah, Red. Oh, Red. Yeah, he was here. Was? You mean he left? Yeah, he picked up a letter that was here for him. A letter? He picked up a letter? What are you, a spy or something? I'm a friend of Red's. Oh, well, he was here, like I said. He had a letter and beat it. Did you, uh... Did you see where the letter was from? What am I, the postmaster? Shut up and eat your soup. Okay, okay, but it's still hot. Well, I ate the soup, and I stayed in the mission until 10 o'clock. Red didn't show up, and that worried me, because I knew that for all his toughness, he was anxious and worried about Suki. Then when I decided not to wait any longer... All right, gentlemen, we're going to have our song now. You'll find the song sheets on the chair. Well, I'll see you later. Where are you going? I, I got a date. It'll keep. You heard what Mrs. Work said. We're going to sing. But I've got to leave now. You're going to sing. You ate the soup and you're going to sing. What's the matter? You don't appreciate this, huh? Of course I do. I think it's a wonderful thing, but well, I... Well, then sing. Here's the song she didn't Now, do. we're going to sing number four. Everyone has a sheet? Yeah. Can you sing loud? Definitely at times. That's good enough. And keep on key. I don't like sour notes. Oh, I'll try to be operatic about the whole thing. Well, here, hold a sheet up. Until we can get a melodeon, we'll have to do the best we can. All right, here's the first note. Now, one, two, three. Right. right. Sing, Bob. Sing. Well, I sang, then I left. I wondered about Red and wondered about that letter. Was it from Suki? It wasn't until the next day that I got the joke. I was in the office when Susie brought me the morning paper. Morning paper, Mr. Holliday, and the mail from Box 13. Oh, thanks, Susie. What's new in the world? Not much. And only three letters for Box 13. One from a lady who wants to know if you take babies, Dan. Oh, that's too much of an adventure. Then there's one from a man who wants you to leave your brain to science. Oh, great. This is great. Uh, then here's one from a woman who wants you... Hey. Hey. What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? The side of in the paper here. Accident. Rail yards. Vagrant. Killed. Description. Hair red. Susie, I, I've got to leave for a while. I'll see you later. So what? Uh, 
Bag gets killed. Uh, we get a dozen like that the year. But look, Kling, I told you about Suki. Suki, Smoky. His pal yours was hitting the rods and he got killed. I now, know, I know. It happens a dozen times a year. Sure. Now look, so Red got a letter from Suki. Suki told him where he was. They're pals. Red takes off to find him, gets tangled with... You're the... forgetting one thing, Kling. And that's... Red had a lump on his head. So? I think he was slugged. All right, he was slugged. Got in a fight in the yards. Uh-uh, Dan. You're letting that box 13 imagination whip you around on a merry-go-round. This is just one of those things. Now I've got to go to work. Suppose I turn up something, Kling. Something that proves Red was killed by somebody who wanted that letter. Then I'll be glad to fill out your dance card. Until then, rumba by yourself. Okay, but I've got a hunch that Red was killed because Suki told him where he was. And I'm going to find out where. And why? And now back to The Philanthropist, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holland. Sure, I was going to find out where and why. Sounded a lot easier than it turned out. But I still believe the place to start looking was a rescue mission. I haunted it. Went back night after night, day after day, until finally my face was as familiar there as the surface of the floor. Then one evening... Good evening, Dan. How are you? Oh, fine, Miss Work. How are you? Splendid. Do you like it here, Dan? If, yes, I do. I've been watching you. Somehow you don't seem like the others. Hmm? Why not? I'm no different from them. No, not in so many words. But, well... What's the matter? Dan, wouldn't you like to help yourself? Uh, how do you mean that? Oh, get a job, rehabilitate yourself. <laughs> do you think I need it? All of us do, more or less. Now, there's a gentleman who's done so very much for the mission here. Contributions, furniture, lots of things. And? He's done quite a bit for other missions, too, I understand. I want to send you to him, Dan. Why? What can he do for me? I've sent other men to him. The ones I think are worth the effort. And do you think I am? Is that it? Yes. And what'll he do for me? If he likes you, he may give you a job if you want one. Uh, you say he gives jobs to other men from other missions, too? Yes, I believe so. Oh. Okay, Mrs. Work. I'll give him a whirl. Fine, Dan. Splendid. I'll give you his name and address, and you go see him the first thing in the morning. Maybe this was the lead I'd been waiting for. Red had spoken about Suki going to get a job. Okay. I looked at the name on the slip of paper Mrs. Work gave me. It was Philip G. Rockman. And the next morning found me sitting across from him in his office. Well, well. So Mrs. Work sent you, did she? Uh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Fine woman. Splendid. Magnificent work she's doing down there. Yes, sir, it is. In my own little way, I, I try to help as much as I can. Yes, that's what she said. Mm-hmm. Uh, how old are you, Dan? Uh, Thirty-two. I see. Uh, somehow you don't seem like the usual type she sends to me. What is the usual type, Mr. Rockland? Oh, oh it's no matter. But uh, do you really want a job, Dan? Yes, sir, I do. Mm-hmm. For the wife and kiddies, eh? No, I'm, I'm not married. Oh, too bad. And then it's because you want to show your relatives that uh, that you can make a comeback? I have no relatives. Mm-hmm. That's what I wanted to hear. What? Well, you see, I never give jobs to men who have relatives. I feel as though I should be helping those who are out all alone in the world. I want to reach out and make men feel, well, that there is someone who cares. Do you see that, Dan? Uh, yes, I do. It's very generous of you, Mr. Rockwell. Oh, nothing, nothing at all. My own little contribution toward making this a better world. Well, Dan, I think we have just the job for you. But you have to leave town. Leave town? You mean the job's in a different city? Well, yes, it is. But don't you worry. I pay your transportation. And not first class, but you get there. And it just so happens that you'll be the last one to to take this kind of job. It's all I have. I didn't like the way he said I'd be the last. This was a racket. What kind was it? 
What was Rockman Angle? There was no way to find out, so I went to the city he sent me to. It was far enough away from Rockland to be safe and close enough so that Rockland could keep his eye on it. It was the next afternoon that I walked to the address Rockland had given me and knocked on the door. Yeah? Uh, Mr. Rockland sent me. Okay, come on in. Let me see the letter. Here. Here it is. Okay, follow me, bud. I followed him down the hallway, and I took a good look at the place while I was doing it. I noticed something. It was one of those old brownstone houses, and every window was barred. The bars weren't new. They'd been put there by the original owner. Hmm. Why should Rockland pick a place like this, then? Sit down a minute. Oh, uh, your name's Dan, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, Dan. Had anything to eat? No. Okay, supper's in ten minutes. Go in and wash up. Uh, where? Straight ahead and to your right. There's a big washroom. Then go in the room right across when you're finished. Sure. Thanks. There were about seven of them in the room, talking, washing their hands, smoking. One of them looked up when I entered. He seemed to be expecting someone. Then when he saw me, he went back to washing his hands. I moved in next to him. Hiya, fella. Hi. Just come, huh? Yeah. Hey, what is this joint? <laughs> Softest touch in the world, guy. What's your name? Dan. Yours? Call me Suki. Suki? Yeah, why? You, you a pal of Red's? Red. Hey, where is he? Why didn't he come? I've been waiting for him. Red's got to get in on this thing. I, uh... Red. Red was killed, Suki. Yeah. What are you giving me? I told Suki about Red, but I didn't mention what I was doing in the game. When I finished... Red. Red killed. He was coming to meet me here. I sent him a letter telling him all You about... sent him a letter from here? Yeah. I ain't supposed to do no writing or tell anybody about this, but Red's my pal. I wrote the letter and snuck it out. But... Suki, I think Red was killed because you sent him that letter. Huh? What are you yapping about? What are you... What are you... Doing? All right, you guys. Supper's on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I'll talk to you later, sir. Yeah, after supper in the sleeping room. Dan. Dan, you sleeping? No. Is that you, Suki? Yeah. Don't light no match. Now, what was you telling me in the washroom? Listen, Suki. First, tell me what kind of a place this is. What do you do here? Not just soft touch. Oh, we do a sort of old magazines and we make a kind of... Well, we write down what's in each magazine and then... You mean all you do here is index magazines? Yeah. We get to live here, board and room. Grub's pretty good. Only, uh... Only what, Suki? Well, we ain't allowed to leave. We gotta stay here. Only place we go out is in the backyard. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Oh, what's the difference? It's a soft touch. We each get a couple of bucks after we've fixed up ten magazines. And what's the racket, Suki? What's the racket? Well, there ain't none, but I... I hey, that's the nose counter. Make sure we're all in. I gotta get back to my bunk. The same man who let me in came through and checked each bunk. What was the angle? I lay there watching, waiting, thinking... The moonlight filtered in through the bars at the windows, and suddenly I remembered something else. The doors. Big, heavy, reinforced. Then the man came close to my bunk. I could feel him looking down at me. I must have looked as though I was sleeping like a baby. He walked on, and out. And he locked the door after him. All of us were prisoners in that room. Five days, I worked like the rest of the men, sorting magazines, indexing them, a boring job that made absolutely no sense. And we were watched, but good. No letters in or out. Doors locked at night, windows all barred, two men watching us, checking us. And then one day, I was taken to an office, one I'd never been in before. Rockham was there. I've called you in, Dan, because there's a little formality to be gone through. Formality? Yes, the other men have gone through it. Uh, workman's compensation policy. We'll take you to the physical examiner this afternoon. It'll be all over in a jiffy. Oh, I see. 
Do I have to sign anything? Oh, no, 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 no. Everything's been taken care of. It's a matter of form. You understand. Oh, uh, sure, sure. Excellent, excellent. At two this afternoon, then. So at two that afternoon, I was given a physical examination. I passed. But I was beginning to get an idea. One that made me a little sick. Scared. That evening after supper, I got Suki to one side and told him what I thought. Oh, but you're crazy, Dan. You gotta be. They couldn't get away with anything like that. Listen to me, Suki. Every one of us here have been insured. Not one of us has any relatives. We've been screened, picked carefully for just that reason. But there's nine of us here. They can't kill nine guys to get that insurance. Suki, this looks like a legitimate business. Brockton hires us. We work here. We're insured for small amounts, sure. But nine men add up to $9,000 in policies. And how do we know how many more places there are like this? Ah, oh, it's nuts. It don't make sense. It'd be on a murder rap. Sure as shooting. The insurance company would What if on. it's an accident? <laughs> what kind of an accident would kill nine guys at once? That's uh, so what we've got to find out. Don't you see? Red got that letter from you. They found out about it. Red must have talked to the mission to keep anyone from finding out where you were. Red was killed and your letter taken off of him. D dirty. What do you want me to do? We've got to look this place over. Tonight. That night, Suki and I got out of bed before the checker came around. We made a quick tour and found out it was a perfect setup for a fire. Sure. A fire. Locked doors. Barred windows. Men trapped in there and it'd be... It would be just an accident. What could anybody prove? Anybody who set up a gimmick as clever as this one would have all the angles covered and his tracks wiped out. But what are we going to do? We can't get out. We're watched every minute. We've got to get out soon. If we don't, we're cooked. And I mean cooked. Tell the other guys there's nine of us, only three of them. No, Suki, we've got to pretend we're still patsies for them. Let them think we're not wise. And don't tell anybody, Suki. <laughs> Suki and I worked out a plan. The bars on the washroom windows. Is it coming, Dan? Uh, pretty good. Chipping away the stone with the nails. Slow work. Just three bars. Just get three bars. Lose. That's all we need. Well, Suki worked while I watched, and I worked while he watched. We finally got three bars loose. I was working against time because I was sure the thing would happen any time now. And I was right. Dan. Dan, you awake? I haven't slept for three nights. What's up? It's after 12 and the checker ain't been around. Okay, then tonight's the night. Hey, wait a minute. Out and wait a minute. Smell that? Smoke. Come on, Suki. Get the other men up. This fire trap will burn like tinder in two minutes. Hurry. Yeah. Hey, you guys. You guys, wake up. Come on. Come on, wake up. Listen, there's a fire. 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 Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's a fire, but we'll all get out of here if you'll keep your heads. Suki, open the door. It's locked, Dan. All right, everybody, we've got to break that door in. Then go to the washroom. Three bars are loose. And then take your time getting out, and we'll all make it. All right, let's go. All right, out of the washroom. The other door is too heavy for us. Come on. We got out not too soon. The fire was eating that old trap as over a shoebox then. Hey, Dan, look. They're getting away. Don't let them. Hey, stop those men. Don't let them get to the car. Come on. They got guns, the dirty rats. They can't get away. Head them off at the garage. Head them off. Hold them, Suki. Okay. Now you're going to talk. About what? You'll see. Men. Listen, men. This fire was deliberately set to trap us, kill us. I'll tell you why later, but these are the men who did it. What do we do with them? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You want to talk? Yeah, I'll only keep them away from me. Suki, talk to the rest of the men. But it wasn't over. There was still one thing to be done. Rockland couldn't know things had gone wrong, so I set up a little surprise party for him. Suki and I went to him. Yes, I... Yeah. What are you doing here? Having fun? Yeah. Why aren't you at work? Let me move in on him, Dan. Let me get my... Hold it, Suki. Brockland, it didn't work. Hey, what's the matter with you? It didn't work, I said. Everyone got out. Fine, fine. Got out of what? The fire. 
And one of your men talked, Rockland. He talked plenty. Oh? Well, it doesn't matter because you bums won't let the talk about it. Dan, look out. Okay, Dan. Yeah. Okay. But you can shoot straighter than that, Clint. Lots straighter. My hand. My hand. Yeah. I can shoot straighter. But this is one guy I want to save. See how he likes bars on windows. Any of those men have escaped from that awful house? Sure, Susie, sure. But when he did, he'd end up in an accident like Red. Oh. What are you thinking about, Mr. Holliday? Hmm? Oh, nothing, Susie. I was just saying goodbye to a friend. Huh? Oh, Suki. He wouldn't stay? No, he wouldn't. Oh, and that reminds me. Make out a check to the Hope Rescue Mission. Okay. For how much? I see two weeks, room and board. I, I think that's what I owe. Oh, and Susie, tack on enough for a melodeon, will you? Uh huh. Can I do it after lunch? Sure. Hey, what are we having? Soup. Huh? Oh, good night, Susie. Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Straker. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund McDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Dear Dan, I'm inviting you up to Fair Oaks to spend the last weekend with me. Forget your Box 13 gag for a while and grab yourself a little vacation. There's not much I can offer in the way of excitement or adventure. But if you'll really go any place or do anything, you might like to see the crumbling grandeur of the land. Crumbling grandeur of the last of the Kimbers. You know how to get there, and I'll be waiting. How about it? Tip. <laughs> vacation, the man said. You know, someday I'm really going to take a vacation. But this wasn't it. <laughs> Back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Last Will and Nursery Rhyme. I think you should go, Mr. Holliday. You need a rest. Oh, Susie, every time I go for a rest, something happens to me. But what can happen at a nice, quiet place like Fair Oaks? Gee, from what your friend Ted says about it, it's just the spot to take it easy. Mm, you sure of that, huh? Uh-huh. Why, you'll come back all full of vim and vinegar. <laughs> Okay, Susie, you talked me into it. Forward my mail to Fair Oaks, care of Ted Kenworth. It was pleasant. A 200-mile drive through the countryside. I was forgetting all about Box 13. <laughs> it chased after me all the way up to Fair Oaks. I got there in the evening and Ted was waiting for me. Maybe I should explain Ted and Fair Oaks. You see, Ted was my closest friend at college and well, he had inherited Fair Oaks. One of those big, overdone houses people were fond of building in the 1890s. 
It looked like an insane wedding cake. Gingerbread balconies, all running around and contributing nothing to the architectural value of the place. Anyway, I parked on the drive, walked up the stairs with Ted, and into the house. Oh, I'm glad you came, Dan. I've been wanting to have you up here for a long time, but I guess I never got around to it. Hey, what do you do for space here? Suppose you have a house full of guests and you've only got 20 rooms. Yeah. Well, don't worry. I won't have it long. <laughs> what do you mean? Come on in here. It's the only room with chairs. Hey, why the crepe hanging? Hmm? Oh, I'm selling, Dan. Selling? Oh, but you're kidding. No, I wish I was kidding, but can't keep this place up. You broke? Flatter than last week's pancakes. Oh, but I thought you inherited the money from my... Uncle Thaddeus? No. Not a thin, round dime. Oh, now, wait a minute. He had a thousand bucks for every breath he took. Did he? I'm asking. I'm telling. No, Dan. All he left me was this house. Are you sure? There we go again. Look, fella, I've been asked that question a million times. All he left was the house. It doesn't seem right. Wasn't he a millionaire? Uh-huh. Then where's his money? Gone. Finished. Kaput. But look, where could a guy like your Uncle Fatty have spent all of his money? That's the gold-plated question. He never spent a nickel if he could help it. Okay, then the money's still with us. <laughs> Dan, you kill me. You're so tied up with fiction that you look for a deep, dark plot and everything. Mm, but this makes no sense. It does when you check and find out that Uncle Thaddeus lived the last five years on credit. Credit? You mean with all of his dough... Ah, uh, that's right. He... Well, there must be a record of the money. I had help looking for it. Help? Who? Uncle Sam. Oh. Income tax, inheritance tax. If they couldn't find the dough, how could I? No, Dan. Uncle Thaddeus fooled everybody. He didn't have a nickel. <laughs> Well, it sounded off beat to me. Uncle Thaddeus lived close to his best. And he had had money at one time, lots of it. He never went anyplace, did anything. But a cool three million or so just curls up and evaporates. Or did it? Anyway, I thought about it later that night. Oh, why don't you stop, Dan? You're supposed to take a vacation and you're beating your brains out. Now listen, put it together and what have you got? Uncle Thaddeus, practically a hermit. He's known to have money, but when he dies, all he leaves is this, well, this oversized lean-to. Dan, I've looked through the whole house. I know it like the back of my hand. I lived here when I was a kid after Mother and Dad died. What about the will? Uncle's? Yeah. Well, nothing about money in it. Oh, excuse me, Ted. Oh, it's okay. Come on in, Helen. Well, I didn't knock or ring the bell. I didn't know you had company. Oh, it's all right. Helen, this is Dan Holliday. Dan, this is Helen Stark. How are you? Fine, thanks. Uh, Helen's clearing out odds and ends for me, Dan. Odds and ends? <laughs> well, I was Thaddeus Kenworth's secretary. That is, once in a while I was. When he got behind in cataloging books, I came in and did it for him. Oh. Sit down, Helen. Join the wake. Well, I haven't much time. I want to sort out some papers. You can look them over tomorrow, Tim. I don't want to. Throw them out. What papers? <laughs> Mr. Kenworth kept everything. Yeah, he collected bills, receipts, pieces of twine, bits of paper. Oh, he wasn't that bad. Okay, just like the Keith things. <laughs> Including money. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, Mr. Holliday? Where's his money? We didn't leave any. <laughs> That's what the man said. But, but he didn't, did he, Ted? No. Then where is it? Helen, let me explain. You see, Mr. Holliday has a complex... To him, the simple act of taking a drink of water is filled with mystery and dark meaning. <laughs> what about my cloak and dagger? <laughs> well, you two argue about it. I'll be all finished tomorrow, Ted. You can look over everything. See you later, Mr. Holliday. Oh, good. Nice girl. Uh-huh. What's the matter? Don't you like her? I just met her. What do you want me to do? Start sending orchids? Hey, come on. Let's take a walk, huh? Uh, I'd rather go over the house. Oh, you're kidding. Why? Oh, just to take a look. Oh. Expect to find a million tucked away in an old pillowcase? You never can tell, boy. Come on, just to satisfy my curiosity. Okay, I satisfied my curiosity. Head to the old place backward and forward. Almost all of the furniture had been cleared out. And if there was a hiding place for anything, we'd have found it. But it still bothered me. It bothered me after I finally went to bed. Then in the middle of the night... Somebody was taking a walk in the house. I got out of bed, opened my door, and went to Ted's room. Ted. Ted, wake up. Huh? Huh? What's the matter? Oh, 
Oh, Dan. Be quiet. Hmm? What? What's the matter with you? You're walking in your sleep? I heard someone upstairs. Oh, large mice. Go back to bed. I tell you, I heard someone walking around. What's directly above my room? Your room? Yeah. Why, this is that old room I played in when I was a kid. What's in there? Oh, cut it out, will you, Dan? What's in that room? Nothing. You saw it. Truck with some old toys in it, that's all. I heard someone walking around up there. Ah, oh, you were dreaming. You've got your head so crammed It's before. a car. Huh? Yeah, so what? But you and I are the only ones in the house. That's what I said. But someone just drove away from here. That car was on the road, not on the grounds here. Drove away from here. All right, it drove away from here. Now go back to sleep. The next dream you have, tell Freud, not me. <laughs> I knew I'd heard someone upstairs. Somebody was going through that old room which Ted had used as a playroom when he was a kid. But why? Ted and I had gone through it with a fine-tooth comb and there was nothing there. But the next morning I wanted a better look, so Ted and I went back. I don't know why I'm doing this except to humor you, Dan. There's nothing in this room. Hey, how old is that horn? I don't know. Maybe 20 years. Oh, get this. <laughs> Uncle Thaddeus never threw away a thing. Not even his money. Oh, still harping on that, huh? Yeah. Hey, uh, what else is in that trunk? Oh, baseball glove, <coughs> dust, ball, bat. <laughs> Gosh, this rabbit's almost as old as I am. Then, let's see, tops, strings, that's all. And there's nothing else in the room. Nope. Yet someone was up here last night looking for something. Oh, Dan, stop it. I... Huh? What's the matter? I... Nothing. Nothing, I guess. Come on, come on, come on. What are you going to say? Wait a minute. Lose something? I don't know. Why don't you know? Seems to me there's something missing from this bunch of junk. Well, what? I can't remember but there's one thing. A toy? Horn? Train? No, pro- no, no. Those things are all here. And what's missing? Come on, Ted, think. Oh, but it's more than 20 years ago. 25 is more like it. Yet you know something's missing. I, I don't know. It's just that something hit me. You know, like, like a name you try to remember, or a place, or a date. All right. What? I don't know, Dan. I can't remember. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, Hiya, Mr. Wilson. Come on in. Second childhood, Theodore. Playing with toys again? No, uh, just rummaging around. Uh, Dan, this is Martin Wilson, uncle's attorney. Mr. Wilson, Dan Holliday. I don't know. Well, Theodore, the papers are all ready for the sale. You can sign them any time. Oh, good. Be glad to get it off my mind. But I kind of hate to see the old place go. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, staying long, Mr. Holliday? No, just the weekend. Mm-hmm. Were you looking for something, Theodore? Huh? Oh, no, not in particular. Mm-hmm. Well, when you're ready, we'll sign the papers. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Wilson, but but could I take a look at the will? Eh? Will? What will? Thaddeus Kenworth. What for? <laughs> Dan's a writer, Mr. Wilson. He's writing now. But could I look at it? That will be up to Theodore. How about it, Ted? And when you've looked at it? I don't know. I don't know. Is this the only will? Of course. It's the only one I've been able to locate. Well, Dan, what'd you find? Just the house and all that's in it. What? No, I said this clause states you'd receive the house and all that's in it. Is there something curious in that, Mr. Holliday? Maybe. Ah, here's a clause that strikes me as being peculiar. Which one's that? Oh, listen. The happiest days of all of our lives are those spent in innocence. If you would become happy, Theodore, then remember your childhood and those things that were dear to you. Yeah, maybe the old boy was right. Do you read any odd meaning into that, Mr. Holliday? Do you? <laughs> Old Thad was a peculiar man. A very peculiar person. 
He had streaks and quirks. Yeah, and one of them was getting rid of a fortune in time to keep anyone else from enjoying it. Maybe he thought people should work for their money. But he getting sore about Mr. I'm Wilson. not, I'm not. Well, if you're quite finished with this will, Mr. Holliday... Oh, yes, I, I am, thanks. All right. We'd better get the business of signing the papers over with, Theodore. Can't make a buyer wait forever, you know. All right. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi, Helen. Oh, what is this wild, grim look? Nothing. I'll be finished today, Ted. Then you can look over everything. Oh, thanks. Oh, uh, Ted, want to go for a walk? Hmm? Oh, Oh, sure. Uh, excuse me. Uh, of course. I'll finish my work in here, Helen. Won't disturb you, will I? No, not at all. I'll work in the library. What's the matter, Dan? I... I'm just thinking. For what? I'm sure I heard someone in that room last night, Sam. The room you used as a playroom when you were a kid. Now... Now what? That sentence in the will about your childhood. Remember it if you want to be happy... Oh, look. Uncle Thad was a little, well, eccentric. Maybe, but it ties in. The playroom, your childhood, someone looking for something, and your feeling something was missing from that old trunk. It... Look out! Huh? Ted, Ted. You all right? Yeah. But, Jenna, give me that push. I don't know. That coping stone would have nailed you. It fell off of the roof. Yeah. Hey, I guess it's about time to get rid of the place. It's falling apart. That stone didn't fall, Ted. It was pushed off. Back to Last Will and Nursery Rhyme, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Sure, that stone was pushed. Ted and I went to the roof, saw the marks made when the stone had been shoved forward, and it was meant to put the lights out for him. Why? That's what I want to know. Why? Because there's something in this house someone wants to get and keep you from getting. You know, you're almost making me believe this. You've got to. And you've got to think what's missing from that old trunk. I've tried, Dan. I can't. There was nothing in it but toys. That's all. Yet you say they're all there. Oh, I, I think so. Now, wait a minute. Let's go at this logically. There were trains, bats, baseball, mitt, mechanical toys, things like that. What are you getting at? Well, this. You wouldn't have missed another of those things. So the thing that's missing must be different from those. Different enough to make you realize it's gone. Yeah. You're beginning to make sense. Now, you try making some. Oh, Dan, I... I can't. Great. Look, uh... Hmm? But either Helen or Wilson know. Know what? Oh, the thing that's missing? Uh-huh. Well, maybe. Both Wilson and Helen were in the house when that stone almost put apart in your hair. Yeah. Either one could have shoved it off. It wasn't too big or too heavy. Yeah, but why kill me? Because the key to this whole business is in your head. As soon as you remember what's missing from the trunk, you'll have it. And both Helen and Wilson had keys to this place. And therefore, either one could have come into the house the night I heard the prowling in the playroom. All right. Where do we start now? We try to find what was taken. <laughs> didn't. Whoever had it had taken it away. And two hours of pounding at Ted didn't help. He just couldn't remember what it was. Okay. I had an idea and told Ted. Hey, you mean that? Yes. You follow Wilson when he leaves and I'll follow Helen. Oh, I don't know. I... Now look, it's our only chance. Come right out and accuse either one. And that'll be the end. We've got to do it this way, Ted. Well, all right. Wait. Hmm? Ah, oh, there you are, Theodore. Oh, hello. Holiday, how are you? Just fine, thank you. Good, good. Well, Theodore, it's all settled. You're getting a good price for this place, but you'll have to leave day after tomorrow. What? The terms of the sale. Buyer wants immediate occupancy. Well, put it off. What for? 
Just put it out. Look here, I sold this place for you, Theodore, at a fine price. Yeah, but I didn't know I'd have to leave right away. You should have read the terms of the sale. Well, I've got to be going now. Other things to take care of. How do you like that? I've got to get out. Okay, that gives us less time. Now, you follow him. See what he does, where he goes, anything. I'll, I'll do the same with Helen. Helen didn't leave until that afternoon. I let her get a start and then drove after her. She didn't stop in the village. Kept going into town about 20 miles farther. I kept a safe distance behind. Then, in the town, stopped her car, got out. And so did I. Well, so far, this was a blind chase. Then she went into a store, and on the window was children's toys and books. Toys and books. Children's. I, uh, I edged up to the window and looked in. Helen was talking with a clerk, and she had something in her hand. And from where I stood, it looked like one of those linen-covered kids' books. Then I saw the clerk go to a shelf of books and look them over. Helen followed her. The clerk shook her head. Helen turned to leave, and I ducked to keep out of sight. Helen went to every toy shop in town, but every place she got the same answer. Which shake of the head. Okay. So it was Helen who had taken the missing item from the trunk. And it was a kid's book. But why? And what was in that book? It was dark when she finally headed back to the village of Harrow's. She didn't know it, but she was going to get company that night. Well, hello there, Mr. Holliday. Uh, Dan sounds better. <laughs> What's that to say, one? I, uh, I was just from the village, thought I'd drop in and say hello. I'm glad you did, Dan. Sit down, won't you? Oh, well, thank you. All finished at the house? Yeah. Oh, things were in a mess. That is, Kenworth kept everything under the sun. Yes, including a secret. Secret? What secret? Oh, just any secret. I wonder what he did with his money. Oh, I don't think he had any. I believe he was an old fraud. Why, he lived the last five years of his life on credit. Uh-huh. And there must have been a good reason for everyone extending credit to him. Oh, well, he was an institution around here. Everybody humored him. Well, maybe. Why, maybe? Did you know him? No, but tradesmen wouldn't extend credit for five years without expecting to get their money. I, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> I'm sure you do. Hmm? What? How was your trip into town today, Helen? Pleasant? Profitable? <laughs> you're an odd person, Mr. Holliday. Uh, 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 the name's Dan, remember? <laughs> All right, you're still an odd person. You didn't find what you were looking for, did you? Was I looking for something? All right, Helen, let's quit shadow boxing. You went into every toy shop in town to... Was that a crime? Oh, no. No, not at all. But shoving a stone off of a roof might be called one. What does that remark mean? Helen, I want what you took from the playroom at the house. Well, I didn't take anything. Oh, yes, you did. And among Uncle Thaddeus's papers, you must have seen a letter telling Ted to look in that trunk for a clue, some sort of a book. Well, you're crazy. Yeah, but it's fun. Now, hand it over, Helen. I... I told you I didn't take anything. Listen, that stone just missed killing Ted. Well, it... it and anyone I, who wants to kill someone has a strong motive. But sure. But it was just an accident. I leaned on the stone Oh, and... sure, sure, sure. But how will it look if we put two and two together? The stone and the stolen book. I want to tell <laughs> Something funny? All right, you can have it. But it won't do you any more good than it did me. Now, get out of here. Oh, the ladies aren't. I'll kill you. Go right ahead. Stop there. Must be a lot of money to make you attempt to murder and threaten another. I want that book, Helen. Now. You stay away. No. Go on. Take it easy. Take it easy now. I'll take the gun with me. And the book. It was an old book of nursery rhymes. The kind kids look at hour after hour. I, I took it back to Ted and told him what had happened. Helen? But, but why? Why? For what I've been harping on since I've been here, your uncle's money. And this book is the clue. Yeah, I remember it now. That's what was missing from the trunk. Sure. Look, Ted. 
Helen went through your uncle's papers and found something. I would have sworn it was Lawyer Wilson. Yeah, that's something Helen was counting on, but I ruled him out. Why? Well, when I first saw the will, I noticed it had been drawn up by another firm of attorneys. If you remember, Wilson even admitted he had to hunt for it. Then Helen must have found the letter telling you to look for this book. Yeah, but there's nothing but nursery rhymes. We've been through it a dozen times, and there's not a mark or a piece of paper in it. Yes, I know, but we've got it. Yeah, we've got it. And I've got to get out of here. You've got to figure this out before you leave. Once you're out of here, you'll have as much chance of finding that... Yeah, I know. But... Come on, come on, come on. Now, let's look through it again. See anything? No. Well, keep looking at it. Wait a minute. What's the matter? Go back. What did you see? Uh, I didn't see anything. It was something I didn't see. Oh, Dan, you're crazy. Mm. Look, Dan, look. Each rhyme is numbered. One, two, three, four, then six. Number five is missing. Hey, you're right. Helen took it. No, 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 she didn't. What? Of course she didn't. That's why she was trying to buy another one like it. But she couldn't. It's too old. All right. Number five is missing. What was it? Oh, hey, I can't remember that. Yes, you can. Now, look. Number one, Little Miss Muffet. Yeah. Number two, Simple Simon. Three, Sing a Song of Sixpence. Four, Three Blind Mice. Wait a minute. Wait. Mice. Mice? No, no, no. That one's here. No, no. Not Hickory Dickory Dock. The mouse ran up the clock. It's not there, and I know it was. Your uncle took it out rather than mark it. He took it out to make it tough for you. Yeah, but why that one? I... Ted. In the hall, that, that grandfather's clock. Yeah. I used to watch it for hours when I was a kid. Oh, come on. Hey, Dan, you're terrific. Okay, here's the clock, but it stopped. I tried to wind it the other day, but it wouldn't go. Now, listen, the rest of the rhyme. The clock struck one. One. One o'clock. This clock stopped at six. Now, now, now what'll happen when we turn the hands until they get to one? Well, don't just stand there, boy. Do it. Okay. Seven. Eight. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, easy, one. Look, the face came open. Hey, there's a letter. Well, get it out and read it. Yeah, yeah, read it. My dear nephew... Since you've figured this out, I must assume you've learned that money is to be earned, not come by easily. All right. Go to the sundial in the garden. Turn the indicator until it points to 12. You'll then be able to lift the face of the dial. It, in the column, you'll find negotiable bonds and securities. You'll... Dan. Dan, I... I, I know. You love me. Have a nice time, Mr. Holiday. Great, Susie. Great. Do I look rested? Well, not exactly. That's what I thought. Oh, maybe you won't want to go to the party tonight, then. What party? Well, we're, we're all starting from the city hall. Starting from the city hall? Why? Oh, it's a treasure hunt. It'll be loads of fun. Oh, Susie. How do you manage it? Good night. <laughs> Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood.
Watch for Alan Ladd in his latest Paramount picture. Box 13 with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of the Star Times. If your advertisement, Adventure Wanted, will go any place, do anything, is bona fide, do this. Call Yorkside 89078 and ask for Dr. Ogden. Make an appointment with him. Then phone Madison 9548 and ask for Mr. Alexander. When you've done these two things, you will receive further instructions. I will wait until 3 tomorrow afternoon. Receive further instructions. I will wait until 3 tomorrow afternoon for your call. If you want money, I can arrange that. If you want adventure only, this will give it to you. There was no signature, so I assumed the letter was from the mysterious Mr. Alexander, who liked telephones. I was right. It was his nickel and a million dollars worth of trouble. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, The Clay Pigeon. I wonder why you're to make an appointment with a doctor, Mr. Holliday. Well, I don't know, Susie, but it's a very interesting letter. I'll tell you what, suppose you dial the first number for me, and we'll get in touch with Dr. Ogden. Uh-huh. Let's see, that was truck side. Eight, nine, oh, seven... Eight. When you get the number, ask for Dr. Ogden, Susie. Mm-hmm. Hello? Hello. Dr. Ogden, please. This is Dr. Ogden speaking. Oh, uh, thank you. Just a minute. He's on the line. Answered the phone himself. Oh, thanks. Hello, Dr. Ogden. Yes? I'd like to make an appointment to see you. Uh huh? Today? Well, let's say at your convenience. Well, uh, would tomorrow be all right with you? Fine. What time? Two o'clock sharp. Two o'clock sharp. Fine. You know the address? Well, no, you'd better give it to me. Certainly. 7869 River Lane Terrace. Oh, just a second. Susie. Uh-huh. Take this down. That was 7869 River Lane Terrace. Yes, that's it. Okay, tomorrow too, then. I'll be waiting for you. Oh, just a second, Doctor. Yes? Yeah? Don't you want to know who I am? No. <laughs> I prefer to find it out my way. Goodbye. What do you say? I don't know, but it sounded like I prefer to find it out my way. Well, what do you mean by that? Uh, I wish I knew. Let's call that other number, Madison 9548. Want me to get it for you? Might as well. There's no fun being on first base if there's a chance of scoring. Go ahead. Now, what kind of a doctor prefers to find out the names of his patients his own way? Mr. Alexander? Yes, who's this? Just a second. Here he is, the party of the second part. Oh, okay. Hello, this is Box 13, Mr. Alexander. Oh, yes, uh, Did you call Dr. Ogden? Yes, I did. I have an appointment with him for 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Good. Will you keep it? Well, that all depends on what's going to happen next. I think you'll like it. Now, uh, can you remember a name of the message? Well, I think so. I have remembered my own name for a long time. <laughs> Good. Here's the name. Listening? I'm still here. Matthew Carey. Did you get it? Matthew Carey, right? Yes. Now, remember this. The dead shall not stay dead. Did you hear it? I thought you said the dead shall not stay dead. That's correct. It's not difficult to remember. You're right, Mr. Alexander. But now that I have the name Matthew Carey in the message, what do I do with him? I think you'll know what to do when you see Dr. Ogden. Goodbye. Hey, Alexander. Hey. He hung up, huh? Yeah, he hung up. Susie, this is either a big rib or it starts out as one of the craziest chases I've ever had. Well, all you can do is see Dr. Ogden tomorrow at 2. Yeah, see Dr. Ogden tomorrow at 2. Okay, Susie, hung for a sheep as well as a lamb. Dr. Ogden will see me tomorrow. So, the next day at 2 o'clock sharp, I pushed a bell button underneath the neat little brass plate that said Dr. Ogden... I waited, and the door clicked and swung open by itself. I stood in a dimly lighted hall. I was getting accustomed to the lights when the door closed behind me. Then I heard, Please come down the hall. Hmm? 
Where are you? Second door to your left as you walk this way down the hall away from the front door. Please come in. Oh, thank you. How do you do? Please close the door and come in. Thank you again. I'm very happy to see that you're prompt. You're the gentleman who called yesterday about two o'clock, yes? Yes, I called about that time. Good. Please be seated across the table from me. Now, may I ask who sent you to me? A mutual friend. May I ask the name of this mutual friend? Mr. Alexander. I don't seem to recall that name. Alexander? Alexander. Yes, Alexander. Well, no matter. You are Dr. Ogden. Yes, why do you ask? Well, I had no way of recognizing you, Doctor. For all I know, you may be someone else. <laughs> I see you're a skeptic. About what? Don't you know? Huh? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, shall we proceed? By all means, I'm very anxious to proceed, but first my name is... Please, please don't tell me. I have other ways of finding that out. Oh? First, we shall dim the lights. I control them from my chair here. You can still see me? Very dimly. Your eyes will become accustomed to this light in a moment. Now, there's a drawer on your side of the table. Please open it. You'll find a pad of paper and some pencils in there. Select any pencil and take the pad of paper. Okay, I've done it. Close the drawer. Hmm. Now what do I do? Please write your name on one of the slips of paper from the pad, anyone. Underneath your name, write a question. Some problem that is worrying you. I shall attempt to advise you. I hope your skepticism does not interfere with our rapport. Wait a minute. You mean you are... I... What were you going to say? Let me get this straight. I'm to write my name on a slip of paper. Yes, and underneath any message, question, problem. Mm-hmm. Name. And a message... All right, that's done. Now what? Fold the slip of paper and place it under the teacup in the center of the table. There you are, Dr. Ogden. Good, good. We shall have to dim the lights a little more. More. I am trying to establish contact with your mind. I am trying to feel the psychic rapport between us. Think. Think of your name and the message. Think of them. Ah, oh, I see that your name is... Matthew Carey. No, no. Who are you? Where did you come from? Now, wait a minute, Dr. Ogden. Take it easy. Get out. Get out. You're crazy. You know nothing. Get out. Calm down a minute, will you? Why should my name make you jump out of your chair like it's that? It's not your name. Please, you don't know anything. You can't know. What's the matter with you, Doctor? Please, get out of here. Go! Well, all right. But how did you know what name was on that slip of paper under the teacup? I said get out or I'll have you thrown out! Well, an invitation like that, what else is there to do? I left Dr. Ogden feeling a little as though I'd struck a match and a house a mile away went up in flames. Who was Matthew Carey? More important at the moment, who was Mr. Alexander? I stepped into a drugstore on the way back to my office. Dialed Madison 9548. No, Mr. Alexander. It was a payphone and a marker. It seemed that Mr. Alexander had sat patiently waiting for my call to him. Later in my apartment... Hello? Ah, oh, Mr. Holliday. Ah, oh, Mr. Alexander. Yes. Which market are you calling from now? <laughs> so you called back, eh? Yes, I called back. Look, Alexander, if it was your intention to frighten Dr. Ogden out of his next ten years, you did. It was my intention, Mr. Holliday. Wait a minute. You know my name? My telephone number here at my apartment. How come? I saw you go into Dr. Ogden's. When you came out, I followed you. Oh, very simple. Elementary. Okay, suppose we go to a little higher learning now. Who is Matthew Carey? And why did that name and message frighten Ogden out of his wits? Are you interested, Mr. Holliday? 
I think so, Mr. Alexander. But I'd like to know what the game is. Will you go on with it? I'll admit it has its points. Good. Well, then, you saw the reaction the name and message got from Dr. Ogden. The electric chair would have been a little less irritating to him. Then play along. He'll undoubtedly come to see you or try to contact you in some way. See him, talk with him. But whatever he says or does, don't let on what you're doing. Mr. Alexander, that is the simplest thing in the world for me to do because I haven't the least idea what it is I'm doing. When he contacts you, be mysterious. Pretend you know something. What makes you think that I'm that good an actor? Please do it. You won't be sorry. I still think it's a rib, a joke. Oh, it is, Mr. Holliday. But the joke is on our friend, Dr. Hunton. Oh, he's not laughing. He doesn't have a sense of humor. But will you play along for just a little while longer? If you'll, uh, tell me one thing. And what's that? Where does it all end? And what good is it doing you? I'm not sure where it will end. As for the good it does me, it will keep me from being killed. Good night. Now, back to The Clay Pigeon, another Box 13 adventure with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Well, Mr. Alexander's last words sat me up straight. I wanted to go to the police, but with what? I'd never seen Mr. Alexander, and as far as I knew, he had a lot of nickels to put in phone slots. He'd never give me a chance to trace a call. So I sat tight and waited. And I didn't have too long to wait, because that same night... Yes, who is it? Uh, Dr. Ogden. Mr. Holliday, may I see you? Oh, Dr. Ogden. Just a second. How did you find me? Psychic rapport? Uh, no, I, I followed you earlier this afternoon. Oh. Did you have company? Company? Skip it. Is there something on your mind, Dr. Ogden? Yes. Look here. Why did you come to me this afternoon? Maybe... Maybe because of Matthew Carey. How did you know? Who are you? You followed me here. You came to my apartment. You, you ought to know my name. Yes, Holiday, but that isn't your real name. For heaven's sake, man, will you please talk? I'd like a little time to think it over. Then you haven't gone to the police? No, no, I haven't. Do you want me to? Are you crazy? How much do you think I know, Dr. Ogden? Look, Holiday, or whatever your name is, I, I'm willing to pay you to keep quiet. You must realize, of course, I don't have to pay you a cent. Oh, of course you don't. But I, uh, I want no bad publicity. It'd be bad for my business. Now, how much? I told you. I want some time to think it over. How long? I'll let you know when I'm ready to talk business with you. Meanwhile, you, you'll not go to the police? No, Dr. Ogden, I won't go to the police. Thank you. Thank you. I assure you, Mr. Holliday, you won't be sorry. I hope not. Now, good night, Dr. Ogden. Good night, and you will let me hear from you. I promise just as soon as I come to a conclusion. Then, good night. For a moment, I stood there after Ogden left. I listened to make sure he'd gone. Then I stepped out into the hall and down the stairs into the lobby. Ogden was out of sight. But to make sure, I asked the clerk. Yes, I saw him, Mr. Holliday. He's gone. Mm -hmm, thanks. There was no one with him. I didn't see anyone. Okay, I'm going to step outside for a minute and be right back. Hold any calls that come. Yes, sir, Mr. Holliday. There was no one inside on the sidewalk. The traffic was thin. I was almost sure that Ogden hadn't come alone. Why, I don't know. But I walked a little piece down the street. I was about 50 yards away from my apartment building when... Holiday! Holiday! Huh? Who is it? Alexander. Where are you? In this doorway. I didn't want Ogden to see me. Please come here. Come on out. Let me take a look at you. No, I've got to be sure Ogden doesn't see me. He's gone. I can't take the chance. Now, please come here. I want to tell you something. All right. All right. Okay, what have you got to tell me? This. Feeling better now, Mr. Holliday? Oh, how'd I get back in the lobby? I found you. How did you happen to be looking for me? Well, there was a call for you. I stepped out on the pavement and saw some someone lying in that doorway. 
Yes, and there I was, all tucked away. The original Clay Pitchin, Dan Holliday. Shall I call the police? Now, wait a minute. You've, you've got your wallet. Mm-hmm. My watch, my change, my ring. There's, there's nothing missing? No, not a thing missing. Well, that's funny. The word you want is peculiar. It's anything but funny anymore. But I would like to know why he slugged me and then left me with all my money and... Your, your keys, have you got all of them? Yeah. Yeah, they're all here, but... But look at this one, Charlie. You see anything? Uh, well, yeah, there's there's some green stuff on it. Mm-hmm. Modeling clay. Looks like it. So Mr. Alexander wanted to make an impression of this key to my office. Why? Charlie, someday I'm going to catch up with Mr. Alexander and get an answer to a lot of questions. What did Mr. Alexander want in my office? The only way to find that out was to go there. I called Susie, got her out of bed, and an hour later met her at the office. Gee, I was scared when you called, Mr. Holliday. Yeah, but I needed you to take a look around this office, see if anything's missking. You take that side of the room, Susie. I'll fine come over here. But there's nothing here worth stealing. File cabinets are still locked. None of them forced? They don't look like it. Open them and look inside. All right. Not a paper disturbed, not even a pencil out of place. Okay, I'm crazy. I give up. How about the cabinets, Susie? Gee, they're just like I left them when I went home. I remember straightening them today because I wanted to find them. Okay, let's forget it. You know what I think, Mr. Holliday? No, what do you think, Susie? I think Mr. Alexander is a lunatic. Well, tell him to move over. He's getting company. The guy slugs me, makes an impression on my office key, and... And now what? You know, Mr. Holliday, I think you ought to find out about... about that Matthew Carey. Hey, that's an idea, Susie. Okay, pack up and go home now. Tomorrow, you and I are going to the morgue of the Star Times, and we'll see what we shall see. <laughs> It took Susie and me the better part of two hours to dig through old files. But finally we came up with something. Susie read a paragraph to me. A paragraph from a Sunday supplement. The murder of Matthew Carey has never been solved. The only suspect was Marvin Smith, who disappeared mysteriously and has never been located. Carey and Smith were partners in a mind-reading and psychic act, and, and they... Hold it, Susie. Did that give you a hint? More. It tells me Dr. Ogden's real name, Marvin Smith. Susie, Ogden is a mysteriously disappeared suspect. Sure, but who is Mr. Alexander? Go ahead, go ahead, read some more. Okay. Matthew Carey's body was claimed by a brother, Philip Carey. Philip, at his brother's inquest, was dramatic in his denunciation of police and in his vow to track down his brother's killer. Later, he too disappeared. The Matthew Carey case remains another famous unsolved murder. Gee, Dr. Ogden killed Matthew Carey. Yeah, that's the way it looks. Now, all I've got to figure out is what I'm doing in the act. Why did Philip Carey send me to Dr. Ogden in the first place? To scare him. Uh, that was only part of it. Obviously, Susie, Carey, or Mr. Alexander, as I shall fondly remember him, wanted to make Ogden think that someone was on to him. But why pick on me? Later, I called the police and let them know that Dr. Ogden and Marvin Smith were one and the same. Or at least I thought they were. The police went in to see him. But once more, he had dropped off the face of the earth. And I looked like a prize sap for giving the tip off. Then that afternoon... Want me to answer it, Mr. Holliday? I better let me take it, Susie. Hello. Holliday? Yeah. Dr. Ogden, isn't it? Where have you been? Listen to me. I, I agree to your terms. You... You what? I said I agree to your terms. Oh. You agree to my terms? Well, that's nice. I can't talk any longer. I've got to go now. But I agree to your terms. Why? Argon. Argon. You know, Susie, someday I'm going to have that instrument taken out and thrown in the river. Is something the matter? Yes, yeah, something's the matter, and it's all with me. That was Dr. Ogden, huh? That was Dr. Ogden. And he agrees to my terms. He agrees to your terms? What terms? 
That's the question, Susie. What turns? Not... Oh, no, not again. I'll answer it. No, I brought this on myself. I'll take it. Hello. Good afternoon, Mr. Holliday. Well, Mr. Alexander, how do you do? How's your head? How would your head be after a bolero was drummed out on it? Oh, I'm very sorry I had to do that, but it was necessary. Alexander, if I could only see you just once. How would you like to do just that tonight? What? Uh, what do you mean? Meet me at midnight tonight at the corner of Bay Boulevard and Shore Drive. It's a pretty lonely neighborhood. What's the idea? You would like to see this finished, wouldn't you? Yes. Yes, I would. Then meet me, but uh, come alone. Absolutely alone, understand? What if I don't? <laughs> I'll be very disappointed in you. Goodbye. What now, Mr. Holliday? Good question, Susie. I've already made the police think I'm a little off by sending them after Ogden. Okay, I'll meet Mr. Alexander tonight. But not before I do a lot of thinking. So I thought, and thought, and made up my mind to meet Alexander. But I also made up my mind to get there ahead of time. So I drove to within three blocks of Bay Boulevard and Shore Drive, parked and began to walk quietly. I stayed in the shadows and made sure I wasn't being followed. Then, then I saw him. A man crossed behind a billboard. Someone had the same idea I had. Get there early and avoid the rush. Well, at last I was going to meet Mr. Alexander, but not face to face. I crept up in back of him and... Easy, Alexander. Take it easy. Holiday. Huh? Ogden. Please. I was going to meet you as you asked. I, I was just seeing if everything was clear. Meet me? At Bay Boulevard and Shore Drive? Yes, that's what he said. I said? Let that go for a minute. Why are you waiting a block away from the corner? Why, well, I told you I just wanted to see if all was clear. Hold still a minute. Oh, nice gun you've got here, Dr. Ogden. Was I going the way of Matthew Carey? No, no, I, I swear it. Look, see? I brought the money. $5,000, as you said in your letter. Letter? What letter? This one. Give it to me. And stand a little distance from me. Do, do you want more? I'll get it. Only please, don't kill me. Please. Shut up. Was this letter sent to you? Yes, I... Why are you asking that? Oh, now I get it. I think. Huh? Look, Ogden, it's still 20 minutes before midnight. And you're going to do what I say. Walk to the meeting place. I'll join you at midnight. And you pass over the money. But I'll keep your gun just in case. What are you talking about? You'll do as I say. We'll go to the police right now. Mr. Marvin Smith. Smith? Oh, that hit home, didn't it? Okay, we wait ten minutes and you start at the meeting place. <laughs> night I walked toward the corner. It was very dark and I could just make out Ogden's silhouette. Holiday. Yeah. Now, remember what you're to do. Hand me that package of money. It's here. Now as I walk away, I'll, I'll fire your gun. I'll drop to the pavement. You stand right there. Get it? Yes. Okay. Here goes. Who? Who is it? Hello, Smith. Philip. <laughs> Philip Perry. You did just exactly what I thought you'd do, Smith. You killed him. <laughs> now I'm going to kill you as you killed Matthew. Don't move. Keep your back toward me. Now take a moment, Smith. Take a moment to think how it must have felt to my brother. But now... Drop that gun, Perry. You... Drop it. You dirty meddler. Ogden, quick, down, drop. Oh, you shot him, Holiday. Just in the hand. Oh, killed Matthew. Let me get at him. The police will take care of him and you. And I'll be glad to see it. Because I don't like being a clay pigeon. Now, let's get going, both of you. I've got to explain a few things to my secretary.
So Mr. Alexander, or, or Philip Carey, took just one piece of stationery and wrote all in a blackmail letter on your typewriter. That's why we found nothing missing. Right, Susie. One piece of paper wouldn't be missed. But if it hadn't been for the clay on the key, I... I wouldn't have known he even got in here. But what was he going to do? Yeah, it was a beautiful setup, Susie. He sent Ogden a blackmail letter. Ogden thought I sent it and was blackmailing him. Ogden was set to kill me, which is just what Alexander or Carrie wanted. Okay, so Ogden kills me. Then Alexander steps in, kills Ogden, puts the gun in my dead little hand, and goes away for good. And then? And what did the police find? $5,000 in my pocket... A blackmail letter to Ogden written on my stationery, my typewriter. It's an open and shut case. Shut right on my neck. Aha, but there's one thing wrong. What? I could have testified differently. I, I knew the whole thing. Alexander wouldn't have gotten away with it. I, um, I don't like to keep things from you, Susie, but, but I was going to. Hmm? What? Mr. Alexander would have come after you. Mr. Holliday... Let's take the ad out of the Star Times for a while. Then what will we do for excitement? <laughs> Good night, Susie. Listen in again next week when Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. With the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Care of Star Times. I'm a stranger in your city. I, I don't know a soul here, but I'm in trouble. At least I think I am. I can't go back home until I know what happened to me yesterday and the day before. It's hard to explain in a letter, but if you'll come to 14... Believe me, I need help. And maybe you're the one. Jerry Fuller. Uh-huh, he needed help, all right. At first, I didn't think he did. I went at the whole thing with my tongue in my cheek, but I put it back where it belonged. Fast. And now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Flash of Light. But I think it's silly, Mr. Holliday. Why can't he go back home? And what does he mean until he finds out what happened to him? Just that he's lost two days out of his life. Huh. Nobody can do that. You know, you should go to the movies more often, Susie. Sometimes you get an Academy Award for losing a weekend. Well, if you ask me, this, this Jerry Fuller sounds pretty silly. Two days are hard to mislay. Besides, maybe he's just making a mountain out of a mole skin. <laughs> I was wondering when you'd finally kick one around. Now I can leave. For number 14 East Central Street and Mr. Jerry Fuller. <laughs> East Central Street ran through the part of town where the kids played tiddlywinks with manhole covers. And number 14 was no risk cheap, shabby rooming house in which paint was just all lang syne. Finding Jerry Fuller was no problem. The landlord pointed down the hallway, and 15 minutes later, Jerry Fuller finished telling me his story. Maybe I look skeptical, because... You don't believe me, do you? Oh, sure, I, I believe the part about the blackout, but... But you believe I, I was drunk, is that it? Well, you admitted having a few. But not enough to knock me out for a couple of days. Okay. I'll tell you, and you see how it sounds. You had two cocktails before dinner. After dinner, you wandered into the Red Swan and... Hey, why did you pick the swankiest spot in town? Well, just to tell the folks back home I'd been there. Uh-huh. So you had another drink there. Maybe two? All right, two. Three? Two, I said. <laughs> okay, take two. They're small. But were you alone at the Red Swan? Well, maybe I talked to somebody, like people do at bars, but I was alone. Remember to whom you talked? No. Remember anything at all? Well, I, I don't know, but I I kind of remember a flash of light. It sticks in my head. Flash of light? 
I've got another flask for you. That was your second drink. Look, I can't go back home until I know what happened. Maybe you'd better tell me why not. All right, I guess maybe it's better if you do know. So Jerry told me a story that had happened a million times before. A small town kid in a big city. And a few drinks that were like dynamite to a kid who never had anything stronger than malted milk. And there was a girl, a girl he couldn't remember. And another girl back home, the girl he was supposed to marry. I listened and knew every word that was coming. I could have even added a few that he had left out. But when he finished... And that's why I can't go to the police. If I did, they'd have to wire back home for... for... Verification of your identity? Well, that's it. And everybody back home would know or find out. I know this is throwing cold water in your face, Jerry, but don't you think you'd better take your medicine? Chalk up the experience to... Experience. Oh, now, wait a minute. Look, my wallet. What about it? Every cent I had, even my ticket back home is gone. You did a good job. Listen, if you or anybody else can prove I was robbed, then I've got an explanation. I've got a reason. Okay, I'll give it a whirl. But I think it's cut and dried before we get around to it. Now, the first thing to do is to get you out of this fire draft. But where can I go? My apartment. I'll lend you the money to get back home. I won't go back home until I know what happened, how I got here, and why. All right, all right, Jerry. Leave it at that. Now, come on. Hey, wait, where's your baggage? Oh, I checked it at the depot before I... before I went to the Red Swan. Oh, I'll pick it up for you. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Sure, I humored him. The poor kid was scared stiff, and like any frightened kid, was building up a big thing in his mind. But there was one thing that bothered me. The place Jerry said he had been in before he blanked out, the Red Swan. It wasn't a hangout for cheap crooks and nickel snatches. It was ultra swank, and the odds were heavy against anyone taking him over the boards in there. Okay, maybe he went somewhere else afterwards. We got to the front door, and I sent Jerry to the car to wait for me. Hello? Well, hello. What's your name? Dan. What's yours? Kitty. Okay, Kitty. Is your daddy in? Uh huh. What's the matter? Who are you? Remember me? Yeah, you find the guy? Uh, yeah. He was with a real pretty lady. Shut up, Kitty. Go back in the kitchen. All right. He's a cute little kid. So? Is that what you come to tell me? I didn't come to tell you anything. I want to ask. What? Who brought Jerry Fuller here? Dame. Sure, then? Yeah, sure, I'm sure. That all you want to know? That all you can tell? What else? Was he drunk? Mister, I didn't ask him. Who was the girl? I didn't stop to get introduced. Look, she brings him here, says she's his wife, gives me a couple of days' rent, that's it. Did she leave right away? What do you want from me, a quiz game? Did she leave right away? I don't know. I showed him the room, I got my dough. I don't push questions, see? She gave you two days' rent, huh? So long, mister. What'd you do up there, Mr. Holliday? Got unpopular. Okay, Jerry, now we'll go to my apartment. Yes, a lot. Thanks. Well, we'd better see about shipping you back home. Oh, but you said you were going to help. I am, and the best way I do that is to ship you out of the big city. You come back in, say, ten years. You think I'm just a kid that got in bad, don't you? Well, you were at the church social for two days, Jerry. And I'm telling you, I was robbed. So you were. What can I tell the folks back home? What you told me. Oh, you don't understand, Mr. Holliday. Oh, Mr. Simmons. Mr. Simmons? Who's he? He's Millie's father. Oh? And Millie, I take it, is the girl back home. You're making fun of me. No. No, I'm not, Jerry. Not at all. But the best thing you can do is face the music. You won't be able to dance to it, but... Well, it's the best way. I don't know. I... Now, you wait here. I'll run to the depot and get your baggage. Yeah, yeah. Got the check for it? Yeah. It's the only thing they left me. I had it in the inside compartment of my wallet. All right, Jerry. Now that we've got it figured, you'll feel better. I'll see you later. You'll feel better, I said. <laughs> Everybody makes mistakes, but just how big can they get? I went to the depot, picked up the one police Jerry had left there, and hurried back to my apartment. The automatic elevator was just coming down to ground level. 
Oops. I'm sorry. Yeah? How sorry? I... I beg your pardon? What for? <laughs> Keep your eyes in front, pal, and you won't run into people. Now, just a minute. You came out of that elevator a little too fast. So? That's the way I always move. Objections? I might have. Like what? You don't live in the building, do you? Nah. I own it. <laughs> so long, punk. I, uh, I mean, so long, Holiday. Holiday? I didn't know him, but he knew me, and he came from upstairs. Something told me that character had been in my apartment. Got in the elevator, pressed the floor button. Never realized until then how slow those things can move. Then... Jerry. Jerry, what happened? Nothing. Look at me, Jerry. I said, look at me. Oh, no. I'm all right. Yes, yeah, sure, you're all right. Like you ran into a meat chopper. Jerry, who was that man? There wasn't anybody. Now, listen to me. There was somebody here. He just left. I tell you, there wasn't anybody. Give me my police. Come here, now, sit down. Let me go. Be quiet now. Be quiet now. Sit down. Now, why did he go to you? Nobody did. Sure, sure, you poked your face in an electric fan to see the pretty blades go around. Come on, Jerry, talk. I'm going back home. Wherever that was, saw us at the place I picked you up. Followed us, waited until I left, and came up here. What did he say? What did he want? Nothing. I cut it out. You wanted help? I'll give it now. I don't want it. All I want to do is get out of here and go back home. I... All right, Jerry. But we got to get cleaned up first. Yeah. Go in the bathroom, wash up. Got to change the shirts in this police. Uh-huh. Okay. You... You're going to let me go? Why not? You won't talk. You won't let me help. Oh, Mr. Holliday, believe me, I... Are we going to say? Nothing. I'll get cleaned up. Okay, Jerry. Have it your way. Sure, and... Thanks. Thanks, anyway. Towel's in the back of the door. Honest, Mr. Holliday, I, I appreciate what you've done, but I, I know now i just got to go back and do like you said. Yeah, sure be a good little boy and wander back home. I, I can finish cleaning up on the train. Let me see your wallet. What? Oh, you got to have money. Count it as a loan. Send it back later. Oh, oh sure. Here. Yeah. Oh. Now, suppose you answer a question. Huh? What? Now, how do you explain this? Your railroad ticket. It's back. Oh, I, I guess I must have overlooked it before. Stop lying. I'm not. Okay. Here. Ten dollars, your wallet, your valise. Now, there's the door. You... You're mad, huh? So long, Jerry. I... Lieutenant Kling, please. Homicide, Kling. Hello, Kling. This is Dan. Well, my heart's desire. What are you We'll about? make for the jokes and funny patter some other time. Right now, I want to work fast. Huh? A man just left my apartment. He's on his way to the railroad station. Pick him up. Are you nuts? Here's what he looks like. Five feet seven, light brown hair. Wears horn-rimmed glasses. No hat, dark blue serge suit, carrying a suitcase with the initials J up on it, a foot high. Even some of your boys could spot it. Now, take a breath and listen to me. I can't order a guy picked up because you want to play games. you got to have a charge. Take him up and I'll sign the complaint later. You'll find my wallet in his valise. And now, back to Flash of Light. Another Box 13 adventure with Alan Land as Dan Holliday. It was a nasty way to keep Jerry in town, but it was the only way to keep him and still tuck him away where he wouldn't be the target for the night. Kling and I asked him questions, but if he'd been scared before, he was twice as scared now. 
the second scare was big enough to make him forget what he wanted to find out. Why he'd been mickeyed and packed off into that boarding house on East Central. But I was real curious about it, and because Kling had nothing to work on, I was on my own. I went back to East Central Street. I knew I wouldn't get anything out of the landlord, but I spotted little Kitty. And I remembered something she had said, so I asked her. Uh-huh. And there was a real pretty lady. Well, did you hear her name, Kitty? Uh-uh. Do you remember if she left right away? Uh-huh. She did. In a car? Oh, it was a taxi cab. Why? I... I want to find her. She had red hair and a real pretty fur coat. Oh, well, that's nice. But... But when she got into the taxi, Kitty... Uh, were you near her? Uh-huh. I like to look at her red hair and her pretty coat. Mm. Now, think carefully, Kitty. Did you hear her say anything to the driver of that taxi? Uh-huh. What? She told him where to go. Where? Where she told him. Oh, I, I know, but where did she tell him? What did she say? 245. 245 what? Well, that's the number of the street, I guess. Did you hear the street? Uh-huh. What was it? It wasn't the street. She said Avenue. <sighs> All right, Kitty, that's fine so far. Now, what was the name of the avenue? 245. That's the number of the avenue. Uh-uh. You just said it was. Oh, no, I didn't. I said 245 Avenue. What avenue? 245. Look, Kitty, I... I gotta go play now. Goodbye, Miss... Kitty, wait, I... Well, that was that. Dead end. And I was ten minutes and two miles away when it hit me. Kitty was right. The number was 245th Avenue. A half hour later, I was there. And it took ten dollars to bribe the clerk in the apartment house to give me the name of the real pretty lady with the red hair and pretty fur coat. And a couple of minutes later... Hey, you, Marty? Yeah, Beth? What's the idea of showing up this way? Hey... And a high, nonny, nonny. What's the idea? Oh, uh, pardon the intrusion. You get out of here. Who are you, anyway? I'm going to make a survey. Survey? What survey? Are you listening to your radio? What do you want? Answers. Have you got any? He ain't a cop. Expecting one? Get out. Sit down, Beth. I've got questions to ask about a kid named Jerry Fuller. <laughs> Nobody could call you little poker face. Meaning what? Meaning that name was a direct hit. You're crazy. Now, you get out of here before I call a cop. Okay. Alexander Graham Bell is a great man. He saved us a lot of steps and bother. Go on. Call the police. Oh, you don't think I will, huh? Maybe. But when they get here, they might ask questions about Jerry Fuller and why he was drugged, framed, and holed up on East Central. I said you're crazy. Oh, yes, I know you did. Well? Listen, I don't know who you are or what you're doing here, but I, I, I'm going to give you a break. You don't look like a bad guy. Maybe a nut, but but you can go and and we'll forget this. I don't want to forget it. I'll take it from here, Beth. <laughs> well, hello, hello. If it isn't my elevator friend. How did you get here, Holiday? I drove. Why? I thought maybe you crawled. Because that might be the way you get out. Marty, don't start nothing here, Shut please. up. What did you do? Leave a trail dope? No. I don't know how this guy got here. What are you doing here, Holiday? I want to know why that kid, Jerry Fuller, was framed the way he was. Just, uh, just curious, Holliday? Maybe. You don't know, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so you don't know. That's nice and healthy for you, Holiday. Because if you did know, well, well, you forced your way in here, and I have a perfect right to use this. I, uh, I could find out. Maybe from your pal Fuller, huh? Mm -hmm. Could be. <laughs> okay. Okay, go ask him. But get out of here and don't come back again. Oh, I might not be so nice about it. Come on, Peters. I might be back. I might be waiting. Maybe you let me on a secret holiday. Just where are you heading? Playing, I want to talk to Jerry Fuller. Fuller? Are you kidding? We let him out. Out? I told you I'd show up and sign the complaint. Sure, then Susie walks in and tells us you've decided not to sign a complaint. No charge. Susie? Yeah, Susie. Yeah. Let me use your phone. Why not? You've used the whole police department. Why stop at a phone? 
Hello. Susie? Oh, hello, Mr. Holliday. Where are you? Never mind that. Did you go to the police and tell them to drop my charge against Jerry Fuller? What? Well, yeah. Why? Because you told me to. I told you to. Susie, what's the matter with you? But, but you did. But I should go to the police and tell them you didn't want to. Oh. Okay, Susie. Did I do something wrong? Or right? It doesn't matter now. Well, didn't she? Yeah, but it's not her fault. It looked like a legitimate message from me because she knew I got that letter from Jerry Fuller. Oh, now I get it. Box 13 again. I'm not superstitious, but I'm going to be if I know you much longer. Listen, somebody wanted Fuller out of here. Out of the way because that somebody is afraid of what Fuller knows. Now what? How do I know? I just got off the bench to come in the game. Cling, that kid's in danger. We've got to find him. Maybe you better start from the beginning so I can at least look intelligent about it. All right. Fuller sent a letter to Box 13. He wanted me to help him because he was afraid to go back home before he All right, all right. That's the story. But Fuller can't know anything because he said he was blanked out. We've got to find him. There must be something he knows. Okay, hold on. Sergeant. Get a description of Jerry Fuller from the clerk. Left here about a half hour ago. Put out a dragnet for him. Watch bus, railroad, plane terminals. Right away. Good boy. Now, one more thing. This Marty character you talked about. Short? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's stocky, little scar on his chin. Clothes were neat, but gaudy. Uh, I thought so. Marty Kane. Oh, you know him? Every police department in the country knows him. Killer. Hired by anyone who can pay his price. Killer? Got anything on him? No, Stooley's tipped us off he was in town. Two days after he gets here, Billy Dufresne was killed. Dufresne? Yeah, he was only state's witness against Billy Farn. We thought nobody knew it. Oh, we gave Dufresne protection, but not enough. Kane got to him. And you lose the fraud case against Farn. Yeah. But if we can get Fuller back, you'll have a case against Kane and Farn. If Fuller talks. What do we do now? If you got any fingernails left, start working on them while we wait. <laughs> We waited. Two hours, then three hours. Kling and I stared at each other, each of us afraid of, well, to say what he was thinking. That Jerry Fuller would be dead when they found him. There's one point against that, though. The fact that it must have been Marty Kane who went to Susie with that fake message from me. She could identify him. And her Fuller was killed. Let me go, I tell you, let me go. I didn't do anything. That's all, Sergeant. I'll check over. Go on in, Fuller. What have you got me back here for? I... Mr. Holliday. Look, Jerry, you're a very lucky boy. You're not decorating the bottom of the river right now. You're safe here, kid. Nobody can get at you here. What do you want? I don't know anything. Maybe you do. I told you I don't. I was on my way home. Why Jerry. don't you let me... Jerry, that night in the Red Swan, what did you see or hear that put Marty Kane after you? I don't know any Marty Kane. I never even heard the name before. He was the man who beat you up in my apartment. I didn't know him. I never saw him before in my... But you did. Why did you stop talking just then? I don't know. Maybe I talked to him at the cocktail bar at the Red Swan. I don't know. You talked to him at the Red Swan. Did he tell you anything about about a man named Dufresne? Dufresne? No, I tell you, it's all hazy. Look, Dan, a guy like Kane wouldn't pay to anybody. Does this make sense? And why is Kane anxious to get Jerry out of town? Well, if this kid knew anything, Kane wouldn't let him live ten seconds. And what's the angle? Jerry, did you ever hear of a man named Billy Farn? No. No, I didn't. And I don't know why Kane's after me. All I want to do is go home. Wait a minute. Well, uh, when did you get into town? Four days ago, the 10th. The 10th? You sure? Yes. What's the matter with that, Kling? Everything. Because Dupree was killed on the 5th. Five days before this kid even got near this town. That made it better than ever for people who like puzzles that don't fit together. But there had to be a reason for the whole thing, and because I believed that, I headed for the Red Swan. I went to the cocktail bar and looked around. I didn't know what I expected to find, but, well, maybe nothing. Then there was a flash of light. A flash of light. A flash bulb set off by a camera girl, one of those who take pictures of nightclubs. And that was it. Two flashes of light, one from the bulb and another in my head when the idea hit me. It took me ten minutes to find the man who owned the concession. Yes, sir. We keep all negatives. They're numbered and dated. Got the ones for the night of the 12th? Uh, 
Sure, but I can't show them to you. Oh, look, look, look. Check first with Lieutenant Kling, police. He'll tell you it's okay for me to look through those negatives and find the one I want. How big can you project this thing, Kling? As big as you want. The lab made a positive from the neg you've got. You ready? Yeah, go ahead. Bring it up. Mm, plenty. Jerry, recognize that picture? Yeah. Yeah. I had the girl take one of me at the bar for a souvenir to take back home. But you haven't got that picture, though. Well, no. I forgot all about it. Jerry, at the bar, you were, you were a little tipsy. You got talkative. You showed the picture to somebody. Was it Kane? Well, I don't know. It could have been. So what, then? What's this picture got to do with it? Don't look at Jerry, Kling. Look at the figures in the background. Enlarge it a little more. Yeah. That what you want. Hey, that's Marty Kane. Yeah, taking money from someone. And that someone is Billy Farnes Legman. Well, you got your case, Kling. Farnes Legman paying off Kane for killing Dupree. Better look at it in the light, Dan. This picture shows Kane getting money. Okay, so what? A smart lawyer could make up a dozen reasons. Kane won it from Farnes. He was getting change from the Legman. But coupled with this business about Jerry Fuller, who would stand up in court. Fuller hasn't been hurt. Kane was smart that way. Yeah, I, uh. I. Hey, listen. You want a case. But how? Let me have that negative and listen to your Uncle Dan for a few minutes. Good evening, Marty. So, oh, you did come back, huh? Uh-huh. Want to talk to me? Sure, come on in. Oh, leaving town, Marty? So you're all packed. Maybe you better do the same. I like it here. You must. Now beat it. Uh-huh. I thought you were smart, Marty. What? You got the picture from Jerry Fuller, but there's always the negative. <laughs> You've got a much better poker face than your girlfriend. But you batted an eyelash. Marty, who is it? Oh, you. Sit down and stay out of the way, Beth. Well, Marty? So, uh... So you got the negative, huh? Maybe. You should have thought of it. But that's the trouble with you smart boys. You play ring around the rosy and get yourselves dizzy. What's your angle? Nothing. Oh, and before you pull that trigger, there are cops all around this place. Marty. Shut up. This guy's pulling the bluff. So? Now, why don't you be smart this time, Marty, and go along quietly? The police could use your evidence. Turn stooly, huh? Nothing doing. Marty. Marty, come back. You'll see him again, Beth. Let him run. <gasps> Don't tell him. They did. They killed him. They killed him. Oh, no, Beth. Things too good a shot to kill his best witness. Did he go back home? That he did, Susie. And right now, he's probably a hero in his hometown. He, And all because of a flash in the pan. Huh? I made a joke. Get it? Face, pan. Flash in the pan. <laughs> oh. Good night, Susie. <laughs> Next week, same time, through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville, with an original story by Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Pickard, and that of Lieutenant Kling by Edmund MacDonald. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Hollywood.